Hello, ladies and gentlemen. His antics have been witnessed by millions, with many always keeping a close eye on him, waiting to see what he does next. All you did was make me feel sad, depressed. He should love his mother. She misses him. Hello, we're live on the internet. What do you want? Hi, Mom. Hello. I love the women outside. Do not hate. Hate is not so good. What keeps us fascinated? This is the story of Chris Chan. Christopher Weston Chandler was born on February 24, 1982, in Charlottesville, Virginia, to parents Bob, aged 54, and Barbara, 40. Bob had worked in the engineering field for Western Electric and later General Electric. The family held Bob's life accomplishments very proudly, as he had at least seven patents to his name, including mechanisms used in the production of Kleenex and molding of plastic water containers. Bob was very world conscious and was an avid collector of stamps since a very young age. Later in life, he developed a love for music, especially foreign music. He eventually amassed a collection of over 10,000 vinyl records. 
he had a son and daughter from a previous marriage, the relationships with whom were strained to say the least. Barbara was a secretary with Virginia Power. She had a habit of hoarding her belongings and was an emotionally abusive person, which convinced her then 17-year-old son, Cole Smithy, to seek independence and live life on his own. So when Chris came along, Bob and Barb got a chance to start anew. The new family started their new life in their humble Ruckersville home. Chris later claimed that at around two months of age, he uttered his first word, monkey. It didn't take long for the parent to see that Chris wasn't quite like most other babies. The first signs of his autism could be witnessed in 1983. Despite his condition being congenital, he had stated that his autism was brought about by one particularly traumatic event when he was 18 months old. A babysitter named Roach, or Roach, would look after baby Christopher whenever his parents would go out in the evenings. One of these nights, Chris inadvertently infuriated her, and she locked him in a room filled with toys, in the dark, alone. This would prove so traumatic that he refused to speak for the next six years. Even though he sees this event as the source of all his troubles, he does not blame his parents for keeping Roach as his babysitter because they did not know better. Despite living out his childhood as a mute, Chris was anything but quiet. He confessed later on in life that he screeched often and was very troublesome to his parents. Moved into the neighborhood. The Hammers and the Chambers struck up a cordial relationship, which led to Chris forming a bond with the Hammers' daughter, Sarah. Looking back, Chris considered her to be his closest childhood friend, and that she greatly helped him with his autism. However, from what is known of their relationship, it is also likely that she took advantage of Chris's innocence and trust, and may be seen more as a bully than a friend. For example, she once told him that Casper the Friendly Ghost was hiding under her house. Naturally, Chris crawled into the hammer's crawl space to find him, only to find spiderwebs, bugs, and dirt instead. Sarah locked him in. After about half an hour, her dad came to his rescue. On another occasion, she told Chris that if he were to eat the upper thing of a honeysuckle, it would taste like honey. This is a reference to the berries of a honeysuckle, which can be slightly harmful if ingested in large doses. Fortunately, their parents told them of the dangers of doing so before Christopher could fulfill Sarah's wish. At the age of five, Chris began studying at Green County Primary School together with Sarah. It is not known how he was treated here or how he got along with the other kids. In addition to taking regular classes at the primary school, he received language training at James Madison University. In 1987, in a lengthy letter addressed to Chris, dated December 26, Bob offered his outlook on life and presented some life advice for his son. There are many sides to a mountain and many ways to climb it. If you get stopped, back off, regroup, and try another way. If you are still not successful, maybe it is not meant to be. If it is meant to be, having it on the back burner simmering for a while is not bad. It will pop up again, and the way to attain it will be there. Everything in its time. Your mother and I have done our best for you, and in return, we expect at least that from you, for yourself and your children. He also expressed wishes for his son to inherit and hold dearly his vast...
collection of music, movies, stamps, and art prints. He reminisced about the straight razor which he inherited from his grandfather, which he carelessly broke while using it as a screwdriver. Bob still held on to that broken razor his entire life because his grandfather wanted him to have it. Bob hoped that Chris would share his father's sentiment. I hope that you will not carelessly misuse, waste, or destroy the value of the many things I have collected for you. First, learn all about them, how to use them and enjoy them, their value, and how you can thoughtlessly waste their value. Then enjoy them as... CR tapes and records, my books on popular music, movies, entertainers, musical theater, ship models, my daylilies, gazebo, and dreams. This letter offers an insight into Bob's character as he feared that all he had accomplished over the course of his life may be lost. In 1989, during a weekly trip to the toy store with his mother, Chris picked up a GoBot up on display and slowly started to read out the text on the package ending his six years of silence. Later that same year, Bob and Chris converted the shed in their backyard into a workshop, christening it the Dreaming Studio. Bob had hoped that he and his son would build things together there. He even commemorated the space with a plaque, Dreaming Studio of Mr. C and Little C, where dreams do come true. However, when asked about it, Chris could not recall what, if anything, had been built there. It was instead mostly used by Barbara for storage. For Christmas of that year, he got a Nintendo Game Boy. This was also the year that the family got Patty Chandler, a Beagle Spitz mix, which they picked up as a pup from their aunt Karina. Chris grew very attached to the dog, displaying a fondness and arguably a love rarely shown for anything or anyone else in his life. In 1990, Bob co-hosted a jazz marathon on WTJU radio. During the program, he displayed his keen knowledge on 20s and 30s jazz music. Okay, now we go on to performance number two, which is tight like that. This is November the 9th, 1928, with Chicago personnel, the Tampa Red Folk and Jug Band. It's a great group of Chicago musicians featuring kazoo, guitar, and jug by Hudson Whitaker. Tampa Red's guitar, Thomas A. Dorsey is on the piano and the washboard. Frankie Halfpipe Jackson, vocals interact to make this a great session. Listen for some very good kazoo and jugs, and notice how Halfpipe Jackson laughs like scat singing. Very unusual. <laughs> Nineteen ninety also marked the last year of Chris's tenure at Green County Primary School. For his fourth grade studies, he transferred to Nathaniel Green Elementary School. It was here where he allegedly had very distressing experiences. He asserts that the staff at the school didn't know how to handle autistic children and treated him cruelly. Chris contends that five members of staff abused him by pinning him down to the ground, holding his wrists and ankles, and audiotaping his cries. Furthermore, he claimed that the principal forced him to sit on his lap and said offensive things to him. But little Christopher resisted, and the advances never went further than that. The principal is also claimed to be gay, which Chris feels justifies his homophobia. I was abused by one. A homosexual principal at my elementary school slapped me on his lap, said some offensive things to me, and I felt uncomfortable. Even though Chris's accounts of the events could not be verified, it is also not unlikely that an event like this could have taken place. Though Chris never specified the reasoning behind their attacks, nor did he state whether him being restrained and being assaulted by the principal were separate or related events, it is possible that he may have been restrained and verbally abused as a form of disciplinary action and even placed in a scream room, which was a fairly common school installation for dealing with autistic children up until the mid-1990s. Whatever event transpired, it forced Chris's parents to take him away from Nathaniel Green Elementary School. To further things, they took the case to Green County Court. After the school board threatened to take Chris out of mainstream education and instate him into a special needs school, the Chandlers dropped the case. For the remainder of the school year, 
he was homeschooled. It was around this tumultuous time that young Christopher had an uplifting experience that would change his life. During a shopping trip in Richmond, possibly in December 1992, but in other accounts he stated that it was 1989, he came across the Leonard Bernstein Symphony Orchestra, a show comprised of animatronic characters that is held around Christmas time at the Regency Square shopping mall. The conductor, Leonard Bernstein, is made to be fully interactive with his audience with the help of a human controller behind the scenes. On this blessed day, the turnout for the show was weak, so Chris got extra attention from the bear. When Leonard asked him his name, the person controlling the animatronic misheard it and answered back, calling him Christian. The boy took this as a profound sign and felt that he should be called Christian. In order for Chris to continue with formal education, Bob and Chris moved to Chesterfield County while Barbara remained in the family house in Rutgersville with Patty so she could keep working. Christian enrolled in Providence Middle School in Richmond. looked back fondly over his time here, giving special credit to his teacher Virginia Sanford. She was the most influential teacher in my life. During my years at Providence Middle School, she taught me better social skills, how to better cope with other people, bullies, and life. With a positive and fun tomboyish attitude, she was a teacher any child would be most proud to look up to and be taught by. He also forged a friendship with Natasha Turner, a girl a few years older than him. He lost romantic interest in her when he saw her smoking. They would often hang out together at the bus stop. He would sometimes give her money on behalf of his father for her friendship and attention. Chris would later realize that Natasha was, in a sense, a friend with benefits. She would stay with him and be friendly in exchange for a monetary reward from Bob. Bob knew that his son had little hope in having true friendships otherwise. The Avengers of Sonic the Hedgehog, the cool new TV show, is on the air. In the fall of 93, Sega, the video game developer, held a watch and win sweepstakes contest in conjunction with their Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog cartoon. The lucky winner would get a $1,000 shopping spree at KB Toys. And that winner was Chris. Christian is one of only about 100 winners nationally to receive $1,000 worth of Sega games and equipment. For his parents, it's just another example of how well he's doing. Christian is a high-functioning autistic child. This past fall, on his own initiative, he entered a contest based on a favorite cartoon character. What I had to do was exactly what side the edge of a cartoon, and I'd listen to what side says at the end of it, and write it down for a whole week, and then I had to mail it in, and I had to be drawn out of a hat, and I just won. And Christian's father says it only takes a few hours for him to master an electronic game and then move on to another. I can't master any of them. That's it for now. And it's this is the first of many competitions that he entered during his life and has cemented itself as a likely key reinforcer to his future sense of entitlement. On December 29th, 1993, the Richmond Times Dispatch published an article about Christian's magical encounter with Leonard Bernstein entitled it took a talking bear to give the name a young boy loves. The boy's father recounts the events of the day. Since this was early in the Christmas season, on a Thursday afternoon, the crowd was light. The conversation between Leonard and Christopher lasted about an hour. Christopher was spellbound. Something unusual happened during that conversation. When Leonard Bernstein, in a decidedly British accent, asked Christopher his name, the bear must have misunderstood what the boy replied. Leonard started calling our son Christian. What better name for the Christmas season? And the name stuck like glue. From that time on, for the past year, his name has been Christian Weston Chandler. Christian is very emphatic about that. Bob also offered up some insight into the family's situation. Christopher is a high-functioning autistic child. While intellectually, his age level is 12 or 13, socially, he is around age 7 or 8. He has some behavior problems with his peers and relates better with children a few years younger than him. The Greene County school system was not equipped to teach an autistic child, Mr. Chandler said. The Chesterfield County school system has accepted him with open arms. 
The article also mentions that Bob had originally wanted to name his son Christian, but had chickened out. It is unclear what scared him off from naming his child Christian. In any case, the following year, the boy had his name legally changed to Christian Weston Chandler. In the spring of 96, Barbara retired from her secretarial position at Virginia Power and moved in with Bob and Chris, reuniting the boy with Patty the dog. In late spring, Chris graduated from Providence Middle School. As a parting gift, Mrs. Sanford wrote a personal, touching, and prophetic letter to Chris. Well, it's been three years now at Providence, and it's all over. Where has the time gone to? The most important parting words I can leave you with, well, are to always remember this. You show people where your weak points are located, then they will know how to push your button. If you never show them, they will never know. I hope you will have an enjoyable summer and come back to visit. Do your very best at Manchester, put your best foot forward, and treat others as you wish to be treated. Love, Mrs. Sanford. The Manchester in question happened to be Manchester High School, where according to Christian, he spent the happiest years of his life. Over the course of four semesters, he studied Spanish, of which he has a very loose grasp. For class assignments, he adopted a Spanish name, Ricardo, a common practice for students in order to better get into character and the culture of the language. However, Christian got too into character and often used Ricardo in class assignments outside of Spanish and even considers it as part of his real name. When riding on the school bus, he used to sit right in front of the bus door so he could always get off the fastest. However, during his freshman year, he got into an altercation with another boy who wanted to be off the bus first. He punched Christian in the face, knocking his glasses off. In order to resolve the issue, Chris was forced to take the special ed bus to school from then on, which deeply affected him. He always felt very uncomfortable associating with others whom he called slow in the minds. I ended up with this really worse off mentally challenged person who could hardly ever speak other than her. That boy bopped me on the back of the head for his own laughs. The special ed teacher who rode on the bus talked with his brother about it, and he kept it from bopping me. But having to put up with his nonsensical slur talk was still just as cringy and horrifying. Ugh. Among his other activities, he served as a water boy and allegedly a manager for the school basketball team, the Manchester Lancers, along with Joseph Herring, one of Christian's only male friends. Chris had always gravitated towards girls, and at Manchester, this was no exception. He had a sizable group of female friends, which he dubbed Gal Pals. Among the first that he met was Molly Qualls, a cheerleader at the time whom he met as a freshman. He fondly remembered them being paired up during a matchup event for Valentine's Day. Laura Beth Dorazio was another cheerleader Chris met and cared for. But after he confessed that he had a crush on her, she told him that she would like them to remain just as friends. Tiffany Gowan was said to be a real good girl to Chris, and he has described her as a bit of a tomboy and a peppermint patty to his Charlie Brown. Kelly Andes was his biggest crush and says they were high school sweethearts, even though they were never in an actual relationship together. Sarah Bevel was in the same chemistry class along with Kelly and Chris. Sarah had a boyfriend at the time, and Chris watched them interact, hoping to experience their kind of relationship one day. It was fun to just watch them flirt with each other. I could have learned from that, but my autism and normal social phobias held me back then. Miranda Mitchell was the big brain in his circle of friends, and shared computer graphics class with Christian. His group of gal pals were possibly not genuinely interested in a friendship with Chris, but rather stayed with him out of pity or as protection. A later comment made by Chris suggests that the group had made an arrangement with Bob and or the principal of the high school. Concerning schoolwork, there is a wealth of information that has been attained which helps to refute his previous claims that he held an honor roll streak all throughout high school. For one of his assignments, he had to conduct an interview with his parents, offering some more information about their life experiences. For the question, why did you choose to have children, they answered, it's nice to have kids. For what adjustments did you have to make?
after your first child arrived? They answered, laughter from four kids and three situations, referring to their troubled past marriages and estranged children. Interestingly, when asked about what has been the hardest part about parenting, the answer was dealing with the school system. In another assignment concerning families, Chris inserted mathematical equations into his definitions, making them hard to read and understand. For example, he defined a nuclear family as a mother, father, and X is more than or equal to one child sharing the same household. He also described adoption as a right to raise a child who is biologically their own. Christian took part in a parenting exercise in which he wore an empathy belly to simulate the feeling of being a pregnant woman. He wrote a report describing his experience. Having a belly like a pregnant woman was really an awkward experience. When I tried to get my pencil bag out of my backpack, the belly held me back by putting pressure on my left leg. Luckily my arms were long, but if they were any shorter, I would have had a real problem to reach the pencil bag. While I was sitting in my chair, the belly made it uncomfortable for me to cross my legs. And while my legs were separated, it put pressure on my private part, which gave me a strange, weird feeling. He wrote an essay about Japan's involvement in World War II. It should be noted that he addressed himself as Ricardo W. Chandler, with Christian placed in parentheses, and wrote English in Spanish. The teacher justly corrected this. According to Chris, the war was a very tragic event, with guns, insults, and yuck. He continues, the Japanese and Americans had Dean glowering at each other like boxers from opposite corners of a 5,000 mile ring, waiting for the bout to begin. So, the US and Japan really wanted to get it on. He also quoted that President Woodrow Wilson tried to get Japan to withdraw from Shandong. Christian's essay ended up being a mishmash of events of both world wars. In addition, he referenced several books, however all of his findings could be found within the first eight pages. The teacher commented, restate thesis. There is a page titled Warm Fuzzies for Christian W. Chandler, which most likely was a class activity in which the students wrote nice things to each other in order to promote acceptance. The messages left for Chris read very bland, such as, I like your clothes, is a very funny and nice person, okay, funny, you are a nice person, nice watch, you tell great jokes, and you tell fun jokes. But perhaps the most baffling piece of writing that there is on record is his 13 lucky writing tips, an assignment for English class in which he switches four tips in to what most closely resembles Spanish. In any case, it is little more than unintelligible garble. Use standard written English. Do not use contractions in formal writing. You must have a thesis statement in each essay. The thesis statement es el finalier estance de la doctori paragrafe. Tu escribes de literature. El thesis inclure el llama de author y llama de work. Los paragraphs supporte y relate cue el thesis. Los paragraphs tienes el topic estances hablan el unifying concepto de el paragraph. Los details support y relate a el topic estance de paragraph. Necesitas los adecuate soporte details. Escribe el literatura en presente tense. Necesitas tres muchaco mirar de puente. Necesitas creas muy bien tu escribes creas sense y es muy logical. Cheques to escribir muy carefully. From this school report, it can be seen that he failed all but two of his 14 assignments, earning a D plus for the year. At age 16, Chris wrote a poem entitled Song of Christian for his class, loosely based on Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. He decided to record his creation for posterity in video form. The video itself is poorly lit, but there isn't much to see anyway. I hear America singing as I sing of myself, and you experience as I experience. The problems of myself are my problems. The youth of the young singing cries a happiness. The children's song is song of laughter. At age six weeks, I sang the song of laughter that one and a half years of age, the Lord put the new button on. My song that I sing, although I talk well, my fear relationship is low and my loneliness is off the scale. 
Anyway, that's my poem. Beyond just reciting the poem, he pretends to be the enthusiastic host of the Christian Chandler Show. <laughs> He then rambles on about his fascination with the Sonic the Hedgehog universe and talks about Bionic the Hedgehog, his first Sonic related creation, which he came up with during basketball practice. And then I have science when that helps. Of course, Tails that flies, Knuckles he punches and climbs, and Bionic. Well, you heard rumors about Bionic. He's that Sonic brother I made myself, who's that very good basketball player and mechanic. And I can tell you the background story on him. He proceeds to rant about receiving an F in English class. I see my thought, that's about time I sign off. But uh, before I go, I just one thing to say to uh, the teacher. An F in English class? You have got to be kidding me. I mean an F. I do not even know when was the last time I got an F. I mean, who knows? It could have been back in old Green County. That stupid place. <laughs> At Green County Primary. Actually, it was a nice school, but... Then the came the thing of Green Elementary. That's why I got the F. Anyway, then many years go by. Then you came along and gave me an F. I mean, I started off with an A, and you just lowered it, lowered it, lowered it. I'm getting sick and tired of this lower thing. What do you have against all, against the handicapped children anyway? I mean, I know my handicap is autism, and I'm not afraid to admit it. And you, Mrs. Bird, I think that F is very disrespectful. I mean, I am very emotional about it. Anyway, it's time I sign off. Well, this has been the Christian Channel Show. Around the same time, he made a series of stop motion videos of races set in his Lego made town called Quickville, based on his own initials. They were made with a Game Boy camera, which produced grainy, low resolution grayscale photos, or alternatively, low quality stop motion video. The awkward frame rate makes it difficult to discern what is actually going on, but it is important to note that all the racers are named either after pop culture characters that Christian idolized or people he knew in real life. This is the earliest account of Chris using people to play out his fantasies. The biggest trend in kids' toy history, it's multi, multi billion dollar. Throughout the late 1990s, the Pokemon franchise was spreading across North America, with Chris keeping a keen eye on it. He began playing the trading card game, and included illustrations of Pokemon characters in his Spanish homework. He also wrote a lengthy essay detailing how the Pokemon came into their Pokeballs, with which his teacher was very pleased. The year 1999 marked the birth of his wall of originals. This was a designated portion of the wall which displayed Pokemon trading cards that Chris made himself. It featured original Pokemon such as a female Pikachu called Chikachu and Plotistic, a plant which is autistic. Chris himself also appeared several times. His fascination grew to a point that he would dress up as the Pokemon character Ash Ketchum out in public. Around mid-1999, Christian launched his first website a simple Pokemon themed effort humbly called Quick's Pokesite, cementing the moniker Quick. It was soon replaced by Quick's Pokesite 2 with a new logo designed by Miranda. He updated it with personal and Pokemon related news here semi regularly for the next year and a half. This year also marked Christian's first visit to the Game Place, a hobby store which allowed returning customers to play video games, board games, or trading card games. It quickly became his weekly haunt. The Pokemon craze was captured on film for Richmond's NBC affiliates WWBT News. The report featured excited young kids playing the game and trying to explain the phenomenon. How do you play the game? I can't explain it, it's too long. Their bewildered parents standing witness. Um, I'm watching and, and uh, I still have no clue. <laughs> And the 17 year old Chris in action. I'll switch, I'll put out my dragon there, even though it has 60 damage on it. Oh boy. 
So if you had the time to tell me... To commemorate Valentine's Day of the year 2000, Christian wrote a Valentine's Day hymn, a free verse effort in which he reveals that he holds very traditional views on courtship and the predetermined rules of etiquette for men and women. On a date, the man could not pay the bill, so his date slammed her door in his face. The man's coat over a puddle, the maiden walks, then the man trips and pays the laundry bill. Under the moonlight, the couples of the world kiss, but unfortunately for a few, they are interrupted by their parents. He uploaded it onto his website. Ten days later, Chris celebrated his 18th birthday, a date which he held in the highest regard. Among the guests in attendance were a handful of Christian's gal pals and his half-brother Cole. Nearly three years after the fact, he reminisced about the event. I will never forget my 18th birthday party. It was the best of the rest. The weekend before my real birthday, my mother and I prepared for the party I was going to host that day. We hung balloons and streamers, and we laid refreshments on the table. At the door was four of my high school amigas, and one of them brought a friend. We ate pepperoni pizza and drank Pepsi. It was great. As mother lit the candles, I was filling up with ecstasy. After I blew the candles, I was presented with a big jawbreaker from Kelly, an R.L. Stein novel from Sarah, a planer with stickers from Miranda, and a rabbit doll with jelly beans from Tiffany. We watched Good Burger and had fun. After they left, it was done. What did I wish for? I'm not telling. Even though he seemed pleased that his gal pals came to celebrate, he was never pictured together with them, preferring to sit alone. He is also photographed wearing a pair of jeans with a suspicious stain on his crotch. Some have speculated that it is dried semen, but it is unlikely. About a month later, Chris was tasked with designing a CD jewel case for his graphic design class. On the fateful day on March 17, 2000, I wanted to feature on my favorite hit CD cover, lifelong hero Sonic the Hedgehog and cute newer character Pikachu, but copyrighted characters were prohibited from the project. So, in my mind, I pondered and pondered. When it hit me visually, Sonic and Pikachu combined. In a way to escape copyright, he combined Sonic the Hedgehog and Pikachu to create Sonichu, the electric hedgehog Pokemon, which Christian considers to be one of his greatest life accomplishments. The CD tracklist itself consists of Pokemon, Sonic and Mario related music, with intermittent appearances of old time jazz from artists such as Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby, undoubtedly an influence from his father. Another month later, Chris had to document a week of his life for a school project. The result was A Week with Christian W. Chandler, a self-documentary, which detailed the events of his life from April 29th to May 5th, 2000. The front cover features a blurry photo of Chris and Patty, with a discolored ghostly Sonic below. He writes it in the third person, as if followed by a documentary crew. On April 29th, he visits Books A Million to participate in the Pokemon Trading Card Game League. Afterwards, he enters a costume contest, and since he wore his regular Ash Ketchum outfit, he wins and receives a cool t-shirt as a reward. The following day, he talks about packing and moving things from their home in Richmond to their old house in Rutgersville. The next day, he goes to high school. He uses a tripod to help take pictures of himself. During class, Mr. Goss discussed the difference between Shakespeare's world and the real world of today. Christian rested his eyes after Mr. Goss's discussion and before the bell rang. Next, he had trigonometry. I'd hate to be Christian when his nerves kicked into action after waking up from a naughty snooze cruise, but I was. Next was computer graphics. It was great for him today because he got to print his own CD cover. Next was Spanish too. He took a quiz today, but I think he feels confident in his work. And finally, after a hard odd day, he rides home on a bus, but unfortunately, it had a few slow in the minds on it. The following day, he repeats the routine of snoozing through class, and that on even days, he eats lunch with Tiffany and Sarah. For the following day, 
He describes his daily activities at home, which mostly consist of playing video games and managing his website. The next day, he talks about working in computer graphics class and making a Mother of the Year award for Barbara, which he plans to give to her on Mother's Day. For the final day's report, Chris states that it was a difficult Friday. One of his duties included taking part in a senior group photo. After the long wait for the pictures to be taken, being crowded like a sardine surrounded by immature teenage boys, and having the hot, hot sun shining down on him and everyone else, he went back to the shady entrance. After the photo shoot, Chris was picked up by his dad. And that concludes our week-long documentary of A Week with Christian W. Channel, the autistic boy that has made it this far. Colon close parentheses. Chris wouldn't pass up an opportunity to go to the senior prom, so he did, bringing his mother along as a date. Even though Christian had labeled the set of photos as the senior prom, it is possible that it was some other social gathering due to the fact that the event is held during the daytime. Looking back on the prom, he claimed that he was naive about dating unlike the other students. Out of pity or out of genuine compassion, Tiffany asked Christian to dance. I hesitated at first, but she grabbed my hand and pulled me onto the dance floor. We danced for what felt like hours. It was the most pleasant experience of that night, and I thank her for dancing with me then. He felt that her willingness to dance with him meant that she was attracted to him, and stated that if they were to meet again, they would start a relationship. Graduation. The end of high school the end of his interactions with his gal pals. Most importantly, it was the day Christian had to be recognized for his achievements. But unfortunately, this wasn't the case. I only got recognized for my grades with a star pin, yet they had more fancier awards for more important qualities. I should have been highly recognized for my artistic talents I showed in my many art classes for the award ceremonies before graduation day. I felt crestfallen greatly from not getting recognized for any of my talents. I excelled in math too for the love of God. I was so f jealous. I was a high functioning autistic boy who came way beyond out of his social shell only to get zilch, nada, zip, a big fat zero. I felt so devastated and out of sync. As a result of his heartbreak, he only went up on stage to receive his diploma without looking at anyone's face nor shaking anyone's hand. After the ceremony was over, he found himself an unoccupied table, sat by it, and cried. Eventually, his mother and later Tiffany came to console him. His father would look back on this event with shame and anger for years to come. Christian's time at high school is still thought of fondly by him recalling the sweet memories of creating artistic projects for class and frequently hanging out with his gal pals, all of which were abruptly ended with that gloomy, rainy graduation. But with the end of high school came the promise of a new world in college, a chance for new friends, new experiences, and the first steps to a bright future. made him this way? What is the attraction? What keeps us fascinated? This is the story of Chris Chan.
In the year 2000, the Chandlers came back to their family home in Rutgersville, and in August, at the behest of his parents, Christian began attending Piedmont, Virginia Community College, where the highest level degree students could attain was an associate degree. Perhaps spellbound by illusions of grandeur, Chris chose to study marketing, but Bob quickly transferred him to a computer-aided drafting and design degree in the hopes that it would be a better fit for his challenged son and his future. According to the PVCC handbook of the time, this was a two-year degree worth 15 credits. In addition, he took English classes and even a tennis class. Apart from study, he continued to develop his Pokemon website and added more cards to his wall of originals, creating cards representing, among others, his beloved Sonichu. In October, he launched Quick's Sonichu site, a website devoted to his original character. Over the course of the year, the Sonichu family grew. He created Sonny, Sonichu's pre-evolutionary form, and dedicated a trading card to him. He also gave Sonichu a female companion, Rose Chu, based on Amy Rose from the Sonic franchise. After high school, contact with his gal pals was lost, apart from Kelly. He claimed to have called her every weekend for about a year. For Christmas of that year, Christian made her a CD entitled Songs for Kelly as his gift. He incorporated a mini Sonichu into the artwork. Winter of 2000 is also significant, for that was when Chris created his Sonichu medallion made of Crayola model magic and acrylic paints. Late 2000, I bought some Crayola model magic clay and I molded and crafted the first original Sonichu medallion that I wore around my neck with a makeshift chain which I later replaced with a better necklace I bought from Pacific Sunwear at my mall. He would rarely be seen without it. The following year, he continued to develop the lore around Sonichu, which included creating an offspring for Rose Chu called Rosie and designing an Archie Comics cover for Sonic the Hedgehog vs. Sonichu. For his mother's 60th birthday, he made her a cake with Sonichu on it. In July, he filmed the City of Quickville tour using the stop motion feature on his Game Boy camera. The town in question was as yet unfinished Quickville made of Lego. He still hadn't settled on a naming system yet, so he spells it in two different ways. First with an I, then with an I and a K. The tour is led by a Lego incarnation of Christian, and he shows two landmarks of the town the water tower and go-kart pass before the video abruptly ends, possibly due to the Game Boy camera only having the capacity to hold 30 frames at a time. In August, Christian got a job at Wendy's. He was mostly in charge of cleaning trays, tables, and carpet tile flooring, keeping the place neat and serving the customers with kind, understanding help. He alleges that he never quite saw eye to eye with his supervisor, who disagreed with Chris's way of operating. According to one supposed event, he got his uniform dirty, and despite it being likely that he could have swapped with a clean spare at the establishment, he proceeded to continue to work with his sullied attire, and even attempted to wash it in the bathroom sink. According to Christian, a female co-worker gave him a hard time, pelting him with criticisms and insults, perhaps mistaking her constructive criticisms for attacks against his person. He also admitted he took breaks frequently, neglecting other duties. Chris was fired from Wendy's in September or October 2001 for a number of possible reasons. One of the most popular motives for his dismissal was that he performed a Donald Duck impression to a child at the restaurant, bringing him to tears. In other accounts, he said that he was fired after he drew an unflattering caricature of an older female co-worker. His termination was likely a culmination of these events. It was also around this time that Chris ended his weekly calls to Kelly. He gave conflicting reasons for this. He first stated that he suffered from noviophobia, a term he coined, which he defines as a fear of speaking to a woman who may already be in a relationship, which convinced him that his calls were in vain. Initially, Chris stated that he was told by his mother that Kelly most likely already had a boyfriend, so he might as well quit his attempts. But later, he changed I live in a low-income housing environment that goes by the government name of Section 8. Me and a group of my allies... He simply forgot to call her one weekend, and that... I live in a low-income housing environment that goes by the government name of Section 8. 
Me and a group of my allies control certain areas of this section in order to run our illegitimate business. We possess unregistered firearms, stolen vehicles, mind-altering inhibitors, and only use cash for financial purchases. If anyone would like to settle unfinished altercations, I will be more than happy to release my address. I would like to warn you, I am a very dangerous person, and I regularly disobey the law. broke the routine. It didn't want to continue. On February 24th, 2003, Christian spent a tearful 21st birthday. For some reason, he was kicked out of English class by his male and possibly gay professor. Like many historical accounts of his life, he keeps changing the story. First, he said that the class was reading the book Wednesday's Child, which featured an autistic girl. He recounted that he told the professor that he was autistic as well which resulted in a misunderstanding and Chris being forced to leave the class. Alternatively, he admitted to causing a disruption in class, writing in a report, exclamations you'd likely hear from a black person in church, which prompted his dismissal from the classroom. This ejection further increased his hate for men and gay men in general, and further convinced him of launching a pursuit to find true love. In order to meet whom he called a boyfriend-free girl, he launched his love quest. However, finding that one special person in his life wasn't going to... ...to be easy. Christian didn't feel like he had the confidence to approach women on his own volition due to the infinitely high boyfriend factor. This term refers to the very high probability that any girl to whom he spoke already had a boyfriend, making it close to impossible to find his coveted boyfriend-free girl. By extension, every man who already had a girlfriend was thought of by Chris with seething loathing. With the infinitely high boyfriend factor, I'm not fond of about 99.9999999996% of the total male population, with a margin of error of the four billionth of a percent for about 100 men, of whom are okay acquaintances. Those doofs get all the luck, having a sweetheart to care for and to be cared from, getting all the hugs, kisses and e emotional support and the security of a solid future without loneliness and with love and children and besides that my autism is not much help on the programming of my mind sigh oh my life to combat his reluctance to approach prospective females he devised a way in which women would approach him instead the attraction sign christian created what he called an attraction sign which was much like a personals ad but in public. 21 and single white male, shy, smart, young at heart, computer skilled, humorous, a great thinker and go-getter, natural salesperson, enjoys good parts of life, diplomatic, friendly, loves his family, peaceful, very creative, he's lonely, seeking a cute 18 to 21 single female companion. 18 to 21 years of age, does not already have a boyfriend. Single, average to slender weight, body type. White, lives in Charlottesville or Rutgersville area. Does not smoke or drink alcohol. Happy, positive personality. Average high income, drives a vehicle. If any men read this huge sign, mind your own business. And to all men with girlfriends, except marrieds and blacks, go jump off a cliff. Have a nice day. He would hang the sign up at the PVCC lobby and would stand or sit beside it in the hopes of attracting potential mates. Based on the attraction sign and later comments, it is clear that instead of finding the love of his life, his quest for a sweetheart 
was more of a quest to lose his virginity and to find a woman to mother him and financially support him. Just a couple of months into his love quest, Christian was met with an obstacle. Mary Lee Walsh, the Dean of Student Affairs, tore down his attraction sign and allegedly even tore it up in front of him. According to Chris, she yelled at him in a violent manner and said that his way of doing things would not get him a girlfriend. It is likely that Walsh may have, in fact, taken down his sign and told him that it was inappropriate, as his methods were akin to soliciting sex on campus. In any case, he was deeply disheartened by this event. It literally shattered my heart to almost nothing and murdered my soul. In response to this attack, Christian made another sign, which was quickly removed in a similar fashion. This was to be the beginning of Christian's make-believe conflict with Mary Lee Walsh that will haunt him for most of his adult life. As an act of catharsis, Christian wrote a poem called Saddest Heart in the World, in which he refers to Walsh in the most unkind of light. Lonesome and sad, lonesome and sad, the mastermind is very bad. In efforts of getting a boyfriend-free gal, that female dog took my only idea for a fall. Heartbroken, sad and very lonely, I may never remove my virginity. On April 10th, Chris wrote a short story called Sonichu and Rosechu, the genesis of the love hogs. It establishes the origins of Sonichu and Rosechu and also incorporates elements from the Sonic the Hedgehog lore such as the Chaos Emeralds. In addition, the story features a lovely Pokemon trainer. Her name was Kel, short for Kelly. He published it on a Sonichu site. In June, Christian found work as a salesperson for Cutco, a cutlery retailer. It is unknown whether he actually managed to sell any knives. Later testimonies prove that he was still in possession of unpurchased stock, holding onto some items more than a decade after he was employed. His tenure ended in August, when his boss left the Charlottesville area. In August, the newly formed band, Christian and the Hedgehog Boys, released their debut album. The band, which was led by Christian, and also featured Sonic, Sonichu, Shadow the Hedgehog, and Black Sonichu, in fact only existed in Christian's head. The album entirely consisted of Christian singing melody-free vocals with original lyrics over existing songs being played in the background. His songs covered a range of topics, such as his search for love in So Need a Cute Girl, based on I Want It That Way by the Backstreet Boys. Tell me why I'm stuck as a virgin with rage. Autism in A-U-T-I-S-M, sung over the Backstreet Boys, Larger Than Life. And his Spanish skills in the Ricky Martin adaptation, La Cocina and La Casa de Casanova. Later that year, Chris wrote another poem, Sonichu's Ode to Rosechu, an attempt at depicting the romantic ties binding Sonichu and Rosechu. Oh Rosechu, you are as beautiful as a rose, though a zap bud is the flower that heals your woes. He once again reinstates his idealized views on relationships between men and women. If I evolve into your knight, I will protect you with my lance. Speed makes no difference, though you are slower than I. You dance in a field with such grace and style. Sigh. The poem closes with possibly the first utterance of a variant of Christian's commonly used term, sweetheart. Rosie, as often as birds tweet, will you be my lovely heart sweet? In October of 2003, Christian reunited with his childhood friend, Sarah, for her birthday. For the special occasion, he made her a present, a hand-drawn comic book detailing the complete history of their life together, entitled, Chris plus Sarah's Life Shares. It is from this work of literature that the majority of their interactions with each other has come to be known, including Sarah's supposed childhood bullying, which then 21-year-old Chris completely neglects. Like most of his creative attempts, it is self-centered, bragging about his accomplishments concerning Sonichu. He also talks about her personal life, including her relationship with her boyfriend. As of some time before July 2000, Sarah has been living with her boyfriend, Wes Isley, a magician who does parties. He closes the book with hope for the future. 
A special note from Christian to Sarah. I hope that we can hang together sometime. But for now and forever, we will always be good friends. To return the sentiment, Sarah decided to spend Christmas with the Chandlers, which delighted Chris. Nintendo. On November 22nd, 2003, Christian filmed a documentary of his activities in the game Animal Crossing on the Nintendo GameCube, which he then sent to Nintendo for consideration. Chris narrates this hour-long tour of two of his self-made towns, Quickville and Quick City. Since the documentary features a video game player narrating his activities while playing a game, this possibly makes Chris the first ever Let's Player in the modern understanding of the word. Hello, Nintendo! Welcome to my Animal Crossing for Nintendo GameCube. I am your host. My name is Christian Weston Chandler. I live in Rutgersville, Virginia. And I is 21 years old. And I play because I'm young at heart. So anyway, we're going to take a tour of my city. Like everything he produces, it includes Sonichu. So anyway, stepping out is my character, Sonichu. He's wearing a clothes with a character on it. Like I said, you might remember his face. And there's his actual face. If you remember the rest of his body, you see the whole picture. Chris performs a spontaneous rendition of Yellow is a Mellow Color off the Sonic and the Hedgehog Boys album. Yellow is a mellow color. Yes, it is. It's a mellow color. Sonic shoes after lightning. And mellow color. Yeah. He also treats the audience with a performance of So Need a Cute Girl. Tell me why I'm stuck as a bird in mid-range. Tell me why I so need a... I'm stuck as a virgin with rage. Tell me why I still need a cute girl my age. Tell me why I ain't never wanna hear you say I have a boyfriend. And that was inspired by a real thing. He previews the in-game diary that he keeps. As for a monthly journal entry here in November. Yeah, I try to get a girlfriend because I don't have a girlfriend. But I have made up a poem. Let you guys read it. Alright. Scroll down a little bit as we go along. It's a very good poem because I am an artist as well as a poet. I make a rhyme every time. He proceeds to give a tour of his bedroom. This is my bedroom. It's a lot of fun, isn't it? Because I like to make things fun since you know I'm young at heart. As he unwittingly transfers his hoarding habits into a virtual environment, his bedroom in Animal Crossing closely replicates his real-life counterpart. Chris goes outside and comes across several characters who all seem to run back indoors at the very side of him. Around here, I want to show you my favorite character that I kind of got to know from the start. Oop, she just went in. There's Anna Cootie. She just went in. And there's Elmer. He just went in. He then travels to his house on Quickville Island to reveal that he mostly uses the property for extra storage. I use mine as storage for the uh, extra items I uh, don't have room for at home. Yeah, I got a bunch. He reasserts his brand loyalty for Nintendo and decries their competitors. Speaking of which, you should make this Sonic Heroes should be Nintendo GameCube exclusive because Xbox and PlayStation 2, my opinion is the same as yours, they both stink. Yeah, I do not even own them. I don't even want them. And that goes double for the PS1 as well. But if you want to know my game systems, I had my GameCube for about almost a year and a half now. Got it on May 31st, 2002. I got your SNES, Nintendo 64, NES. I got the Genesis 301 with the original Genesis, 32X, and Sega CD, as well as Sega Dreamcast, and the Sega Saturn. So I got mostly all of them. I've been a Sonic fan forever, and that's why I'm glad that Sonic came to uh, Nintendo. He mentions that he likes to keep his surroundings clean by picking weeds. Oh, we look at this. There's a weed. I pick weeds. Keeps my town clean as well as uh, Quixie. He also likes to keep active. Another weed. Why you know about that? I usually like to run. It keeps, it keeps me going faster. He introduces the viewers to his character, Crystal. Anyway, uh... This is Crystal. She's wearing the uh, rose chew look. There's a zap button on the door. I got Sonic's rose chew mug right here. 
Near the end, Chris proclaims that he is high-functioning autistic. And uh, to answer the all-important question, what is the meaning of HFA with the two red eyes? I will tell you. Got that? That means high-functionally autism because that's why I am. I'm high-functionally autistic. I may have autism, but since I'm high-functional, I do all. I could do a lot of things. I mean, otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do this documentary I'm doing right now. But anyway, uh, for the, for the submission of Nintendo Power, this has been a documentary narrated by Christian Western Channel. Thank you very much, and I hope that you will consider this for a publication. Bye now. Christian started 2004 with a New Year's resolution to find a girlfriend. On January 3rd, he drew a Sonichu comic strip, which also featured Rose Chu and Black Sonichu. This was the first time he included his characters in an illustrated storytelling setting. On the 6th, he went to get an eye exam. The optometrist in question happened to be Dr. David Chandler. Chris's brother from Bob's first marriage, who informed him for the first time that he had an eight-year-old niece named Savannah. On January 18th, he wrote Hard Love Quest, a poem concerning his difficulties in finding a boyfriend-free girl. Without girlfriend love, he feels an older age, as he is still stuck as a virgin with rage. He searched low and high to the end. The only delay is the fear of being already beaten by a boyfriend. On January 1st, Christian wrote in his diary, It's the end of another month, and I still didn't have a girlfriend. Maybe my latest idea, the Sonichu's News Dash newsletter, will make the ladies take notice of me. The newsletter in question was an outlet for Christian's creative ideas concerning Sonichu and his poetry. Issue 1 featured a couple of skits starring Sonichu, the poem Saddest Heart in the World, and a personal ad for himself which was not unlike his attraction sign. Christian is a very shy and very thoughtful person and will only accept person-to-person -person encounters. When getting his attention, approach and say hi to him. Do not flirt from a distance. He will not be able to notice. To find Christian, he'll be wearing the Sonichu medallion. In addition to posting a digital copy onto his website, he distributed printed copies of the newsletter around PVCC campus as an alternative to his attraction sign. This must have caught the attention of Mary Lee Walsh, who issued a cease and desist order. In an email dated February 1st, Chris tried to settle out of court. Mary, I've slept on it, and I've realized that note hanging is not the way to get attention, and I don't really want to meet with either you nor Susan. No offense. I'll tell you what, let's forget the meeting, and if you will allow my newsletter to stay in distribution, I will do all of the following. I will never hang notes on the wall again. I'll consider stopping my silent treatment on Susan. I'll consider knocking you and Susan up my scale of respect, each by two points. Zero equals no respect. Ten equals respect. Walsh replied and insisted that they meet the following week. On February 9th, Christian recounted the events of that meeting. Mary Lee Walsh made it illegal to distribute the news dash. I am very angry at that XXXXX. In response, I plan to incite the masses and hope they demand the return of the news dash so my chances on getting a girlfriend can be restored. I have also declared war on them as well. It was allegedly during this meeting where he performed his curse yehameha attack which consisted of Chris mimicking the hand motion of an attack move from the anime series Dragon Ball Z and cursing people into experiencing bad luck. However, it is not certain whether he was inspired by the original occurrence of the Kamehameha or its parody featured in another anime, Excel Saga, to which Chris has definitely been exposed. In March, Chris claimed that the kerfuffle concerning Walsh got his parents upset too. That XXXXX Mary Lee Walsh got on my and my parents' nerves. All I'd been doing was trying to get a girlfriend. Is that too much to ask? I am very devastated due to my shattered heart that XXXXX caused unto me. My life sucks. Completely disregarding her demands, he published issue 3 of Sonichu's News Dash, with most of the content themes remaining unaltered. However, his requirements for a boyfriend-free girl were tweaked a little bit. 
he was now looking for 18 to 22 year olds, since he had just turned 22 himself. In May of 2004, Nintendo Power Magazine published an article highlighting Christian's Animal Crossing video, referring to Chris only as Sonichu. Simply amazing. There's no other way to describe what we've received from Sonichu of Quickville, a full video documentary that walks us through his daily life. His opulent manor contained every manner of furniture. Quickville's landscape was filled to the bursting point with all the animals who'd moved to his well-tended town. And Sonichu has customized everything about his town. Even many villagers have followed his bold trends, wearing the patterns he has created. This apparently got the attention of PVCC's newspaper, The Forum, which featured Christian and Sonichu in an exclusive report. PVCC student Christian Chandler has dedicated many hours to his pastime. He is the creator of Sonichu, the electric hedgehog Pokemon. Like Sonic, Sonichu can run at high speeds. During Super Sonic's battle against the perfect chaos monster, Sonic Adventure DX for GameCube, Super Sonic was spat out by the monster and collided with a bystander Pikachu. According to the story, the power from the Chaos Emeralds transformed Pikachu into Sonichu. Chandler and the world he created for Sonichu were featured in the May 2004 issue of Nintendo Power. The place is called Quick Prefix. The Quick Prefix are his initials, Christian Weston Chandler. Nintendo Power was apparently impressed with Chandler's work. During all this rigmarole, he continued to publish his news dash, but he updated his personal contact information to include a link to his Match.com profile, which he created to aid in his love quest. It was also around this time that he opened a MySpace account. I enjoy drawing, listening to music, playing video games, and TCG. I also like anime, Legos, and I love my parents. I also enjoy web design. He proceeds to list all the gaming consoles in his possession, finishing with the Pokemon catchphrase, Gotta catch them all. Interestingly, he listed his occupation as student slash cartoonist. He explores his most desperate desires in his blurb. I am a bit shy, but I would enjoy the company of a beautiful girl who likes some of the things I do. I also like to have fun when I can, and I don't really like to be alone. I graduated from high school on the honor roll, and I'm doing very well at PVCC. A lot of men make false promises to their girlfriends, but I am totally different. When it comes to what I can offer, I can seriously promise care, respect, empathy, and love. I think that most girls deserve the world, and I would do my best to give it to them. In May 2004, he attended the anime Mid-Atlantic Convention for the first time, where he met notable voice actress Monica Rial. She also sings opera very nicely, and she is a very nice, fun, and sweet person to hang around with. She sure made my day a sweet one. In Sonichu's News Dash, Issue 5, he introduces three new Sonichu characters. Christian Sonichu, based on himself, Wesley Sonichu, his quote-unquote rival, who is based on Sarah Hammer's boyfriend, Wes Isley, and Sarah Hammer Rose Chu, obviously named after Sarah herself. In June, to celebrate the 24-year wedding anniversary of his parents, Chris made them a present, a dramatic retelling of the family's life via Animal Crossing. Through this videographic endeavor, he delves deep into the family's history. Hi, Mom and Dad. How are you doing? This is my little present for y'all. A little... how y'all were and how you are now and so forth. So take a trip back in time with me, won't you? As we explore uh, how we could be work. As far as first we go back in time to the time of good old Robert Franklin Chandler Jr. He was a hit youngster back in his day. Let's take a look inside his chateau and uh, see what describes him as him. He collects records. And he's got lots of them, he's got so many shells. He might call a record case. Yeah. Chris reveals that Bob has Cherokee ancestry. He was born at Cherokee in uh, Texas. Actually, he's, he's like 116th Cherokee. But that's why we have this totem pole here. This Chinese lion here. That's, uh, he was, he's been to Korea. 
for uh, war in World War II, I believe it was. And he got conduct medal of honor. But that's what this is right here. He performs the same type of tour for Barbara. But that's that she went to school and she worked hard. And this uh, shirt here, that's her school colors, blue and white, because uh, back in high school, she was a cheerleader. Bum, bum, fish, boom, ba, yay, yay, la, la, la. Oh yeah, she likes the old stuff. Get old stuff as well, so she's got a little. Bit of it. So, no, we got kitchen, fridge, and uh, stove. Here's a little fan to keep cool with. Keep food in this little uh, pantry, and she keeps her uh, booze and mops in the old closet here. Although somebody brought the mop, somebody wanted to clean up. You put your garbage in the garbage can. And this is a sad part. And they get in some time, in some places now in uh, very few houses nowadays. But it's what happened in the uh, old days. The bathroom was in the same room as uh, the kitchen. But luckily, we always remember to wash our hands with soap and water. Yeah. Anyway, that's just in the days of old. Nowadays, she does have a private bathroom. Yeah. Chris explains how his parents first met. They met over at Maddie's pub, see. Yeah. Mom was just uh, sitting down with her friends. She was watching uh, Bobby uh, sing up here. And well, she li she really liked his uh, singing, so uh, she, as father put it, she went up to him and then uh, as he passed by, changed the, changed the thermo thermostat. Yeah. Anyway, she chased him down the hallway and cornered him. And then, uh, after that, they just talked. So they just uh, talked things out and they got to know each other. Not a common thing. Bob, do you take this woman to be your lovely wed wife, to love and hold and cherish and to honor? I do. And do you, Barbara, take this man to be your lawfully wed husband, to love and cherish and to honor forever? I do. I now pronounce you man and wife to my kiss the bride. Whoopee! After reenacting their wedding, Christian introduces himself into the picture. But anyway, when first comes love, then comes marriage, then they come along with their baby carriage, and that's where I came in. Born in February 1918 was me. He gives himself a tour of his own room. So anyway, this is my bedroom. And then returns to Bob's room. As a little retribution for uh, how things were, we're going to play a little number on the jukebox here. But since we don't have side-by-side -side on recording, we're play we're going to play uh, Sitting Under the Apple Tree. <laughs> He proceeds to let the 1942 song, Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree, play in full. And there you have a nice little blast of sound. And now for uh, my mom and dad's little something special for this uh, video. This is my way of saying happy anniversary to y'all. Coming up next. The video cuts to a drawing made with Mario Paint, which says, to mom and dad, happy anniversary. Thank you both for my birth. Love, Christian C. In July, Chris began going to the Charlottesville Fashion Square, attraction sign in hand, to seek out fellow mates. Evidently, his current practice did not yield promising results, as in a diary entry dated August 1st, he announced, well, it's another month, still no girlfriend. But I have a new idea that I am sure will reel in a girlfriend on a fateful red string. The idea concerning red string consisted of Christian tying a red string to a paper heart on which pick me up and bring me to my owner was written. The significance of using a red string was most likely a reference to its appearance in the anime Excel Saga and is a well-known symbol in many Asian cultures. Christian would throw the heart at prospective partners and hope that they would pick up the heart and follow the red string leading back to him. It cannot be determined how successful this strategy could have been, because just four days after he employed the red string of fate, a mall security guard, which Chris referred to as a jerk op, put an end to it. In August, Chris shifted focus away from Pokemon and centered his attention on Yu-Gi-Oh, a similarly themed card game. He began making his own custom cards 
and attended his first Yu-Gi-Oh tournament at the game place where he met Megan Trogu. Over the months of getting to know Megan, I grew fond of her. Although at that time, and up to now, she wasn't interested in a lovely relationship, I've bided to her wishes and requests. I am truly fond of her. Since he and Megan had Yu-Gi-Oh as a common interest, Christian only intensified his obsession with the game, creating more and more custom Yu-Gi-Oh cards with one depicting crystal, Christian's make-believe female twin. He also designed a girlfriend's gift card, on which the illustrated girlfriend looks suspiciously like the sister. On September 4th, Christian reflected on his love quest so far. While I was at the mall for the 8th week today, I realized something. Since I have been using a sign to state my being single and lonesome towards an 18 to 22 year old boyfriend free woman, I, in the event, was trying to sell myself like a new car. Two days later, Chris's love quest was interrupted by a jerk cop. I told that jerk cop off when I pulled some of my fun cards and told my lonesome virgin story, intimidated him, and shouted no into his face. In short, today was my independence day, but I am still alone. On September 11th, his search for love took a turn for the worst. I was not bothering anyone at the mall today while I was trying to sell myself. When I got arrested for trying, I fortunately did not go to jail, but I have been stripped of my right to go to the mall by myself. I would be required to bring my mom or dad with me. My independence and my soul were practically murdered. Chris's run of misfortune climaxed when only five days later, the school board of PVCC suspended him for one year. My dad is bloodthirsty for revenge as well. He's going to write to US President George W. Bush Jr. and Laura Bush to help me get allowed back to PVCC. We all curse to death upon that XXXXX Mary Lee Walsh. In conjunction with his suspension, he was required to take anger management classes, get a psychological evaluation, and receive social skills counseling. Ten days after the event, he lamented over his inability to go to PVCC or the mall, and confessed that he would be asking for a girlfriend this Christmas. Despite his bans from the college and the fashion square, he decided to continue with his search for a boyfriend and girl, but never went to the University of Virginia's campus to do so. However, this move wasn't for long, as Christian was allowed back to the fashion square in November. Regardless, he went back to UVA for a different kind of engagement, in the form of a mandatory psychiatric evaluation. There are more of such documented examinations in existence, but this is the only one so far which has been made public. Mr. Chandler says that since finishing high school and starting at PBCC in the year 2000, he has had an increasing interest in a female companion. His attempts at this ultimately led to his suspension from college. His attempts took the form of a sign, which he placed next to himself while sitting in the lobby at Piedmont. This sign was a list of qualifications that a potential girlfriend would have. He said that he has been very frustrated by his inability to find a girlfriend, and he suffers from no phobia. This refers to his frustration that females often tell him that they already have a boyfriend. While he does have physical attraction towards females, his primary frustration is with his lack of companionship. The report mentions his medical record and earlier evaluations. He has already undergone psychological evaluation by Robin Hobbs at the Center of Learning Potential. The recommendation concerning Mr. Chandler's emotional status is that he seek psychiatric and psychological treatment. The psychologist felt that counseling and medication would possibly address his obsessive thought pattern and assist him with social skills. She also recommended anger management training. The analysis also comments on Christian's appearance and demeanor in the session. The patient is a mildly overweight white male, wearing blue jeans and a shirt. He was also wearing a makeshift necklace that has a large plastic medallion in the shape of a Pokemon character's head. He also had a number of Shrinky Dink decorations attached to this necklace. He had a large backpack that he carried with him and had a notebook containing a large number of drawings. 
His speech was somewhat nasal, with frequent awkward laughing during his sentences. His speech was fluent. His responses were appropriate to the questions posed to him. Overall, the volume of his speech was slightly elevated, although his tone was generally pleasant and almost jovial. His thought processes were linear and logical. He was somewhat concrete, especially regarding social interactions. He seemed to have a good insight into his limitations. The attending physician offers up his final verdict. Folstein's score was 30 out of 30, with his sentence being, Uncle Spunky is a really funky monkey. Mr. Chandler is a 22-year-old man with a history of developmental delays and autism. Despite these limitations, he seems to have been quite successful in maximizing his academic abilities. He is left, however, with a severe degree of social awkwardness and seems to have good insight into this. He is left feeling somewhat frustrated as he has a strong desire for companionship, although his social limitations prevent him from being able to realize this in the way which he would like. The patient doesn't seem to pose a significant threat to himself or anyone else. After the evaluation, Chris carried on with life much like before, with neither him nor his parents making any significant effort to change his ways. But Christmas was soon approaching, and maybe Santa would bring him a girlfriend like he wished, who could right all his wrongs and change his life for the better. What made him this way? What is the attraction? What keeps us fascinated? This is the story of Chris Chen. My name is uh, Christian Chandler, age 22 at this time. I will be 23 on February 24th, 2005. <clears throat> anyway, for uh, over a year now, I've uh, been trying to attract an 18 to 22 year old boyfriend free girl, 18 to 21 before February 24th, 2004, which is this year. Anywho, been trying for over a year to attract a girl, boyfriend free girl, and I have failed. And you know, when you got when you have so much so many failures at this time, you can't help but feel sad, you know, and depressed. 
Yeah, here it is, about Christmas time. And that all I want for Christmas is a fourth and three girl. Chris prepares for Christmas 2004 by singing two of his songs for the camera. He performs So Need a Cute Girl. Tell me why. I so need a cute girl my age. Followed by All I Want for Christmas is a Pretty Girlfriend. All I want for Christmas is a girlfriend. Oh, she has to be 18 to 22. <sighs> well, at this time of year, all I can say right now is that I hope Santa will comply with my request and bring me a pretty girlfriend. And so, happy holidays from me, Christian Chandler. By the way, you can call me Chris in public. And thank you. Christian whipped his camera out for Christmas Day, too, and documented the state of the house at that time. Twas Christmas Day, and all through the house, the creatures that were stirring were my family and me and our two cats. And we wander upon our wondrous Christmas tree, with a star that was made so delicately. Delicately? The star on top of the tree is, in fact, Sonichu. Chris reveals that his dreams were dashed that day. And a Christmas present that was supposed to be for the girlfriend that Santa brought. But unfortunately, he didn't show. Chris introduces his audience to his parents. And now we wander in on my family. Say hello, Father. Uh, yeah. Making our Christmas movie. <laughs> well, I'm going to play on to VHS anyway. A smaller Christmas tree down here. Yeah. And our mother is asleep here in the dark area. Would you care to share a Merry Christmas with the world, Father? Oh, oh, oh. The tour puts a spotlight on the extent of the hoarding situation in the house, as Chris visibly has trouble navigating through the hoard. Can you say something to the entire world? Merry Christmas. Yep. After the tour, Chris documents the gift exchange revealing the interpersonal dynamics of the family. Okay, yeah, it's recording. So, here we are around the Christmas tree. We're gonna open presents. Right, right. Chris presents Bob with a card. Hi, baby. Are you supposed to read it? Yes, read it. Am I supposed to read it out loud? Yeah. Read to, read, to, read to Mom. I want to thank you all for your support and love throughout my fantastic uh, And if Santa doesn't bring me one. <laughs> like I ask him, then I'm going to need some support finding a fourth cent free. It'll come, Christian. Hope you all like my presents. Okay. Today I'm thinking of Christmas and remembering you all. Merry Christmas. Christian, yep. Christian gives Bob the option of receiving the puppet TV show Fraggle Rock on DVD or on VHS. After Christian discreetly implies that he wants to keep the DVD for himself, Bob caves in and chooses to take the VHS. Okay, you want the VHS. Remember the original white DVD? Oh. Yeah. It's like a rock, Father. That's what's on there. I see. Everything that's on the DVD is on that VHS. Uh, VHS works better than my system. Yeah. Chris presents Barbara with a Lego set. No boring stuff. He gives her a plush doll of the Japanese character Hamtaro. Look at you, Hamtaro. The family discussed the possibility of a surprise visit from Sarah. Oh, that's my present for Sarah. I guess, you know, she might come over. Well, she did last year, remember? Chris attempts at an embrace with his mother, but ends up hurting her instead. Here, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He does it again. Chris gives Bob another present. 
A snow globe with him in it. Snow globe with me in it. Merry Christmas, Robert. It's also got, it's also got sign shoe in it. Look. See? You know, one side sign shoe and the other. That's cool. I got it over at Walmart. It's a snow globe. How about that? Cool? Yeah. That's neat. Merry Christmas. Yep. Merry Christmas. Now we'll do the back downstairs with you. Happy New Year. Yeah. Happy New Year, huh? Not only cow. After the gift unwrapping, Christian went back to his room to record a video recapping the events. Well, now this ends our family Christmas of 2004. I think it's a nice gift, but it does not compare to having a boyfriend for a girl that I can make it to a girlfriend. <sighs> uh, but unfortunately, I was hoping for her to come, but she didn't. My, my uh, lifelong friend, Sarah Hammer. You know, she had not been paired up with that jerk, Wes Isley. I can have it, but seriously, though, I wish she was here so that I could talk to her and so she could help me in my quest to get a boyfriend free, 18, 22-year-old girl. 18, 23, as of February 24th, 2005. Well, anyway, uh, that pretty much uh, sums up my uh, Christmas.
season for this year, so, uh, as he's saying, showbiz. Goodbye, folks. As he entered 2005, Christian continued his tried-and-true tradition of pacing around the mall, hoping to attract a boyfriend-free girl. His activities quickly caught the eye of Anna McLaren, an employee of Pack and Son at Charlottesville Fashion Square, who described her encounter with him in a blog post titled, The Tale of the Crazy Pacer. There was a guy who paced in front of Abercrombie & Fitch. He'd come and do it for hours on end, just walking back and forth. He was an okay looking guy, not evil looking like creepy molester dude. So he would pace for his a lot of time, then leave. Sometimes as he paced, he would sing or shout. Nobody really could ever tell what he was saying. Oh yeah, and he always wore the same shirt. A nice little long sleeved red and blue number that had a gold crest on the left side and white collar and cuffs. Then, one day, he decided to start pacing on the pack sun side, so he started pacing in front of our store. We were doing floor set, and Lin Lin noticed that Crazy Pacer kept looking into pack sun as he paced, and this day, he was acting particularly crazy. He'd pace and pace, then stop and shout something at the wall, then keep pacing. And he also did some singing, even getting into the vibrato falsetto junks. It was hilarious. So anyways, someone, I can't remember who, suggested that the next time he looked in, we wave at him. So they waved, and Christian waved back. After some waving back and forth, Christian took the initiative and entered the store. He came right up to the counter that I was standing behind, and he looks right at me, all fidgety and twitchy, and he goes, You look to be about 19 years old, right? He then proceeded to introduce himself. My name is Christian, he said, but you can call me Chris. I'm Christian W. Chandler. Oh, I said. Hi, Chris. So, he continued, do angels have names? I found out later that he meant to say do angels like you have names. Poor guy was so nervous, he didn't get it right. Anna introduces herself, then Chris talks about eyes. My eyes are two different colors. One of them is green, and the other is blue. That's because I had pink eye a while back, and one of them stayed that way. What color are your eyes? I was pretty grossed out by the pink eye story, but I told him anyway. Sometimes blue, sometimes green, and usually gray. Oh, that's neat. It's funny how that happens, isn't it? Yeah, I said. He attempts to ask her out, but Anna declines. He eventually settles on the internet as a forum for future communication between them. Christian came back and handed me a card with a crudely drawn Sonic the Hedgehog and some other yellow Sonic looking creature on it, along with Christian's name, email address, and website. It was a homemade business card. That's my email address, and you can just email me sometime, okay? Okay, I said, not intending to email him at all. Little did either of them know, but this was the start of a friendship. But for the time being, Chris's contact with Anna was sparse. In February, Cartoon Network's Adult Swim Block held a contest which asked viewers to make their own commercial advertising the release of the cartoon series Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law, Volume 1 DVD set. Christian sent in his own unique take in which he mentions his ongoing feud with Mary Lee Walsh. Hello! I hired Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law, to help me, Christian Weston Chandler, in my case against Mary Lee Walsh, who years ago shared my heart. And he has won the games for me and knew he have won for me. I hope you remember to do this DVD box set, which comes out April 12, 2005. He finishes with a brief promotion of his custom cards depicting himself and Sonichu. This is a Christian Chandler Sonichu production. Regrettably, the winning entry did not feature Chris. In response, he vented his frustration at losing on the Adult Swim message board. My entry was very dramatic and a lot better than that piece of poo or any of the others that made the top five as well. I'm very upset about that. My quick Harvey Bird demand spot was the best, and I feel sorry for you, Adult Swim, for not noticing that. You all should take another good look at it and seriously reconsider. In March, 
Christian published Sonichu, Issue Zero, his first full-length comic. The issue is further divided into episodes, much like a television show, with a different story in each one. Episode 1 begins in an open field five miles from the city of Station Square, in which a wild Pikachu observes fighting in the distance between Supersonic and the perfect Chaos Monster. Pikachu gets caught in the scuffle and collides with Sonic, the impact releasing a rainbow which lands on a girl Raichu 15 miles away, who then transforms into a hedgehog-like creature and calls herself Rose Chu. Meanwhile, the Pikachu somehow inherited Supersonic's powers and changed form and joins Sonic in the battle, defeating the perfect Chaos Monster. He christens himself Sonichu. Christian himself interjects here and there. He draws himself having one blue and one green eye, as he had told Anna. His eyes are in fact different colors, but the difference is nowhere near as profound as in his illustrations. He then proceeds to introduce Quickville and reveals that he is also the mayor of said town. He then goes on to introduce all the main characters of the story, including Mary Lee Walsh. He saves himself for last, and devotes a full page to talk about Christian Weston Chandler. The next episode concerns Sonichu and Rose Chu meeting and quickly falling in love, sharing a kiss underneath a spray of fireworks. In episode 3, Sonichu confesses that he has a dislike for pickles, as does Christian in real life. This is followed by the introduction of the evil foe, Natesirk, whose name is simply Christian, backwards. After the battle is won, Mayor Chandler drives off in his car, carrying the Virginia vanity plate, Sonichu, identical to the one on his real life car. It should be noted that Sonichu refers to Chris as his father, even though his creation has nothing to do with Christian. The comic ends with a sub-episode starring Chris in a story based on his run-in with the mall police. However, in this version, he clutches his medallion, says Electric Hedgehog Power, and transforms into Chris Chan Sonichu, who largely looks like a blue-colored Sonichu, making him look like the original Sonic the Hedgehog. Meanwhile, the Jerkop equips metal armor. Needless to say, Chris defeats him by cursing him into experiencing horrendous bad luck by using his Curse Ye Hameha attack. Towards the end of March, Hannah, who worked at Starbucks in the Fashion Square, approached Christian during his new daily pacing and asked him out on a date. After she left, I became very excited and oh my god all over. After calling mom and eating me nuggets, I lifted the chair with such cheer and grace and spun around with it like a dancer. Then I put it back where it was. I felt that my love quest had finally come to an end. And I so elated that my shattered heart had a full, fast recovery. I went to Starbucks, and we talked about basic things. I showed her my Stonichu scrapbook. She was very impressed. I gave her my email and both my phone numbers on a Stonichu site card, and she gave me her email address. I was very attentive as I took notes about her and maintained eye contact. As I left her, I gave her a double take flirt. That was the rise, now here comes the fall. As I was sitting at my spot, thinking about future steps for later dates, Anna and Dana told me that when to talk to Hannah, she told them that she was setting me up in a prank. I could not believe it, so I found and asked Hannah. Sadly, it was true. Then in major shock, my heart shattered again by 85% and I let out a big no. His outburst of negation resulted in Chris getting banned from the mall again. He devoted the second sub-episode to this misadventure. Not long after, he completed his second Sonichu comic, Sonichu Issue 1. Pokemon's Giovanni teams up with Sonic villain Dr. Robotnik to create their own Sonichu in order to defeat the real thing. Unfortunately, a blunder causes Sonichu's DNA sample to get corrupted with Cherry Cola, producing an imperfect replica of our hero, called Black Sonichu, also known as Blachu. Blachu captures Rosechu, so Sonichu and Sonic team up to rescue her. After combating Blachu and the new Metal Sonichu, they eventually save Rosechu. The style of the comic became more tech- heavy, with some conversation so convoluted that Chris numbered the lines in the order that they should be read. The following month, 
Chris's review for Sprung, a dating simulation game for Nintendo DS, was published in Nintendo Power. I originally bought the game because I needed some lessons on what to say to, or do for, a girl. To make a long story short, I developed a fear that all the pretty girls are already paired up with a boyfriend. I've dubbed this social phobia, noiophobia, after the Spanish word for boyfriend. Anyway, before Sprung, I was afraid to approach most women. FYI, I am 22 years old. I tried to silently attract a boyfriend-free girl, mostly with signs, for over one year and four months. Then Sprung provided me with general things to say and do, so I felt more confident. When I tried my newfound expressions from the dating simulator, I forgot my fear of the infinitely high boyfriend factor, and I met a couple of lady friends with whom I feel more comfortable. So thank you Nintendo and Ubisoft for the dating advice that this frustrated virgin needs. Christian C. On April 13th, a University of Virginia student wrote a blog post that included her observations of Christian, whom she renamed Sonichu, hanging around the Alderman Library. So Sonichu returned to Alderman today. I'm not sure what to make of him. He sits in his chair and draws his Sonichu comics. Harmless, I ask me. Yet I feel like he knows he's different. He knows that the world rushing in front of him is not his own, surrounded by the brightest students in America, whatever that means. He sits in his chair and draws. 23 years old. I'm not sure he graduated high school. In front of him, text of Plato, Faulkner, God, and Kleist's swirl. Does he have the capacity to understand these works? Whether he can or not, I'm not sure. But there is something in his eyes that realizes that there is a level of understanding and thought that he is unable to partake in. As he slumps lower and lower in his chair, with each student he eyes reading or holding a book, he falls into himself, into the markers and colors on the page in front of him. He seems intelligent enough to understand that he does not understand. And that is the hardest part of all. In early May, Chris released Sonichu issue 2. This marks a turning point in the comic as the story begins to focus on Christian rather than Sonichu. Chris presents Barbara with a Lego set. No boring. He gives her a plush doll of the Japanese character. Only thing I can't agree with you. Doctor Hamtaro. Hamtaro. Discuss the possibility of a surprise visit from Sarah. Oh, that's my present for Sarah. No, she's not small, bro. Mm. Chris attempts at an embrace with his mother, but ends up hurting her instead. Mm. My microphone not been on. Mm. Holy shit.
It's so frustrating. I thought I'd been talking this entire time, man. Episode 7 concerns the Andrian Prophecy. When Sonic explains the mysterious prophecy to Christian, Chris reaffirms that he is the creator and father of Sonichu. They enter the Destiny Cave and unknowingly release an ancient evil power. Chris also meets an ancient leader of the Cherokee clan who reveals that Chris is his reincarnation. He is told that he has to unleash ancient powers to defeat the evil by using his Sonichu medallion to transform into Chris Chan's Sonichu. The story ends in a cliffhanger, with Sarah Hammer and Wes Eisley getting possessed by mysterious forces. Between episode 7 and 8, Chris inserts an advertisement for Axe Body Spray, in which, ignorant of the societal norms of hygiene, unknowingly confesses that he believes that bathing makes people smell exceptionally nice, to the point that people will compliment you, and that using Axe Body Spray is just as effective as bathing. Episode 8 continues with Wes meeting his past self, who is a member of the Wasabi clan, and turns into Wesley Sonichu and vows to kill Chris. Sarah also sees a vision and meets the queen of the Cherokee clan and transforms into Sarah Mon Rosechu. Meanwhile, Chris Chan Sonichu accidentally transforms back into his human self, leaving him vulnerable to attack from Wesley Sonichu, who turns himself into a ball and goes for a flying attack, prompting this exchange from the protagonists. What the? Sonichu, run! You don't have to tell me twice, but during the Stone Age. Chris figures out that his attacker is Wes Eisley and confesses how jealous he is of him for being with Sarah, who is eavesdropping nearby. Wesley reveals that he only wants to steal the Cherokee crown. Chris changes into Chris Chan and fights Wesley Sonichu, who eventually knocks Chris out and steals the crown, which inexplicably just came into being. Before Wesley can finish him off, Sarama intervenes and fires a lightning bolt arrow at Wesley, pinning him to an unsacred tree. In the final episode, Sarah breaks up with Wes, who cries out no while shrugging. They learn that Quickville, which is a vibrant community with happy people, cool chicks, business, and a frustrated male, is under attack from a giant stone golem, which is under the control of Mary Lee Walsh and a mysterious talking orb. So Chris Chan, Sarama, and Wesley fly over there to fight them. The orb reveals itself as the ancient evil and announces that he is Count Graduan, who is a personification symbolizing the pain and sadness of Christian graduating from high school. The three heroes beat them off for a little while, but Walsh and Graduan escape, Graduan. bound to fight another day. In the epilogue, Christian and Sarah chat on the couch, and unfortunately for Chris, she reveals that she has found herself another boyfriend named William, and thanks Chris for being a great friend. Christian dedicates an entire page to Sarah Hammer, what his lifelong friend, and offers some highlights of their time together. Currently, I don't get to see he as much as I did, because she found herself a boyfriend while I was in Richmond. But I often wonder how she is, and if she is happy with him. I share my troubles with her in my illustrations, letters, and over the phone. I always appreciate the little moments I have with her. The final page is a call to action for all Sonichu fans, in which Chris expresses his wish to have Sonichu produced into a bona fide franchise by Nintendo America. The comic concludes with Sub Episode 3, which is a dramatic reimagining of Chris's conflict with Mary Lee Walsh, who is the head of the private villa of Corrupted Citizens, the base of operations for the villains in the Sonichu universe, the name of which is derived from the acronym of Piedmont Virginia Community College. With Sonichu issue 2, Christian comes closer to blurring the line between real life and his comic book world, creating his own reality. In Sonichu's News Dash issue 9, Chris announced that he will attend the Anime Mid-Atlantic Convention in Richmond, Virginia on all three days. Since he has put himself into Sonichu's world, he will cosplay as himself. Talk about self-respect, huh? Also, he will be watching some of the good anime, getting some souvenirs, participating in some of the events, and just having a good time. Also, he will have some printed copies of Sonichu Premiere Issue Zero on hand. 
but if you want a collectible copy, you will have to find him and ask for one. He stayed two nights alone in a hotel room, and during the convention, he handed out copies of Sonic 2 Issue 0 to unsuspecting attendees. On June 22nd, Christian recounted the events of the past two days. I had my setup at the McDonald's at Walmart, and apparently complaints were made. The two mana jerks, or manager jerks, a Saiyanor comic, and a black fat jerk. He looked a lot like the leader of the jerk cops at the mall, whom I refer to now as the jerk key, approached me and took me for a fall with my trying to find a boyfriend free girl, like I had been doing for the past over one year and 10 months. We argued and disputed until the two of them left to call the police. While they were gone, I had taken up the sign from my Nintendo DS and hidden it on the back cover of my diary. When the jerk cops came, they were all like, what seems to be the problem? And the married Sanor comic was like, where's the sign? And I was, what sign? And another argument was had between the four of us in which I never gave any of those jerks eye contact because none of them deserved it. So I got kicked out from the McDonald's, not the Walmart for the rest of the day. Now for what happened today, I was starting to set up my things and the B mana jerk was getting in my face. I feel that he really hates me. And he was like, don't set up your stuff. Don't push me. I was not going to use the Nintendo DS sign today anyway, but he did not want my pixel block sculptures at all. I stood up against that mana jerk. I continued to build and I dictated my situation into his face with a song and dance. He went up to the Walmart mana jerk and he was like, hey, let's talk. But I sat silent for a minute. Then I said to him, I do not speak to any man other than myself because they all have taken all the pretty girls, leaving me with none. Verbal combat had started, and during the fight, I ran off, still giving verbal punishment, as well as the finger, and many cursier hamehas. I nearly backed up onto him with my car, and I gave him another finger. Then I dashed off. Now, I feel sad, because I have nowhere else to go to attract a boyfriend free girl, and I feel very furious with those mana jerks and all men other than myself and my father. Chris began believing that there was a conspiracy involving all the men in his town. They all are against me in finding a girlfriend of my own, but I will not give up on my long and Tado's love quest. I'll find a new attraction spot, somewhere in Charlottesville, Virginia. There has to be at least one 18 to 23 year old boyfriend free, caring, smoke free, non-alcoholic, white girl out there somewhere. Chris dramatized this entire ordeal in sub-episodes 4 and 5 but his adaptation also featured the manifestation of his dream sibling, Crystal, his twin sister. A mere month later, he caused more trouble, but this time at Target, where he sat waiting to encounter a boyfriend-free girl for hours, taking gross advantage of the free refills at his disposal. I was at the new Target store, just hanging around, not bothering anyone. And, from out of the blue, these two managers asked me to leave because they said I was loitering. I was not. I was there hoping to find an 18 to 23 year old boyfriend free girl like I usually do. Then, from out of the blue, after I told them off, they came back with two jerk cops. I was slightly intimidated, but mostly annoyed and ready to strike back on them. They asked me to leave and never return. I did not want to leave. I would have left peacefully. In fact, I was ready to go. But I had a prepared speech to say to them stupid jerk cops. And during the middle of my speech, they chased me, pulled my pants, and pinned me to the floor. Five jerk cops dogpiled on me as I struggled to get free. A thousand pounds of sausages on my 180 pound body was seriously a cutoff for my breathing flow. They handcuffed my wrists and legs, and they hogtied me. Not only did I feel humiliated from being the victim, but I was angry at them, not only for handcuffing me, but once again thwarting my efforts in trying to find a boyfriend free girl. They drove me to the county jail, but fortunately they did not keep me there. I was released to my family. Chris was charged with trespassing and disorderly conduct. It was terrible, but my mother and I are going to get back at them in court. In fact, I learned that the jerk cop who arrested me was called Baggett. That was the only thing about the situation that was hilarious. Replace the B with an F and you can see how funny it was. However, after attending two court hearings, the charges were dropped. 
This event was recreated in Sonic 2 sub episodes 7 and 8. But in Chris's reality, he endured much greater torment and came out victorious in the end. Less than a week later, Chris had another run in with the law. This time, a minor fender bender when he rear ended the car in front of him. He was fined $30 and also paid $56 in court costs. In August, Christian returned to PBCC after the end of his one year suspension. It was around this time that Anna announced that she was moving to Utah. Her announcement also somewhat coincided with her 20th birthday, so Christian and her friends organized a birthday slash farewell party for her, with Chris claiming that he picked out and bought the cake himself. Throughout August and September, Chris engaged in back and forth conversations via MySpace with two female students, Jelena and Lindsay, but despite all his efforts to meet with them, it ultimately came to nothing. In September, Chris finished Sonichu Issue 4, which was merely a compilation of sub-episodes 1 through 8. He claimed that his mother didn't want him making any more stories concerning his own life, so he obeyed and stopped making sub-episodes. In October, a user on a Sega forum began a discussion thread about Sonichu, in which members discussed the comic and Christian's personal antics. This was the earliest documented online discussion concerning Christian, but the original Sega forum hosting site has since been shut down and there is no known archive of the discussion chain. In November, Shoujo Beat, a manga anthology magazine, published Chris's letter which vaguely concerned the manga Absolute Boyfriend. Riko Izawa in Absolute Boyfriend sort of has the same problem I do. She can't get a guy and I can't get a girl. Here's my sitch. All the pretty girls are already paired up with some jerk, leaving me with none to choose from. Also, nobody can tell, off the bat, a paired up from a boyfriend-free girl. At first, it's equally hard for Rico to find a girlfriend-free boy, but then she is granted this wish where she gets a girlfriend-free boy, although he is a robot, delivered to her doorstep. Lucky girl, I'm 23 years old. One would think I'd have gotten a girlfriend by now, but no, I haven't. I'm stuck in this situation where if my parents should pass away, I will be a very lonely virgin. Some months later, a fellow reader sent in a reply to Chris. Why is he only looking for pretty girls? There are plenty of girls who are not supermodel gorgeous whom he could date. It's not the outside of the package that counts, but the inside. A girl can be pretty on the outside, but might be mean or self-centered or have other problems. Whereas another girl could be plain or even ugly on the outside but quite a beautiful, kind, intelligent person on the inside. If more guys would think about what qualities they look for in a girl and make sure those qualities don't just focus on her outer appearance, they might just find a girl to go out with. Otherwise, many girls will think, why bother, he'll just leave me for the next pretty girl he sees. Megan agreed with her sentiment. Chris's advances towards Megan intensified, as is documented in their emails. She declined giving out her phone number, and later in the same email, also declined his invitation to go out to a restaurant. In an email from December, she stated that she did not appreciate Christian trying to kiss her, and admitted that she is not interested in a relationship, but insisted they can remain as friends. She also confessed to accidentally discovering that he bought Megan a Nintendo DS, even though she had recently just gotten one herself. Through Megan, Chris was introduced to My Little Pony and Sailor Moon, with Megan providing him with some of her own family. He also began making his own custom My Little Pony figures, including one that he made using his own hair. As an adult male fanatic of My Little Pony, he preceded the so-called brony culture, which would only begin to blossom around five years later. Megan also requested him to bid on a collection of World War II photos on eBay, of which Chris was the winning bidder. In 2006, Christian's online spending habits intensified, with Chris purchasing My Little Pony and Sailor Moon figures, pornography, and sex toys, among other things. In February of 2006, Christian finished drawing Sonichu Issue 3, which took seven months to complete. The comic begins with the origin stories of each member of the chaotic combo, whose eggs were created in and ejected from the rainbow as seen in episode 1. The green egg lands in the jungle. The electric hedgehog Pokemon that came out of it grows up to become Wild Sonichu. The blue egg lands in the ocean and is rescued by the Pokemon Swampert, which takes it to the beach just in time for it to hatch and become 
bubbles rose chew. The white egg lands in front of her church, and out of it hatches Angelica Rose Chew, who is raised by nuns. Mystifyingly, after she evolves into her final form overnight, Christian is outside her window, bringing her a scrunchie and a pair of shoes as a gift. The red egg crashes into Nabe's dojo shin and hatches. For some reason, Nabe is compelled to rip off the Sonny's tail, causing him to instantly evolve into Punchy Sonichu. The purple egg hatches in a cave, and the purple Sonny starts to telepathically communicate with the Pokemon Mewtwo, who decides to mentor it. For months, this mysterious mentor taught this Sonny how to hone his pores, lift objects mentally and physically, and what the outside world was like. Until one day, during meditation, the Sonny suddenly evolves into Magichan Sonichu. He then farts. The episode ends with a final bulletin which would have been more suitable for a televisual feast rather than a comic book. Stay tuned for when these hedgehogs meet. In the next episode, Blachu steals a Master Sunstone and through a comedy of errors, has met with four of the chaotic combo. Eventually, the five-member troop teams up with Sonichu and they take down Blachu, leaving him in a bloody mess, accompanied by a tweet-tweet sound effect, commonplace in cartoons. The comic closes with a fake ad for a call service that would send one of the two single men in the world a beautiful girlfriend or a monkey. In May 2006, Christian attained a CAD degree after five years of study, even though it should have only taken two. For the graduation ceremony, he decided to wear the robe from his high school graduation instead. Now that Christian received this qualification, this made him more likely to get a job and advance his life towards building up a career, doing what he loved, and possibly even realizing his wish for the Sonichu franchise to become a dignified reality, making his dream come true. Please do not hate. Hate is not so good. Bum, bum, bum.
Move. Never watched the entire thing. Never did. So. Bum. Hey everybody, so something I've been thinking about a bit lately is the conflation we make in Discord around the era between getting something and enjoying that thing. So recently I made a video talking about how I find the scene in Oppenheimer where he, in the middle of sex, quotes the I am death destroyers of world section of the Bhagavad Gita to a woman who prompted him to quote this for no apparent reason. And one thing I saw a few people say was, you just don't get the meaning of this scene. And I'll just paint you a picture of that argument, one that isn't quoting any given comment. This scene is interesting for a few reasons. First, it draws a connection between small deaths and big deaths. The woman Oppenheimer is sleeping with here will go on to kill herself, die just as the victims of the atomic bomb died. So this scene not only foreshadows Oppenheimer's most famous quote in an interview after the bomb was dropped, but also foreshadows the ruinous destiny of the people in his personal life. Second, you can make an argument that it's thematically important. A central theme in Oppenheimer's story is a lack of clarity on his politics. Does he support the bomb or doesn't he? Is he a communist or isn't he? Likewise, Oppenheimer isn't able to commit to this woman to give her real love. And the result of both of these failures to commit are death and destruction. Third, you could say it's a moment meant to demonize Oppenheimer. He literally associates the bomb going off with his little orgasm moment, right? And fourth, and this is probably the most solid point, you could argue that this moment humanizes Oppenheimer. 
and here you can see a kind of meta point going on. We want to see Oppenheimer as this big important man, the man who said I am become death, destroyer of worlds, a mythological figure. But this scene conceptualizes it as smaller, more crude. His far-flung feelings about the atomic bomb later in the film are in fact much smaller than they seem. They come from this relationship he had years ago. And so, the film tells us, at the earliest possible moment, this is not the story of an icon, but of a man. Now, I like Oppenheimer. It's probably the second or third best film I've seen from Nolan, and I do enjoy these interpretations. But I feel there's always an assumption among media discourse people that if you don't like something, and if that thing has some depth to it, it must mean you didn't get it, that you didn't understand what was going on. But here's the thing, uh, that's not true. Sometimes you don't like a thing, you know, not because you can't access its inner depth, uh, but because that hidden depth doesn't make the scene good for you. So I guess I'll explain why I don't like it. If there's one problem I have with Oppenheimer, is that it sometimes feels too direct to me, too heavy-handed. At various points in the movie, it feels like Nolan was desperate to get characters to say interesting historical tidbits that don't feel at home or natural in the mouths of the characters. The most talked about example of this is of course where two guys mention JFK and it feels like they're winking to the audience. And this scene at the beginning is, I think, just the most egregious case. Oppenheimer presents itself as a movie that is deeply invested in Oppenheimer's subjectivity, the way he sees the world and the thoughts he has on it. This is so much the case that parts of the film meant to access this subjectivity are placed in color while the rest is in black and white. So much the case that the script was written in the first person. We are fucking hot, sweaty, a little brutal. Tatlock gives up, climbs off of me. Wait, wait. I catch my breath, watching her study my shelves. Unexpected. What? For a physicist, you've only got a shelf full of Freud? Actually, my background's more Jungian. <laughs> you know analysis? <laughs> so fucking hammy! And yet, oh. in this scene, one that takes place in the first act, we see something that feels so obviously directed uh. at the audience, that is only written that way because of our memory of Oppenheimer, his famous... Yeah, Oppenheimer one-liner. Seeing this woman during Oppenheimer one-liner. Get Oppenheimer to say this line feels so contrived that it genuinely feels like fan service to me. In my yeah. opinion, this choice is not justified through some analysis of how his relationship to this woman is like the bomb, how his sexuality plays into the movie's themes, how we should understand Robert as a person, not an icon. I think there were probably better, less groan-worthy ways of expressing each of these ideas. Ways that don't feel so kitsch, so out of place in the movie, so inappropriately fourth wall breaking. So, yeah, Oppenheimer is a good movie, one that does express these ideas, that plays with a kind of historical meta-commentary, and that explores the humanity of its main subject. And, somewhat ironically, I guess, my problem with this scene is not that it's too hard to understand thematically, it's that it's just way overplayed, way too on the nose. It's a moment that, for me, is crying out for even a hint of restraint. So here's the message I want to say. Interpretation is not a review. Finding depth in a movie is not the same as thinking it's a very good moment or that it's well crafted. Movies are more than the ideas they communicate, uh, and that's a good thing. That makes talking about liking movies fun. Thank you for your time. Hmm. Alright, I guess so then. Mr. Piccolo, wake up! You have to stop him! Don't worry, Gohan! Goku's never let us down! I'm sure he'll be here any second! This is food again, Princess Snake! Well, it's the least I can do for trying to eat you like that. But I thought there was Ooh, something else you had to do. Ooh, something about Saiyans and the Earth. 
crap, 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 crap. Aneurysm out of sheer stupidity. Wow! Didn't think you were that stupid, Vegeta. Ah! Nine minutes, eighteen seconds. Nine minutes, eighteen seconds. What's that, Vegeta? <laughs> Happiest moment of my life. Hey! Stop treating me like a joke, damn it! I've got a new technique! Which I probably could have used earlier and maybe saved all of our friends' lives. But that's beside the point! Get ready for my destructo disc! Wayne! Now, take this! Ooh, a frisbee, Vegeta! Oh, oh, no, a no, it's a trick! But Vegeta! Tricks are for kids! You know what, Nappa? On second thought, catch it. Catch it with your teeth! Yay! Like a dog! Ow! 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 Oh, God damn it! Fuck! Oh, no, my face! My precious modeling career! You know, I was trying to be a team player. Trying to be a nice guy. You killed half our friends! I said trying! Well, you're failing! Oh, God! And so are you! I'm back! Ah, I said what you did there. there. Now, it's you and me, big guy. And I'm gonna kick your ass. Ah. Oh. Take that, you insufferable f***ing uh. simpleton! Whoa, go, go on! What, what the hell? hell? Well, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Piccolo. Well, I didn't mean to snap like that. No, stay snapped! Stay snapped! Ah. God damn it. You are making me so mad! <laughs> Vegeta, look! I'm a fire in my body! <laughs> Alright, it's time to redeem myself through one final act of redemption. I'll save Gohan and. Wait a second. Why didn't I just grab him? I could probably still do that now, actually! Yeah, that's it. I'll grab him and throw him out of the way! Take anything you can dish out. Oh god, there go my audience. Mr. Piccolo! Go on. Go closer. Something I have to tell you. Is it that you always pictured me as a son? If you could never make your own, considering you lack the reproductive organs to produce your own legitimate offspring? What? Just shut up. Listen. What is it, Mr. Piccolo? Why didn't you? Well, Mr. Popo, it seems my time has come. But do my friend. I don't go nowhere. It'll be a long, large mission, but I'm sure you can. Bitch, I don't go nowhere. But Mr. Bobo, the fate of the entire universe. Checking order. But I. Bobo, goodbye, my friend. Bye. Oh. 
<laughs> Vegeta! You see me kill the green guy? Yes, that was a very good kick. Ah, oh, Vegeta, you weren't watching! Did you at least watch me kill the toddler? Ugh, fine. Uh. <laughs> Shinhan, Piccolo, Yamcha. Oh wow, especially Yamcha. Wait, where's Chelsea? Oh, oh no. he's here. Yeah. I'm there. there. I'm there. Drillin! What? Too, Too soon. soon. I'm sorry I'm late, you guys, but I brought some sensu beans for you. Woohoo! Thank you, Max Machina. Hey, which one of you did all this? That was me, totally calling it. I killed every single one of them. Except the Chaozu. He blew himself up. Vegeta, what the does does that does say about his power level? It's one thousand and six. Really? Uh, kick his ass, Nappa. <laughs> Right. Oh, no, it wait, does. Wait, Nappa! <laughs> what? I had the scouter upside down. It's over 9,000. Ah. Why do you sound so bored? Because it's still not a threat. But... To me. Besides, once we get the Dragon Balls, we'll just wish for immortality. Then no one will be able to stop us. Wait, what? But you killed Piccolo. And your point is? Well, if he's dead, the Dragon Balls don't work. What? What? Oh, and I totally killed that guy. Oh, well, at least we still had fun getting here, right, Vegeta? Vegeta? Remember the fucking planet? Remember the fucking planet? Vegeta? 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 And Vegeta, tricks are for kids. The following is a Pandas parody. Dragon Ball, 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 Dragon Gohan, Krillin, I'll handle Vegeta on my own. I need the both of you to get as far away as. Quit 
Krillin go? go. <laughs> Gohan, follow Krillin. Get home to your mother. Right, Daddy. Is there anything you want me to tell her? Yes, Gohan. Tell her... ...to put dinner on. Because I'm hungry. Are you ready for this? You bet I am. But first, why don't we take this battle somewhere else? What's wrong with here? I don't know. Something about it doesn't feel right. Well, it is a little corpsey. Meanwhile, on King Kai's planet. So, the fight is about to begin. The showdown between the Saiyan elite and the low class warrior trained by me. Taking all bets, guys! Taking all bets! <laughs> Yarr, I have as busy gold doubloons on the short run. Aw, uh, sir, is this really appropriate? If Goku loses, the entire Earth could be destroyed. You were saying? Now, ah, 1,000 semi on Goku. Hey, can I get in on this? Wait a second, don't you already know the outcome of the fight? Mm no. This is it. Ah, oh, yes. To mark your grave. Listen, we don't have to do this, you know. If you leave now and promise to never come back, I'll let you go. And we can stop this meaningless bloodshed. Such tripe! Where's your Saiyan pride, Kakarot? We are proud warriors, bred to fight and conquer. This planet has made you soft. Are you sure about this? Because even if you're a little sorry. No, I'm not sorry! Are you absolutely sure you- Yes! I am entirely sure! I'm going to obliterate you and the rest of this planet myself with my own two- I'll pass! Kyle, what? Okay, not bad. But still nothing compared to me. Now witness the power of a Saiyan Elite! Elite? What's that mean? It means I'm of the upper class, a finer breed, the highest grade of warrior! <sighs> okay, consider yourself beef jerky while I'm filet mignon. Ooh, I like both those things! I'm going to start feeding you now. I don't know when I'll stop. Hopefully before dinner, because I told Gohan to tell Chi Chi to- <laughs> What's wrong, Kakarot? Can't keep up! I told you, Kakarot, there's no way you can measure up to an elite like me! You're fighting a losing battle here! You might as well just surrender this pathetic planet now and- I can times three! Times one! <laughs> Come in too? I'm surrounded by idiots. I oh, thought you were surrounded, surrounded by gumdrops and ice cream. I will not stand for this! I will not be humiliated by a low class wretch! Oh, oh, sounds like somebody's, somebody's got an ice cream, cream headache. headache! That's it! Everyone dies! Well, that's not very nice. I of course not! I'm fucking evil! Garlic gun! Ooh, did he say garlic? Oh, oh my. my. Kakarot, you don't stand a chance! I put all my 
power into this attack! Now perish with the rest of your pathetic world! Kyle can no times. No, no. Oh. Back at the ranch. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Remember when we used to do stuff? You know, be out there with them and help? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And remember the Red Ribbon Army? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. And what about King Piccolo? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good times. Good times. Whatever happened to launch? Oh? Meanwhile, back at the plot. Son of a bitch! This can't be happening! I'm the prince! I'm supposed to be the best by default! I'll show that little bastard. I'll become the mighty Ozaru and crush him into the... Where's the moon? Where's the damn moon? I've taken you for a fool, but it seems you're far more cunning than you let on. But destroying the moon won't stop me. Mm. We've learned to create artificial moons that supply the necessary blood. Question! What? Are they not out of cheese? I'm going to enjoy this far more than I should. Ah! Now watch, Kakarot, as your life becomes inconsequential as I reveal my giant monkey! <laughs> Oh my. Oh my god, I thought he meant penis! He's getting huge! That means he'll only be stronger! That means he won't be as fat- Oh god, he's so fast! He's too powerful! I have to come up with a plan! Wait, I know! I just have to think like a monkey! Hmm... <laughs> hey, it's working! No, that dirt bubble! Get off my back, bubbles! <laughs> Goku, listen! The only way that you can beat him is if you use the spirit bomb! On it! And whatever you do, make sure you're very well hidden! It's going to take a lot of time to gather up all that energy! We're sorry, the number you are trying to reach has been disconnected. Please hang up and try again later. At the end of World War II, the various Axis powers were treated differently. Italy had switched sides, so they remained intact. Germany, along with Austria, was divided into four occupation zones between the British, French, Americans, and Soviets, with the capital cities of Berlin and Vienna also divided into four zones. Japan, meanwhile, had some land annexed by the Soviets and gave Taiwan back to China. But in its home islands, they simply had a single American occupation zone. Well, okay, on the surface that is mostly true, and usually we like to quickly move on to the more dramatic Cold War. But there is one aspect of the occupation of Japan that is almost always ignored. While yes, it is true the home islands of Japan were on paper a single occupation zone under American General MacArthur, it was technically designated as an allied occupied zone, not American occupied. General MacArthur just happened to be the supreme allied commander in the Pacific, so he was given the job. And as a result, American troops did most of the occupation. However, since it was an allied occupation zone and not exclusively an American occupation zone, there was also within it an unofficial British occupation zone, or more accurately, a Commonwealth zone. We're going to learn more about this unofficial Commonwealth occupation zone, but first, I'm going to talk about this video's sponsor, Ridge. 
I've been sponsored by Ridge many times, but this time you have a special opportunity to not only get a new Ridge wallet, but potentially a Hennessy Ford Bronco. On the Ridge website, you can enter in without spending a dollar for the chance to win a brand new upgraded Hennessy Ford Bronco. Or hey, maybe you're not into that sort of thing, so you could choose a cash prize of $75,000 instead. You get one bonus entry for every one dollar you spend on the site, up to a thousand entries when including custom Hennessy products, all with the same beloved features of being able to carry up to 12 cards in your cash as well as block RFID signals from digital pickpocketers. Use the link ridge.com slash emperor in the description below to get 10 <coughs> bonus entries into the sweepstakes and 10% off your purchase. Thanks again to Ridge for sponsoring this video. There has always been a debate on how much of Japan's surrender was based on the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki versus the rapid Soviet invasion of Manchuria, bringing the fear of a possible Soviet invasion of Japan. But this video isn't going to look at how and why Japan surrendered, but rather what the Allies had planned to surrender. While Japan was a member of the Axis powers, not every Allied power was at war with all of them. Some nations only went to war in Europe against Germany and Italy. A few, such as Chile, only went to war with Japan. The Soviet Union had stopped the Russian path in Japan, similar to Germany. And once Germany came to the USSR and they got near Moscow, the Soviets weren't going to focus on anything else. They even famously helped save Moscow from falling by providing extra reinforcements from the Soviet forces that were originally stationed along the border with Japanese Manchuria. But by the time Germany's defeat was close and inevitable, the other major allied powers had wanted to make sure everyone was willing to be at war with both Germany and Japan, and the Soviet Union was urged to forego their non-aggression pact and open up a new front with Japan. Throughout the war, the allied powers had multiple conferences with each other, and after Germany's surrender in May of 1945, they had one final wartime conference in July and August 1945 known as the Potsdam Conference. One of the results was the Potsdam Agreement on August 1st, which involved agreeing to the post-war occupation zones of Germany and how they planned to denazify the region. But another event was the similarly named but different Potsdam Declaration that occurred a few days prior on July 26th. In it, the British, Chinese, and Americans agreed that Japan must unconditionally surrender. The Soviets were not added to the agreement precisely because they were still not officially at war with Japan yet. The Soviets at the conference did, however, inform the Allies that they intended to go to war with Japan in August. I bring up these events because one of the terms of the Potsdam Declaration is the intention to have the right to set up points of occupation in Japanese territory to be determined later by the Allies. This means the possibility of a similar occupation partition like that of Germany could have theoretically happened. On the internet, I've seen this map floating around of the supposedly proposed Allied partition plan of Japan, in which zones were to be occupied by the Soviets, Americans, British, and Chinese, with Kyoto and Tokyo each also having occupation zones. However, trying to find the source of this map led me to only a random online article, which itself had no source for this claim. I personally have doubts this would have ever been agreed upon, as not only were the Soviets not a part of the Potsdam Declaration yet, meaning they wouldn't have been included in such early discussions yet, but also, there are several documents and messages from American authorities, such as President Harry S. Truman, that were absolutely dead set at not allowing the Soviets to occupy any territory on the home islands. If somehow the atomic bombs never happened and the Allies were forced to invade the home islands, the Soviets did have plans for a possible invasion of the northern island Hokkaido, so perhaps they could have forced their own occupation zone. But we'll never know. Regardless, this map, while an interesting hypothetical, is not something I could find substantial proof for for being a serious proposal. So for all we know, there was no official proposal for occupation zones of Japan. The proposal to have Japan's home islands under a single occupation zone under the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces General MacArthur was agreed upon by the United States by early August. And with Japan's surrender close by, the Soviets didn't object. Aside from being a little late to the party, there were two main reasons the Soviets did not participate in the Allied occupation of Japan. Firstly, they had managed to seize South Sakhalin and the Kuril Islands, and the Americans were willing to allow the Soviets to fully annex them. Secondly, Stalin did not like the idea of any Soviet troops being under the command of an American general like MacArthur. China, meanwhile, was content with merely being allowed to re-annex Taiwan, and was much more concerned with resuming their civil war with the communists. France had to...
recently liberated country back home and was in no position to impose anything over the peace in the Pacific regardless. This meant of the major allied powers, while the U.S. would conduct the front of the occupation, the British and other British Commonwealth countries were the other major participants of the Pacific Theater who could supply men for the occupation. The British set up a British Commonwealth occupation force, made up of a mix of soldiers and airmen from the United Kingdom, British India, Australia and New Zealand in early 1946, and on February 21st of that year, the first troops arrived in Japan. The BCOF was assigned an unofficial occupation zone consisting of the island of Shikoku and five prefectures on the western end of Honshu. Interestingly, their headquarters was at the port of Kure, less than 25 kilometers southeast of the recently new Hiroshima. There were approximately 40,000 troops involved in this occupation force, and at one point made up 25% of the total Allied occupation force in Japan altogether. While the U.S. did occupy the great majority of the country, areas occupied by the Commonwealth still had over 20 million people, so it was no small contribution. However, the British Empire was in a much more fragile situation after the war than the United States, meaning that this occupation force would quickly dwindle. The entire force was always under an Australian command,
Donald Trump found some votes in Georgia. They just weren't the ones he was looking for. You know, it's not every day that the former president of the United States gets charged with multiple felonies. Or no, I guess at this point it is. Uh, every day, it seems like. But a Georgia grand jury indicted former President Donald Trump, charging him with felony racketeering and several conspiracy charges as part of a sweeping investigation into his attempts to overturn the 2020 election. The 41 count indictment also names 18 additional defendants, including legal luminaries like Sidney Powell, Jenna Ellis, John Eastman, Kenneth Chibro, and Jeffrey Clark. Also among the indicted is Rudy Giuliani, who himself pioneered the use of RICO charges to go after Trump back in the This thing is incredibly ironic. Well, well, well. Now well, the turntables. So let's break down the Georgia indictment. And as a reminder, the indictment contains unproven allegations. Just because the grand jury voted to indict, all that means is that they believe that there was probable cause that a crime may have been committed. That's a far cry from the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt that the prosecutors will need to be to trial. But the Fulton County indictment echoes the DC indictment, right? starting with the press quote, Trump and the other defendants charged in this indictment refused to accept the Trump loss and knowingly and willfully joined a conspiracy to unlawfully change the outcome of the election in favor of Trump. Trump and oh 18 alleged conspirators have been accused of 41 different crimes. Now, not all of the co-defendants are accused of having committed the same crimes. Trump himself has been accused of 13 of the 41 counts. Count one is for violating the Georgia RICO statute. Basically, the way that this indictment is that the co-defendants Different general schemes and administration of is related to another crime. In this case, the big crime is racketeering in violation of George's RICO statute, and to violate RICO, a person must engage in a pattern of racketeering activity. Now, not every crime can be a predicate crime for Georgia RICO, and the law lists 43 specific crimes that can qualify under the law that can be used as a predicate act. But many potentially apply here. False statements and writings, impersonating a public officer, forgery, filing false documents, influencing witnesses, computer theft, computer trespass, uh, computer invasion of privacy, and conspiracy to defraud the state, and acts of theft and perjury. And in the indictment, prosecutors listed 161 acts that they say prove that a violation of the RICO Act occurred. Among the acts uh, include things like assessing motives and influencing witnesses. Not all the acts are crimes on their own. And the indictment cites several Trump tweets, for example. And when asked whether a tweet can be a crime, Willis said that the tweets are both alleged to be acts taken in furtherance of the conspiracy. Many occurred in Georgia, and some occurred in other jurisdictions, and are included because the grand jury believes they were part of the illegal effort to overturn the results of Georgia's 2020 presidential election. Normal garden variety conspiracies, which we covered in the context of the DC indictment. Crimes are often made up of smaller, non criminal acts. Buying a gun is legal. Buying a gun as part of a criminal conspiracy to rob a bank is illegal. Telling lies is legal. Telling a lie as part of a conspiracy to defraud someone is illegal. But that's how you get really dumb legal takes like this tweet things that are apparently illegal in America tweeting that you're watching TV, reserving rooms for meetings, asking someone for a phone number. Which is not only a dumb legal take, it was actually stolen from somebody else. Uh, but at least it gave rise to one of the greatest tweets from Internet Hippo. New right-wing thing is describing crimes as generically as possible to pretend like they're not crimes. If someone gets a of conspiracy and they start yelling, Wow, so it's illegal to make plans with friends now. But as both crimes on their own and as predicates for RICO, the indictment alleges several different schemes. Uh, there are some similarities with the various schemes with the DC indictment, but there are also differences. The first is the fake electors plot. The indictment alleges that co-defendant Mike Roman, who worked for the Trump 2020 campaign as director of election day operations, helped organize slates of phony Trump electors purporting to represent the election votes from battleground states including Georgia. On November 30th, 2020, Roman instructed an unindicted co-conspirator to, quote, coordinate with the individuals associated with the Trump campaign to contact state legislators in Georgia and elsewhere on behalf of Donald Trump and to encourage them to unlawfully appoint presidential electors from their respective states. This allegation shows that the effort to send false certificates to NARA and Congress was highly coordinated by people connected to Trump. On December 3rd, 2020, Giuliani, Ellis, Stallings, and Eastman met with members of the Georgia Senate uh, who were present at a Senate Judiciary Subcommittee meeting and solicited them to violate their oaths of office by unlawfully appointing presidential electors from Georgia. During the hearing, Giuliani made two false representations that at least 96,600 mail-in ballots
ballots were counted in the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in Georgia, despite there being no record of those ballots having been returned to a county election office, and that Dominion voting systems equipment used in the November 3rd, 2020 presidential election in Antrim County, Michigan, mistakenly recorded 6,000 votes for Joseph R. Biden when the votes were actually cast for Donald Trump. Trump. During the hearing, defendant Ray Smith, an Atlanta lawyer, made six misrepresentations about election fraud, such as claims that 66,248 underage people illegally registered to vote before their 17th birthday. But while Trump was tweeting, Ken Cheesebro was organizing the fake electors in battleground states. On or about the 11th day of December 2020, he sent an email with attached documents to Mike Roman. The documents were to be used by Trump presidential elector nominees in Georgia for the purpose of casting electoral votes for Trump, despite the fact that Trump lost Georgia. Defendant James Schaefer, who was then the chairman of the Georgia Republican Party, oversaw a December 2020 meeting at the state capital of 16 GOP electors who signed documents falsely claiming Trump won. Schaefer and several other defendants created a document entitled Certificate of the Votes of the 2020 Electors from Georgia with knowledge that said document contained the false statement, we the undersigned being the duly elected and qualified electors for president and vice president of the United States of America from the state of Georgia do hereby certify the following. Trump and his co-defendants included the fake certificate in a legal filing. And then there was the attempt to call a special legislative session. On December 5th, 2020, Trump called Governor Brian Kemp and allegedly solicited, requested, and importuned Kemp to call a special session of the Georgia General Assembly. Oh, so, like, we're not supposed to importune people anymore. I thought this was America! Huh? Isn't this America? I'm sorry, I thought this was America! But on December 6th, 2020, Trump tweeted, Gee, what a surprise to anyone informed the so-called says he has no power to do anything Governor Brian Kemp and his puppet Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan that they could easily solve this mess and win signature verification and call a special session so easy. On December 7th, Trump called Speaker of the Georgia House of Representatives, David Ralston, and asked him to convene a special session of the legislature for the purpose of lawfully appointing presidential electors in Georgia. Prosecutors alleged that Trump was trying to call Ralston Miller as a felon. Then there was the New Year's Eve lawsuit. Uh, Trump's campaign filed several lawsuits in Georgia seeking to throw up ballots or overturn the results. The indictment says that the New Year's Eve lawsuit, which was filed by John Eastman, included statements about mass fraud that Trump made were false. The statements included the suggestion that dead people, underage people, felons, unregistered voters, and people with P.O. boxes illegally cast votes. The lawsuit demanded that Kemp and Raffensperger decertify the election results, and Trump signed a document verifying the facts of the complaint were true to the best of his knowledge. Uh, then there was, of course, the perfect phone call. On January 2nd, 2021, uh, 44 days after Biden was declared the victor in Georgia, Trump called Brad Raffensperger and said, quote, I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have. We won the state. And flipping the state is a great testament to the country. I only need 11,000 votes. The indictment says that during the call, Trump made 13 false assertions about election fraud in Georgia. He told Raffensperger that, quote, The ballots are corrupt, and you're going to find that they are, which is totally illegal. It's, it's more illegal for you than it is for them, because you know what they did, and you're not reporting it. That's a, that, you know, that's a criminal Raffensperger's lawyer, Brian Germany, told Trump that Raffensperger didn't have legal authority to conduct another recount, but Trump applied pressure, quote, Brad, what are we going to do? Uh, we won the election, and it's not fair to take it away from us like this. And it's going to be very costly in many ways. Trump followed up his call by threatening Raffensperger on social media. According to the indictment, Trump's scheme to overturn the election continued at least until September 7th. 2021, when he sent Raffensperger a letter. Trump told Raffensperger that DeKalb County had violated the proper chain of custody procedures for 43,000 ballots. Quote, I would respectfully request that your department check this and if true, along with many other claims of voter fraud and voter irregularities, start the process of decertifying the election or whatever the correct legal remedy is and announce the true winner. As stated to you previously, the number of false and wow. irregular votes is far greater than needed to change the Georgia election result. Now, as you can probably already tell, Trump and his co defendants are going to need a lawyer. If you need a great lawyer, my firm, the Eagle Team, can help. If you or a loved one has suffered from cancer, oh suffered an injury or death in the family, or were involved in a car crash, we can represent you or help find you the right attorney. You click on the link in the description for a free consultation with my team. Because you don't just need a legal team, you need the Eagle Team. The link is down below. Right back to Trump. And then there were the computer hackers in Coffee County. One of the more bizarre sagas laid out in this indictment is the story of how Sidney Powell coordinated agents in Coffee County, Georgia, to hack into the At the behest of Powell, Kathleen Latham, chairwoman of the Coffee County and Scott Hall, an Atlanta bail bondsman, met
met with computer forensics experts from Atlanta firm Sullivan Stretcher at the Coffee County Elections Office. Once there, the election official Misty Hampton invited them in, and the conspiracy that allegedly and on camera accessed the Coffee County voting machines, and in the words of Scott Hall, quote, scanned every freaking Ballot. The indictment alleges that Latham and the others were not authorized by the election board to do this, and that after they imaged the voting machines, they then disseminated the secret voter data from the servers uh, at Sullivan Stricker to other co-conspirators. And then there was the harassment of Ruby Freeman and her daughter, uh, Shay Moss, who were both elections workers. During the January 2nd conversation with Raffensperger, uh, Trump said that Freeman was a scammer who was responsible for fraudulently awarding at least 18,000 ballots to Joseph R. Biden at the Washington State Park Arena, and allegedly some of Trump's co-defendants traveled from out of state to harass Freeman, intimidate her, and to solicit her to falsely confess to election crimes that she did not commit. For example, uh, Stephen Lee, a police chaplain from Illinois, tried to intimidate Freeman by making a surprise visit to Freeman's home in mid-December 2020. And as you can see on the video, the police body cam footage shows uh, Lee acknowledging that he had knocked on Freeman's door and offered to provide a pro bono service to her. I want to let her know that you know, I've got some pro bono Afterwards, uh, Lee <laughs> to Floyd to arrange a meeting with Freeman to discuss uh, an immunity deal in exchange for full submission committing fraud. And Floyd was the director of the Black Voices for Trump. So that takes us to the predicate offenses. The foregoing summary is just the tip of the iceberg here. The indictment goes into much greater detail about the acts uh, that Trump and others allegedly engaged. And this video would be feature length if I uh, went into all the details of the crimes that uh, based on the foregoing facts, the co-defendants are accused of 41 different counts. Uh, one of the patterns that you see in this indictment is that it alleges crimes committed by the folks on the ground, and then the very next count is the crimes that allegedly were committed by the leaders of the conspiracy uh, and the, the ones who sort of planned things out and coordinated. Uh, and Donald Trump, in particular, is accused of committing 13 different crimes. The first was the solicitation of violation of an oath by a public officer. Under Georgia Code Section 16-10-1, any public officer who willfully and intentionally violates the terms of his oath, as prescribed by law, shall, upon conviction, be uh, imprisoned. Uh, Georgia law requires public officials to take an oath to, quote, support the Constitution of the United States and of the state. Uh, the governor, attorney general, secretary of state, and members of the state legislature all took uh, the statutory oath upon assuming office. And Trump is accused of soliciting conduct such as altering the results of an election, which arguably violates the oath of Raffensperger, Ralston, and others swore. Trump was also charged with violating this section by sending Raffensperger a letter in September 2021. Then there was the conspiracy to commit impersonating a public officer. Under Georgia Code 16-10-23, a person who falsely holds himself out as a peace officer or a public officer or employee with intent to mislead another into believing that he is actually such officer commits the offense of impersonating an officer. Uh, Trump and the defendants unlawfully conspired to cause individuals to falsely hold themselves out as the elected and qualified presidential elector from the state of Georgia. Trump and the defendants are alleged to have unlawfully conspired to cause certain individuals to falsely hold themselves out as the duly elected and qualified presidential elector from the state of Georgia officers with intent to mislead the President of the United States Senate, the Archivist of the United States, the Georgia Secretary of State, and, and the Chief Judge of the United States District Court for the Northern District of Georgia into believing that they actually were such officers. Uh, then there was the conspiracy to commit forgery in the first degree. In Georgia, a person commits the offense of first degree forgery when, with the intent of the fraud, he or she knowingly makes, alters, or possesses any writing other than a check in a fictitious name or in such manner that the writing as made or altered purports to have been made by another person at another time with different provisions or by authority of one who did not give such authority and utters or delivers such writing. Here, uh, fake electors sign certificates falsely certifying that they were duly elected and qualified electors to be president uh, and vice president of the United States. America, uh, in Georgia, uh, when that was not true. And Count 11 charges Trump with presenting the fake certificate to the Archivist of the United States in Fulton County, Georgia. Then there was a conspiracy to commit false statements. False statements in writing is covered by Georgia Code 16-10-20, which states that any person who knowingly and willfully falsifies, conceals, or covers up by any trick scheme or device a material fact makes a false fictitious or fraudulent statement or representation or makes or uses any false writing or document knowing the same to contain any false fictitious or fraudulent statement or entry has committed a crime. Now this law differs from the general charge of making false statements in violation of Georgia Code section 21-2-560 because it does not require an oath and criminalizes any knowing and willful false statements in any manner within the jurisdiction of any state or local department 
another agency. Now, counts 13 and 19 relate to the fake electoral certificate. Counts 29 and 39 are connected to the Raffensperger call. Count 28 charges Mark Meadows in addition to Trump for solicitation of violation of oath by a public officer for the encrypted phone call. And Bonnie Willis could have charged the election fraud version of this crime, but that crime isn't a RICO predicate, which is probably why the more general false statements law was used here. And then there is the filing false documents charge under Georgia Code 16-10-21B. Trump allegedly violated these sections by attesting to the facts in the New Year's Eve lawsuit and by filing false elector certificates. So now that we've talked about all of the predicate acts, let's talk about racketeering. Let's talk about what Trump and Young Thug have in common, and that is a Georgia RICO charge. Some commentators have had to fall on their swords because this time it is RICO. Fine. It's RICO. Are you happy now? Now, contrary to popular belief, just because something might be a RICO violation on a federal level or a state level, that doesn't necessarily mean that the crimes are more serious or that the defendant faces more jail time. RICO, first and foremost, was a tool created to deal with especially difficult to convict criminal enterprises. Uh, Georgia's RICO law was enacted in 1981, about a decade after the original federal RICO statute, and the Georgia RICO law was modeled on the federal version, which Congress enacted to deal with mafia bosses. Uh, RICO allowed prosecutors to tie mob bosses to the actions of their underlings who carried out the crimes on their behalf. So RICO was created not because it's more strict, but because it's easier to prove in certain situations. RICO can be a way for a prosecutor to send a message. Uh, like conspiracy, it allows you to bring in a lot of evidence and other people that might not otherwise be an explicit part of the crime. And sometimes this can be a good thing and sometimes it can be a bad thing. Uh, in Georgia, RICO cases tend to take a really long time and take lots of resources, which prosecutors can use as a tool to strong arm some defendants. Now, it's generally easier to convict someone under Georgia's RICO statute than it is under the federal statute. In part, it's because the law is expansive, but also has actual definitions. Now, federal RICO is very complicated. I've actually litigated federal RICO before. And federal courts have adopted a very complicated test that prosecutors often have a hard time meeting. But Georgia courts seem to skirt over this issue. Uh, this is my gloss of what needs to be proven, but the case law is fairly underdeveloped in Georgia. Uh, Georgia Code 16-14-4B states, it shall be unlawful for any person employed by or associated with any enterprise to conduct or participate in directly or indirectly such enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activity. So in other words, a prosecutor has to prove an enterprise, a pattern of activity, and a racketeering activity. Now, the definition of enterprise is extremely broad. As defined by the Georgia Code, enterprise means any person, sole proprietorship, partnership, corporation, business, trust, union chartered under the laws of the state or any other legal entity, or any unchartered union, association, or group of individuals associated, in fact, although not a legal entity, and it includes illicit as well as licit enterprises and governmental as well as other entities. Now, a pattern of racketeering activity means engaging in at least two acts of racketeering activity in furtherance of one or more incidents, schemes, or transactions that have the same or similar intents, results, accomplices, victims, or methods of commission, or otherwise are interrelated by distinguishing characteristics and are not isolated incidents within a four-year period. And then finally, racketeering activity means to commit or attempt to commit or to solicit coerce or intimidate another person to commit any crime which is chargeable by indictment under the laws of the state involving basically one of the 43 types of enumerated crimes which we've already talked about and of which there are a lot alleged here. Now, the Georgia indictment lays out a pretty clear enterprise. In fact, it's the same enterprise that was running for the election from the government. Uh, that was basically at issue in a case called Caldwell versus State that I'll talk about in just a second. And uh, there are way more than two instances of conduct uh, alleged in the indictment that could form a pattern. And finally, a lot of the alleged conduct could qualify as racketeering activity as it fits within many of the enumerated categories of the RICO statute. Now, Georgia courts have concluded that at least one of the predicate acts for the RICO charge must have been committed in the county in which the criminal proceeding is brought. However, the RICO law lets the government introduce evidence of crimes committed outside of Georgia to prove that there was a wider criminal conspiracy. And that's what the indictment alleges, that Trump and his allies uh, operated a criminal enterprise in Georgia County, but also in other Georgia counties and other swing states. Now, the Georgia RICO Act has been used in a wide variety of different ways historically, including uh, charging four people with running an assisted suicide network in violation of state law. It was used to prosecute former <laughs> sheriff Stephen Dorsey, who was convicted of masterminding the murder of his successor, who was fatally ambushed in his driveway. Uh, Dorsey was found guilty of murder and racketeering after he organized four men to kill his uh, opponent. Uh, Fawny Willis used it to convict Atlanta teachers in a test cheating scandal involving 180 educators. 
and Willis is currently pursuing several RICO cases, including a racketeering case against Young Thug and several other rappers affiliated with the uh, alleged street gang Young Slime Life. Now, the expansion of RICO laws has had plenty of criticism. Now, some people argue that the list of predicate offenses is way too broad. It can also uh, complicate a case by making it more difficult to try. Uh, and Trump will likely argue that the law can't be used against a political campaign. However, there's precedent for using the Georgia RICO Act for corrupt political uh, campaign maneuvers. In an early case called Caldwell v. State, the Supreme Court of Georgia found that RICO applied to an elective office holder seeking re-election, uh, specifically the commissioner of the Georgia Department of Labor. There, uh, Caldwell and 15 employees of the Department of Labor maintained control of the department through a pattern of racketeering uh, consisting of alleged crimes related to the campaign preceding the 1982 election, including theft by deception, extortion, false statements, and false swearing. The court held that, quote, by its express terms, the RICO Act includes as a crime a re-election campaign by the holder of public office in which two or more similar or interrelated predicate offenses specified in the act are committed. But there's still some significant issues with parts of the Georgia indictment. While we talked about how non-criminal acts can be overt acts in furtherance of a conspiracy, sometimes non-criminal speech must always remain non-criminal. Uh, unlike the D.C. indictment, the Georgia indictment includes a lot of activity that's core First Amendment free speech. Uh, even when you are in a criminal conspiracy, you still have the right of free speech. And the D.C. indictment avoids almost all of that. But by including that kind of speech, parts of the Georgia indictment might be thrown out on First Amendment grounds, or at least complicate things. And some of the alleged crimes seem to go after core political activity as well. For instance, asking legislators to appoint electors. Now, it's one thing to ask public officials to do something that they have no power to do or is illegal to do. But it's another to ask a legislator to do something that they might actually have the power to do that could be considered core political activity and that might not be colorable as a crime. And that could be a problem with some of the charges that are alleged. Uh, but this is again a quagmire that the DC indictment seems to avoid. And for reasons that I don't have time to go into, there's also a bunch of removal issues that might result in part of the case ending up in federal court. Now here, all 19 defendants were charged with felony racketeering under Georgia's RICO statute, which carries a mandatory minimum sentence of five years if convicted, but those five years can be probation. But the President of the United States does not have power to pardon people for state convictions, so a future president couldn't get them off the hook. And the Georgia governor doesn't have the power either. The Georgia Board of Paroles and Pardons only considers pardons for those who have completed their full sentence obligation and have been free of supervision and or criminal involvement for at least five consecutive years thereafter as well as five consecutive years immediately prior to applying. But as you can tell, there have been a lot of recent indictments, and the only way I've been able to get through them all is with a really good cup of coffee, which is what I get from today's sponsor, Trade Coffee. Now, seriously, uh, I'm going to need a lot of coffee to get through the next couple of years of Trump Duke. I think we all will. Uh, but Trade's great uh, not only because they have a huge selection of your favorite coffees, but they have a fine-tuned matching process that helps you discover fresh coffee based on your taste preferences. I have very specific types of coffee. Basically, I want something that tastes like hot chocolate and uh, pairs well with milk. And Trade was a fine need for me. And let's be honest, you claim you want a rich... Good information, so maybe it's charges that are unpardonable. I guess like I guess like if you're on the radar of Secret Service and the FBI, they will take you out. If you want to kill like school children, they're like, ah, it's fine. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. <laughs> Oh my lord, what the hell? Craig Robertson from Provo, Utah was killed today by the FBI during a raid after he made threats against Biden. Here are some of his recent Facebook posts, all in just the last two days. Perhaps Utah will become famous this week as the place a sniper took out Biden the Marxist. Now, what I find really funny about this post is that this is like the trans flag colors, kind of. It's giving it's giving trans flag or like at least bisexual uh, flag colors, you know? I don't know what's happening there in my dream i see joe biden's body in a dark corner of a dc parking garage with his head severed and lying in a huge puddle of blood hurrah i hear biden digging out my old ghillie suit and cleaning the dust off my m24 sniper rifle welcome buffoon and chief i like that back in the day back in the day this used to basically be like fed posting right this was fed posting this guy just decided i'm not even fed posting i'm gonna get killed by the feds <laughs>
Guys, I'm I'm feeling like this guy wasn't uh, all there. Yeah. In the United States of oh, America, yeah. you can do suicide by cop. Or if you're real crazy with it, if you want to get real spicy with it, you can do a, a long, drawn-out suicide by fed. Turns out this man had also threatened Merrick Garland, Adam Schiff, and constantly posted his weapons and vague and specific threats. Also, meant to go into a target-rich environment at a big fundraising event last year. Imagine being this upset about Democrats who literally are the same villains that the Republicans are. That's what also, that's what always blows my mind about like hyper specific anger that these guys have towards the Democratic Party. And you know, it's just from like doing too much Facebook, right? Cause it's like, like what? What do you think is gonna change if you kill Joe Biden? You already know that Joe Biden is a carcass. He's a meat cutter. He is just, he's nothing. He's just like a symbol. The, the Democratic Party and the institutions rather, the non Democratic Party are just running without, with or without his input. You think killing him is gonna do anything? What do you? I mean, you are stupid. You're the stupidest. Also, yet another Meal Team 6 uh, guy, which I personally love. Uh, hungry. Especially because you can tell that he's Meal Team 6, even from all the gear that he has on. Merrick Garland eradication tool. Coming for me with your FBI, you little demented weasel, cowardly asshole. And it's, uh, this is also another, another one of those situations where it's like, well, this is kind of ableist. You know what I mean? Are we, are we being a little ableist here? But it's like, well, how can you make the distinction between, like, a regular old crazy conspiracy theorist conservative and, like, one that's just a, a little bit beyond? I want so much to put this against Adam Schiff and Jerry Nadler's temple pulled the trigger and watched their heads explode like watermelons drop from a three-story building. Like, you're that mad about Adam Schiff and Jerry Nadler? Like, what have they done to you? I'm sorry. Oh, there's a piece of hair. There's like a little hair right there. I try. I thought it was on my screen. <laughs> like, a positive cure for Bidenitis. Look, Joe, it's a ghost gun. Also to be used as an AOC douchette bag. Going to a Democrat fundraiser. Hear that? It's a target-rich environment. So, like, AOC, like a death threat towards AOC, I understand. She's like propped up as like one of the major villains in the Democratic Party, even though she clearly has no power within the Democratic Party's infrastructure. But like these guys are idiots. They don't know any better. But like Jerry Nadler, oh, like is Jerry Nadler getting a lot of play on Fox News? Like, why are you mad at a dude who shits his pants on camera? kill people who are already like who already got one foot in the grave you know scroll down for a photo of him without the mask he's exactly what you uh shooting them oh, like, wait there is one craig robertson without the mask let's see let's see what my main man looks like oh wait is that his dad or is that him no shot that's him wait, does he have an i stand with the flag he has an i stand with the flag uh avatar thing was he arrested no he was killed here apparently here it is after investigating the FBI saying that a man was shot and killed today during a raid in Provo, Utah, uh, in connection with an investigation. I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of shocked that the FBI did the, he was on our radar, but like, but took it out way before. I guess like, I guess like if you're on the radar of Secret Service and the FBI, they will take you out. If you want to kill like school children, they're like, ah, eh, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Those were some insane threat yeah like if you say this kind of so my wife went to the university concert here in atlanta this past week and she came home basically floating on air and proclaiming beyonce to be the greatest possibly even the biggest black pop star since michael jackson definitely the biggest black pop star right now if not the biggest pop star period to her infinite shame my wife is not even that big a beyonce fan but she was converted to the church of beyonce after seeing miss Knowles in all her glory this weekend and mm -hmm. every piece of media i've seen explains why she enjoyed herself so much like if you go to instagram facebook twitter TikTok, and search beyonce concert you'll see 
the sheer feminine and very queer joy on display from all the concert goers and i love it for you all of you the black women the films the the girls the girls girls girl is this okay if i go get canceled <laughs> And even the handful of cis men that invaded that queer femme space, hopefully you were on your best behavior. However, when my wife woke up the next morning, she was shocked to find out that she had been victimized during the concert. She realized that she was seven pounds lighter, but she hadn't done any exercise. And then you realize that seven pounds is the exact weight of a soul. The only answer, according to Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter posts about Beyonce, is that her soul had been sacrificed by Beyonce to the devil in an open ritual so that Beyonce can become more famous or something. I honestly can't ever figure out exactly what the motive is for these things. That's right, for those who are unaware, Beyonce is Black America's equivalent to Marilyn Manson, Glenn Danzig, or Alice Cooper. When you search TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, and especially Facebook for Beyonce, you'll find no shortage of black people, and unfortunately mostly black women, proclaiming to see through the designs of Satan via 60 second camera phone footage that says it has proof that Beyonce is shape-shifting on stage and going into trances. This of course all a part of her now 10 year plus long plan to do something for Satan. Again, I'm not quite sure what that something is, to be rich and famous even though She's been rich and famous for like 25 years. Maybe it's to win more souls for Satan, which doesn't sound all that biblical to me. Some people say it's to join the Illuminati, which, okay, I guess that has some plausibility. All jokes aside, I've always been fascinated with this persistent set of rumors and criticisms of Beyonce in the black community because I've always found weird things fascinating but also because this particular urban legend exposes a lot about black conservatism black religiosity anti-blackness and kind of like a limitation on black political thought as a whole so first a little history i was there when the whole beyonce is an illuminati black illuminati thing started some years back in the late 2000s there was a singer i don't remember her name but there was like this young pop singer starlet type that never really got a full shot in the industry, never got a chance to really shine. And she wrote this supposed tell-all blog about how the reason why she didn't ever make it is because everyone in the industry was worshiping the devil and you had to sell your soul to the devil to be famous. And she was never given a chance because she wouldn't play the game with them. And some of y'all probably remember, I don't remember this girl's name. Go ahead and put it in the comments if you remember if you were there. But she's not that important. Although we do want to say, like one thing about this particular conspiracy theory is that it kind of conflates the very exploitative nature of the entertainment business to actual demons and devils, which is not true. It is true that people, especially young women in the entertainment industry are often exploited and coerced into sexual acts and all kinds of fucked up yes. stuff. But that's just like normal, normal human shit. It's not like this is all for Satan's army. We're already getting off topic. And she sprung on this modern era of insert celebrity here is in the Illuminati. If you know anything about conspiracy theories and moral panics, then you realize it kind of makes sense that this occurred at a time where the visibility of black art and black culture rose to brand new heights in the near decade long Obama block party era of the late 2000s and early 2010s. This is light work, so I'm not gonna get too deep into it, but suffice to say that superstition and fear of the new and unknown has always been a part of world cultures pretty much for them. The black rock and roll stars of the 50s and 60s constantly got accused of being devil worshippers and trying to employ the youth into Satan's army. By the 70s up to the 90s, the focus switched to white rockers as everyone from the clean cut, really nice sounding Beatles to the openly satanic Marilyn Manson was accused of trying to implant demons into America's youth. There are lots of albums played backwards, tons of church meetings and new congressional hearings about rock and roll and its negative influence. However, in the late 2000s, this phenomenon seemed to spread like wildfire over black pop culture in a way that I think was a little different. I can't fully explain it for time, but understand that when Obama got in office, it was a cultural reset for black art and media. Think of the way black folks have been acting up for the Alabama Tea Party just the last couple of months, but turn that up to a thousand. 
So black art and music and TV and movies had a renaissance, not just among us, but everywhere, all over the world. Meaning that there were new heights of success and visibility and the way that black felt for that moment was really different than how it felt up until that moment and to an extent, but lesser extent, how it feels now. And I think this was a bit shocking to a lot of black people who for reasons I'll get to later are uncomfortable with the idea that black was suddenly not just being seen as socially acceptable, but commodifiable and worthy of celebration. And then all of a sudden it became normalized to believe that almost every black celebrity, any black person that's ever been successful in Hollywood or music or whatever, whether they're a rapper, singer, actor, or politician, was secretly in the Illuminati, gay, or devil worshiper, and most likely all three. There's probably still a ton of these conspiracy theory videos up on YouTube, and I swear according to many of them, there's basically no black celebrity that exists or has existed that hasn't also been a gay devil worshiper or sacrificed someone to the greatness. Fiddy Send is exposing Jay-Z and Beyonce for allegedly doing ritual sacrifices. And it looks like Fiddy is saying J and B will do literally anything to stay on top. At that time, the Illuminati was why everything in black pop culture. It's why Leah died. It's why R. Kelly got caught. It's why Biggie got shot. It's why Drake. It was black QAnon, I shit you know. It got to the point where within a few years, you start to see rappers and singers and other pop chasers purposely evoking the imagery and aesthetics of the Illuminati and devil worship and whatever else, just to get outrage and free publicity. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going into the specifics of these conspiracies and why all of them are stupid and wrong, because if you know anything about people who are hardcore into nonsense and conspiracy theories, do you know you can never really disprove them in their minds? They will always find a way to take whatever proof you present and reformulate it back into a different version of the same theory. There's also the fact that there are and have been real conspiracies by American social institutions that harm black people. Going to pros of the end, the Tuskegee experiments were a theme, etc. Also, one of the most prominent risk factors for a person getting into ridiculous conspiracy theories is social dysfunction and alienation, i.e., a lot of things black people deal with. When you suffer in a world where nothing makes sense, you are more likely to buy into grand and bizarre explanations about where that suffering stems from. So, I'm trying to be empathetic here, even though this shit is really fucking stupid. Like I said, every black famous person has been the target of these rumors at one point over the last 15 or so years. Nobody has constantly had to deal with them as long as Beyonce has. So much so that she actually even addressed them in the first lines of her first single for her album, Lemonade, a few years back. Y'all haters corny with that Illuminati mess. Why is this? What is it about Beyonce in particular that makes this rumor stick to her more than anyone else? The top and easiest one to point out to me is misogyny slash misogyny. The fact is that Beyonce is an incredibly powerful, very talented, and highly visible black woman. And in many ways, all of those things are transgressive. She talks about sex openly, and while she's no sexy red, she's not afraid to put a little raunch on record, even though Beyonce is married to her mother, allegedly. She very much doesn't embody the image that is expected for that role from a conservative standpoint. All of this, of course, wouldn't be much of an issue if Beyonce were a man. Some of the same people calling Beyonce a devil worshiper are asking people to pray for and forgive R. Kelly. Our media and black culture as a whole tends to hyper-focus on black women when they behave inappropriately. But I want to be clear here. In this case, so much of this comes from other black women. When you look through the folks with the strongest hate for Beyonce, it's other black women. Often black women closely align to quasi-fundamentalists and out there church ideologies. For whatever reason, black men have never taken issue with Beyonce, as far as I can tell. Most of I think it's because Beyonce's brand of feminism is a bit toothless, so it just doesn't raise anybody's ire. But she's still too much for a sect of hyper-Christian black women. And this is an example of how patriarchy is genderless. The women who constantly attack Beyonce are practicing misogynoir in the name of affirming a specific and appropriate type of black femininity that Beyonce doesn't always engage in. Anyway, this brings us to the next reason, which is general black conservatism and goofy religiosity as a whole. So when it comes to black conservatism, for Beyonce, she's just too out of the norm for them. With her aversion to organized religion, her intentional courting of a queer fan base, her high art and avant-garde aesthetic. I hate to say it like this because there is a classist element to it, but there are like just 
portions of black communities that refuse to try things that are new and not like explicitly ordained to do within black communities. You try to force certain people to analyze or expand their perspective. For some of them, it's easier to just say that shit is the devil and write it all off to begin with and challenge themselves to grow in, in any form or fashion. Like we got whole generations of autistic black kids being abused because their parents would rather pray over them than get an occupational therapist. And I don't want to go too deep into the complex relationship between black people and the church. Lil Bill has a great video on the topic that you should watch. But I do know toxic church culture when I see it. And this is something that is always surrounded Beyonce. It's essentially a cottage industry of people selling DVDs and their own church sermons and whatever else seminars and conferences and they use revealing the truth about beyonce to be their big ticket to get people to spend money it's basically a the last and most insidious and disappointing thing though is anti-blackness and really if i wanted to i could map everything else i've said so far onto that because it all connects but i wanted to touch on this in a specific way this is where the real ugly deep roots of black conservatism actually lie the gist of it is this Beyonce is too successful to have gotten where she is based on her talent and work ethic alone. To some black people, other black people are just not capable of accessing this level of wealth and variety without some nefarious, maybe even supernatural forces allowing it to be so. There are some black people who have a subliminal inferiority complex in their heads that makes it where any black person doing good and progressing beyond the ordained position that they see, even in this fucked up system, must have some way done something wicked and devilish and demonic. It's giving a little uncle ruckus and a little stink meaner at the same time, and it's sad on so many levels. The irony is, if you know me, then you know I do feel like there is some truth to this sentiment. It just doesn't have anything to do with the devil or Satan. When black people are highly talented or driven, they don't have to sell their soul to the devil. They don't even have to sell out per se. In reality, capitalists and corporations and white interests will come find them. They will want to use that talent and extract value from it for their own needs. They will want to reach on black art and black creativity to make sure that said art and creativity won't be able to be used to build up black people. Extra points if it can be used to marginalize black people, like the gangs around our own oh, in and nineties. When you look at some of our most prominent black celebrity figures, many of them are beneficiaries of shady business deals and business practices or exploitative contracts or selling specifically corporate backed and regressive images of black people and black art. There is a reason why Rhapsody dropped a classic album in the same year that Meg Thee Stallion dropped Savage and nobody remembers Rhapsody's album. And although I love me some Meg, I do feel like there is room for multiple images of black femininity in hip hop, but we're not seeing that and this is a reason why. Beyonce's husband, Jay-Z, was I'm pretty sure the first hip hop building. And one of his biggest steps on that path was to sign on as a fractional owner of the Brooklyn Nets back in the 2010s. The purpose of this deal was to put a popular black face on the team in order to smooth over the team's movement to Brooklyn, which resulted in massive gentrification of Jay-Z's hometown of Brooklyn and the displacement of thousands of his original residents. Jay talked and was promoted as being the owner or at least a big player in the ownership team. So it was sold as at least one of our own is going to benefit from the situation. Situation. He would even rap about it. But he only owned a fraction of a fraction of the team, which he then sold not long after the team moved to Brooklyn. This maneuver helped spur Jay into a different stratosphere of business and helped result in him reaching that billionaire status. But it also cost the original residents of Brooklyn. And this isn't the only move that sort by him or many of the black super rich. Similar things happened with Kanye West, with Adidas.
Rome was not built in a day, but it was built consciously and with intentionality. Roman civilization as we understand it is the product of millions of people, men and women, young and old, weak and powerful, working over millennia to make their culture something spectacular. We can see that they built and accomplished amazing things across three continents, but what's less obvious is what they built on. Not literally, mind you, that's usually brick or stone, but what cultural foundation sustains so huge an idea as Rome? That's the kind of question that takes us to the very beginning of their history as we try to figure out what inciting incident led to all of this. However, any records from the earliest Roman chronicles are agonizingly absent as the city was sacked and burned in 390 by a tribe of Gauls, so we are instead left at the mercy of Roman legend, complete historical and palo propaganda. But despite this rather considerable setback in understanding the earliest roots of Roman history, we can work with this, because later Romans... This man is the most interesting man uh, that Andrew's ever interviewed, which is crazy because Andrew has made a living interviewing the most interesting people. All right, let's watch this. Does anyone have the TOS moments for this? Yeah, are there TOS moments for this? I mean, everything is blurred most likely, but oh shit, this guy wrote the time codes and then got clapped by Fossa Bot. <laughs> Chill. <laughs> Fascist bot, more like. Anyway. 235 to 240 is a bit sus, 732 to 805 is a diagram of a dick. I mean, that's educational, right? Yeah, that is educational, but you know. What's the channel five? Where is he going for this one? Uh, this is a guy who drinks his own piss. That's what that channel five is about. Yeah. What the fuck? This guy drinks his own pee pee. Oh my god. He's crazy. All right, let's watch. I am fearless. I am doubtless because fear in the present moment. Pee pee is a tasty little treat to this guy. And has like, I know it's like a survival thing. You got to drink your own pee. This is like and eats his own jizz. He says it's like a. Okay. I mean, never know. I mean, you eat other men's jizz. That's true. Who doesn't taste? Oh, now you, you switched up so quick. You literally went from never done that before. That's gross. To like, yeah, I've, I've done it. <laughs> you know, that's crazy. Just a little bit. That was like a straight guy response. Like, what? What am I gay? <laughs> What are you crazy? What are you trying to say? Call me queer? What is this? Huh? Never tasted jizz in my life. I'm like, bro, no, chill. No, I, mean, I, I just don't. Uh, yeah, maybe I've tasted it, but, <laughs> but it doesn't taste good when you're after. You know, you know, Come is something that you either really want or you really don't want. There's no in between. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, it looks good. Fear. fear in the past is shame. Fear in the future is doubt. So when you cup another dude's nuts, you're sending good vibrations, good chi spiraling up the back, down the front of you. Austin, agree. Dude, I love this video already. Oh, dude, don't say that. You said it too soon. Oh, really? Okay, never mind. What the fuck is the typical Austin show moment? They're your batteries. So when you focus on your testicles, you're literally charging your batteries. And of course, you're probably the first guy in your family lineage who's doing shit like this, at least for hundreds of years. So of course the shame's gonna come up. Of course the fear's gonna come up, and of course the doubt's gonna come up. So I always tell <laughs> what do your balls feel like right now? Smiling to that feeling. Staying grounded in your nuts and your body in your feet. Good. And then you reach for the nuts and you basically cuff the nuts and you appreciate the nuts. And you kind of feel the Reiki energy leaving my palm chakra into your ball sack. Yep. And we take three deep breaths through the mouth. And then you say, I see you, brother. I see you. Amazing. And then you give them a hug. My name is Will Blunderfield. We're in my apartment in Vancouver, Canada, and I teach sexual kung fu. Oh, he's the most okay. He's just a Canadian, dude. That's what it is. I was like, what's the deal with this guy? What's wrong with him? And now I know. Okay, like the act of cupping another man's balls doesn't really. It's kind of strange. No, he's just he's just Canadian. That's what it is. I, I, get I mean, there's it. nothing strange about cupping another man's balls, but just like in the nuns, I don't know. I mean, I cut other men. Do you? Not really. I feel like it's not a very sexual thing. No. 
I, I, I don't see you doing that. I like, I don't even know. I don't really even hold that. Like, why would you cup another man? I like balls? maybe grab him for a second, but I don't really like cup him. There's not really any joy in cupping him. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a sexual act. Anyway, he said he does sex kung fu. So it's the daily discipline of harnessing and directing your sexual energy from your loins up into the rest of your system rather than constantly shooting it out. Some people are like, well, you're saying that, you know, you should love yourself as you are. Why are you encouraging guys to go to the cock? But I'm just saying, let your cock and your balls fully exist in the form that they're meant to exist in beyond poisoning. The sad truth is that cock size is the smallest it's ever been in recorded history. So my holistic approach is a three pillar thing. It's about getting the pesticides and the microplastics out of your body through superfoods and detoxification protocols. Then it's actually sexual kung fu techniques, like pulling, literally like taking. Dude, Wait, is how this guy can... trying to grow people's dicks? Is this the whole thing? I guess. That's his, that's his thing. He's I mean, he landed, on, he landed on an incredible grip. There was a documentary I remember of a guy whose uh, girlfriend denied him in, in a stadium when he like asked her to marry him. And, and when asked why, she said he had a small dick Ooh. and i remember that he like went and like looked for uh dick remedies basically what was that does anyone remember that it was like a documentary no the moral of the story is that there is nothing that's what i'm saying if there was something we'd all be taking it because i think everybody could use a little the song. unhung hero oh yeah yo the dick diagram is the only thing that screams tos to me the rainbow chakra the dick not like a biological diagram the unhung hero. <laughs> what? So said the unhung hero. No, that's the name. I think that was literally the name oh, of the documentary. <laughs> anyway, but that's when I found out, like, there's motherfuckers out there that'll do anything for this, okay? Which is why this is a good grip. In the coconut oil and milking your penis down 50 times, up 50 times, left 50 times, right 50 times, and straight out 50 times every day. My balls used to be the size of like, enlar like slightly bigger than an almond, and now they're both the size of like a brick. <laughs> Someone in the chat said, Konami code! <laughs> He's doing a Konami code on his cock, dude! An almond? Okay, let's hear the man out. Maybe he's got some good ideas. There's surgery that can add an inch in length and width, respectively. Dude, you can't. You this can't so trust that shit, too. dude. No shot. This motherfucker won't even take Propecia. No. Because he's worried that no. his dick won't work. Fuck no, I won't take Propecia. I think I need to. No. I'm taking Nutrafol. Uh, no, it is. It's a supplement. Brazil nuts. It's gonna work. Wait, was that a TOS moment? Oh, it's coming it's up now. It's great to be able to feel that. And it's also great to be able to lengthen the penis. The easiest way to really I mean, come into the, the penis in terms of lengthening it. I mean, these are all censored. <clears throat> these, <throat> these dicks are all censored. You literally just make an okay grip, and, and you just of... pull it pull it down. The penis and the tongue are the outermost extensions of the heart. In classical Chinese medicine, you're just like... <sighs> okay, I got to show you this, though. They're all doing the okay on their dicks. Oh, so this isn't like a sexuality. What do you mean, bro? What, what, what are you talking about? Motherfuckers got their dicks out flopping about. Yeah, but they're, there's no. They're, this is platonic. Oh, you mean? I mean, it's a sex thing, but it's not a sexuality. Thing. Exactly. Yeah. It's a platonic moment. Traditionally, you sit naked. My teacher Montauk Chia taught me this. Later on, we're going to talk a lot about screwing technique. Literally focus consciousness into your nuts because energy flows where the mind goes. Mm. There's also something that my teacher Troy Casey taught me. It's called testicle slapping. Mm. <sighs> you do this for maybe. Bro, I, I don't know if I can show this, man. <laughs> I don't know if I can show this. He's doing CBT, dog. And that slap, those slaps, those were him slapping his ball sack. <laughs> you could hear it <laughs> like fucking <coughs> like ass cheek clapping yo this is crazy he's a true martial artist this is not a grip man shut the fuck up sexual kung fu is not real dude he said stop Ray, stop hiding the dick lengthening secrets i'm pretty sure you're not supposed to hit your balls like that i don't i can't i can't see that being a good thing
two minutes. Not too hard, not too easy, just right. Mixing the blood in the balls, increasing your testosterone, which will increase your manhood. And then you take the energy of nature. Okay, so I don't know why I flushed the toilet, force of habit, but anyway. So this is oh my God. Shibambu. Oh my God. Oh! He downed it! Stop! Stop! Oh! Oh, you can hear him gulping! Oh! It's oh fucking. My God. Ah! Oh! Bro! Bro! Oh Little droplets, brother! Why? Little droplets on the chin, brother! Oh! He gulping. <laughs> He's out here going. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, He's glug glug glugging away. Oh, it's in his fucking beard. Oh, my also, my man needs to drink some water, dude. What? How yellow is his piss, bro? That. Oh, uh, bro, that is the worst, dude. That, oh my god. Oh my god. That's really bad. He needs to hydrate. Without piss. Oh, I got in my beard. I eat carrots, organic carrots, because they make me feel good. I drink my piss because it makes me feel good. Can you tell us what same sex erotic bonding is? Yeah, same sex erotic bonding is when. Uh, See, it's sexual too. I'm about to learn something now. Let's hear it. Uh, two men or a group of men together to do things that this culture would say would be like homosexual. For example, two men hugging heart to heart with the cocks touching, breathing, and doing our best to stay in a parasympathetic state of being rather than going into stress mode. The first time was definitely really challenging to really be present with actually observing my yeah. brother's body and being present with him watching me. The more you do it- Wait, that's his brother? Dog, stop. No, I think he's calling him his brother as if like, like they're brothers in this, in this- uh, They're brothers in Bond. Yeah, in Bond. I don't think they're actually brothers. Dude, this is wild. But I, I will say straight guys are going to really uh, incredibly uh, crazy lengths to not be gay. I think these guys probably do gay shit. Yeah, but why? Like, why do they give them- Like, they might be gay, I think. I don't know. Do we know? Are they not gay? Like we weren't gay. We're just same sex bonding. That's what I call my when I When I'm with other men, I call it same sex bonding <laughs> <laughs> There are pretty strange sex called brothers like two nuts and sack So the more you spend time with each other too, the more you can actually just observe and witness the person for everything they've gone through It's no different than any other part of their body. So why not give them some appreciation? You've got a beautiful body <laughs> like everything is censored. Everything is censored. Everything is. <laughs> you have a beautiful cock. Oh yeah, nothing like same-sex bonding. <laughs> That's what I do with my bros. Just one bro on one leg, one on the other, spread it wide open. Okay. By the way, that shit's way gayer than sucking a cock. Yeah, okay. That's <laughs> He had that shit oh, spread. He had that shit spread wide open, eagle style, okay? <laughs> that, is, that is incredible. That is so incredible. Anyway, uh, let's get back to the piss drinking and shit. Right, I'm ready. I hate this video. No, it is great. You got a beautiful cock, baby. <laughs> got you. And then you hug heart to heart because the heart is on the left side of the body with the cocks touching. When I started hanging out with these guys, it's not just Will, there's other people in Vancouver who are also engaging in, in these kind of practices. My assumption was like, oh, yeah, West Hollywood, I want something. From them. Oh my God. It took a few years to finally build that trust with these guys that, oh, they're not trying to like subtly manipulate me and maybe they are gay underneath, but they're not acknowledging it whether we call ourselves gay or straight or trans like we think that these labels make us all so unique and that they're so important when really to me they're just tools that the matrix uses to divide us and control us because i feel like well, there's so much more than that just one little word like but if you're going to call me something call me a faggot and then oh, facebook sensors oh, go off shit. and i'm in facebook jail now for 30 days oh uh, my god i talk about medical freedom so it's like a double whammy for me oh my god the wild naked man denies 
uh, the existence oh of viruses, and he just like talks about all this crazy shit that I didn't what? learn about, and I've been going to med school for five generations. Okay. <sighs> Did you actually read the links that I sent? Oh my god! Just accept that you're gay. You're gay. You're gay. You're gay, honey. The word that I was called most in high school was faggot. And I just love the intensity of that word. And I guess it's like how some black people reappropriate the N-word. Yeah. I like to reappropriate the faggot. So you experienced like a lot of bullying in school and stuff like that? Yeah, it was pretty bad. Like people would like drop. Austin wants to say it's so bad right now. Why do you like this so much? Oh, this is so so this. So he's he's not gay. No, but he's just fucking hurling it. Like it's he's <laughs> obviously not gay, Austin. No. <laughs> I can't say it. I can't. I only say it. What do you mean? You say it all the time. Yeah, in private. He says it he says it all the time. <laughs> in private. It's my word, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Cox in my mouth on my student council posters and I guess they assumed that I was gay because I was a singer. I remember I was living in Manhattan. No. Uh, <laughs> nah, I don't think that's the reason, dog. <laughs> He's like, yeah, it must be. They probably think uh, they assumed I was gay because I was having sex with women too much. I think <laughs> that's what it must have been. <laughs> um, <coughs> this man is the most interesting man uh, that Andrew's ever fucking interviewed, which is crazy because Andrew has made a living interviewing. The most interesting people. Not even because of everything else, but his head shape is so weird. And I cannot stop focusing on it. He literally looks like an alien. He's got such a skinny neck and such a massive dome. Like, the top of his dome just keeps going larger and larger and larger. Yeah, he does look like Megamind. <laughs> it's odd, man. I can't stop myself. <laughs> I'm glad you noticed it, bro. Are you kidding me? It's like when you look at Ron Perlman, you're like, okay, bro, you have Neanderthal dome, okay? You got the Neanderthal skull. Like, Neanderthals were not genocided. Ron Perlman still lives among us, okay? This man's got the alien version of that. And I was dating this guy. We just, you know, had a great meal. And we, we held each other's hands. Right when we got out, it was it started to rain, and this guy takes out a switchblade, and he's like, "You fucking faggots, I'm gonna get you!" And like we ran. Oh, he's gay. Yeah. It just like showed me that there still is a lot of like. Oh, he's um, gay. Triggering that can happen when two men or two women are showing love. Right. I mean, yeah, I definitely have same-sex attraction, and it's interesting when I do things like detox from glyphosate and atrazine, mm -hmm. I start to feel an increase in a procreative urge. The testes tingle around beautiful women, whereas before they were completely, I was cut mm. off. The more I retain my seed, the more I eat well, the more I do same-sex erotic bonding, the more pussy I want to eat. So that's what I'm interested in. How can we okay, do so same-sex erotic bonding, superfood nutrition, detoxification to enhance male potency? So, so I'll, I'll be honest, I think he's on to something. Because I find when I don't jerk off as much, my life has more meaning. And for that reason, I Please eat better. Please stop. I, I hate out. I hate this semen retention bullshit, I bro. Out, I eat better, right? I, 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 I'm, I'm more engaged, right? Like, I think he's actually, uh, I think I'm actually, I'm actually buying into what this guy's saying. All right, minus the drink and the piss part. He lost me there. All right, let's go. Can feel more and, juicy and, and whatever the fuck he's doing wild. right here. Okay, he lost me here. <laughs> Wait, I can't, can I show this? I don't know. Just don't risk it. <clears throat> I don't know if I can show. It's a straight cock. But, like, it's a photo <laughs> of a cock, but there's, like, rainbow colors on it. It's a pride cock. Come on. You couldn't ban it or they'd be homophobic. It's not Fish blurred. can't ban you for this. It's a pride cock. I'm not going to show it. I can't. The cock, the ears, are really great places to massage because they've got so many nerve endings in them that relate to the entire body. Austin, when he said the F slur. <laughs> uh. All right, let's keep going with this video. So in my classes, we get naked and we literally massage our cocks together. 
<laughs> and this is called penis reflexology. This is a diagram in terms of... But not gay. Oh, like, why doesn't he just go fuck other guys? I don't see the he, he does fuck guys. Oh. He dated guys. He says he dates guys, but when he dates guys, <laughs> and then he does, like, all this shit... Oh, God. Oh, my God. He does look like Keemstar. Yeah, so when he does, like, the, the penis bonding shit with other dudes, that that <coughs> creates an urge within him to want to fuck and eat pussy. That's what he said. So is he is this, like, conversion therapy? I don't know. Everyone knows this is penis reflexology. Definitely a real thing. <laughs> Oh this man! Gay conversion therapy. Is this what he's Wants to I don't. I don't. I don't think so. I, I don't feel even. Like there's some some sort of. He seems comfortable with the sexuality. I don't really know what he's trying to do. I don't get it either. I thought originally he's trying to get people's dicks bigger. In terms of penis reflexology, it's a little bit blurry. So basically, we massage each other's heart meridians to help release self hatred while cuddling and watching Obi-Wan Kenobi and it was just so beautiful and this is what my Celtic ancestors did. They would also suck each other's nipples and share each other's beds before battle. If you do some more digging, Spartans were actually doing same-sex They believed he ingested the semen of a big strong man. Yeah, they were gay as fuck. I mean, they were super gay. Like, really. They were so gay, they weren't even thinking about it. Like, that wasn't a thing. Yeah, back then we didn't label it. Yeah, there was nothing. It was just like, yeah, you're fucking your dude's ass. You're, you're fucking your homie's ass. That's just like whatever, you know? It is what it is. That you would become a big strong man. And they still do that in tribes that have not yet been contacted by the West. In Papua New Guinea, for example, oh. they actually have to suck as much cock as they can <laughs> before they hit the age of 20 or 21, and then they can marry a woman. What? To get as much sperm into their bodies as they can. Wait, is that real? What the fuck? <laughs> God damn. <laughs> wait, what? Wait, hold on. That seems really suspicious. It is very real. Wait, really? I learned this in anthropology. Wait, I can't tell if you guys are being serious. Why don't I just Google it? Hold on. It's just like, what is it? Papua New Guinea? Suck cock? That's going to be a weird search. Papua New Guinea suck cock. What is it? Is this it? <laughs> no, not the Celtic one. I want to know about the... Oh, it's the first recommended search term. Simbari people, known as the Simbari Anga, <coughs> are a tribe of mountain uh, dwelling, hunting, horticultural people who inhabit the fringes of the eastern islands of the province of Papua New Guinea and are extensively described by the American anthropologist Gilbert Hurd. <coughs> They have ritualized homosexuality and semen ingestion practices with pubescent boys. Ooh. Ugh. Awkward. In his studies of the Simbari, Heard describes people in how, God, they're libertarians, bro. Yikes. That's what it is. Yeah, they're free market. It says right here, they are, uh, they are big fans of the free market. They're free market libertarians. It also says, actually, it's called ephibophilia sweaty. That's what it says in the, in the Wikipedia article. Oh, man. I mean, technically, so were the Spartans. You know what I'm saying? Simbari people speak Simbari. Male of rites of passage, Maku. They're separated from their mothers at this stage, participate in the bloodletting, where long sticks are inserted up their nostrils, make them bleed, therefore ridding themselves of their mother's presence in them. Simbari people do not believe that males are born with semen, and so during Maku, the boys participate in fellatio. Wait, what? Bro, you shouldn't even know about this. We know too much now. I feel like... What the fuck? Bro, looking at this is one thing. Okay, learning about this and going gross, ew, is another. Looking at this and being like, this is actually a good thing. Is entirely separate. You know what I mean? They are also required to undergo a strict diet during this time period, which is from age 7 to 10. Male bonding and rewards for making it through. During the stage, the boys begin to go through puberty. They no longer need to participate in fellatio. Oh, what the fuck? They learn gender roles. Oh, god damn, dude. What the fuck? Okay, let's watch the fucking video or something. Definitely said before, like, 20 to 21, so he didn't have to say it was children. Yeah. 
Why would you look at this and go, man, seems like some good ideas. He looks way better bald. Oh my God, dude, his head, there's something wrong with it. Hassan, I beg you to close that wiki article. Yeah, there's a time limit on that thing, dude. You stay on that for too long, immediately, immediately the FBI comes knocking down your door. You stay on that Wikipedia page for too long. <laughs> You stay on that Wikipedia page for too long, okay? The 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 Young Americans uh, for Freedom Foundation uh, sends you gift cards. All of a sudden, your entire YouTube search algorithm, your TikTok search algorithm, all of it is turned into Ben Shapiro clips, okay? They believe it like it's got testosterone in it too that they are like increasing their manhood my testicles attract girls from all over the world mm. my testicle attract humans from all around the world my balls produce massive amounts of testosterone my balls produce massive amounts of testosterone my testicles are an engine of alpha growth my testicles are an engine of alpha growth Beautiful. So for most of my life, I couldn't feel my balls. Now that I do this ritual regularly, I can actually feel the sperm being produced in my balls and I feel so much more grounded. I couldn't feel what? my cock and balls unless I was fully erect. And even when I was fully erect, I couldn't even so really much. feel my nuts. Wait, he's got some issues, man. What the fuck? <clears throat> That's not healthy. What the fuck? What did he do? Did he fucking rub it too hard? Like, I don't understand. My man, you should have gone to a doctor, okay? What the fuck? You have some kind of disorder. I'm just saying. Son, not all of us have as big of balls as you do. But, but like, but I don't understand. Like, You understand how people could have smaller balls? No, I'm not talking about that. You can have... He's talking about feeling. This <laughs> <laughs> is so dumb. I felt just like there was nothing there. Also, I was sexually abused by a doctor when I was four. So it was a combination of like a chemical, almost like a chemical castration plus the shaming of the abuse. So the sexual kung fu lineage has literally helped me like feel my balls again, mix the blood and the cheat in my nuts. There it is. Say, yeah, literally collectively everybody went, oh, that makes sense. I witnessed his cock change for sure. Like his cock's gotten bigger. It was probably flaccid, maybe two, three inches. Mm. And then a rack is maybe five inches. Now it's usually about three to four inches flaccid. And erect, it goes to about six, just over six inches. So many dudes that I work with and that I've chatted with, actually, I'd say every dude is worried about is their dick going to be perceived as small? This like fear of like, oh my God, if I show my dick. And this work has helped me to feel like I don't really care about what someone thinks of my dick. I'm just like, this is my dick. None of you guys have super small dicks. Thanks. <laughs> the changes I've noticed in my own genitals, not just localized to that area, it's more so that they're interconnected with the rest of my body. If I'm engaging in sex with somebody, I'm not just focused on this little, as Will would say, a bubble of awareness in that area. It seems to coalesce back into a full system where if I'm receiving a hug, How horny do you got to be to explore your balls that deeply? My whole body's involved usually, except for my genitals. Think about that. I seem to, to be what unaware depths? of that. Even in those moments now, I'm a full body back online. I'm not so much emotionally. You gotta be so horny one area or to like. There's you need more than just whatever people. sex has to offer. Ah! <laughs> this is great to do like in a circle with a bunch of naked men because we communicate huh? subtly through the pelvic consciousness. I call it the testiculum, mm. kind of like the mycelium network in the forest. The mushroom is the mm. cock, and the mycelium are the testicles. So it's like. Let them fill with this yang chi, with this yang prana, and exhale. I'll be honest, Hassan. If I was standing in a circle with all them, I think I'd want to eat pussy too. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is actually like gay conversion therapy. Yeah, they're like, dude, y'all are fucking weird, man. <laughs> Austin's like, I've been gay my whole life, but this shit's whack, bro. It's too much. <laughs> I am ace, and I've never felt more normal. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful that these guys are making everybody feel better about themselves. Yeah. Right? Because gratitude is like make men yoga. feel. So you're like, you're basically blessing your nuts for the upliftment of all of humanity, and you're increasing the frequency of the mini brain of your gonads by 
smiling and grabbing. I mean, this is one of those things where it's like if your mom walks in while you're watching this, just turn to porn. Just turn up, open porn immediately in another tab. Be like, I was jerking off. Mom, I was jerking off. Uh, it's so, it's so much less embarrassing. Oh. I mean, this is crazy. Bowling into her. Uh, you can do this when you're having sex with a woman. that makes up. When people think of the Frieza arc, they think of the Super Saiyan transformation. They think of the climactic battle between good versus evil and the chaotic search for the Namekian Dragon Balls. But man, for me, that only begins to scratch the surface. And what's more, as a kid, it marked the very first time I was so moved by a particular story that I simply had to figure out why it made me feel that way. 20 years later, I'm happy to say that these are my findings. Last week we covered the Saiyan invasion on Earth, but this week we're plunging ourselves headfirst into the deep, dark reaches of the starry night sky, unwittingly en route to a certain lion's den, the likes of which none of us could have been ready for. Not Gohan, not Krillin, not Vegeta, not even Son Goku. So sit back and get comfortable, everyone, because this is how Akira Toriyama changed the Dragon Ball world forever and established one of the most iconic moments in all anime history this i am of course talking about is the terrifying the captivating and the endlessly entertaining culmination to one of the central plot threads introduced in dragon ball z this my friends is the iconic frieza saga <laughs> In the Saiyan Saga video we just covered, I explored the prevailing message of the arc being that the differences we are criticized and demonized for, if we try hard enough, become the strengths that define and ultimately save us. The mission statement of this arc expressed loud and clear that all of what Goku represented was a virtue against the evil which Vegeta represented. And in the end, Goku's good triumphed over Vegeta's evil. At least that was until a certain amount of poison slipped through the cracks of Goku's apparent virtuous facade. When he, quite selfishly, requested Krillin to spare Vegeta's life simply because it would have been a waste to erase such rare fighting potential that someday he wished to fight him again. With that somewhat contrasting footnote coloring what was otherwise a rather uplifting and gleeful ending to say the least, we once again return to melancholy as we prepare to embark on the most ambitious journey this story has ever attempted. For the very first time, leaving the safe and comfortable confines of the Earth's surface and venturing forth onto the stars above to explore answers to a problem established in that very last arc. How can they get more Dragon Balls to rescue their friends that gave up their lives for the Earth against the Saiyans? Once again, putting to the test those very differences the prior arc celebrated, the Frieza arc takes to its natural extreme. Asking the question, what happens when you encounter a foe, the likes of which your friends can help you best, who threatens your very family? Someone that forces you into a corner to fight, not with what you've learned, but instead forces you to lash out with instinct, necessitating you to contend with what you are instead of who you are. The Frieza saga of this story is a fascinating deconstruction of the bedrock philosophy established in the prior, testing it and pushing it past its limits to reveal something honestly exceptional. But to get there, we have to start at the beginning. Act 1. Okay, so right off the bat, one important aspect of Dragon Ball Z's structure is abundantly clear. Something that made this story incredibly difficult to put down for me when reading, and something I feel isn't taken advantage of nearly enough in the modern material. And that is blending your arcs together, feeding into each other, to establish and to set up story beats for what's to come. What do I mean? Well, as we touched on last week, 
The likes of Yamcha, Chaozu, Tenshinhan, and Piccolo all bit the dust thanks to the Saiyans, and due to Piccolo's death, the Earthlings not only now can't wish back the likes of Chaozu, but they can't wish back anyone ever again, it seems. However, in passing, in the middle of a conversation Nappa and Vegeta shared, Toriyama dangled a potential solution right before our eyes. Naturally, we aren't too worried about that while we're covering that material because everyone is dying and we're waiting for Goku to get back to Earth to make the save. But thanks to that small piece of exposition, that small amount of time set aside to explain that very small piece of information, we now have a natural cause and effect between the last arc and this new one. Due to the events and information disclosed, we now have a motivation and goal to strive for. In other words, because the Saiyan Saga happened, therefore, the Frieza Saga must happen. In Dragon Ball Super, it really struggled with this, with each arc feeling as though they were independent islands of story largely disconnected from one another. When the Universe 6 tournament ended, it ended. It had a conclusion. And then, suddenly, we get a cold open into the future Trunks material that wasn't informed by the prior events in the slightest. Now, this does not happen once in Dragon Ball Z, but it happens for a specific reason to mark the ending of a particular era. It's sort of, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself with that. No spoilers for Boo, you gotta wait for that one. But anyways, yes, the fallout following the Saiyan Saga is a large component to what ultimately defines the setup for this one. Every fighter involved is hospitalized or in critical health. And funnily enough, they all have their eyes set on the same goal, to gather the Namekian Dragon Balls. And while Vegeta's path to that goal seems rather straightforward, that isn't the case for the Earthlings who are tied down by their current technologies. Or at least, that's what we're led to believe. Due to that beneficial cause and effect I spoke of earlier, the legwork of the prior arc makes the journey to Namek possible for the Earthlings in a very believable way. For if Piccolo is a Namekian, so too must Kami be. And if Kami is a Namekian, he must have come to Earth somehow. And so enter Mr. Popo with the single fastest form of transportation on Earth in all of Dragon Ball. I'm serious about that, by the way. This magic carpet thing he has puts the instant transmission to shame on planet Earth. Dude can teleport in an instant without even a key signature to lock onto. But something I didn't notice until this reread was how both the Saiyan arc as well as this one begins with stories of an alien origin. Both Goku and Kami, children sent from their respective homeworlds to wait for rescue on an alien planet. With both infants suffering memory loss in the process. And to be honest, when I first read this, I found the amnesia angle to be quite convoluted and frankly, a little convenient considering we already just moments prior accepted that was Goku's fate also. And while it is a little trite for it to follow a similar path in that regard, let's see if there's something more at play here thematically to acknowledge before casting harsh judgment. Structurally or narratively, this plot point exists to grant Bulma, Krillin, and Gohan the means with which to travel to Namek in order to make their wish on the Namekian Dragon Balls before Vegeta does. Because of this, there's a pressing time constraint and thus they couldn't wait for Goku who eventually travels using his own pod's tech. An otherwise creative choice that's difficult to critique in comparison. However, with Goku and Kami sharing a similar origin in many respects, there's something more there to perhaps to appreciate. Divulged initially through Mr. Popo and later on Namek itself, we hear a tale of a mysterious event on that planet called the Cataclysm, an event that
that almost wiped out the Namekian race entirely. Does anyone have like Trump tax return 2016 debate combo that he had with Hillary Clinton? I want to show you guys something really important. Oh, here In this bucket about fitness to be president, there's been a lot of developments over the last 10 days since the last debate. I'd like to ask you about, about them. These are questions. By the way, look who's moderating the debate. Hundreds of millions of dollars. There are documented immigrants in America who are paying more federal income tax than a billionaire. I, want... I find so that let me just tell you, astonishing. Person. We're entitled, because of the laws that people like her pass, to take mass. This is what I wanted to show you. So, she's right. She's calling him out correctly and saying, you pay no federal income taxes. It's disgusting. You shit on undocumented immigrants who pay more into the very same systems than you do as a billionaire. Okay, she's completely right. Look at what Donald Trump says here. And Donald Trump is completely right with his answer. Watch. This We're entitled, like because of the laws that people like her pass, to take massive amounts of depreciation and other charges, and we do it. And all. So this was something that Obama did in the recovery efforts in 2008, where the rollover tax credits that you could get on your reported losses to stimulate the economy, Obama changed that from two years to five, I believe which helped Trump tremendously, okay? Part of the reason why Donald Trump was able to report all these losses and then and then not pay taxes at all is because of Obama and it's because of Hillary Clinton as a senator is what he's pointing out, right? He's saying, you guys built this broken system. So he's right. So when Donald Trump was running for president and he said this, he was right. All of her donors, just about all of them. I know Buffett took hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, Soros, George Soros took hundreds wait, of millions wait. of dollars. Let me just explain. Wait, wait, All no, of her wait, donors, wait, most of her donors Mr. Trump. have done the same. But here's the thing. What did you do when you became president? Now, this is something that we need to be talking about because he is on the money here when he says, you and people like you give people like me and other wealthy benefactors everything. You give us the world, okay? And of course, I'm going to take advantage of it. I'm not an idiot. I'm smart. That's why. And he was right when he said that. But what the fuck did he do as president? This is what you need to hammer in. Because Donald Trump is an outsider and he ran as an outsider, even though he was an insider, technically as a billionaire. And he's still trying to run that same 2016 era outsider narrative right now. But he's not an outsider. He's been the president for the past four years. And guess what? He made that unequal system much worse so joe biden or anyone has been please for the love of fucking allah aziz muhammad jesus christ so the fucking you. buddhist god the moist meter is proudly presented by is a station i know what to expect it gross go ahead and be upfront and honest right away because lying is a sin and sin is gross i don't want to be gross i don't have high expectations when i go into a superhero film anymore i feel like I always know what's coming, I know what to expect, it's the same dish I'm getting served every time for the most part. It feels like most superhero films are algorithmically driven, made following the exact same formula, just copying each other's homework. So going into Blue Beetle, I thought I knew exactly what I was going to get. And it turns out I was right. I, I got pretty much exactly what I was expecting for the most part. That doesn't mean it's bad. I don't think Blue Beetle is bad by any means at all, but this is a movie that you'll watch and you'll recognize, damn, this is just like every other superhero film that's come out recently because it just borrows all of the same shit, even down to like it, like identical scenes from other superhero films. But like I said, I don't think it's horrible by any means. I don't think it's a bad movie. Let's just go ahead and dive into it. I think the best part of the film is actually the family element to it. So Blue Beetle, the main character, Jaime, he and his family are a very core component to the story. And when they're on screen together, I actually think the movie's at its best. 
They are fun. There's great chemistry with every member of the family, and they're all really enjoyable on screen. George Lopez actually does a really good job delivering the comedic bits, and make no mistake, this movie is not light on comedic bits at all. Even during the most intense situations, like murder, they're still cracking jokes about it. So this is the film that very much does not take itself seriously, but there is one scene in particular where they did try and be very emotional, and they fucking nailed it. Like, there's a very emotional scene, I'm not gonna get into spoilers, but every character around that scene, everyone in that moment, crushed it. And it actually made me mad because if they had focused on maybe doing something a little different with a superhero movie, making it actually emotional and maybe a little more hard-hitting as opposed to just falling back on the same tired, quirky, quippy, non-stop, light-hearted, joking characters that every superhero movie follows now, I think it would have been much better. Like, instead of just having so many scenes where a character's like, bro, I just took a luxury dump in that toilet fist bump, like, instead of having every character have all of those moments and have every scene be filled with jokes, if they had instead just really doubled down on being a little more hardcore and having scenes like that one I mentioned, I think this could have been a really great film, or at least a much better one. Especially because they do have elements that would really lend itself well to it. The main villain that Blue Beetle keeps squaring off against is basically just Robot Man when he's fighting. But when he's not fighting, he's a pretty interesting character who has a tragic backstory that I think they really could have expanded upon and fleshed him out and made like a really interesting piece with Blue Beetle and his family and that guy, and I don't want to get into spoilers, but his situation. I think they could have done so much more and made it a lot more unique as opposed to just unrelenting AI generated jokes that they just constantly throw in your face every single second on screen. Anyway, the plot is exactly what you've seen in other superhero films before. It is the same kind of recycled plot you're used to where evil corporation has super secret weapon and it ends up in the hands of the most unexpected person to have it, our main character who just happened to be in the right place at the right time and the Scarab, which is a world-destroying weapon, chooses him as the host. Evil Corporation's obviously not too thrilled about it, they want it back, so they start threatening his family, trying to track him down, then send out their big bad robot killer guy. And uh, there's a main villain behind the robot killer, and I already forgot her name. I'm not going to lie to you. I know her last name's Cord because that's the name of the company. I think her name was like Vivian Cord or Vicky or some shit. I don't know. But that just goes to show you how forgettable of a character she is. Which is a shame because I think the actress is very talented. But she was given actual <laughs> urinal cakes to work with on this one. It, it, her material is bad. Th the way that this villain is written is like the way a Saturday morning cartoon would write a quick villain for a single episode. She just says uh, the standard tropey evil shit like sacrifices must be made and we have to make weapons because weapons make us money and we like money. And also she's like racist. So the character, she doesn't really have any interesting features about herself. She is actually a caricature of an evil person. And she's not really the one they keep squaring off against. She just happens to show up and order people around like, Can you please kill him? Because I need money. And he has the super secret world destroying weapon that I'm going to use for money and machines. Or weapons. Uh, so please, can we, can we kill him now? So I thought she was super lame. Definitely the robot killing assassin guy was the star on the evil side. And now I would like to give a bit of praise here to the visuals because I actually think this is one of DC's better looking movies in terms of its CGI. DC's become synonymous with dog shit CGI. They have really fumbled when it comes to its visuals over the last 10 or so years. They just, they've had some like garbage CGI in a lot of their movies. This one though, I think is pretty good looking, aside from a couple of scenes that got a little wonky, but aside from that, I thought all of the visuals were pretty good looking, and I enjoyed the action scenes here, uh, however, there was not many of them. I really would have liked if they explored the suit's ability to create any weapon that the host can dream up. I would have liked if they explored that a bit more, because he basically just makes air blasters. He makes force pushes, basically. Handheld force pushes. So you just blast, 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 blast. And then when they are about to make cool weapons like swords, he's like, No! Wait a minute! Pump the brakes! That's gonna hurt somebody. That could kill someone. No swords. Just give me more air blasters. And it's like, ugh. 
just roll your eyes it's like jesus christ but i am happy to say in the trailer this isn't a spoiler so it's in the trailer he does make a giant sword which ends up being very cool i just would have liked that they explored that power a bit more with create like more creativity behind it as opposed to just making air blasters forever but yeah the visuals i thought were definitely an improvement over previous dc movies now i mentioned the family is actually the best part but there's something I need to mention about the family. It leads to a big tonal inconsistency between Blue Beetle and the family. And let me explain what I mean. And I don't think it's intentional, by the way. So they're very tight-knit. They're very close. Blue Beetle even has like a very tropey anime moment where the bad guy says, Your love for your family makes you weak. And he says, No, my love for my family, that's what makes me strong. And it's supposed to be very much they are a tight unit. But... The family couldn't be more different from Blue Beetle in how they handle the overall narrative. So Blue Beetle is like fucking Batman, I guess, who is completely opposed to killing. I don't know enough about Blue Beetle as a character in the comics to really opine on that, but there is a scene very early on when he's learning the suit where it's about to kill some of the bad guys that are threatening his family. And he makes a point to say, no, no killing. I'm not a killer. So then he instead just shock blast them gets them with like an air blaster and his family however does not share that same belief his family kills so many people george lopez in particular piles up corpses he impales a man literally impales a guy and he makes a joke about it his grandmother has a gatling gun and she just chops up peppers eight different dudes murdering them in cold blood and then she makes a joke about it, all while Blue Beetle watches. And even he's like cheering her on, like, wow, you really fucked them up, that's great. And he's smiling and, you know, happy about it. But meanwhile, the entire movie has already solidified him as someone who is totally against killing. But he's absolutely fine watching his family kill? I don't know, that just seemed like a, a bit of an oversight. Like, at that point, why not just have Blue Beetle okay with killing in the first place? Overall though, like I said, it's not a bad movie by any means, but... It's a movie that follows the same superhero formula you're used to seeing at this point. So, if you like the standard superhero movie, you'll most likely really enjoy Blue Beetle. And like I said, this is one of DC's better looking movies visually. So, plugging Blue Beetle into the moist meter, I'm just going to give it a nice 60%. I didn't Bro. dislike it. More shit they made, eh? Before I log out, happy birthday, Renee. Thanks for being a real friend, I appreciate it. In this situation, it's hard to say that anyone uh. really prospered. But there was a silver lining that Sir Tony Ray's Twitch exploded in support shortly after he overcame his false accusations. As for Drama Alert, this mess up hardly hindered its growth, as it only lost subscribers for one day and continued its climb through the YouTube ranks like nothing ever happened. As for Keem, though he was doing what he could to fix the situation, like many of his past controversial events, this was thrown into a pile of controversial acts that as time would go on would mostly be forgotten. And that's because the earlier months of 2016 were pretty good for Keem. A little over a month after this most recent controversy, Drama Alert hit 1 million subscribers. But the biggest change happened behind the scenes. As Keemstar explained it, since his time on YouTube, there are some that grew up watching him and now have jobs at YouTube itself. Through this, he was finally able, once and for all, get cleared for promoting that scam several years back. Meaning instead of relying on a loophole of not owning Drama Alert, but being allowed to appear on it, he was now granted ownership of the channel and is able to manage it without constraints. Not only that, YouTube was changing in a way that used drama alert faster than it ever has. As 2016 is remembered as a heavily drama-laden year, with the likes of Leafy is here and H3H3 battling it out, there was much to cover, and it helped drive views as much as you'd expect to a channel called Drama Alert, with each of King's videos averaging on the lower end 500,000 views, and on the higher end well over a million. But with 2016 being such a drama-laden year, Keemstar eventually found himself stuck in the center of it, and not in the way he preferred. It was all sparked through one of the business ventures Keem was doing outside of Drama Alert. 
While he was still diversifying his revenue streams through merch, live streaming, sponsorships, esports, and various other avenues, he was also helping establish events between content creators when necessary. One of these events was meant to be a boxing match between iDubs, a rising content creator known for reviewing strange Kickstarters, and more recently his Content Cop series where he called out what he and many other agreed to be lazy or scandalous content on YouTube. And that's where Jinx and iDubs' content comp on him came in criticizing his reaction content. Things escalated between the two, and a boxing match was planned with Keemstar setting up the event for March 4th. And though Jinx was combative on Twitter and eager for the match, he never showed up, making iDubs the automatic victor. And that's why Keem and iDubs were in touch. Also around this time, Keemstar's Alex video was making its seasonal return, fueled mostly by his recent controversy with Sir Tony Ray. Idubs noticing this tweeted out the Alex clip, but instead of leaving it there, Keemstar private messaged Idubs asking not to use that clip or he will have to ruin Idubs' career like he's done with other content creators that appeared on Drama Alert. Though Keem says this was a joke, Idubs definitely did not take it as one and had something bigger, mayhaps in retaliation, in the works. And that is the most effective and memorable expose on Keemstar. And that's saying much, considering the existence of all these exposés on him already. So about halfway through the year, on May 5th, 2016, iDubs dropped Content Cop Keemstar. What made this video vastly different from the rest is that where most exposés on Keemstar focus on specific events rather than analyzing Keemstar's character, like easy to denounce events such as the Alex situation or his misinformation on Sir Tony Ray, iDubs instead analyzed Keemstar on a day-to-day -day basis and not truly on its low points, as he showcased what he deemed to be Keemstar's consistent hypocrisy and manipulativeness through several points throughout the video, with examples taken through his Twitter rants and drama alert. An example is how outwardly it may seem that Drama Alert is meant to be a non-biased news show, but in reality, the way Keemstar typically reports stories is based on the relationship with the other person. This coupled with his constant instigation on Twitter to have creators appear on his show or continue to receive his mass spreading up rumors painted Keemstar as an even more unfavorable person. There are a lot of reasons to call Keemstar a hypocrite. I'm going to focus on one reason, the reason that I find most compelling. My objective isn't go destroy their life on Dromler. I don't use my platform that way. You know how they've been contacting me saying that you've been dating some like 14 year old French girl and shit? Just please swing at me. If you're gonna swing at me, swing at me, dude. Let me know because I got a fucking files on top of files to swing back at. I don't use my platform that way. I don't use my platform that way. I don't use my platform that way. Because I got a fucking files on top of files to swing back at. Well, that was extremely blatant. You said you don't use. Panic and desperation at the Cincinnati Zoo. A four year old boy slips into the zoo's gorilla habitat and over a moat wall. Suddenly, Harambe, a 17-year-old, 400-pound gorilla approaches the boy. His mother watches in horror at what happens next. Is that so much to-
to ask Harambe. Harambe. I wake up in the morning thinking I've way to the bottom. Here is just a really strong neodymium magnet, and a while ago I decided to see what would happen if I blasted it with a blowtorch. It honestly didn't look like it did very much, but what was interesting was that once it had cooled down, it was no longer a magnet, and it was just a heavy piece of junk.
think there's something wrong with me because all I see is death. Smoke weed every day. Smoke weed every day. Go motherfucking damn! Go motherfucking damn! <laughs> Smoke crack cocaine all motherfucking night. This is what happened to your ass. God motherfucking damn. Motherfucking damn, we had CNC groceries. God damn, you ugly than a bitch. You look like an orangutan, bitch. God motherfucking damn. Look at that nigga head. He better get some pussy. Oh my God. Rick Ross. Bitch, you need to come out with a new CD, ugly ass nigga. You eating with that Adolf Hitler. What are you eating? About to get me some monkey tails. Monkey what? Monkey ankles and tails. Ma let me see. God motherfucking damn. God motherfucking damn. You, know that look. you look like a monkey yourself, bitch. Follow Chester Stone 745 or I'm gonna put my foot in your ass, bitch. God damn, let me go in this store and see what's going on. God motherfucking damn. God motherfucking damn. This bitch drinking beer all motherfucking day. This bitch was knocked out in front of the store. Now he looking for some more beer. God damn, nigga. You ain't had enough beer, bitch? Huh? Nigga, you need it all. Go over here with the cold beer at. The cold beer over here, bitch. All that cold. God damn, bitch. This nigga fucked up. You got to see. You need to motherfucking stop drinking, bitch. Go get your beer, nigga. Go. God motherfucking damn. The Don Dada. With it be God damn, look at that nice BMW. Can I borrow that BMW, nigga? God motherfucking damn. Let me go to the store and see what I can get. God motherfucking damn. The Don Dada, bitch. And the nigga using the goddamn U Haul. Nephew, how many pounds you gonna put in the back of that bitch? God motherfucking damn. Chester Stone 745, nigga. I love you, nigga. What the fuck is that smelling so good in that bitch? God damn. God motherfucking damn! Look at my nephew, bitch! Nephew! What's up? What's up Tell the girl something. Look at this nephew. shit! Nephew! Nephew, drop a hundred on the ground, bitch! You the darn daughter, nigga! Excuse me, sir. You need to purchase a shirt, nigga! You need a shirt, nigga! God motherfucking damn! Nephew, I put some money to it. Look, wait, I got 50 cent. You wanna you would need 50 cent, nephew? Huh? God damn. Nephew, you know you the Don Don. Look at that nigga sneaker. God damn, that nigga got it going on. Look at that nigga going in his pocket, pull out that big ass knot. God damn it, nigga went to the club. Nigga, I seen you at the strip club last night, nigga. God damn, look at that nigga. Rich little bitch. God motherfucking damn. It's a beautiful day in Tampa Bay. Look at the ice machine. Boigua, you getting some water, bitch. God mother, oh my God. The motherfucking Don Dada. Look at this nigga. Tell the girls what you dealing with in the music business. Man, what's up, man? Come on, talk loud. Stone, what's up, man? What's up? Talk about you, nigga. Man, nigga, I want to get on your next CD, nigga. Because hey. you the Don Dada, bitch. I want to put some hooks on this nigga shit. You know I need one of hooks. Yeah, I need a hook? You know I need one It go a little something like this. If a boy test me loud, they must get fucked. Chop off him and I'm put it in the truck. Send it on the dump. Make it pop up. But you number one, bitch. I'm fucking damn. Yeah, boy, you see me out here straight out the Bronx. 114K, you feel me? Get your money up straight. Gold champion size. Fuck with a nigga, you heard? God damn. Nephew, can you donate some marijuana, please? I'm out here. God, yeah, motherfucking damn. Yeah, okay, nephew, let's go. Here, nephew, on. come on, let's go. Niggas nephew, Niggas let's go. Here. Come on, nephew. Nephew, give me a ride in your BMW. That's, that's your Where your car at? Your Where your BMW at? Nigga, my BMW at? God, motherfucking damn. So I say, Mr. Monkey, Mr. Monkey, could you please give me a piece of that banana? The monkey said, hell no, nah, nigga. You need to plant a banana tree and get your own. Get your own, bitch. God motherfucking damn, nigga. God motherfucking damn. That nigga bought a G-Man, bitch. But you ain't buying no no Chester1.com. Nah, Chester1.com, nigga. Hey, nephew. You forgot, you forgot, nephew, you forgot to buy album pick, bitch. What do you say, bitch? Fuck you, nigga. Ugly ass motherfucker. That nigga so ugly, he look like an extraterrestrial. From the Monkey Way Galaxy, bitch. God motherfucking damn. That 
that nigga Junior can tell a lie. He tell a lie. I tell a lie. Then we compliment each other's lie. One time this nigga told me the story about the two niggas with the biggest dick in the world. So they were called walking across the Golden Gate Bridge. Seen all that water, made him want to piss. Go the nigga pull this thing out. Go the nigga pull this thing out. The nigga say, damn, that water cold. The other nigga say, yeah, any deep too, bitch. God motherfucking damn. The Munchkins. The Munchkins. We're off to see the wizard, the wonderful Wizard of Oz. Warning, warning, do not purchase anything on ChesterStone1.com or anything on the dot com with Chester Stone's name on it. They done hack my shit and they're gonna rip your black ass off. White, Chinese, whatever you are. Do not fuck with ChesterStone1.com. Warning! Motherfucking damn, I'm looking for them crackers. I'm looking for them motherfucking crackers. I'm looking for them crackers, excuse me. God motherfucking damn, there they go, bitch! Rich crackers! God motherfucking damn! God motherfucking damn, we need some doctors, some lawyers for the new generation. It's 2020. 2020! We need you young kids to open up some goddamn businesses and be doctors and lawyers and shit. No! No! Well, what do you want to do? I just want to play baseball, boss! Baseball! God motherfucking damn! This the season to be jolly, fa la 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 la. This the season to be jolly, fa la 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 la. Ho ho ho! I'm Santa Claus, and I'm bringing what you asked me to bring you for Christmas. Here you go, buddy. So goddamn Brillo in the stem, bitch. Brillo in the stem. God motherfucking damn! God damn! There go my nephew! Nephew! Is this your girlfriend? God motherfucking damn! Chester Stone, when you coming out with the dog hoodies, bitch? The motherfucking dog's hoodie, nigga. I want a dog hoodie, bitch. Cause dogs are better friends than niggers. God motherfucking damn. God damn, nigga, you ain't better nigga. I want a dog hoodie, bitch. Cause dogs are better friends than niggers. God motherfucking damn. God damn, nigga, you ain't gonna pass the blunt, bitch. Pass the goddamn blunt, nigga. God motherfucking damn, nigga. <coughs> Where you get this loud from, bitch? <coughs> God motherfucking damn. <coughs> Man, that nigga finna kill me with this shit. Take this shit back, nephew. That shit good than a bitch. God motherfucking damn. Oh shit, let me hear you play a tune. Come on, dude. I got to get away. I got to get away, yeah. I got to get away, hey. I got to get away, hey. I got to get away from a nigga today. God motherfucking damn. To the right, to the right, to the left. God motherfucking damn. The John got a bitch. people we gonna come together and unify put our resources together connect with mother africa build ourselves up economically open up stores and business that's what we're gonna do unite we're gonna unite wait a minute boss wait a minute boss what in the fuck is unite what does that mean god motherfucking damn nigga don't even know the definition of unity what you doing today Ain't it a cold day? Where you going? You need to go to the store, put some lotion on them rusty bitches. God motherfucking damn! I look. How do I look? With the god motherfucking damn t-shirt, bitch. Even a dolphin no motherfucker. <laughs> oh, goddamn Super D, I feel so bad. 
I feel for you like Shaka Khan, I'm the Don. Pussy when I walk, Rolex on the arm, bitch. God, motherfucker, damn, look at this shit, nigga. God damn, the girls on fleek too, bitch. God, motherfucker, damn. Nephew, drop a hundred on the ground, bitch. Let me smoke with you, bitch. God, motherfucker, damn. Hey, 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 hey. Chester Stone, 745. God motherfucking damn. I'm finna go somewhere and get away from niggers and shit. Cause I got my motherfucking blunts, bitch. I got that motherfucking natural lead, motherfucker. Oh my God. This nigga finna jack me. Nephew here. You can have it. Nephew, please don't beat my ass. God motherfucking damn. God motherfucking damn. Look at this nigga, bitch. God damn. Excuse me, sir. Can I have one of your tattoos, please? God damn. Right on, y'all. God bless you. Motherfucking damn. Oh, my God, baby. You look like Miss Black America. Can I get your autograph? Huh? Fine, little bitch. Hey, tell your mama I'm going to suck the paint off her toenails. God damn, because you all freak, bitch. God motherfucking damn. Bitch, you need to get that iPhone SE at Metro, motherfucker. Chester Stone 745, god damn it, doing it again. Chesterstone1.com. Purchase that shit. But make sure you come to Metro on North 22nd in East Martin Luther King, bitch. God motherfucking damn. I got that. Right, right, right here, right here. God motherfucking damn. Yeah. That nigga got red, white, and blue, bitch. God <laughs> Yeah, brother. You love black people. Sure, I love black people. Wow. Amazing. I'm telling you. <laughs> Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not for the wall and you love black people. After I had to force you by asking you 10 times, you finally said, yeah. Do you recognize mm -hmm. there's a difference between being able to mm -hmm. like people individually versus liking groups of people because of a reason? I'll repeat that. If I were to ask you, do you like gamers? What would you say? I love all people. All people? Yeah. Okay. Totally love all people. All right. Um, I have a question for you from somewhere. Hold on one minute. What if you criticize black for the lack of moral character? Uh, would you criticize black people for the most, not all, not all, not all, but would you criticize most black people for the lack of character? No, I wouldn't target a group of people by their skin color to criticize for them. How about black people? No. Uh, do you agree with me that there's no such thing as racism, sexism, homophobiaism, Islamophobiaism, dead be dadism, or white supremacism? Do you agree with me that those things don't exist? It just has everything to do with the lack of character? I mean, it can have to do with lack of character and both exist at the same time. Those, do you agree with me that those things do not exist? No, of course, those exist? things absolutely exist in the world. You believe racism exists? Yeah, of course. Are you a racist? No. How come you're not? You're a white man. Okay. Why are you a racist? Just because I'm white doesn't mean I have to be racist. But they, they think, though. They think all white people are racist. They even think you are racist. That's Some why you are. Think the you earth are, is flat. Yeah, it doesn't mean I think that as well. So are you okay? Yeah, racist. Mm. Yeah, yeah, racist. You go to the gym? Yeah, I do. We go to the same gym that you want, you got kicked out of. I don't go. I don't go to that gym anymore. Anyway, it's you too stopped boring. going because they threw me out. No, I. Yeah, I, I boycott yeah. Equinox because they kicked you out. <laughs>
Should I call you uh, Woke Bay or Hassan? Whatever, whatever suits you. Whatever you want to call me, I'm fine with that. And why you call Woke Bay? Um, I think it's a heavily commoditized marketing term. It has nothing to do with like anyone's personality or whatever. It's just like an era where everyone is woke or not woke. I don't necessarily agree with the concept or with the with the being called that. But BuzzFeed calls you that. That's a big deal, right? I mean, BuzzFeed calls a lot of people a lot of things, right? And so you don't believe them? I mean, I guess, I mean, I just don't know what the, uh, what the concept of wokeness entails. Oh, uh, what do I want to watch? I don't know. with the fermented fish and, and spoils it even more. You, you Swedish people are crazy. I don't want to get too much of that juice in there. We don't want a leaky fermented fish sausage after all. You get, get extra, extra bone in there. That's what they always say makes a good sausage. Oh, you know what? That tastes, um, 
bad. Pretty solid Duke on the paper. I'm gonna have to give that while I blow three Mark Ruffalos! I lit a candle to cover up the smell and it is not working. So we're going to plan B. Now it smells like uncontrollable diarrhea and original citrus. Oh, halfway done. They're looking strange. So good news and bad news. The good news is the, the sausages no longer stink like fermented fish. They look good. They smell like a normal smoked sausage, so good for us. The bad news is the basement smells 100% like the Sherstrom and still. Well, 90, 99% Sherstrom and 1% poopery. The poopery is in, is in a losing battle. I mean, I bleached the table. So the stink is not coming from that. My only guess is that I got some of the juice on the ceiling beams. And if that's the case, that smell ain't never coming out. Uh, but, uh, you know, let's, uh, oh! Oh, it's on the floor. That's going to be now our cut open sausage. Ew, so let's uh, open it up and see how we did. Oh, there's a little bit of that fermented smell, but it's not too bad. All right. Here we go! Not terrible. Not terrible in the slightest. It kind of tastes like fishy bacon. There, there's definitely a, a fish gone bad aftertaste to it, though. We did ourselves a solid by including the pork. You know, I hate to say it, but it's pretty good. It's definitely an acquired taste. It's a strong taste. It tastes all right to me. Smoking it was absolutely... Thank you. Uh. You don't use your platform that way, but then you threaten to use your platform that way. But I dubs the Keemstar Twitter account and Drama Alert are two separate entities. I try to keep my show fair and balanced, but on Twitter, I'm gonna give my opinion. I heard you're a pedophile. 14-year-old French girl? Mm, pedophile. I, I have the taste of pedophile come in my mouth. I'm on the hunt. Thinking about it logically. You want big YouTubers to come onto your program after you harass them on Twitter, so how are you gonna get them to come on your program? Oh, I know. You suggest that if they don't come on your program, they're not innocent. The situation turns out where a big YouTuber comes on because he's innocent. Of course, that's just part one. We gotta think about the second part logically as well. If you are a small YouTuber, you're gonna get a big fucking sub boost from it. And guess what? I won't let you fucking forget it. I will hold that shit over your head. If, if you fucking blink in my direction, I'm gonna hold that shit over your head. Along with other examples of King's hypocrisy and explaining King's general aggression, Idubs also succeeded in making it entertaining in a way that while it did carry many serious points, it also served to mock Keemstar. Because the first about 4 or so minutes of the video is him tracking down and wrestling a garden gnome. Though that insult wasn't started by Idubs, it was solidified by him, which is why enemies of Keem still refer to him as a garden gnome. As for the effect that this video had on Keemstar's channel, if we look at Social Blade for that time, we can see that it did absolutely nothing. In fact, Keemstar gained more subscribers than usual around this time. But as the video got more and more viewership, its influence started to take effect. The big difference this time, to the many other times the masses have gone against Keemstar, is that now his influential friends start turning on him. How it's usually remembered is that IW's content cop was the sole instigator in this situation. But the reality is, there were already many exposés attacking Keemstar prior to IW's video. His video was just the straw that broke the camel's back. The next biggest expose video on Keemstar came out a little over a month later by Pyrocynical, an ex-friend of Keem's. Star also does this really cancerous thing where he'll accuse someone of something or make something up and then when he's called out he'll say that someone told him or people have been telling him which basically gives him a line of defense for some bullshit that he just made up five minutes ago. Pyro is threatening me with all this shit on Skype because I showed his picture. Play that again. You know how they've been contacting me saying that you've been dating some like 14 year old French girl and shit? Dating some like 14 year old French girl and shit? 
14 year old French girl and shit. 14 year old French girl and shit. No, if anyone didn't notice that, he just deliberately lowered the age. No, originally this alleged girl was 15, and now Keemstar has lowered the age to 14. Probably to make it sound even more impacting and incriminating. And guess what? Later on stream, he lowered the age again to say the girl was now 13. And on top of that, basically insinuating that I was a pee. Hey, Pyro was trying to hook up with a 13-year-old fr uh, girl from France. All right, that he was technically like a P or a weirdo or something, right? So this man has lied about the age of this girl on two separate occasions. And knowing Keemstar, this girl will probably be an embryo by next week. Weirdly enough, this video is almost exactly the same length of Idus's content comp. But as for the video itself, beyond the changing of mood towards Keemstar, this video seemed to have been instigated by Keem's constant rumor spreading on Pyro Cynical, as seen in the video. Also, Keem tweeted out Pyro's face, which was mostly unknown at the time. Mostly unknown because a few months back, Pyro's face was revealed with consent on a video that got over a million views, something that Pyro failed to mention. As for what caused the falling out in the friendship, Keemstar, whenever he hears that someone said something bad about him to any degree, he will usually go on offense. And that's where things usually snowball. A small criticism towards Keem, if it's said behind his back, can turn into a feud that will last several years. The difference now is that Keemstar was being watched very closely, and he couldn't get away with attacking other creators as viciously as he had before. Also, with Pyro's video coming out, Keemstar was finally starting to lose subscribers, and he was weakened enough for other, less effective Keemstar expose videos to be made, which is typical for any sort of cancellation. Or even those with the smallest interaction with the council person will make their own video to rake in views and add more to the massive amount of noise already being made. But the extreme levels of videos being made against Keemstar became exhausting extremely fast, as it almost became a meme to post a Keemstar expose video, due to the fact that many of these ineffective videos recycled Keemstar's old but popular controversial clips. There were also some that covered lesser known clips like when Keemstar fought someone or him shoving ice cream in what he claims to be a child actor's face. A skit done for the Bad Kids cast that Keem actually refused to upload because he later saw how bad it made him look, but Blade uploaded it anyway. As for what many saw as the most distasteful of these lesser known clips, was Keemstar, during a beef with content creator Total Biscuit, said that he can't wait to report on his death. Hmm, can't wait to report your death! Ha <laughs> ha! Though Keem said it in jest, these words stuck with many, as Little Biscuit several months ago announced that he was suffering from a terminal cancer. Back to the cancellation itself, one of, if not the worst part of this for Keem was having his close friends betray him. The worst offender being Leafy, who admittedly distanced himself from Keemstar as a business decision. These past few months, he's honestly just gone fucking insane. Here's a perfect example. A certain YouTuber by the name of Colossal is Crazy made a tweet saying he's gonna make a video about Keemstar. And how does Keemstar respond to this? Get this, by threatening to release his personal info on where he fucking lives. You're obsessed with me. I have a portfolio of all your tweets mentioning me. When your personal video hits, expect a response. Docs too. Even Bashiverse, the content creator with a troubled past that Keemstar later helped build up, jumped on the bandwagon of Keemstar hate, which crushed Keem even further. On to lawyers in Kentucky, and we've asked about taking this to court. They have absolutely no idea about the internet. Every time I've gone to legal representative, they're absolutely blown away that people can make money off of YouTube. That's how out of the loop they are. Me and Clara need help. Like so much freaking help right now. And we don't know what else to do or where to turn. Last time we tried to do this, somehow Keemstar found out and then threatened to spread more rumors about random girls to destroy me. If you wish to help us, please spread this video. I need someone in legal to see this and help us because we have no idea how to go about this or even where to start. We love every single one of you who have stuck by our sides this whole time and never left. So, seriously, thank you. Hey, listen, Basher. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Is that you thought you were a fucking genius manipulator.
the subject, in my point of view of it, than ever before. Because I got you to react to me. And I got you to play victim to me. And I got you to pander to your audience. And now that they're paying attention, this whole forget him and ignore him would have worked if you would have done it right away. But now that you have it, I got your fans' attention. How good of a manipulator. To give us some more insight on Keem's old controversies, this cancellation, and a bit of context of future things Keem would go through, I interviewed content creator Tommy C. SFTP, who would later host a podcast with Keem. Considering what um, Basher had done, that he, you know, Keem was responsible for reducing him, and he reduced him because he, th he felt like he was getting kind of a raw deal from his girlfriend. I think he thought maybe, um, I don't know the details of, you know, whatever had happened when he was a kid, he was 18, 19 years old, maybe that was a mistake. You know, we'd find on that there would be a pattern, but we didn't know this at the time. Uh, and certainly Keem didn't know that at the time. Uh, and uh, you know it was a you know it was a give and take relationship. They both got a lot more famous. It's one of the greatest stories in drama alert history between him and Basher. And I can say that he was personally hurt um, when Basher, had, had, like I said during the leak, he said, "I need money," and I need money because you know he was the most hated person on the internet uh, to go sue Keem Star, and it was probably a scam of some sort. He never did. And he disappeared off the internet until about 2019. Um, disappeared again and uh, unfortunately passed away recently. There is no doubt that Kim will now be on edge and even more defensive when it comes to his inner circle after this betrayal. As to show the collaborative efforts against Keemstar, Leafy, Pyrocynical, Grady Underay, Vex, and IW's videos got views in the multi millions. Kim did make efforts to fix his image by justifying and apologizing for his actions in a 51 minute video uploaded Drama Alert in June of 2016. First, Keemstar addresses one of the biggest, earliest expose videos by a channel that goes by Chosen. That's right, encouraging suicide. This already highlights a massive problem with the video Keem is making. He does address many of his mistakes, like when he docks the content creator's Skype, or other lesser known rants where Keem starts trolling and insulting other people while using things like their race to attack them, or how he reported the false allegations that hurt Toby Turner's channel severely. Though he fails to address everything, but it's not like these expose videos did a much better job as most of them were poorly made and lacked much context and research. But with Keemstar's style of video, everything needed to be addressed and put out there. Like in the beginning of Chosen's video, there's a Twitter screenshot of Scare saying Keemstar DM'd him his parents' house address. And with there being much evidence of Keemstar doxing in the past, his intentions were most likely not good here. At least that's what we can go off of because Keem never addressed it. He does address the Alex situation, but more importantly, the clip of saying he hates his fans, which he says was a joke, but it's actually more probable that he doesn't remember the situation. So, I, I think what I noticed, right, at least, he confuses timelines a lot. So, that became satirical. Mm -hmm. that, that initial clip was, like, what started it all. And what happened was, because, like, he, he makes a bunch of, like, trolling videos, and he, then he started he trolling online. Yeah. Do a live stream, and then, like, fans mm -hmm. kept, like, joining in and being assholes and ruining, like, the, the whole trolling thing. So, because he, he couldn't troll, like, fans, because they mm -hmm. were running, right? Well, I showed that video to him in 2016, and I can attest, I swear, my kids, he said, I don't remember, I've made so much bullshit over the years. And this is what he said privately to me. I don't know when I said that. Is I keep seeing it, but at the time he couldn't remember. It. And then I had a fan approach me. He told me that he was on with the Basher, and they were fooling around. And that clip was really out of context. That's why I've never seen the evidence. But, but when I sh when, when that clip was flowing around, floating around during the Great A under A and Leafy situation, he told me, and it sounded legitimate, and it wasn't a private phone call that he simply didn't remember saying that, and he doesn't he doesn't even know what it was. This happens quite a bit with Kim, being that he's been on the internet for so long that his day-to-day -day activities can be difficult to remember because they're so packed full of traumatic events. So it's very believable that he genuinely believes he was joking when he later watched the video and was relying on others' information to fill in the blanks. 
but relying on others is a very dangerous thing to do online, or worse, when running an online news channel, like what happened with Sir Tony Ray or the accusations against Power 7. It should be mentioned that prior to releasing this video, after losing 200,000 subscribers and scarce being promoted so much as Keemstar's competitor that he gained 1 million subscribers, it was a not. And for what seemed to be the first time, Keemstar left the internet. In the meantime, he had another content creator covering for him while he went on a retreat with close friends and drink. So when he returned a little over a week later, he released that video, and for the most part the hate was dying down, or it was at least reduced to what it was prior to his retreat. This event almost fully got Keemstar off the internet, but on the other end, there were still many things keeping him on. Not just considering his passion for his new show, but also his podcast that went by the name Faded, hosted mainly by Keemstar, who also is crazy that greatly opposed Keemstar, and Tommy C, who was the moderator. While we won't delve too much into this podcast, I will recommend Turkey Tom's video covering it. The main takeaways is that it helped Keemstar make amends with many content creators like Leafy is here that now had the shared experience of being the subject of a content cop. Right. So a lot of hate jumped from Keemstar to Leafy. But uh, refocusing Keemstar on, and his uh, post-cancellation, just like making maps he right that now. when he returned, he embraced the bias. Going around the... Uh, in yeah, the end, it is his channel, and it like can be understandable rivers, that things uh, that he hyperfixates on are also the things he wants to report like, uh, on. And now that all his dirty laundry the was meticulously picked at by the internet for a month... You know. You can kill some. Um, eight hours, um, something like that, maybe. content at the same time so it's not been so boring uh a little bit very very <laughs> uh just a little bit i was uh, looking at christian content and stuff saddle there's uh, one black horse there if you want to take the saddle up on him I made myself a really 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 good meal A mule. You know what a mule is? Yeah, I got one of those. It's quite good. I recommend you get one for yourself as well. If we're not going to have any home commands or anything, it's gonna be good to have some extra inventory space if you're going around. Yeah. Ow. 
just drop down <coughs> my holes a little bit. Um, this is that fire resistance on a spider. It's weird. I like that they give buffs to spiders as well by like giving them potion effects. This is my trusty steed, he goes very quick. I think you meant to say African American. That's how I got my saddles. We need more of them. I really like my meal. It's very quick. Oh, uh, yes. You see why? Level 30. No. There. There's also another fishing spot. is coming to hug me. You, you just uh, you just had uh, a fish try to go Just keep it in the water. This is not like fucking Pokemon, okay? Like it, keep get it to you have to have patience with this. It takes time for it to come. Now it's coming. I'm supposed to be trying to get level 30 so that I can get multi shots and then I can have uh, an emergency um, rapid fire fucking okay, uh, crossbow uh, fireworks. Yeah, bas basically, uh, if, there's a, if there's a huge, huge, huge bunch of enemies which I can't deal if I'm in a corner, then I can just clear them away. 
It's it's a it's a range it's the ranged AOE, you know. We don't have any arranged AOEs other than that in this game. Well, and well, there is the potions, but that's like not really ranged. Oh well, do you have you have um uh those uh tipped arrows? Those are AOE. Okay. Those are very small, very small AOE. For the love of God, stop saying AOE. Um, you're free to use my um, ass to breed. Looting too. Looting um, when you kill up enemies, it gives you more uh, loot from the world. Like it, it, uh, it gives the chances are heightened. So if you're like trying to get a wither skeleton skulls, then you get m m more of a chance to get wither skeleton skulls. Looting too, like basically basically doubles the chances. Oh yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah, so if you wanna, if you have, uh, uh, if you're gonna go and kill animals, like for meat and stuff, then you want to have looting on your sword as well, as fire aspect probably. That's a, this is actually like top tier. This is this is something that I didn't even have on my sword last time. I played. It's uh, quite rare to get it actually. Is this for me or what's the thing? What's going on? You throw you threw it at me, so is this for me or run? Go. Let me get this on. If we get any tropical fish, do keep them as well. They're quite good for us. We need them for uh, breeding axe mm. muscles. They are quite rare. Do you know anything about axolotls? Do you want to know anything about them? So axolotls are basically like lizards that never grew into adulthood. They still have uh, gills and uh, everything. They, they're basically forever young. And they also can regenerate limbs and everything. Sign, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my lead next to it, and it's gonna say, "You can use my ass to breed."
this, this is actually pretty good. God, no, you're okay. I'm making. Oh, oh, yeah. You, you have to uh, set your bed. Uh, I think as well. Like, uh, you have a, you have it, you have it in a weird corner right now. You can't sleep uh, where it is right now, but it's just that it's. I put our beds uh, in a certain way, and yours is a different way right now. Body spray. Oh. So you see how our, our beds are? And like this, and you can see outside your own window. So you can do that with yours. Yeah. And I, I can do a nice decoration sign for you. I can, I can do the same. Looks pretty okay. That fucking chasm that I almost uh, died in is absolutely huge. I, I couldn't cl uh, clip it well. So I realized that I didn't have any sound, so I gave up. My microphone didn't work, but it was a pretty, pretty amazing, pretty amazing drop and a pretty fucking tense situation. Yeah. Uh, five hours and four to six minutes. And no one has come here, so it's like, oh yeah, I don't care whether the people don't come to be honest. Like, yeah, it's mainly for that. I mean, this this is um, I'm trying to document the sort of uh, process of uh, us building this uh, thing. I'm trying to make this like a long long term thing that is also being sort of documented in some way. So if people who are gonna come and fucking watch a little bit, then they can come, but. Why am I still getting hate? Viewers and creators had a full grasp of Keem, which gave him a unique immunity and power, because he now had everything mm. out there. 
meaning that any future controversy would be much less impactful as it'd be placed alongside his list of previous controversies. Whoa, Keemstar. I don't know how he got in here. Oh, Keem, Keem, get out, get out. Disappear if uh, it's weird. He comes and goes. I think that I think that uh, Kim starts screaming is uh, a better sort of like um, uh, jump scare uh, than uh, Charlie because it's like it has, it's actually funny. I think. Anyway, it doesn't it doesn't jump scare you, but it's like oh fuck, he's here. I don't like. It. It's so animalistic. It's so animalistic that, like, the very start of it. <laughs> the, the start of it is so good. I love it. It's, it's such a good start. Oh. <laughs> He keeps it going, uh, and then it like starts to waver a little bit. But it's really good. Because he has so many of them. Also, been watching some Keemstar documentary for a As previous as doxing, there was little that could be said that would tarnish his image more than it I'm just doing was. cherry acts. Even viewers can appreciate that you can get a full grasp of Keemstar as opposed to the more clean cut creators. And there is no doubt he brought more himself into drama alert. Regardless, YouTube was a dramatic mess all around in 2016. The viewers knew this, the content creators knew this, and it's been revealed that apparently YouTube knew about this too and were extremely worried about how it was negatively affecting the platform, and therefore the companies that advertised on it. I got this information through an interview with Pescator, a seemingly controversial figure within the community that was the head of the Drama Alert news team from mid-2017 to 2019. They had to call in a special little conference back Drama back Alert Nation now over 1 million. 283,000 subscribers. They were, they were almost, <clears throat> excuse me, they were almost gonna uh, delete their channels, or I think at least get rid of their, the YPP, the YouTube partner program. I think they were gonna get rid of their... I guess I'll put looting on my soul then, if you don't mind. It is going to benefit us a little bit. The diamond sword. No, I did not. I got more diamonds and I didn't replace yours. Uh, kind of. What I, what I, what I, what happened was, is that I was supposed to go and get a bunch of wood uh, uh, with this diamond axe. And I didn't get any. Well, I did take get some, but I didn't really like get a huge, huge amount, which I was supposed to. So, yeah. I do feel like I do feel like uh, I should replace them at some point. Prefer, prefer be, prefer, prefer be before you had come, but. Uh, Apparently, regrets only comes in after, afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to come. I'm about to neon.
not quite. Don't have any arrows to spare really. Oh, but it did get kind of close. I'm just quietly trying to assassinate you from afar, don't worry. You are not him. I don't think I'll hit this one either. I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'm not really, really trying, but I guess this is my last arrow, so maybe this one will hit. Oh, was I was using, I, I was, I was using, I was using Optify uh, to zoom in. It was a bad idea. Yeah, I, um, I do cheat on my spouse. Boy life. What do you mean? A name tag! Holy shit! That's dude. I wanna I wanna I wanna name my thing. I wanna name things. Can uh, use my ass to breed. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'll give you full iron armor. I don't know. So so no no. What should I what should I do, Daddy? Should I name? I do have my favorite horse already. Um. Who the fuck is John Brown? Uh, oh yeah, I, oh this one, yeah, yeah, I like him. I like John Brown. John Brown, uh, during the um, uh, Civil War in America, John Brown was a abolitionist, uh, this, um, like a person who went around um, the South and like um, uh, helped uh, black people uh, from like get, getting away from slavery. Oh, nice. Nice, nice. He, uh, he, sorry. A shell. A what? Oh, an Altula shell. Oh, we got a fish. Um, yeah. He was 
was fighting in the bleeding of Kansas. Uh, he was eventually captured and executed for a failed incitement of a slave rebellion at Harpers Ferry, preceding the American Civil War. So he actually, before the Civil War, he was uh, trying to free slaves in the South. He was a pretty, pretty good guy. What about him? Is this, this is, I just, um, I, I wanted to um, uh, give a name to my mule. And it is a brown mule, so I'm gonna name him John Brown. My lovely, my lovely mule. He has pockets. I even put a lead in his pocket so that I can you know, I can lead him anywhere I want. I think we had our first thunderstorm here um, and uh, the lightning struck on that lightning conductor thing that we have. Uh, not really. Uh, I went under it in our house and nothing happened. It was all good. But it did, um, like, change. It, 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 like, opened those trapdoors for some reason. I don't know what that... I don't want that to happen. Poggers? I'm thinking maybe I should get rid of some of these cows. The sort of point of these cows was to use all of the wheat that I got from the villages to make more cows, so that the purpose has been fulfilled, so... AdSense, but they didn't at the time. Later on, they did it to Leafy. But Keen, you know, smart enough to know I've got to change. I've got to, you know, I've got to change with this platform. So he did. It could have been this that prompted Keemstar to release the initial statement, asking for a friendly environment. But no matter what Keem did, he did not reach the viewership that he had in the earlier months of 2016, as his views were dropping drastically at the end of the year, with his competitor Scares outperforming him every month. Again, this is hardly helped by him being used by other contributors as an alternative to Keemstar. By the start of 2017, though much of the drama around Keemstar had died down, it was very clear that his viewership was dying down a lot of work. So he had yet another problem in front of him. But instead of getting better, things just got worse. Worse than his competition was scarce, and worse than having to reavail his drama alert team. As many remember, 2017 was the year of the because the drama of 2016 was the year before, and the next year of the year of 2017 was made all the more worse. At least on the surface level. This and other questionable actions across YouTube had many advertisers leaving in panic. 
The end result was content creators videos getting demonetized in mass, as YouTube was experimenting with the same algorithm meant to promote and monetize family friendly videos. And because they really needed to build the confidence of advertisers back up, they erred on the side of extreme caution. So many channels that lacked true content saw their paychecks being slashed. Teamstar himself saw only 10% of the revenue being again. Where many creators quit, took breaks, or reformatted their content, Star kept going, and actually for this time period, they removed ads off the video so that the smaller YouTubers could get a small amount of advertisements going to each other. But there was still a benefit in this for you, and that was other creators making scares were struggling to do. To the point that scares stopped making videos for two months. <coughs> Scarer says he left because of family issues. Keemstar says it was most likely money. While it might seem reasonable that during the worst performing months, money wise, I'm just gonna kill all of these cows. This was actually I'm gonna make the extinct. absolute worst time that Scarce could have left. And that's because of the divine invasion of YouTube. With that platform shut down, many of those creators migrated to YouTube, and among those was Jake and Lee Hall. Drama machines that bounced off each other and captivated millions of children while simultaneously annoying millions of adults. Maybe we should Nobody keep one. Community. We should keep one and uh, call it the Alpha Cow. You know, you know what the. Um, do you know about the uh, Norse creation myth? In the beginning, there was a cow, and on and the cow traveled on ice. And what the cow did was lick all the ice away from the world, and then from the ice emerged the giants, and the giants fed upon the cow. So, <laughs> and um. Uh, so well, it, they fed, they fed, uh, they, what I mean is that they like suck the cow's milk. That's what I mean. And, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then, then, um, well, the, mm -hmm. the, the cow just sort of went away. But Ymir, uh, c came from the, 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 the first mm -hmm. giant, the first. A cow, Audumia, nourished him with her milk. Audumia was herself nourished by licking salty, rime covered stones. She licked the stones into the shape of a man. This was Buri, who became the grandfather of the great god Odin and his brothers. They were still in a bit of love. You can all agree on their hatred for the Paul brothers. But not Keemstar. His first video covering Jake was on the Everyday Bro song that introduced Jake to the majority of YouTube. This video's performance was mediocre, but then he covered him again, and again, and again for about seven videos in a row, only interrupted by the video saying that he won't be on Drama Alert for a few days. And for the first time in a year, King's channel was on a climb. Prior to Jake Paul, his videos were getting about half a million views. Post Jake Paul, he was getting a million to three million views per video, just in time for ads to stabilize a bit more, turn them back on, and make hundreds of thousands of dollars. As for how this affected the content itself, it's no secret that Jake Paul harbored a younger audience of children and young teenagers. Possibly in response to this, Keemstar was more animated and less vulgar, which went perfectly when adapting to Jake's younger mm. audience. This also mm. went hand in hand with being more family friendly. Though Drama Alert was outperforming Scarce significantly view-wise, so we got about high, four Scarce still still had about a million more now. subscribers than him. Or but four. just three months later, no, the content passed the Paul Brothers drama, Drama Alert passed Scarce. 
But let's look at the bigger picture. Let's take a look around, at though. the global news rankings on YouTube for this time. A capture for August 29, 2017 shows Drama Alert, according to Social Blade, oh, yeah, sorry. outperforming CNN, Fox, MSNBC, CBS, Fox News, and BBC News. Also, look at my journal and non traditional news channels. There was no argument. Drama Alert was back, and it was back There's on this, top. Uh, Peaking at 61 billion views a month showed again that Keemstar's persistence had once again paid off. Mm. While many of these videos yeah, covering the drama around Jake Paul so were just tense. quickly telling of his videos, there was quite a bit of interviews and information gathered behind the scenes that allowed Drama Alert to get exclusive information and also get stories out faster than other channels. So so there gonna, was a time gonna where in. it was nothing to get 10,000 new subs, off a you know a video just yeah, about Jake Paul being moments. in his house and you know uh, what girls came by you know it was crazy man we had uh, inside sources along that whole road do not sign it I actually had uh, I talked with the lady across the street from the house and uh, courted her as an asset and every day she would tell me exactly what's going on and one morning she, she called me up uh, she DM me and she said. How much would y'all pay me for a picture of uh, a whole team ten lined up in a wall with the cop? Mm -hmm. so we don't pay. We don't pay for stories. It's one thing we don't do. Mm -hmm. so, you know, if you want to give it to us, we'll credit you. Mm -hmm. Whatever. And she said, okay. She sent me that picture of all of team ten lined up against the wall. The book. Uh, with uh, that guy Nick turned when they got swatted. It was uh, one of the greatest pictures I'd ever seen as far as like scandalous and we put that as a thumbnail and he did the whole story he doesn't like doing swatting the stories but he did a story on that and i remember that that video went bonkers it was like almost three million views you would think that one of these drama oriented videos would have been king star's most viewed video of 2017. no that position belongs to the rehashing of his 2012 hit dollar in the woods Fitting the dramatization of the diss tracks floating around at the time, this video eventually got up to 11 million views. As silly as it was, it really helped encapsulate how Keen and Gears Time went from being Walked the most in the woods. Found a dollar, found a dollar, found a dollar, found a dollar in the woods. Becoming more well known and accepted throughout the online community. As hated as he was, he still had more character, energy, mm. and a talent to entertain that most content creators mm. hope to have. He was partly a runner in the woods. He gained even more respect from the community when in December of 2017, he interviewed a squatter. A squatter whose phone call got someone killed. What this sounds horrible, as Keenstar gave a platform to someone like that. But the truth was, Keen and his team had the intention of bringing this person on to get them to confess on the show. To Keen's surprise, it worked immediately. So you, you swatted that address, correct? Sure. Okay, right. so you swatted the address, you <coughs> the fake hostage situation, correct? <coughs> yeah. And then this guy gets killed. <coughs> That's what happened. I but blindsided by this quick submission, Keen, as he claims, struggled to continue the interview. At least in an optimal state. Quick update for those of you that might not know yet. Uh, this is and my main objective with the interview was to get him to verbally confess to what took place. Like that was my only goal. And I had all these strategies and all these techniques that I would pull the truth out of him. But as you saw in the interview, he verbally confessed to it like right off the bat. And then I was just lost. I got so much praise all around the world saying that I did a good job on the interview. But quite frankly, I, I did a really bad job. As soon as he gave me the confession, like I didn't know where to go from there. He asked, I asked him about, you know, do you have parents? He said he doesn't have parents. Like there should have been a follow up question. Like, what do you mean? And then the guy just kept throwing me off by not being remorseful at all or, or sorry for what took place. I, w I was just like at a loss for words. Like my brain. But the following day, Keemstar brought the welcome news that the squatter was arrested, ending the episode by promoting a GoFundMe for the family that held that the squatting. That interview. Now, I want to let my audience know that there is a GoFundMe to help pay for funeral expenses for the family of the victim. That link is the top link in the description of this video.
even if there was a bit of opposition against Keemstar for monetizing that interview and bringing us water on a platform, the majority of viewers appreciated the intention and action of helping get a squatter behind bars, as this is regarded as one of the best things Drama Alert has ever done, ending a strong year with a strong action. Moving on to 2018, while it still did well viewership-wise, no individual month came close to surpassing Drama Alert's peak month the year prior. But if it wasn't obvious then, it was by May 2018, that Keemstar had several revenue streams, and as he expanded them, Drama Alert was an ever-decreasing stream compared to the money he was receiving from his other ventures, namely Friday Fortnite. What many accepted to be the first competitive Fortnite competition that was to happen weekly, with the price point increasing from each weekly airing. Though the specifics of the rules of the tournament are not of extreme importance to this video, the controversies and success of it are. As for how this happened, Keem has always dealt into competitive gaming and gaming teams. Some projects were more successful than others, but Friday Fortnite was his biggest success thus far in that field. It may have been influenced by his newly adapted audience of children and teenagers that tuned in for his continued coverage of the Pablo. You know why I put that totem there, saying that well, horse horses not fair. their trust must never be betrayed. For the sake of entertainment and not to see who was the top Fortnite player. You never leave As them the behind. Began building when Keemstar stated that these events were made. If you're gonna use a horse, if you're gonna, well, if you do, then you have to leave them the onto a post where they're not gonna wander the away and you have to get them back at some point. His Twitter post explaining this did not please the If you do that, then I'm going to kill you. Creating a rich get richer controversy until Fortnite started hosting their own I'm competitive good. events. Still following the format of writing <laughs> yeah, a I'm going to, with the I'm game going to kill you. other successful competitions that pitted popular YouTubers and streamers alike. I'm going to kill you in Minecraft if you kill a horse in Minecraft. This, like its many predecessors, pulled in millions of unique viewers across several streams and also the sponsors of the events like G4, arguably the largest and most memorable sponsor of Keemstar that could be found through a multitude of Keem's projects. But in reality, this is not the actual timeline. A timeline where Keemstar's biggest controversy between 2018 and 2019 was that the selection of creators who starred in its video game competition was biased was not the biggest controversy of this time. There are two major controversies that happen between them, one significantly lesser known than the other. So we'll cover the lesser known one first, and to do that we have to talk about the person at the center of it, Just Destiny, known now as Mori. While we won't delve too much into the situation, I will recommend Nicholas Mori's video where he gives a detailed rundown of what happened. For the sake of brevity, we'll give a quick rundown. Back in February of 2019, Just Destiny was, and still practically is, known as a Leafy Club. But unlike Leafy, he's just focused on daytime television like many other channels around him. Through this, Just Destiny was able to get 1.7 million subscribers. So in the YouTube creator community, he was cemented as one of those many channels filling in the hole Leafy left. But he began to get much unwanted attention when his thumbnails came into question. Usually clickbaiting kids and teenagers that start I'm glad that you can at least While make a leather horse armor. thumbnails were relatively small, they grew ever in size. When he abused YouTube's copyright system to strike down a channel calling him a predator. Not only was this blatant yeah. abuse of the copyright system, Lieutenant Cobra, the channel struck, followed also, you know, to a Lieutenant horse. Cobra was also a very, very small channel that was hosted by a 15-year-old. There are many aspects about this it entire situation that, that, that made Lieutenant Cobra's video extremely unbelievable, and would have Chain been relatively unknown on if just Destiny kind of, let it be. Kind of he even went as far as to send over a cease and desist. Many creators already had an issue with just Destiny's sort of personality like had even more of a reason to hate him, <laughs> as sending only okay, gentlemen taking the prize are among one of the worst things a creator can do to another creator in the online realm. So an already established group of smaller creators took it upon themselves to combat this and spread the words of his abuse. This was a group that also opposed Keemstar, which was practically the entire purpose of the group, which was to grow without Keemstar's influence. But their hatred of Just Destiny was greater than their hatred for Keem, so they let him in with a pretense that he would help take down this copyright abuser. And things went really, really well at first, as Keem invited Just Destiny on a show where he was able to easily counter Just Destiny's points, and made it clear that he made a massive mistake by targeting the smaller channel that though he was slandering him, chose the wrong route to silence him. 
But there was a bit of a slip up on the key's part. When he asked, Seems really weird to me. It's like, t t from the outside looking in, like, it makes me have to ask this question, like, do you yeah. touch kids? The oh, fuck? Yeah. Really? But, but do you? Um, do you touch kids? Do you Stop touch kids? Asking ridiculous questions. Usually when Keemstar paints someone as a predator, he does so on Twitter Keemstar and has like passively. But him asking the question... Keemstar, uh, the stack, uh, asking a, a people, wait, so you're a pedophile? Uh, like, yeah. So somehow in this documentary, it keeps coming out like so very often. Like saying it very often, like uh, people are pedophiles. So sudden made his tactic where he slanders other parties by spreading rumors a bit too obvious. Maybe it was this that reminded the audience of what kind of person. Well, yeah, like uh, who or their general one? disapproval of the know, interview I'm, caused him to lose 3,000 subscribers. Uh, While Keem and other creators were able to get Just Destiny to remove the strike and uh, watch uh, that action. The Lion King, I think. No, I, I, I don't think I don't think that Bashaverse was like a pedophile because he was uh, it was during the time of the controversy it was said that uh, he was 20 and the girl was 17 but it was so that he was 18 uh, oh no no it was no it was so that the, it was here that he was 20 and the girl was 15 and um or, or 13 even but the truth was that uh, it was uh, 18 and 15 and it was like basha had never had any sort of relationship with a, a girl before but it's like you could you can uh, you can understand that it's it was like it was something that happened in the past and like Basha versus his story is really quite tragic when you understand it for the, the whole entirety of it because he is like uh, sort of a loser but it's like his it's uh, really not his fault that he's a loser because he has just had a tra tragic tragic life and um it's it's um he uh just can't like defend himself uh because of how uh his mind works because he doesn't have he doesn't have like security in himself almost at all he didn't have he died of covid um but yeah um but virtual was kind of good but there was um kind of a good, good person in, in a way not, not not too bad but he he, he, he was i will have to, i'll have to say that he was uh uh said that he is a manipulative person though that was something that was said about him uh uh i don't think it was that i i don't think so i don't, I don't there's nothing that i've heard about that that it was it was so what happened about Basha uh, it, it was he was 18 and when when he was famous he was like about at least 25 or like a, uh maybe close to his 30s uh, uh close to his 30s he um uh well, he like had police come to his house uh, because he had, it was like a brother, it was the brother's, uh, no, that was no, fuck me. It was a friend's sister that um, he had like, a, had got an interest in, or what, whatever this thing uh, had, that had happened. That the two had somehow had a, uh, some sort of relation. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the parents got, the parents of the daughter got suspicious of what Basha was doing. And then the police were called. About uh, pedophilia uh, or whatever, and then like uh, Basha was uh, traumatized for about ten years of his life. After that, they had never he didn't like um, do uh, go outside uh, much because uh, he was afraid about what he was uh, gonna be, what was gonna happen to him. Uh, so and then then um. Uh, he uh, got like fa he got famous because uh, simply because Skydust Minecraft 
um, somehow was like play got to play with him through like friend connections, and he he like somehow made a good made a friend. Uh, maybe he had a YouTube channel, made fr made a friend uh, with someone who was who was much smaller um, uh, than Skylar's Minecraft, and then they like started making a couple of videos together, and then the subscribers uh, base like translated over. Um, yeah, there was no, there was nothing like bad um, that really happened with uh, like Basher first. There was, I don't think there was any anything other than like his reaction to everything was just really bad, and how like um, ignorant and what is it? He just he is very, very um, um, uh, impulsive. He doesn't have control over himself very well. So he, he, that's like what ended up happening with him like going going to scream um, uh, on a YouTube video about uh, people harassing him because he couldn't deal with any, every, any of it, uh, with any of the faults that were associated with it. Um, yeah. Like there were there were legitimate other uh, pedophiles uh, going around. Uh, like, like what was that? Uh, lion King. Lion King. Oh. Lion Maker there. So Lion Maker was uh, one cunt. That was a uh, Minecraft pet predator. Like a uh, uh, message in their fans and stuff. You know. Easy. Easy clap. Um. see oh there there's lion maker oh there's no I don't see any I don't see his channel here anymore I don't see his channel right on here anymore uh or we'll make it back to me what well he's tried so many times so it's it's it, I don't I don't know if it, if it will happen but it's not, it's not completely impossible. Like, if, if people would just uh, be given enough time, like if he if he keeps going for ten years, I guess then, like he's gonna he's gonna have people always commenting on his videos, but he's like he's gonna keep having a he's gonna keep like getting platforms by just going on them. It's not like I don't think there's any um. Any of them are like taking them away. Those uh, platforms. Yeah, they're, like, they're gonna keep making more. The more or not. How oh, come? <laughs> that bad that he didn't get arrested.
is uh, what I, I think it, he deserves um, the, 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 so the punishment that he's getting uh, from like the public uh, scrutiny or whatever it's like it is sort of like um, okay um, all the punishment um, but it's also like not enough because he needs, he needs to have uh, some serious consequence, or the law needs to know. Uh, there's, uh, he's getting an easier sentence than other people just because he's uh, an American content creator, and the people who people who got him um, were uh, not that were working with the police. It's a shame that he's, he didn't get arrested, because I, I think that would have been better for him. He has to now like think about the shit and not just like be in peace and when I actually the one, one one thing is of course that the fucking prison systems over there are, are quite crappy so he would just like get uh ass clapped a couple of times and then like he would maybe you know end up end up doing something permanent. Uh, end up losing some weight, you know. Wink, wink. Dial gun on air. This horse is very good. It goes, it goes lanes for me. <coughs> Ow, sorry. What? This wasn't enough for Keem as he lost, even in the smallest way possible. So like he does with other situations, he snowballed this into something regrettable. But not yet for Keem, as Keem's tactics of painting Jarn's destiny as a predator worked to an extent, and was able to enlist the help of this group of content creators to be able to gather his personal information for the sake of exposing his potential predatory past. That was the narrative. Though things started to change when Keen began doing things in the group that they would see as questionable. And that is leaking information. What's this hit him? Uh, I'm gonna send it to you right now. I don't want to really share his Skype name publicly with anyone. I don't want that getting out, but I mean, yeah, I know. I'll send it to you. As Keem had information that no others had of Just Destiny through trust, namely his Skype, as that was used to do the interview on Drum Alert. And with a little prodding, he gave this guy to a known squatter who was helping him investigate his destiny. And a few failed leads later, Keem was finally able to obtain the identity of Just Destiny. Keemstar finally had access to his docs. And what he did with this extremely sensitive information was give the information to Lieutenant Cobra, who did little with it besides talk about it to other content creators. But Keemstar in doing this docs Just Destiny. And the act of ignorance was up. As normally Keemstar is able to play it off as he wasn't aware of the consequences of his actions, but being back into a corner during the live stream, the mask fell off. Everyone already knew came out. Stick here. I dox destiny. Doxing is bad if someone has the intent to harass. Yeah, but you said you had the intent to harass just Destiny, so wouldn't that make your dox illegal? I said that I wanted to harass him, but... That's the same as it that means intent. Oh, whatever, I guess I'm guilty. I'm not hacking into his shit. I'm not, I'm not doing anything but looking at public information that he posted publicly. So, you know, this whole thing where Tommy plays this big guy and the same thing with Nick, where they play this fucking big guy like, you know what, you can't put on Team Start no, you don't. I doxed him. What are you gonna do about it? And I don't give a fuck what anyone says. If you think my career is gonna be ruined or hurt in any way for what I just said on this show, 
And what have I made it to? You're crazy! As for what happened, it was not really nothing much. It was covered by many creators as the doxing is seen severely worse than the down in the video. And even through the many enemies Keemstar made, he was still largely unaffected because what's a drop in a bucket already overflowing with controversies. Though his next controversy did not go by so easily, and being that it is a sensitive subject that any which person has a different opinion on, we will cover this quickly and with the basic facts laid out there. This is where we talk about Etika. There are many oh questionable God, things Etika. that Keemstar universally gets Jeez. hatred for, mostly due to his inability to grasp mental health. As no doubt Keemstar has a very different perspective and motivation than most people and is unfamiliar with how prevalent mental disease is and how seriously it can affect someone. Keeping this in mind, Keem had the perspective that Etika, who was having many mental breakdowns in 2018 and 19, was perhaps faking up her views. We know for a fact that he wasn't, but this is to explain Keem's mindset. To that is where Keemstar did such things, such as put out the mental hospital that Etika was staying at. Some other examples of Keemstar's older perspectives on mental health can be well encapsulated by this defendant named Chris Reagan, a content creator going through his own mental health issues in the same time period. For Keem says, why is everyone claiming that they are suffering from mental health issues? Life is not meant to be happy 24-7. If it was, you would not know what happy is. You wouldn't be able to compare it to anything. So some of you might be sick, fine, but most of you are just babies or lying. Or a tweet made in 2019 saying, The drug companies invent all these illnesses so they could sell drugs to morons. Social anxiety is 100% a fake invented illness so they can sell you drugs and make millions. Stop being weak. Society is literally going to die not much changed on his perspective on mental health. On you know, May 19, 2019, at the peak of mental breakdown and fresh out of a mental hospital, Keemstar interviewed Etika on his show. Why, not Why do you fear death? Well, that's what I'm saying. That's, uh, it's, it's, it's scary because if you really think about it, then why live? Just yeah. jump off a cliff. If, if it's just a simulation, who cares? Will be Bird Box? Uh, no, I haven't watched that movie. I just, it, I got horrible reviews. Do you know what happens in the movie Bird Box? I don't know how to explain it. Humanity confronts the fifth dimensional being. Team Star, you're sitting there, right? You're asking yourself, oh, let me go outside today. And yeah. guess what happens when you open the front door? You see, you see eternity sure. swinging on maybe your playground swing set. Or you see eternity sitting in your car. You see something that doesn't belong. Something more powerful than you. A lot of human beings can't handle something outside of their understanding. And that's why they fear what they don't understand. Now, in the movie Bird Box, rather than humanity killing what they don't understand, what they don't understand kills humanity. For select clips of King of Stars interview are consistently recycled <coughs> on the internet. As to why these clips are constantly cycled is because a month later, Etika was found dead by his own hands. There was much sadness. Confusion, disbelief, and hatred going around the community throughout this time. Some that Keemstar was not exempt from, as he received much hatred for his prior interview with Etika. But also, people brought in counterpoints that showed Etika's repertoire of Keemstar, namely in a live stream done on October 29, 2018. We're here for hours, you know what I'm saying? Thanks, man. Um, another donation shit. came through, man. <laughs> Let me see here. Let's see what Keemstar saying. We're gonna, we're gonna check him out. Um, Nin Park. If I disagree with Keemstar, it won't be the first time, man. I, I disagree with him on so many things. But I still find him entertaining, you know what I mean? So it's like, if he says something aggressive towards me, I don't really mind, man. Let's keep looking. Um, I don't want to get... Okay, um, Keemstar says, I actually like Etika. I don't think he's evil like Fuzzy, but he's definitely manic as fuck. Like nah, not like this. Oh actually, my yeah. god. <laughs> evil <laughs> like Fuzzy. I mean, you know, what it's, the it's, fuck? You know, Keemstar, you can't be mad at him for saying that, bro. He hasn't been around. It's not like he's a fucking fan. Keemstar literally didn't know of my existence until, oh. like, what, like, a year ago? For the whole skin he swatted thing. Oh, nice. Now, Very saying cool. that Keem had no part in Etika's passing, and that he was actually quite a large fan of his. 
but this developed into multiple sides arguing against each other, bringing in third parties wanting his passing to be drama free and not to be remembered as a drama revolving around Keemstar or other parties, but a tragedy and a reminder that mental health should be taken seriously. But it was brought up again in major light the very next year in 2020 to none other than ATH's content creator, this wound was reopened by Ethan. Also showing another clip of content creator Fuzitu's manic episodes against Keemstar in 2018, where after a failed event, Fuzi got on top of a car and said, Hey, I'm just telling you as a man at 28 years old what I feel. You made me want to commit suicide last year. I wanted to kill myself because of all the attention you gave me. I rewatch videos going viral after the attention is giving me now of you saying, Fuzi is the biggest piece of shit, egotistical asshole on this earth. I have bipolar and depression. That what you put into my head made me want to kill myself. And that is the extent that we will talk about it. With that, we can talk about what this content nuke even was and why H3H3 took such opposition against Keemstar. And according to Pescator, this is something Keem snowballed as well, as it all originated through a comment H3H3 made in 2017 when Keemstar appeared in H3's podcast. He's, he's still mad at Ethan for that little comment after he went to his podcast. Well, he was one of the first people on that uh, H3 podcast. He went to that podcast. They filmed him in the most unflattering way. He looked like a pear. Oh. He was, he, he, that was yeah, those he things was really, behind the scenes. they do a lot of damage. But that, uh, I, um, that podcast. I recommend you get projectile like projection. Uh, uh, projection or whatever the fuck. H3 was just like, yeah, we really don't like him, but whatever. And when Keem saw that, there you go. That's, that's where it started. Three years later, enemy small back and forth through Twitter and jabs against H3 on Drama Alert and H3 hitting back, this eventually, after much confidence, turned into content new Keemstar, a sort of take on the content cop iDubs made. As for what new things it brought to the table in terms of Keemstar's known controversies, practically nothing. But it was effective in the sense that it showcased Keemstar's wrongdoing to new viewers that were not very familiar oh, with Keemstar or up knew about or quick. watched iDev's content cop back in 2016. Yeah. This sent a massive wave of hate towards Keemstar <clears throat> as his older and new controversies were being fleshed out for a new audience of millions. Expanded by two further videos, H3 made oh, wow. But the reaction towards H3 videos was in all positive. positive. Within the over hour long coverage that these videos were spread across, there were bound to be a few mistakes and improper. Wow, this is obviously a volcano. Any sort of long form content. In fact, you can look at my. Can I check my? You'll probably see a few things huh? that I got wrong with this video. Can you check my stream real quick? This looks project. exactly like a volcano. The problem was that H3H3 or Ethan it's doesn't colder. make corrections unless he's back into a corner. Like why? And YouTube some of the stream. more serious errors was when Ethan failed to provide content in many sections, so we'll talk about the two more prominent ones. Yeah, it's like, First is it's like a, it is a mountain, it's, it's got about this one hole in it, and it's just one of them, like a mountain like this. Swatted. But you know, to mention like one, the one, one thing. Also it's just got this, got this thing in the street. middle. The so it's like really cool. Says, it's like, looks like, a, like a, you know, volcano thing. Smile for YouTube dude yeah. is a liar. Okay, right? no, no. never it's swatted him. He swatted me and he swatted Basher. It's Another cold example cold. of failing to paint a poor picture was when Ethan brought up the squatter Keem interviewed in 2017. <coughs> the one he helped get an additional guilt from and also promoted the dope harmony for the victim's family. Ethan failed to mention both of these key pieces of information, mm. which then made it seem like he was knowingly leaving out those yeah. aspects out to be yeah. yeah. poorly yeah. for what some considered to be a good deed. The pretty Though fucked there up. Is a chance he really pretty fucked know up. About it, there is still no correction made anywhere in the comments, so it's harder to justify. As for the last big piece that made this content new controversial, was Ethan directly attacking G Fuel. Keemstar's got a bottle yeah, of G Fuel somewhere in his house, it's actually a Horcrux. How is G Fuel still sponsored? Yeah. G Fuel brought to you by false pedophilia accusations. God, chug a G Fuel. Get it now. One of, if not Thank Keemstar's you. biggest sponsor. Thank you very much. To the point that his contract with them was terminated, which set a terrifying precedent for many content creator feuds. 
may be in future disagreements, and so oh, targeting not really no. You could weaponize your fan base to target their sponsors and therefore the source of revenue. But this tactic can also be used in retaliation, as by the time things settled down, H3 had actually lost more sponsors than Kingstar through the fallout of his nuke. It was mutually assured destruction that many viewers and content creators hold different perspectives on. Oh, and also Keemstar in the past had also done the very same thing, just not to this degree. If G Fuel dropped Keemstar, I would say that's very much Keemstar fault. And another thing you did in this video is an absolute first for YouTube. You went after my sponsors. An absolute first, he says. Isn't that interesting? Well, Keemstar, why don't you just leave the word hypocrite out of your mouth from now on? Fucking hypocrite. You've always been a goddamn hypocrite. Many of these teams are big. They have lots of sponsors. And at the same time, they're being racist, homophobic, and trying to convince other children to kill themselves. You went after my sponsors. And they are sponsored by Elgato, Loot Crate, Scuff Controllers, and Cyber Power PC. It's an absolute first for you two. Why are these sponsors sponsoring such a team? You went after my sponsors. There are many small teams out there that do not act this way, but I think are more worthy of these sponsorships. But what this whole thing brought to light was a confirmation. A confirmation that Keemstar cannot truly be cancelled because he is in a golden era of controversy that embraces and empowers him. Yes, he can be cancelled if it came out that he was a domestic abuser or predator, but he's not. He is a doxer and hated for many things, but just enough for him to be talked about and energized. So you can't cancel Keemstar for having a 20-year-old girlfriend while he is in his late 30s. That interestingly enough, might also be due to him being stuck in his 20s mentally, as the 20 year olds that make up a large portion of his life act as his peers, which also largely impact his personality. But back to this golden area of controversy, it's something that we've seen through Jake Paul and the sphere. It works well for any given content creator, as you will always find supporters and objectors constantly talking about these figures and bringing them to light, embracing it and developing light controversies that have that effect of creating more arguments where the sides are usually split help keep the fire burning. Though it seems now that the newer, more sanitized standards of the internet have fought back against this. As Leafy is now banned and Jake Paul has moved to the YouTube, Kingstar, however, has only many controversies at least in comparison to the ones he had years prior. This could be partially influenced by YouTube directly reaching out to him about his feud with H3. Whatever the case, there has been a passionate decline in Keem's drama alert channel that can either be blamed on oversaturation or what Keemstar claims to be, YouTube taking more control over the algorithm and slowly killing his channel. Where in the early months of 2021, it was rare for one of his videos not to break a million views. Now it's rare for a video to go beyond 600,000 views, and since May of 2021, his channel has been weak in subscribers. But this came at an opportune time, as Keemstar has said in the past that once he reaches 40, he is retiring from the Drama Alert channel, and so came his announcement to retire on his 40th birthday in March 8, 2022, where he is actively looking for a replacement for his show. So after 13 years on the platform, this finally seems to be the end of Keemstar. But man has seen and lived through several different versions of YouTube, surviving through them with spite and persistence. Must we must go fast. So it's here, uh huh?
Where the fuck is it? It's gone cold, I wonder why. I don't care. No. All the wrinkles of the world. I see it on the internet. I can do it on the internet. I I'm sorry. Okay.
Waiting for the age free podcast. Co ty jest tam na małą mapę? Fuck. 
Let's go. Oh, hello, everybody. Hello. You know what's interesting about this coming weekend? It's going to be a rainy mm -hmm. weekend here in L.A. Yeah. It's a rainy day out here in Los Angeles. <laughs> and that's right. Today's episode is sponsored by SeatGeek and Manscaped, who we love our sponsors, don't we? Uh, they really are the greatest. I love um, it. We got a heck of a show here. Lots of fun. First of all, love is catching up. We mm. forced him to do all of the challenges that he's missed yeah. <laughs> when he was living in Sweden. Now that he's here, he's done a lot of them, but one that he hasn't done is basically the uh, ink block test of the H3 Studios, mm -hmm. a.k.a. making a clay sculpture of my oh, head. fun. <laughs> it was actually very fun. You did it? it You're yeah. done? Yeah. You're happy with the result? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy, yeah. Do you think it says anything about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's up to the boulder, I guess. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to analyze your whole life from this. Sure, sure. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, additionally, Ela, who is pregnant okay. and who is craving, <laughs> we have put together weird pregnancy food combinations. Amazing. For you to try and tell us what you like. I'm so ready. And we'll put it in a tier list. Cause Do it right now. Everyone likes tier list. Are you hungry? I'm hungry. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I've been hungry at all hours all day. What should we do about it? It scares me. It didn't scare you. You got a little. You got a little. Well, it scares me you. because I, in my previous pregnancies, I gained a lot of weight, 50 pounds. But that's normal. It's on the high end, from what I understand. I don't know. It's fine. But I'm like, if I'm starting out already like this, I'm gonna gain like 80 this time. Well, that. No, you're not gonna get 80. That's nuts. Well, who cares? Yeah. So what do you want to eat? Anything. <laughs> 
Okay. Interesting. Um, Just name it. All right. Well, we'll see. Let's I think there's some funk, right there's now, some funky it. combos we'll do. Oh, um, that's basically our main segments, but we got all kinds of good stuff to talk about. Um, oh, God, I'm so tired. I could not. I slept so horribly last night. I kept having. It wasn't even a nightmare. It was just really weird, <laughs> reoccurring dreams. Oh, I hate that. It was so weird. You feel like you wake up and you go back to sleep to the same, same spot. Dream? Yeah. Uh, it was... Hey, Gabe. Yeah, you pumping gas? Hey. People are asking <laughs> if you're high. Yeah, I, just, I, I know just what made... you guys mean, but no, I'm not. My eyes are real <laughs> squinty because I'm tired. Oh, damn. Look at that slice, boy. Talk to me about that. <laughs> It's a fresh pizza. It's a fresh pizza I just made. Damn, that looks good as shit, right, Ela? Yep. Hmm. We can do something about we got, that. We got oh, the yeah, pepperoni and then we got right the now, cheese. But... You said you made it? Something like that. Well, what like that? <laughs> What's so, what is it like that? <laughs> Because you're sitting outside a pizza shop. <laughs> very nutritious. Specially made. It's not okay. saying specially made. Well, give us a bite. Don't keep us waiting. Tell us how is it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let's let's get it while it's hot. Yeah. Ah. Here it is. Ooh, ah. my man. Oh, that's hot. Fucking hot. That's fucking <laughs> hot. So that made me want a pizza. The thing is, though, when Anecdote. you order pizza, you don't get that that's fresh that. bite. Yeah. It's different. Yeah. It's different. Oh, that's that's, that. that's why I call making my pizza. I order it, and they make it for me. Okay, I see. So, something like that. I got you. How you that's doing? my own pizza. Anything fun, anything fun happening this weekend? That's Friday, baby. Woo. It is Friday. Woo! You getting ready for the big rainstorm coming? Sure. Dude, right. It's a break from the sunshine. That's what I'll say. Did you hear about it? <laughs> like yeah, a hurricane? You, yeah, it's like a hurricane. Maybe not a hurricane, but a fucking... It's probably just a rain. Well, no, it is literally a hurricane right now coming up from yeah, Mexico. It is. People are boarding up their windows and shit. Oh, shit. No, yeah. they're not. Not in LA, anyway. No. But there is a... There's a hurricane coming up, and it's going to be like a tropical storm when it hits Los Angeles. Which is, a, I have a funny uh, anecdote about that. We were going to go whale watching this weekend. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. And we're like, oh, a hurricane. It's like a once in like never before, basically, a hurricane hitting Los Angeles like this. Yeah. And I, we call the whale watching guys. And we're like, oh, well, we're going to have to reschedule. And they go, rain or shine, no cancellations. <laughs> I was like, I was like, are you serious? There's a fucking hurricane. Do you want to go whale well watching? Is it a hurricane or No shine? refunds, baby. I said, I was like, all right, I'll see you fuckers there. Rain or shine, have that boat ready. They eventually, they let us reschedule, I think. I think once they saw the news. Yeah, morons. Hey, bu hey sailors, watch the weather report. <laughs> but yeah. does the whale, does the whale, um, does the whale does itself or does it confirm with the schedule? Uh, the whale, the whale, say that again, do ask we, that again. Does the whale, does the whale, whale have to do on a show at its rescheduled time or does it, does it, does its own show? Right, I wish I could coordinate with the whales. I wish I could coordinate with them, man. I really want to see a blue whale out there. I've never seen a blue whale. They're out there uh, yeah. mating at this time of the year. I think they're mating off the coast. That would be really special. Have you ever seen a blue whale, Gabe? I've seen a whale, maybe a, a gray whale, but not a blue one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That'd be interesting. Yeah, fuck. it would be. Fuck. 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 Yeah. fuck. <laughs> Shit. So, um... All right. I see you keep posting pics with that girl. How's that going? It's going good. Is it? Is there a romantic connection? I keep asking that. I'm just fascinated. I'm sorry for prying. We have connections. There's, There's a have. connection. Yeah. Mm. I like connections. Mm -hmm. How much are we connecting? Pretty much, we, we like we like things. You know, we like almost everything. We like to kind of enjoy. Okay. It's part of mating. Mating is connection. Mating. Fuck. 
Yeah. Oh. Hold the phone. <laughs> mating is having sex, isn't it? Oh, mating. I thought mating, like, meeting together. Like meeting a mate? Yeah. Oh, no, he connecting, said mating. Connecting. That man said mating. He knows what that means. <laughs> mating. Mating means yeah. that you are going to basically have a child with her sexually. <laughs> oh, uh-oh. Right? Sex. <laughs> you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I didn't know what that meant. Okay. That meant by, like, making connections. <laughs> but I, I like mate. Mating is beautiful. I mean, it's one of the beautiful things of life. <laughs> Or you could just have a homie that you call your mate. Maybe right. she's just yeah. your mate. Yeah, just something like that. Yeah. Not, just not, like, not mating. Not mating, but mate, like. Yeah. How you doing, my mate? Got you. Got, got it. You. My partner. Nerd. My partner in crime. I told you. Bitch. Bitch. You don't call her bitch, do you? No. Okay. All right, Gabe. It's going to be a crazy weekend. I hope you stay dry out there, all right? Ooh. If, if you're from back east, this is nothing. East, mm. east Coast storm looks kind of like that. Downpour and... Well, it hasn't rained yet, Gabe. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see, you know what I mean? Let's pray, yeah. let's pray for an easy one. All right. <laughs> uh, nice to hear from you, Uncle Gabe. Uncle How's... Gabe, bitch. Bitch. Shit in my bitch, dick. Bitch. <laughs> Shit on my tits, lick it up. Shit on my eyeballs, and... Right, brown tears. Oh, nice. <laughs> shit on my bra brown tears coming down my face like shitty Virgin Mary, bitch. Ooh, shit on my eyes, crying brown tears and and fucking lick it off my mouth, bitch. You know how some people see Virgin Mary on like a grilled cheese? I saw Virgin Mary in my toilet bowl, bitch. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. It's hard to improvise this, you know, every week. <laughs> All right, Gabe. Oh, you got the How's Cameo? <laughs> Come back, Cameo Virgin Mary. <laughs> How's Cameo going? Still good? It's still okay. <laughs> yeah. What are you? Are you? So, Uncle Gabe, guys, if you if you have Cameo needs, mm. he's your man. Mm -hmm. If you guys want to say, hey, uh, Los Angeles, hope you don't drown this weekend. Uh, this is Uncle Gabe saying, grab a life vest. I don't know. Just an idea for people to yeah. request me. Mm -hmm. All right, Gabo. Enjoy your pizza, all right? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. All right. All right. Thanks, Gabe. Have a good weekend. Mm -hmm. Love you, buddy. Take care. I almost broke. I almost broke. I did almost break. We have fun. We have so much fun. All right. Have a great weekend, buddy. You're the best. Have a great weekend. Peace, baby. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to hear from Uncle Gabe. Um, can you believe those whale watching people? Rain or Rain shine. Rain or shine. It's like, the fuck? <laughs> Rain or shine. <laughs> The visibility would be like one foot. <laughs> you guys see that? <laughs> Think I hear a whale. Come on, man. Tell them to bring out the whole ocean. Tell them to bring out the whole ocean. Oh, my dream? It's just really weird. You know sometimes you have like really weird dreams and... Yeah. You explain it, but it, does, it doesn't sound that interesting. Doesn't make it's always sense. terrible. Dream stories are terrible. It's one of the worst mm. genres of stories. Because, like, <laughs> if you feel no. that shit. Right. Mm -hmm. But dreams are not really rational. So when you tell the story, 
Yeah. Not in. Dreams are about, you know, feelings. It's yeah. Like, you can't really, like, communicate. You just list a bunch of stuff that happened to you in a dream. It's like, okay. Uh, Although this one was pretty weird. I think it might be interesting. Mm. Oh, and uh, I, I don't I want anyone this. to try to dissect it, though. Uh, you know what I mean? No <laughs> analyzing. That's definitely happening. <laughs> they definitely That's, will. I'm going to do that right now. I don't want any <laughs> fucking analyzing. I'm ready. <laughs> so, I was throwing a birthday party oh. for my brother. You never do that. Right, so already in a dream world. <laughs> Love my brother. <laughs> no, yeah. Well, that's never happened. Love ya. I mean, I don't throw parties for myself. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. And everyone's raging, drinking. I don't know anybody here, okay? And I don't think, and please forgive me, Eli, I don't think that I'm married in this story. <laughs> oh. But I don't do anything. Yeah. So... Everybody's drinking. I go in the backyard, and all of a sudden, this is so I can't say it. Okay. It's weird. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> I know it's gonna be weird. It's a magical dream. It was a magic dream. So I go in back. <sighs> right. I'm contemplating if it's worth saying. I'm gonna regret it. <laughs> is it gonna kick off a week's worth of uh, Divorce dream analysis? Uh, That's uh, my what are we I don't need about? dream. No, there's no, no, no. I didn't. I didn't even cheat on you in the dream. Okay. You, you, you. I, I wouldn't even dream of cheating on you in a dream. Wow. <laughs> right. Like I'm being <laughs> a scumbag. So I go in the backyard, and everybody is fucking. What? Everyone's <laughs> coupled up. And I was like, what the fuck? They're in the pool. They're on the couch. <laughs> they're coupled. And they're just... Everybody's fucking. Got and it. I was like, what the fuck is going on? And you know, my brother's pretty milk toast. I was like, the hell? <laughs> Who are these people? It's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Vince is interested. Vince is all here. Oh, Zach. Zach. It's just so <laughs> vulgar and it so out of pocket. It's, it's pretty out of pocket. Family? Yeah, no. is it all family? No, no, no. No oh, family. Thank God. Thank no, God. No family. You don't know them. No, I don't know them. What's your argument? There's no family. Mm, okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes, yes. Okay. It was your brother's birthday. He wasn't there. <laughs> he wasn't there. <laughs> he wasn't at his birthday. It wasn't a family party. Yeah. It was like a rager <laughs> with <laughs> young, anonymous folks. How young? No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, like, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, people I would say in their, their the mid to I would say in their upper t around thirty. Okay. Twenty to five. They were like forty five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fifty. And but again, I didn't I didn't have sex with anybody. I didn't even cheat on you in my dream. But I walked I had a drink and I was just walking around. <sighs> and I feel like there was people sitting around looking to get coupled up and have <sighs> sex. But <laughs> See, this is the part where I don't think it's going to translate. Uh, I was walking around and nobody wanted to fuck me. Oh. Do you know <laughs> what this sounds exactly <laughs> like? The story that Seaman told us at the bathhouse. He was like, it's I walked in, everyone was fucking. What, did, wasn't he I'm walking Bizarro around alone for a while? <laughs> you were Seaman. No, I was Bizarro Seaman. Everybody wanted his cock. Oh, his feet. Yeah. You were off. Right. Everybody off was like man. following him around, begging him. <laughs> but it was like, uh, it was like I didn't exist, and I was like, wow. And I wasn't trying to fuck anyone, but I was like, wow, I'm so vile. Damn. I don't know why it was such a self-hating dream, mm -hmm. because I promise I'm not like that. But I was like, I'm so vile. I'm so repulsive. Like the girls, when they saw me walking, they would like look away. They're like, what? Don't, they're like, don't look. At me. I hope he doesn't think that I'm trying to, that I'm willing to fuck him. It was like that. And I just felt really That's bad cool. about myself oh. in the dream. But I promise I'm not like that in real life. Huh. And then I had a hard time the rest of the and week. And I had a hard time the rest of the week because nobody wanted to fuck me in my dream. <laughs> but I didn't cheat. There was no. There was no family there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was just a feeling of. Uh, What's your argument? No, uh, Dennis Prager. <laughs> rejection. It, it was like not even rejection. It was just like, dude, you are so fucking vile. You are putrid. <laughs> like you're huh. the ugliest person alive. But that's that was the dream. I don't Fat, know. Fat, ugly, and stupid. And I kept having it. It was mm. annoying because I'd wake up and be like, God, that was such a weird dream. And it's so noisy downstairs with the kids. Yeah. 
because uh, your family's in town, so it's yeah. pure chaos. Everyone's having fun downstairs. <laughs> as early as what? Mm. Six a.m. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, wake up! Nobody wants to fuck me. Go back to bed. <laughs> oh god, mm. nobody! I'm so vile. I'm so vile. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really tired. Mm. It was a hard. It was a. It was a hard evening. Damn. <laughs> I hope I. That didn't. I didn't do anything to you, right, to make you feel anything. No, I, I, I just hope you don't actually feel like that about yourself. No, I don't. Mm -hmm. Are you sure? I don't think I do. <laughs> Maybe I need to psychoanalyze deeper. <laughs> I mean, the good news is that it's not your fault. I'm not going to swinger parties or trying to uh, mate, in the words of Gabe, with anyone. It's not your fault. Anyone else other than my wife. And so... I think I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna be okay. I wonder if it's your reaction to the fact that actually people have been thirsting for you. Mm -hmm. Do you think it could be an autoimmune thing? <laughs> Maybe it means I have lupus, huh? That's a typical <laughs> lupus. Dude, you know, there are symptoms of lupus where people imagine they're at an orgy and nobody wants to fuck them. <laughs> really One specific. The yeah. yeah, really specific. So there it is. No. Okay. So glad I could yeah. open up to you guys. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you for listening. Yes, thank you for sharing. Thank you for listening, everybody. Yeah. It's a sign of lupus, Shad is saying it. <laughs> it's a sign of lupus. I feel that. Let's see, we got all kinds of top of the show stuff going on here. Waiting for everybody to analyze it now. <laughs> I mean, what, what can you analyze from it? See, now I challenge them. There's going to be a whole write up. All right, I'll, I'll read them. I'm curious. Fuck it. I'll read them. So Tom Ward, uh, new friend of the show, of the Tom Ward show, he he uh, was very appreciative of all the love y'all sent him. So thank you guys for being kind and gracious to Tom. Here's his video, teary eyed. Hey guys, hey guys, hey guys. I just got off, I just got off Ethan's podcast, the H three podcast, and I'm just the support is overwhelming and I can't um, oh, can reply to all of you, but I just want to say after a tough year of failing over and over again, um, that just the support you guys showed me today means more than you will ever know. So thank you so much, you guys. You know who would want to hey, fuck guys. Tom at an orgy? Everybody. I just got on. <laughs> For sure. That's, he's the seaman. But he's, he's taken with yeah. He has a wife and kids too. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. He rocks. But uh, that was nice that you guys um, that you guys were so kind. Now everybody's like, I'm just being a little cautious because you guys know the life cycle of this type of stuff. <laughs> they come on, we love them, and then somebody finds one thing about them, <laughs> and then we ruin his life yeah. on accident, not purposely. Right. <laughs> Hey everybody, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Tom Ward. So, uh, and did actually, you see that he uh, put up all of the old episodes? Like, he yeah. Oh, yeah. And and there's a lot of really interesting ones. I kind of wanted to look at them. I don't understand the theory he had on unlisting some of these. Like, let's go to videos. I understand the theory, but I, I you're right to tell him to just go ahead and but put he, it back. So, and Emma Chamberlain was his number one. Mm -hmm. oh. Almost a million. Look at this little huddy, the huddy, the muddy huddy. The muddy huddy himself. Playhouse guys. Mm hmm Yes. Yeah, he's, he, he said in, um, when we spoke with him that he wanted to kind of revamp and be more business focused and less like social media influencer focused. I so guess he I, unlisted all of these. But you I, know what? Yeah. I, I guess I can see where you come because it's a lot of like adolescent TikTok stuff. Exactly. And he's a little bit on the older mm. side. Mm. I guess he maybe misinterpreted what Emma Chamberlain is because she's she's not in that world. I feel like she's above all that. So I would leave that one up. If you wanted to take Lil Huddy down or the Sway House, I get that. You should remove those, Hello. Tom. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Leave them yeah. all up. Leave them all up. But they had Addison Ray, and he got he got these people before they got super famous. This is interesting. Yeah. 
some more Dubrick uh, crew members. More du He's in deep with the Dubricks. Mm. The Dubricks. Garrett is a Dubrick guy, isn't he? Or is it a Shane guy? Shane Dawson. That's a Shane guy. Uh, not anymore, though. They're not associated with him. Really? They had a falling out? Uh, they haven't posted together since uh, he was Shane was canceled. Mm. Oh, he lost Garrett Watts. Garrett and Andrew, who yeah. was his camera person, they left uh, together and they had a podcast. And I don't know yeah. if they still film together, but they were they're, great. Yeah, they were doing some pretty interesting content, like Shane Dawson content. Is anyone Shane. watching it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good really? He did send, like send a me a link. I want to see how they're doing. He did a few haunted series that did really well. Yeah. Bryce Hall, <laughs> Addison Ray, Bella Thorne. I mean, she's a legit celebrity, you know. God damn, he did all kinds of work up in this bitch. Jason Nash from four years ago. This man came back. <laughs> which is interesting because he got 40, 88,000, which is not a little, but over four years, you'd think he'd come back. Now he has 300. It's his fault. Jason, get your shit together. Tana, <laughs> Zane. I mean, damn, boy. Larry. We mentioned this when we were talking to him, and, you know, he, he, you kind of encouraged him to give it one last shot and to try and switch it up the content mm -hmm. a little bit but genuinely tom if you're watching if if you decide this podcast thing is not for you i think that you have a career in being a booker like <laughs> and unironically you with almost no following were able to secure really big names and i don't know that that isn't something everybody do. Not. he said he had a background in sales which makes sense he, he was able to sell himself really well so i don't know i, I think you know if he, well, if he, if the podcast thing doesn't work out, he may have a future doing that kind of work. Right, and the good news is that his recent video with Jason Nash is up to two point seven thousand. It's a big boost. So we're moving, or no, the podcast was at seven thousand. So we're making moves out here. But I am really curious. I told him go to your next um, interview and mix it up. I don't know if you watched the whole Tom. I haven't yet. Yeah, yeah. That was pretty interesting. But um, mm. people are like, hire him for a booker. You need to go on a show. You guys need to be best friends forever. I am down to be Tom's best friend forever. <laughs> but we need to give it a little bit of time yeah. before we make a move because <laughs> these things have a, ten you guys know, uh, yeah. things tend to change on a pretty quick basis. So we're just gonna feel it out, you know? Aww. Because who knows, he might, I said, I tell the guy, mix it up. He's gonna go into the next interview and like take his dick out. <laughs> Right. I'm like, not like that. Not like that, Tom. No, no. We're rooting for you, Tom. I'm just saying, you never know, man. <laughs> yeah. Because he said, who did he say he's got? Uh, David, right? Mm -hmm. he, yeah, that's not happening. You don't think? I know. He messaged me. He's like, David canceled. Oh, no. Uh -oh. I was like, well, I, yeah. Probably knew that was going to happen. Although, if I can put my theory out, yeah. I don't think David was going to do it anyway. Because he's not doing press since his controversies. He, you know what I mean? He's not He's not sticking his neck out for nobody. It's not nobody. He has a relationship with him. He have interviewed he's had him yet. previously and other blog spot people. That's true. Jason was on there. Jason. Maybe he was he was enticed by the 300 view. Okay. Oh, that's right. Okay, Ethan. <laughs> no, look at what Cam just said. There was a... Uh... Was Patrick bet David? Yeah, that was the guy that you thought he actually had a good opportunity to uh, get a great interview with. Patrick Bet David? I know. he He's got a terrible name because I can never remember it either. And who every time that? we bring him up, Patrick. you're like, who is that? We've gone through this so many times. It as sounds like a sentence. Him, like Patrick Bet David what? Oh, this guy. Okay. See, we've done this many times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, definitely. This guy's a big deal. He's got, he's got Patrick Bet David. Oh. Patrick bet David what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand what the, what you're saying, man. <laughs> so okay, yeah, I'm I'm gonna be watching, and uh, we're we're all room for you, Tommy boy. You know, let's do this, brother. Brother. Um, all right, let's let's get off this. Yeah, uh, this was really crazy. You know, everyone's talking about the weight loss, but this picture is probably the best before oh and after God. comparison. And I can't emphasize to you guys just how, like, at my peak fat, when it, and everyone was like, oh, you're so fat. I knew I was massive, but I would look in the mirror and be like, I don't look that different. 
That's so weird? interesting. I see, I didn't know that different. Yeah. And now seeing this, I was like, holy shit, man. Put an apple in my mouth and fucking <laughs> put me over an open flame. No, not funny. Stop. <laughs> Just, I mean, it's funny, but. No, but I, it's, it's, it's shocking to see it side by side. Yeah, that, that, that is a lot. I so. feel like the one from the right is like when people will show me pictures of us from like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. 15? Yeah. Oh, shit. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's one year difference, though. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> Please clap. Round of applause. Please clap. <laughs> well deserved. Good job. Oh, that's good, you know. It does make me feel bad in this. It genuinely feels like the people who hated me respect me more now. It's insane. And it makes me genuinely sad. Yeah. Because I feel like this whole thing was so much out of my control. Right. And I have so much empathy for others who suffer from the same kind of addiction. They people really hate fat people. Right. They like, don't genuinely. take them seriously. No. You know. Shit. And actually what's what's kind of interesting related. I've been wanting to talk about this for a while. So there's this viral country song uh, that's being shared from everybody, from Joe Rogan to Matt Walsh. Uh, have they talked about it on Fox News yet? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, I got a lot of coverage. So, all over. <clears throat> it's really interesting, and, and it's related to fat people in okay. an interesting way. Let me find where this is. It's the... Uh, it's Mumford and Brother Sons? Yeah. Brother Sons? That sounds incest. That's that's the joke. It's a joke? Yeah. But he does look like he does do incest. Right. right. And he's doing like the folky Mumford and Sons thing. That's, that's a, What's your argument? So here he is. Little, this guy's joke there. <clears throat> Alright, I don't like Mumford jokes. Mumford and Sons, but it's <laughs> His name's Oliver I thought already, but... And he dropped this song, Rich Men North of Richmond. Okay. And I don't know why every conservative is freaking the fuck out about this song. Everybody's sharing it. Everybody's talking about it. It has 21. They just love it. They love this goddamn song. Okay. And they love this guy. <clears throat> 21 million views after nine days. This man was literally nobody. Oh. <clears throat> um, the, the lyrics are quite interesting. It shot up to iTunes number one chart. Whatever that, whatever that's worth, I don't know. I think it's worth something, right? I mean, that's still a big deal. Really, number one? Yep. And another song of his is number two. Another one? Number there one. There it is. Ain't, ain't got a dollar. Ain't got a dollar because all them fat people on welfare. And he has another number one. I see yeah. at number six lyrics. there. Oh, my God. I've got to get sober. I can't get over all these fat people on welfare. Got me drinking. <laughs> it's like that. So, um, th what's interesting, so let me show you kind of the roadmap of how this all happened. So the song was, uh, released on a random YouTube channel, which I just pulled up. It's created by our two broke college students with a passion for soulful and real music. Mm. By the way, I, I'm skeptical now in my older ages of people that describe anything they do as real. Totally. As the other because people everything else is real. fake. You know, because that quickly goes to like, oh, we can't believe anything, including facts and science. Well, it's just straight, straight arrogance. It's straight like uh, delusional. It's like, OK, you don't like other people's music, but I mean, it's still music, it's still real music. Um, he usually was getting 15 to 20,000 per song. Now, 20 million. He's all over the top charts. Wow. Um, so he, that, he that's to clarify that's the channel was getting that many views mm -hmm. not the channel is separate from the artist oh so what's okay what's the significance so that channel the uh, uploads other people the radio music? west oh. virginia channel oh they re-uploaded it that's actually where it was originally published they, Got they did it. it with him so here's the original post um and yeah, here it is. You know, here's one Virginia. Like go go to videos. Yeah. And scroll past these. 
see all the way all, down 18,000 12,000 I mean, there's a couple that are you know 5,000 but then I saw one that was like 200,000 so you know they're getting some views now, I like folk music I'm a big fan of uh, folk music and all the roots of rock and roll and all that mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm into all that stuff yeah so I'm a fan of the genre and I really love Lil Nas X Old Town Road I mean wow the that most really that's one of the most my yeah, love for folk authentic music. expression of folk music right there. <laughs> He's a libertarian. So he claims that Richmond, north of Richmond, is about human trafficking? Well, there's a line in there about Epstein's Island. That one line, so it's all about... Okay. Got it. I don't think he was saying it's all about it, but this is one of the many things that he's concerned about Here. that he's talking about. So I want to show you how this happened. So Matt Walsh... And we all know him. He's like the biggest transphobic, fucking freak, genocidal, absolute maniac. Ab just a demon. I mean, truly in its, in its most uh, literal sense. This okay, man was yeah. born in hell. The main reason this song resonates with so many people, Matt Walsh said, is because it isn't political. It's because the, saw is, the song is raw and authentic. We are suffocated by artificiality. Everything around us is fake. But a guy in the woods pouring his heart over his guitar is real. Mm. We ain't no city slickers no more, boy. I'll bring me back to the country, Old Town Road. People Virginia. We always missed you, Virginia. Let me give you just a taste of it so you guys don't have to wonder. So, Matt Walsh. People like you wish I could just wake up and it not be true, but it is. Oh, it is? Yeah. Um, moving, so Joe Rogan lost his fucking mind about it, posted it. I mean, the people who are sharing this kind of tells you all you need to know about mm. it. I mean, genuinely, you know. First of all, if Matt Walsh suggests to listen to any form of art, He's got it's got to, there's got to be a Nazi involved somewhere in it. <laughs> just saying. What the fuck is this, Joe Rogan? Wait, this, wasn't this small? Yeah, thing? no, something weird about the version of it that he posted. <laughs> So anyway, it got it doesn't. Up. It looks, uh, it looks normal on a phone, but oh. on desktop, it's like okay. legend. What a tech savvy king. <laughs> um, this had almost a million likes, so I, I can only imagine how many views it got. Yeah. I love this song. Joe said, "You can't fake authenticity." Why do they keep harping on the? Oh, they are like saying the same thing already. Same thing as <laughs> They're all. It's almost like they're aligned. They're messaging. It's almost like they all decided to post about this random account on the same day. <laughs> He's so mm. authentic. Mm. Like, nobody's authentic anymore. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Know? You can't fake authenticity, and he tags him, Oliver Anthony Music, as in an abundance. Richmond, north of Richmond, so <clears throat> everybody loves him. Jack Prolapse. <laughs> Who's that? Pro, well, his name is like Prozy. I can't say his name right, so I always just write uh -huh. it in the doc as Prolapse. Well, that's what that's what it makes me feel that I'm gonna do whenever I read anything he does. So it's apt. Jack Prolapse, who is basically how would you describe? Is he just a white nationalist? I mean, how would you describe so, him? By the way, I have a question. Some uh -huh. people are saying industry plant, and like I've been seeing that about other stuff too. And I'm just curious, like, what is the concept behind an industry plant, and why would anybody want to do that? Okay, that's a great question because. People were saying that about Bobby. And yes, like, that's, that's uh, where I, I saw it. it. But so this guy is literally an industry plant. And I will show you exactly Maybe. what that Maybe. is. Maybe. Allegedly. We well, think so. Allegedly. Let's not say uh, he, 100%. Well, well, in your opinion. Even by what, opinion. They what they admitted to, he's a plant, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So so we'll get to that. And that's a great question. Okay. Okay. Thank so Jack uh, Prolapse says, don't even remember the last time a new song <laughs> hit me like this. Mm. That man doesn't listen to music. Like that, he's, Pat <laughs> he's Patrick yeah. Bateman. He just like stares in silence at his wall while he's like waiting. Like he he doesn't have hobbies. He doesn't do anything. If people are looking for this kind of music, they should listen to the band. Sure. No, they're not authentic. <laughs> but yeah, the band is a wonderful rock folk band. I mean, there's there's so much good folk music. Much better than this. And that's I mean, I, I still haven't fully listened. But. Yeah. I mean, listen, he's, he's telling. We'll get to it. Yeah. Be a shame if this anthem went absolutely viral. This insinuation that oh, they don't want this song going viral. <laughs> yeah. So, it seems that they all really are organized the way they're talking about this. Yeah. Here's MTG, not the good kind, Magic the Gathering. No. <laughs> 
Marjorie and Taylor are gross. Titan gross. I don't know what you prefer. It does look like a Titan. Marjorie and Taylor are gross. Like, I'm not taking music advice from MTG, okay? Let me just <laughs> This is a song that Washington, D.C. needs to hear. It is the anthem of forgotten Americans that our government no longer cares about. These are my people. The hard-working, good men and women holding up America. I will fight for them every day. She's from the suburbs. What are you talking about? Yeah. Like, your people? I think your people. Also, she's a corporate shill. Shut up. Yeah. They're all <laughs> are. All these people are. Uh, that's the irony of it. Benny Johnson, who, as we know, is number one closeted... Can I even say that? I know Hassan always joked about it, but I feel wrong joking about that. Yeah, I don't I don't love joking about something like that. Yeah. Just a little. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that to you today, Benny. But I do think you're a giant douche. And really pathetic. And not funny at all. <clears throat> Damn. Yeah, I said it. Damn, dude. Richmond, north of Richmond, is the most listened to track in the world in the past 24 hours. This American working man's protest song has millions and millions of plays sung by an off-the-grid farmer in the countryside with his dogs. Okay, so the, me the messaging is pretty clear, right? Yeah. He's authentic. He's off the grid, baby. He's just a dude with a guitar in the woods. Ain't no My social God, man, media. Me, damn it. Yep. <clears throat> okay, but when you look a little bit deeper, and I promise I will play the song, we're going to look at the lyrics, and it's all very good. Um, but here's a right-wing guy who came out and spoke against it. This is a right winger. The MAGA Hulk. I mean, geez, look at his name. <laughs> <laughs> and so here's what he said. I didn't want to comment all of this because Oliver Anthony seems like a genuinely great guy, but Matt Walsh's sanctimonious word vomit forced my hand. Well, we have that in, in uh, we have that in common, my friend. <laughs> there was nothing authentic about this song's rise in popularity. Jason Hoff... Howerton. Howerton seems to be the key player involved in the astroturfing campaign. Astroturfing is essentially a plant. Okay. It's basically like it's another way of synonymous. Yeah. Uh. He's the CEO of Reach Digital, which helps media companies and political influencers grow their social media footprint exponentially. Jason was one of the first accounts heavily promoting the song, as he provided a background on Oliver, An Oliver Anthony and his fate. Jason indicated that Oliver Anthony had been contacted to record the song. Jason also admits he even covered the cost to produce the song. Mm. So who wrote the song? And how did so many big right-wing accounts have the video ready to post <laughs> simultaneously? Right. You can like the song and its message without gaslighting us into believing this was an authentic viral hit by a simple country <laughs> man with a mic and a guitar. Mm -hmm. Launch a product, get over 1.3 million hits. Overnight was the article that Mr. Howerton shared on LinkedIn. This is just another conservative astroturfing campaign. Embrace it. Um, he's called out by his own. <laughs> but he says embrace it. I, I'm confused about it. Is he saying just like, just own that we're good at this? Uh, I don't get his point. Yeah, they embrace it. I'm not quite sure how to take that. Well, because he sees it as a W for as like w? the move for the conservative movement to oh, have yeah. this thing. I guess but that is what it means. You don't he's just being lie. real. You don't know what it's like to be real, Ethan. Yeah. Be, we need a be real fucking real with you right now. Okay, we need real authenticity like uh, the MAGA Hulk. <laughs> Only the MAGA Hulk can provide. So this is the guy, Jason Howerton, CEO of Digital Reach. Formerly an editor at The Blaze, Glenn Beck. And so this guy started commenting, Oliver was about 30 days sober when someone reached out and asked him to come record a song for his YouTube channel. That song was Richmond, North of Richmond. Within days, the song was a viral on social media. Okay, but then it gets even, the web uh, gets even stickier. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you can say that. Can we say that? Uh, here is Jason's statement on the, on the topic. Sticky man. Um, he had a whole thread about it. And this was like right when it went up. Like, what was the proximity of him posting about this? No, it, it was a day or it was like the next day. Or maybe, yeah. He was the first guy posting about it. Y yeah. So, One goes, first. so this guy shared it and he's got a whole thread about it. This song is called Richmond North of Richmond. It's been viewed millions of times. The artist's name is Oliver Anthony. I just got off the phone with him. 
With his permission, I'd like to share the story he told me that moved the deepest parts of my soul. Blah, blah, blah. Yada, yada, yada. Whatever. He's got the whole 30 story. days sober. Yeah. Born again mm -hmm. Christian. Just found God. All that good stuff. Mm -hmm. But, um, so here's this guy denying it as he's being accused of astroturfing. Jason Stickyman. So he's responding to the MAGA hole. He says, is this actually a thing? I'm incredibly flattered that you don't think I'm capable of manufacturing a once-in-a-decade viral moment. Flattering to yourself. Truly, quite the compliment. Once in a decade? Show me the the uh, gold blue dress, okay? Then we'll talk. <laughs> Alder oh. could have posted that song to MySpace and would have found Got a way it. to go viral. Y'all need to touch grass. Okay. So the 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 argument the They're arguments just begin. Flat denial. Uh -huh. Yeah. But then our Dan Bongino, who is has a name that sounds as dumb as he is. <laughs> One of the rare times where you can be like, oh, Dan Bongino, that guy must be really dumb. And you're right, he is. You're Bongino! So so let's, not, let's not insult the Bongino yeah, out there. There may be a Bongino out in right. the audience. Let's take right. Dan let's Bongino! Not, let's not insult the Dan's either. Really? Yeah. Well, I, I, I see didn't no problem with his name. Man, nothing wrong. It's the bon Dan Bongino. Got nothing wrong with that name. Uh, well, we Perfect name. Love to all the Bonginos who are geniuses out there. He got pissed because he's a one of these right wing hacks. Okay. He's like, I don't know what's the deal with this guy. He's like number one on podcasts all the time, Facebook. I don't get it. But here's what he said. Jason works with me. Jason is a great guy who texted me last week, blown away by the emotion of Oliver's song. He texted him before the song came out, he's saying, right? Last week? What's the timeline here? Uh, yeah, the song came out on August 8th. So August he, 14th he is when he posted this, yeah. And it didn't go viral for a few days after. Yeah, so uh, he, August 10th is when it went he, viral. In, in his effort to defend him, he's essentially outing this as an AstroTurf project. Oops. <laughs> so he goes, yeah, we've been talking behind the scenes about this for a week. Jason wanted to help him. He flew from California to North Carolina to help him get the message out. Okay. Yes, that's what he does. He uses digital platforms to spread the word, mine included. This fucking moron below doesn't have a clue about what happened. He literally just confirmed it. Yeah. Imbeciles like this fucker below are what decimates our movement. They open their big mouth about shit they have no idea about while sitting on their fat asses. Again, mm -hmm. this is the fat hate. Yeah. It's a common thread throughout this story, as you'll see. Their fat asses criticize the doers. Fuck this guy. <laughs> and then, wow. didn't Joe Rogan also say something about him? Or is it just the Bongingo? Bongingo. 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 Uh, here's Matt Walsh, the the demon. He was born in hell. He's actually his mom and father are both uh, demonic. That show, The Leftovers, which is a great show, by the way. Thank you. Uh, the feeling's not Astro mutual, though. I'm sorry to say. And fake, in my opinion. The song was produced by a right-wing influencer named Jason Howard. Can look it up. KM says, man, I like Oliver Anthony's voice and he seems like a nice guy, but his lyrics, you have to admit, are simplistic and politically all over the place. The stuff about taxes and welfare is pure establishment Republican stuff. Okay. Uh, and please stop this, too, because I've seen a lot of this. Both please of these stop. kinds of comments. Stop it. First, Oliver Anthony was not astroturfed. Jason Howerton offered to pay to produce his his album in the future. Like, he didn't produce nope, the song. Nope, that's not one Bongingo said. <laughs> Bongingo said... He contacted me before this shit came out and flew out there to help him. All right? Um, they made him go viral. He said, if you want to make an album in the future, I'll pay to produce it. Uh, how did it go fi viral? Well, somebody posted it on Twitter, and a few big accounts saw it, myself Jason. included. And we liked it. The guy who asked for so it. And so we posted it, and a bunch of other people liked it. Okay, so what is so fucking great about this song, you might be wondering at this point? Well, let's watch it. And by the way, this is kind of interesting theory on the astroturfing. Does it get claimed? Oh. They want people. Yeah, I was going to say. How doesn't get claimed. It? It's semen bad for I mean, plants. Right, that's okay. 
and it's published on Apple Music and Spotify and everything. That, that was, so yeah. they that that's a conscious decision, which I I appreciate, but I think it does say something. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Oliver. So here's a good old boy. Obviously, you can tell by his bushy beard. Mhm. Mm Got all kinds of critters from Last Supper hiding in that thing, boy. Tell you what, <laughs> me. So here it is. I've been selling my soul, working all day, overtime hours for bullshit pay, so I can sit out here and waste my life away, drag back home and drown my troubles away. It's a damn. Okay, so that's good. Mm -hmm. It's like good folksy stuff. Yeah, so yeah. far, no. Problem. Hey, you know, my crops died and the government don't like me. My wife fucked my brother. And I'm lonely. Well, I haven't seen any of that yet. I'm just saying, you know, I know how folk music goes. I'm saying what the world's gotten to. People like me, people like you. Wish I, I could just wake up and it not be true, but it is. Okay. Oh, it is. Living in the new world. Whipping whole soul. Like a it's called a Dobro. It looks kind of cool. Thank you, Zachy. Your dollar ain't shit. Well, it's like a hybrid electric, right? It's mainly for a like slide guitar. Oh, mm. I, yeah, I see. Is it fancy? Oh, it's like a bluegrass instrument. Um, this this verse starts to go up the rails a little okay. bit. He goes, he goes like, yeah, man, working people just have it, and he goes, the rich men north of Richmond, they want total control. The Jews. No, I'm kidding. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but. And it's tax to no end. All the rich men. All the rich men. So, the dollar ain't shit, and it's tax to no end because of the rich men north of Richmond. Okay. Nice. Wish politicians look out for miners, and not just miners on an island somewhere. That I was like, the fuck. Yeah, what did we say about miners? He goes, I wish politicians would look out for miners. Okay. Mm -hmm. And not just miners like kids on an island somewhere. Oh, so what other kind of miners are we not looking for? Coal miners. The coal He's miners. from West Virginia. Oh, coal, yeah, miners. Coal, coal miners. Okay, okay. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I was on the farm, I'm working, man, and now we talk about <laughs> Epstein? What the fuck? What? That the was such a weird... Epstein, I wish the politicians look out for the miners. He could just mean mine, just... Minecraft gamer. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's that. No, I mean, he... Yeah, Is he's he saying just... they're fucking the miners? Yeah. yeah. You don't uh, You don't understand that line? The, the miners on an island thing? He's, he's talking about politicians that wish they'd look out for coal miners and not... He can fucking kids on. Yes, I know that, that Dan. Okay. You were saying? <laughs> well, I was actually Didn't, confused. Yeah. Oh. I was confused. So he says they're looking for they're looking out for miners, coal miners. Well, Dan already said it. Uh, you know, he just said the damn thing. Um, where are we? Uh. Oh, I just saw the obese. Line. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, it's line. Wait, where? Are, I lost my spot in the lyrics. Um. <laughs> Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, I'm doing my mom thing, fuck. <laughs> Look at this, I'm looking at this like this. It's all over for me, folks. These nuts. Yeah, okay, I wish the mother, uh, yeah. Lord, we got folks in the street, ain't got nothing to eat, and the whole beast milk and welfare. Okay, then I was like, yo, okay, no. we're talking about Epstein, <laughs> no. and then he goes, People are starving in the streets because fat people fat. are taking all the welfare. Like the fat, it's the fat, fat people that are destroying. I mean, read it like exactly how he says it. He says, Lord, we got folks in the street, ain't got nothing to eat. Good. And these obese milk and welfare. <laughs> 
So the theory here is, and he he, he mentions fat people again in the song. So but like, so wait, I I haven't I haven't traveled with America, but like, educate me. They're is all, that... they're the most obese people in the world. Yes, that's what I was gonna ask. That, they are. I mean, that's not a secret. The Southerners, the, they're they're. I mean, just, like wait, those obese people that he's talking about, isn't it like a lot of people around him, his family, I mean, friends? listen, Oliver. Hey, he's complaining about. Him. You're a little husky. <laughs> You're a little husky. Kind of like. Kind of like trading all of his people, no? Like a, kind like of. a like a but, class trader, maybe. But it's like, oh, you're such a um, you're such a down to earth guy. Let's let's see, what do we what was the message? It's not the capitalist fault, thank you. You know what I mean? It's not Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos that are destro are the reason why your friends and family can't afford to have insurance or buy food. Mm -hmm. It's the fat people's fault. Milking because they eat that too welfare much and they get they get checks from the government to buy food food stamps i was like yo that's crazy but here we go the next line is about fatties too god bless them god if you're five foot three and you're 300 pounds why do you have to do that why do you have to do that five three three hundred i'm sorry oliver what do you weigh you don't look that skinny. Why is he like, <laughs> like you're okay? I'm sorry, but like, I don't. Why are we out here? What what is this? I don't remember the Bob Dylan line where he's like, "Fat people are pieces yeah. of shit." They all die. <laughs> well, actually, what's funny is um, Randy Newman. Randy Newman has a song for fat yeah. or well, short people. Short people. Yeah. Um, also, uh, Cam just found this link, but uh. West Virginia, the state he's from, is actually the fattest state. The fattest state, yeah, okay. boy. I, I, there you go. I didn't Who's want to say anything like... No, you're right on. Come off and, wrong, and what's but... the skinniest oh, state we see there on the West Coast? Is it California? I don't sure know. Sure looks it. like it to me, brother. Colorado's slower, it looks like. <laughs> Looking light blue to me. Maybe you should come join us while we're not fat. What is there no data for No fat in here, baby. This is so weird. Florida's off the chart. They didn't even rate it. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, Wait, the next there's one's no data about available. fatties, too. No way. Yeah, here, yeah and no, then he goes, so he goes, well, God, if This you're... makes no sense. It's, the, it's like the main theme of the song all of a sudden. This makes no sense. How did we go from, like, working people on trucks just trying to live by because like complaining about fat people and welfare. That's, and welfare because like folk music is always like us <coughs> us working folks <coughs> against you know the big wigs mm -hmm. the, yeah. the the the, uh, the capitalists the uh, g-men uh, but no the real enemy is the fat people who are <laughs> taking all the welfare that's crazy that's straight astroturfing if they're on welfare i mean those people need help why are, you why are you going after them hello yeah oh oh we have a squeezy in the chat what a great this was the oh. guy I, was telling you about. I... I was telling you about the yeah i about... was so sad that oh, but, but, i didn't no, get on, to meet you guys anything. okay uh, the, <laughs> just because okay. okay your mics are down <laughs> So I was just po telling Ela about the that they all came and visited, and it was so yeah. nice. My family just arrived yesterday, my sister and brother, so I wasn't here. But I wish I could have met you guys. Yeah, it was really nice. You guys were really yeah, they were great. Really a good time hanging with you guys. Also, 500 euros. Okay, French what? beauty pie. Oh, hey, oh French beauty pie. Are you me? So yeah. I see you. That's what Whoa. we were saying. With French beauty pie. Um, oh, obviously, none of us are French speakers, other than Ian, of course. Oh my God. Our resident Frenchman. Right. He's learned um, it on Babbel. But yeah, I, I I went down the rabbit hole, and he is pretty massive in the French-speaking world. He's Pretty number one. He's the wow. biggest YouTuber. Yeah. And uh, his friend, um, one of his friends, Noel. She was, she's like a big fan, and she was so nice. It was so nice to, to meet her. Shout out to all you, all you four guys, though. Uh, was a pleasure. He said, thanks for the prolapse video. Oh, what did I say her name was? Noel. Why did I say that? Noel. I, know. I know it's, it's Chloe. What's Never your mind. name? Why did I say Noel? Oh, I don't Chloe. Know. <laughs> Is there any, well, because the letters are similar. N-O-E-L. What's your name? Yeah. Let, yeah, sure. Let's go with that. I'm just, I'm trying to debug my it's, dyslexic yeah, brain. Yeah, dyslexia brain. I know it's Chloe, uh, anyway. They're actually, both the girls with them are named Chloe. Ah, two Chloes. What are the chances? How about that? Um, Hugo, oh yeah, 
Hugo was the other guy. Yeah, they're all they were visiting from France. Okay. Also, total sweetheart, real interesting guy. Um, the other Chloe was very nice. It was really. I want to go to France so bad. Well, they invited us to stay with them, so. <laughs> oh. Yeah, they said, come here, we'll take care of you. I said, okay, you'll regret that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, he said, thanks for the prolapse video. They wanted to see the prolapse. <laughs> really? They, they handled it quite wow. well. They did quite well. Brave. And all the tit teddy fresh. Thank you, Squeezy. I hope you guys are having yeah. a good time on the rest of your trip. And uh, yeah. really nice connecting with you guys. Anyway. <laughs> um, this Hugh guy, guy is also a big... He does news, I think? Uh, yeah, he's a TikToker, I think, primarily, and has a huge following as, like, a news TikToker. Does he talk about huge news? <laughs> Wait, and he was, the, was he the one who interviewed, uh... Yeah. He interviewed Christopher Nolan. I went to check out his We were like, channel. what the fuck? His last video was an interview with Christopher Nolan. Oh, my God. I'm like, listen, Hugo, I love y'all, but where's my Christopher Nolan interview? <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, man. You pulled him. You know how to pull him. <laughs> Who's your booker? Tom Ward? <laughs> People seem, uh, a few of them seem lost in the chat what we're talking about. Oh. They had, they had visitors yesterday. We did the a office. hard segue. Yeah, we did. <laughs> we had some folks visit us who are French YouTubers or influencers. French royalty. They're, they're, they're yeah. good friends with Hassan. Yeah, yeah. they came with Hassan. Yeah, so, and Hassan made the connect because uh, one of them is a massive fan of the podcast and watches all the time. So, <laughs> Chloe. Yeah. Shout out. I Shout love out. you. She was so cool. She knew everything. I love that. You're all the lore. Love you are her. so awesome. That's why the prolapse video happened. She was like, I she, see. Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, so anyway, let's get back to the song. We sorry about that let's crazy get back tangent. To dear, dear Oliver Anthony. Um, so Oliver Anthony, so he's there's more lines about the fat people. I cannot believe that. Now it's just turned into like fat, uh, but, but, <laughs> but I was like, I'm blown song. away. So listening to this and then seeing who's who was uh, sharing it, I was thinking like, they really actually just hate fat yeah. And they're like, they're starting to become just like openly distinct. It used to be that you wouldn't, you wouldn't. Sin, say certain things out loud. Right. This is rude. But now it's like, we need to burn, we need to kill and burn the fat people for oil. I just feel like we need ever to process since them into oil for candles. <laughs> I feel like ever since Trump, like it became like you don't need to be ashamed to be ignorant. Like BMI he, king, by the way. He did that. That's I yeah. feel like. Yeah. Being a menace is good. Yeah. And Being I ignorant. And proud. I should point out this mm -hmm. this like thread is in no way new because this is just this is wel <laughs> welfare queen <laughs> stuff, which was like now you know nobody in politics uses that phrase anymore but that was like a reagan thing of welfare queens were these moochers the problem mm -hmm. is poor people mm -hmm. getting government assistance and not amazon like, making people shit in a bag and yeah them away. that's <laughs> just the dumbest thing i could think psychotic of. like i mean he's a total phony you're not a folk hero you're a fucking chill yeah. man what are you talking about so th it's all astroturfing so let's go back um where were we Fat people are the problem. Taxes ought not hit your feet, and the whole beast, milk and welfare. It doesn't God, rhyme. It doesn't even like, sound good. It's so forced. <laughs> like, and the fat people just ruin everything, and I hate <laughs> looking at them. I don't oh, like them. Let me make a small correction. He's actually from Virginia, not West Virginia. Okay, what's their BMI? Okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, but, I mean, um, oh, I, I got confused because the... Uh, the channel that posted it is Radio West Virginia, so. West Virginia! Go ahead, West Virginia. <laughs> now here's real folk music. This is a man of the people. He speaks for me. Virginia obesity rate 34 percent. No, this is Virginia. This is Virginia. No, oh, but wet. they're number oh, 24 because okay. you asked what Virginia was. Okay, I got lost in the song. I got lost in the song. Up the chimney. But seriously, you got so much hate. Yeah. Just because you were fat. 
basically, they don't say that, but now I start to see the same people being like, okay, I guess he's not Yeah, and bad. now they're like, oh, a rare E and W all of a sudden appears. Right. I wonder why. But anyway, here's another fat line. I'm, I'm, I'm pausing it too much, but here's the next one. Then he goes, so I don't know if you caught that. He says, he says, well, God, if you're five foot three and you weigh 300 pounds, taxes ought not to pay for your bags of fudge rounds. Uh, what? <laughs> fudge rounds? Fudge. He says the fat people be using all our damn money on fudge. <laughs> How much fudge these fat people need? Uh. He says, while the fa and then he goes, young men are putting themselves fixed six feet in the ground. Because all this damn country keep is keep kicking them down. Whoa, what's okay, so what about the fat people eating fudge again? Chocolate. <laughs> no, the lonely boys. They need help. Oh, the lonely boys. This is just they're so just, authentic. So it's really authentic. Yeah. Nothing speaks to me like, you know, the idea of processing fat people into candles. <laughs> <laughs> my brain in my is going, if you're five, three. Right. Oh. He's five three <laughs> and he's three hundred pounds. Literally. Wait, what's the BMI if you're five three, three hundred pounds? That's pretty gnarly. <laughs> Is that a real? Can people? I guess there are. Every time you bring up BMI, people get mad. At you. I know. I don't. I know BMI is not real. I just want to get an idea for what we're talking. Five three, three hundred pounds. Is that a real? Is that a real stat? Because yeah. I, I'm five eleven and I was two fifty. Three hundred. Five three is very it short. It is a real stat. 53.14 um, is what the BMI calculator says. Wait, can I get a can I get a photo of someone 5'3", 300 pounds? Maybe not, no. but maybe they're just on TLC or something. No? You don't want to see that? And maybe they're also perfect in beauty. 5'3", 300 pounds. I mean, do we really need to see that? I'm curious what it looks like. Like, well, who are we talking about here? I don't think it matters. Here's a beefcake. Yeah, you want to see what that looks like? Here. Here's your fudge browns. Dave Batista, <laughs> whatever his name is. Mm hmm. I wasn't him. I don't know. That's what came up when I <laughs> I don't know why. Let's finish the song and then we'll move on. But this whole thing was pretty insane. The rest right? of it's all just kind of generic. Uh, folk stuff. That's true. He goes, Lord, is it anyway about the anyway over the welfare and fat people? Anyway, it's a damn shame men just be working out here for no pay. Whose fault is that? Identify the cause of that one. Who pays you? The people at the top, right? Not the poor people. No. Living in a new world with an old soul. These rich men north of Richmond. Lord knows they all just want to have total control. It's just the chorus again. And then he says, I've been selling my soul, working all day, overtime hours for bullshit pay. Okay. Aren't we all brothers? <coughs> Man I have sold his soul, though. That part might be true. Aren't we sure all, he is. Brother? Oh wow, Cam. <laughs> so this is the problem. This is the issue where the, this is why people are poor. Do you know how much of our national budget goes to fudge for fat people? <laughs> I mean it's insane. What's it like thirty percent or something? I think we spent like three trillion on that. Why is nobody day. talking about Crazy. fudge? Fudge issues. Fudge rounds. <laughs> why is nobody talking about fudge? Fudge is destroying this beautiful, once great country. What is a fudge round? <laughs> yeah, what is it? That's some country shit. Yo, it's a cookie. <laughs> These fuckers are eating cookies, y'all. It's so, a fudge uh, round. Yo, it's like a <laughs> ding dong. <laughs> no, uh, for you? Wow. What? Country thing? I don't. I never seen me a fudge round around here, boy. You ever see you a Chocolate. fudge round? I ain't never seen one of them out here. Isn't it just a little Debbie product? Yeah, it's I think you can find right. it in like it's every grocery a, store. Literally, <laughs> these so, that's anywhere. Very good. It's basically, just a Twinkie joke. Basically, yeah, awesome. Yes, of course, yeah. <laughs> they these fat folks eating their Twinkies. <coughs> fuck them, man. <coughs> we could fuck. We could <coughs> bottle their fat and sell it to Saudi Arabia. <coughs> Keep our oil reserves <coughs> high. By processing the fat folk and turn them into fire. <laughs> That's, I mean, shit, you know. I never had a fudge. I don't know if I've 
if I would like it. I yeah, it doesn't tell. look good. Like, it looks too processed. Is this chewy? Is it crunchy? What are we looking at? Not a huge fan of these. Oh, someone says they are so good. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Out here, that's all we eat, boy. We have fudge rounds for breakfast. We have fudge rounds for lunch. And then we have fudge round ice cream for dinner. Little Debbie know how to do it. Mm-hmm. I use all my welfare check. Bought me a thousand fudge rounds. That's right. Mm-hmm. All right, there it is. What's that? I wonder if his family is, like, pissed at him. Like, how dare you talk about our welfare? Ethan has never been to Walmart. I've been to Walmart. Don't do that to me. I never saw a fudge. I, I mean, I know about Twinkies and Ding Dongs. I never seen a fudge round. So kill me, bro. I grew up in a middle class family. Never seen me a fudge round, no. All right, I gotta take the. I gotta do our ads. Thank you to our wonderful sponsors. But yeah, if you guys see if you guys see this song floating around, know what a giant BS it is and how weird this whole thing is. Oh yeah, and by the way, he just happens to have like a beautifully shot, beautifully uh mm -hmm. mixed yeah. out in the woods. Like, that's not easy. You know? Ain't no poor boys from Virginia out here with the cameras and all that. We don't know nothing about that camera. We just strum our guitars, boy. Mm-hmm. I just know I move the strings and it make a sound, boy. I need no more than that, boy. Hmm. All right. Thank you. Thanks for listening. It's Seed Geek. I love Seed Geek. 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 You know, we worked with Seed Geek for a long time. They are wow. they were one of our first sponsors, and I gotta say, I'm a huge fan of Seed Geek. Okay. Love ya. First of all. I'll tell you guys, I'm gonna use Seed Geek because Queen B, Beyonce, if I need to spell it for you, <coughs> September 1st at the SoFi Stadium. <coughs> all the Some people in this room is very excited about it. All <laughs> the pretty ladies, all the pretty ladies. Nope. <laughs> all, all the single. single ladies. Nope. All yeah. the. That's my favorite Beyonce song, oh, and I'm super excited to do that. <laughs> Best deal. Um, listen, also, the thing is, you can look for really good deals mm -hmm. on SeatGeek. And the, way, the thing that I love about SeatGeek that other um, services like this don't do is that they give your ticket a rating scale. Right. Okay, they rate each ticket on a scale of 1 to 10. Green means good. Red means bad in terms of the quality of the seats and the deal you're getting in comparison mm -hmm. to, I guess, retail, mm -hmm. you know? Sometimes it's hard to know. Like, I'll go out there, buy Dodger tickets for my dad, and it's like, yeah. you don't know how hard you're getting at, you know? Good to know. They put all the tickets across the web in one place to make sure you're getting the best deal. And every ticket is backed by their buyer guarantee, and SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. That's also massive, mm -hmm. you know. 28 million downloads, it's the number one rated ticketing wow. app. They love it, man, people Shout love out. it. Yeah. There are over 70,000 events every single day on SeatGeek, including concerts, sports, festivals. You, you, oh, you're showing the app, thank you, Dan. Yeah, we're gonna see Queen B and, and all the all the pretty ladies. Single. Oh, they're single? But they're pretty and single. They're single and they're That's pretty. good for them. Yeah. They're about to have a good time. Mm -hmm. All the pretty single ladies. All the pretty single ladies. <laughs> I thought it was the pretty nice ladies. All the pretty nice ladies. Uh -huh. I thought it was the compassionate ladies. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's getting a little wordy. It's all the fudge ladies. Oh, oh, the fudge round ladies, don't do it. No, they 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 would never, they would never. Um, Post Malone's coming up soon. Blackpink is coming up soon at Dodger Stadium. Ed Sheeran, which Cam, I'm gonna buy Cam seats for that. Coldplay October first. So many great, great, 
great shows coming Cheering. up. And here's the best part about this that you're going to freak out about. Tell them you came from After Dark. Mm -hmm. Use the code After Dark. And here's the best part. $20 oh. off tickets at CQ. Okay. That's just 20 bucks. Here you go. Okay. Here you go. That's $20 off your first purchase with the promo code After Dark. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app. This is SeatGeek right now. Here's 20 bucks for you. Enjoy. I'm a huge fan. Thank you big time to SeatGeek. Um, and uh, thank you guys for supporting our sponsor. Consider, consider that. Thank you. Oh, geez, look at that. Love this. Uh, moving on, we got next up Manscaped. Mm. I like to keep my my manhood nice and scaped, black. Cheers, my dude. Yeah, listen. All bearded beasts from stubble to manes. If you didn't already know, Manscaped now sells beard products. Well, their original product was a pube cutter. Mm -hmm. So now you don't have to use the pube cover on your face. <laughs> All Which I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit that I thought. Mm -hmm. Could you go right in the shower? If it's good enough for my, you know, dick and balls, then it's good enough for my face. Because the dick and the balls is more mm -hmm. fragile. All more to protect there, you know? Just saying. Uh, the leaders in the below the waist grooming changed the game with their beard hedge pro kit. And now they're going a step further with the brand new Handyman? An electric face shaver for a quick, convenient way to achieve a clean shaven look. Mm. I guess you need something a little stronger maybe for the face. For the clean shave. Yeah. It's an electric face shaver for a quick, convenient way to achieve a nice, clean look. Whether you're looking to sharpen up your neckline or give your face that smooth finish that Handyman has you covered. Go to manscaped.com and use the code H3H3 for 20% off and free shipping. Mm -hmm. It's time to go from 5 o'clock to Oh Yeah Baby. <laughs> okay. Or you could go from 5 o'clock to 8 a.m. Early bird gets the worm. And in this analogy, the worm, I don't mean... Because the, if the buzzer is the bird and your dick is the worm, you don't want it to get the worm. Right, Dan? Yeah. Love ya. <coughs> yeah, no one likes a weird beard, so say goodbye with all the weird beard troubles and stubbles with man, uh, Manscaped's Beard Hedger. Can you pull up a picture? I want to see that thing. I need mine. Mine's in the mail. I have a hard time finding good beard trimmers. I need me one of them. This thing is a juggernaut. First off, this cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths. What the fridge? Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah, dude. Let's go. Is there, can I get a 360 of it? There it is, there it Let's is, go. there it is. Let's go. Nice. The Beard Hedger is a high tech piece of art and travel size package with a long lasting battery, universal charger and a strong motor. Your face is your first impression. Your beard is your most important accessory. So make sure you have the right tools for the job with the Beard Hedger. You looking for something, dare I say, smoother? It's time for the Face Hedger. It's time for the Handyman Face the handyman. Shaver. They have two different levels. Yeah. You need the Hedger. I don't think I'm Handyman. Oh. What's the Handyman? Can you pull it's that like up? It's like the clean shave. Oh, once. Yeah, I don't like, like the, the skin. I prefer to cover my face as much as possible. <laughs> So that when I go to the, maybe it's not a time to talk about my dream. Mm. I'll save that. Mm. Yeah, but if you're like me, you know a clean shave is a hassle. That's true. The handyman's a perfect compact tool. I can take it with me on the go and achieve a clean shave looking without all the effort. Mm. So again, 20% off and free shipping with the code H3H3 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code H3H3. Thank you so much to our wonderful sponsor, Manscaped. Thank you. Uh, please consider supporting them uh, if you're in the market for anything like that. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Made my way through that one. <sighs> Not bad. I'm gonna need to go do a potty break. That's a pregnant thing, right? Oh, yeah, it's already happening, by the way, which is crazy, because I don't even have a belly. But, um... Mm -hmm. 
What are we, are we doing the food segment? We should do that now. We should do that now. Right now. You go pee and then we'll do the food segment, okay? Yeah. I'm not taking a pause. To pee. So as Ela goes off, um, I'll just hit some stuff at the top of the show here. Uh, Elon is removing block feature on Twitter. It's kind of a bizarre case. I really understand that. Um, here it is. Um, block is going to be deleted as a feature, except for DMs. But what's funny is, uh... Where's our boy, um... Does it make no sense under that? I don't understand why it makes no sense. It makes sense. Because if you mute if you sense. mute someone, they can still see your post. They can still tag you, they can see your post, they can DM you. So you can block them in the DM, which is good, but you can also still just see it on a private browser to get around like it's not that hard to get around seeing someone's posts. Right. If they're blocked, you know what I mean? I think it's empowering though to know that you can just tell someone to fuck off in that way. Yeah, I don't get why he well I have suspicions of why. Well, pull up that clip <laughs> tweet. Uh-huh. Because Elon's incidentally been blocking folks. Yeah. Which is a little ironic, I must admit. What's your theory on all this, Dan? I think he looked at the back end and saw that he's the most blocked person on the platform. And he's mad. Oh, that's the Definitely. Thing. That's oh. what I think happened. Oh, he's yeah. gotta be. He has to be the most blocked I think blocked he realized, yeah, like... Exactly. Like, not even just like he's number one, but like number two is like half the amount of people. Dude, that's so true because he was forcing himself on everyone's feet. Yes. Yeah. He must have been blocked. And by he's really, really annoying. <laughs> Yo, you guys don't want to see my nine gag memes forced on your timeline? <laughs> oh. A why terrible poster. Insane. That's why. Like, that's why people come here. Raffle. Did you find that clip tweet? I, for some reason, the WhatsApp <laughs> isn't letting me. Open There's it. a clip. Go look for the clip. That makes a lot of sense. So there it is. Uh, no more blocking on Twitter. And I'm not going to call it X. I'll be goddamn before I call Here it, it is. X. Here, let me it's open. Yeah, I mean, Elon Musk blocked Ken Klippenstein, who was just a really good, legitimate, authentic journalist. Yeah, he also does troll a lot. But the point being, we do a like little trolling. Musk found a use for the block function, you know? We do a little trolling. It's called We Do a Little Trolling. So. Okay. Um, Shut up! The PMP, the PMP defending an H3 fans amazing. I want to show it to Hilo though. So one of you, one of you degenerate H3 fans, got into some real deep shit, and PMP bailed your ass out. Let's go. I can't stay mad at her. She's so. I just love her. This girl did some All shit, right. I'm dude. I'm right outside of court with my great client. Hilo, you got to see this. PMP saved the H3 fan. And she she really fucked up. Silly yeah. woman. She stole <laughs> she little girl with such <laughs> big attitude. <laughs> Very short, but she really does. She has a big attitude. All right, I'm right outside of court with my great client here. I gotta really tilt the camera because she's short. Uh, she's we see that, David. <laughs> <laughs> Take it easy on the H3 folks. We love you, girl. Oh, the fan of H3. That's funny. And we really, so really cute. crushed this case today. Look, she was under 21 and was alleged, was charged with DUI. That's bad. He didn't even say alleged, by the way. He's like, I don't need to say it in this case. <laughs> You're under 21 Silly and you were woman. driving drunk and a resisting arrest. And resisting arrest. Uh, it was alleged oh, my that girl. her blood alcohol content was a 0.17%, and we really fought this oh, case shit. hard. And at the end, all these charges got dismissed. She's just getting a reckless driving, one year of probation, <laughs> not three years. And she's just got to do an alcohol class and uh, write two essays oh. about the importance of police. By what? the way, I would they make you write essays? I think that happened to me once for something I did. I had to write. Really? Wait, I would chat GPT that shit so fast. Right. Ain't nobody, yeah. Yeah. nobody reading that shit anyway. Dude, I want to go back to school just like a sheet. Kind of. Yeah. I want to go to fucking challenge. God. I mentioned she charged the resisting arrest for kicking the office. No, what? A few times. A few times? She looks so, like, That's sweet so and funny. innocent. Dude, this girl's a demon. <laughs> the way she's just like. <laughs> 
<laughs> we love you though, girl. We love you. <laughs> but like, oh my god. But really, you gotta you gotta take a hard look at yourself, girl. My drunky girl. I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose you. We need all the Kicking fans. Kicking the officer. Yes, yes. Stay safe, girl. Underage DUI and attack the police. Oh my god. You're too cute. You are. She. Yeah. Silly woman. You're lucky you're alive. Mm -hmm. He's lucky that she watched the show and she oh. knew who to call. <laughs> you think any other lawyer could have got her out of this level of dog shit? Hell Definitely no. Not. PMP works magic. But, you happy? Yeah, I'm happy. I'm so happy. <laughs> you should be. All right, let's go. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> oh my god. I, do you think this is real? I mean, he wouldn't Why? lie about something like this, would he? I mean, if it was oh. like a, maybe they're friends or something. I don't know. No. She looks so happy about the whole thing. Why would she want all this online? To be on the show. That's a good question. To be on the show? Yeah, to yeah. be on the show. I mean, it's like, it's kind of like iconic to be in one of those videos. It is. So maybe she just, maybe. But, oh my God, The conspiracy I'm is that she drove drunk right. and attacked the cop. So that. So that this will happen? Yeah, oh my god, please up. don't that. Our don't let that be the time. truth. Is 0.17 blood alcohol pretty high? Yeah. Very high. We need to talk to this girl. And get yes, reach out. Yeah, we need to talk to her because this needs to be a wake up call for her. We need to intervene. Because what are you doing that you are getting this mm. drunk, then driving, then kicking the Silly police woman. officer? So it's illegal oh, to drive no. above 0 0.08. Uh, you're higher. So so she was a good, healthy, what, like four times over the legal limit? Girl? <laughs> it's 0 0.01 or higher if you are under 21 years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> so she Wait. was uh, 20, 17 times the legal limit. I think I see her in the chat because she just said, oh my God, that's me. No shot, really? But that was over a year ago, and oh my Wait, god, I would what? love to call. It was I'm over a year ago. Screaming in my room because I'm on the show. That was a year ago? Why was he holding on to that for so long? Yeah, what happened? Okay, wait, here's the message. Oh my god, that's me. So, can you reach out to one of the mods or one of the crew members on Discord? I gotta talk to you. Really I must. <laughs> Whoa. I gotta find out. I wanna know how much it costs to get David to work his magic, too, you know? There it is. Love that. Huh. I mean, I don't love that you were driving love drunk. But... No. I'm glad you're back on the street. Not Most drunk. sane. Look at this. Most sane age three fan. <laughs> hey, come on. <laughs> Buy her a cel celebratory drink before oh she drives Oh my god, stop that. it. David's laughing. He loves that comment. Get her behind the wheel. Done. Oh <laughs> my god. <laughs> is she allegedly <laughs> single? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, Any comment from David? No. Uh, Bro is single-handedly creating Gotham a classic. <laughs> He's laughing at that. She definitely did it, but get your bag, gang. He said allegedly. allegedly. <laughs> uh, Let's go. Let's fucking go. Thanks for helping the H3 girly pops. Always. <laughs> Her future employees watching this like. And he just thinks that's funny. That he just like, potentially mm. fucked her whole life up. No problem. Yeah. Okay, let's do the food stuff now. Somebody in the chat is saying, so this is how you get on the show. Yeah, get out there and drive No. <laughs> just kidding. Don't ever do that. No, you guys don't do that. We are no. not. We need it. Yeah, we need to have an intervention. If this happens again, I'll tell you guys right now. <laughs> if there's another H3 drunk driving one, I'm not gonna watch it. Right. Because I don't support this. Right. She was the f she was the the natural, the organic drunk driver. Drunk driving is not cool. And if you want to drink, get an Uber. One hundred percent. Yeah. So so this is it. Just never ever do it. It is death. <laughs> yes. It's almost as bad as being a beta. If you do this, you will not get on the show. Never, we will not discuss ever, you. Ever do it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's do the food segment. That being said, if you are watching Call, I really want to intervene. I am curious why this was a year ago and coming out only now. That's a good question. I'd also like to know that. I've got to intervene, you guys. I don't want to make sure. i got to make sure that she's not...
Was not <laughs> Nobody listening? I said a joke and nobody was listening, so I panicked and nobody listening? Thank you, okay. Sam. The one person back there. All right. I was just, I saw this one comment and it distracted me. Yeah, me too. Oh, what was it? Well, the one that I saw was, Ela. it seems like CF is turning into a fast fashion brand. Huh? And I was like, that's why I wasn't listening to you because I was like, what? And it said, <laughs> with the pace at which you guys are coming out with new stuff, is it even fair trade and environment friendly? Same as it's always been. It's the same as it's it always hard. been, and it's the same as any other fashion company. We work a year ahead, and I mean, it's it's nowhere near fast. No. Nice try. I don't know what you're even talking about. It's always been like this, a monthly release. Yeah, we do monthly releases. We work really hard. I haven't been doing that since the beginning of the, uh, you know. All right, let's talk. Let's get weird food combos. We're hungry. She's 5'3 with a really high output alcohol level. <laughs> Smells good, Sam. So what's oh, the yeah. idea behind this segment? So, okay, doing? as you know, as people know, Hila is mm. pregnant. Yes. And baby wants. when you get pregnant, as often happens uh, with pregnant women. Baby wants. You, there's a little something already. You get you get hungry which is unusual you get craving you get intensely hungry yeah which is fun i love pregnant people <laughs> although when i was 250 that was probably right i feel bad <laughs> so let's see if i survive this one everybody around me is trying to lose weight and i'm like so who wants to eat right <laughs> i know i'll have to i just try to join you responsibly yeah eat responsibly is there a certain amount of food that i can eat that makes it illegal to drive is there like a food alcohol, a food blood? Food blood. coma? This man, this man had three quarter pounders, your honor. <laughs> My mom's <laughs> food. Safe. You know the dish she made yesterday? The chamin? Yeah, so good. That, that knocks you out. Good. People fall asleep. It's not safe that. to drive. It's not safe. So, you know, there's a meme in the, that pregnant women like weird foods together. Something about the hormones. Mm. It unlocks new Flavor interest. Really? This what? is like an actual thing. Yeah. Really. I what? hear. I mean, I I think, I, everyone's heard that. At least maybe an, it's an American thing. I don't know, but it's like pickles. I don't know what the fuck. Uh, here, I'll happened. tell you guys what we have as combination. So we have uh, peanut butter and pickles, fucking... which Ugh. could be good. What? Uh, I'm retching at the idea of peanut butter and pickles. I think it might pickles. not be bad. I mean, hmm. new Nutella and Doritos. Sounds kind of good. I think how to fuck with that. <laughs> Tuna and ice cream is a disaster. <laughs> what? I don't think I can even try Where that. Where did that one come from? Blue cheese and brownies. That one. Oh. Wait, can I eat blue cheese? I guess I can. Well, I it is a crumble. Can Actually, cheese. can someone look up? Is blue cheese? Um, yeah, I don't know if blue cheese is okay for pregnancy. What's it called when they when they heat it up? Pasteurized. Yeah, is blue cheese pasteurized? Best to avoid blue cheese products or only buy ones that use. It, if it uses pasteurized milk, it's okay. Can you see if it's pasteurized? The blue cheese you got. Oranges and white bread. Nothing wrong with that. Lay's okay. chips and Greek yogurt. Nothing wrong with that. Sweet potato and maple syrup. Yum. Sheesh. Soy sauce and mango. That one's in. Hmm. Okay. So we're gonna try each one, and then you. Wow. As the only pregnant person here that I know of, um, <laughs> are gonna put them together on the tier list. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so here it is. And exciting to say that you went to the doctor recently. There's a heart beat. Yes. It was very um, interesting. It's just like a, a tiny dot. It's like the size of a pea. A lentil, your mom was saying. Or a lentil, yeah. Very small. And, um, but you can already see the heartbeat. It's like, you see the flashing. So crazy. It's so crazy. Mm. Like, how does that happen? That's just... But always it's the third time and hearts. I'm still like, so... Like, this, it just feels like magic, you know? It is. I mean, it really is, you know. God did that. God did. God did. 
All right, here comes our first dish, I think. God, dude! This thing is bringing out uh, the peanut butter and pickle. Okay, so the idea here is to dip the pickle okay. into the peanut butter. Never heard of that. So it's like a celery Cappuccino. Dish. So here, hold it up for the camera. I can't see a stand because of the go chart. That's it, there. Good place to start. A bubby, well, well done on the pickle, Troy. <laughs> I kind of like it. You like it? Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's so salty. I like it. Cause like the peanut butter is salty. Mm -hmm. No, that's horrible. Huh. That's not like edible. <laughs> I really tried, Ela. I tried. I don't like <laughs> it. Although there is an interesting aftertaste. It's kind of nice. There is kind of a pleasant aftertaste. They kind of complement each other in a weird way. Fight, then. <laughs> Prove nice. it to me. <laughs> Prove to me that you actually like it. I'll be doing this at oh, home. Fun there you go. See, we're getting ideas. So, I know that we're probably going to move this around a little bit, but if you had to put this on the tier list, what were you? What would you think? S obviously being like mm. God tier. Okay. And D being. I would never eat this again. No. Um, I'm definitely, oh, I'm definitely so more under like I would eat this again. So where would that go? A, B, B? or A? Okay. B's mid, you know. Would you go home like and try this? He's higher than mid. Do this? I think I would. That would be S be then. <laughs> it kind of would have to be S. No, but let's do A. We have let's to say. Let's start save. with A, and we'll see. All right, we'll start with A. We'll so see. this is already off to a pretty interesting That's start. Yeah. yeah, this is crazy. I like peanut butter. I actually like. I'm okay with peanut butter. I don't love it, hmm. but this makes the peanut butter more tolerable, actually. Wow. <laughs> fascinating. Very fascinating. Up next is one that I'm pretty excited about: Nutella and Doritos. Another <laughs> dipping uh, setup here. Let me show you guys. <laughs> a dollop of Nutella, which you are a fan of. Uh huh. I love Doritos. I don't know how you feel about them. I love them. Go ahead. Okay. Somebody said in the chat, I love peanut butter and pickle sandwiches. I guess this is like a thing. Really? I yeah. would try that. <laughs> I mean, what's not too loud? Nutella and Dorito. If it doesn't say, let's just not do it. Yeah. Because mm. it's definitely not, not okay if it's not bad. My problem with it is like, they both have such strong wonderful flavors by themselves I'm not, I'm not sure I would eat it I prefer to eat them together than apart mm. I have no problem with it you like it she has not yet met a dish she does not like okay I like. would you do this at home I like it so it's an A I mean it would be very irresponsible treat but I would eat it no you're pregnant, girl. I mean, that seems that seems s the way that she's like. She's pretty I've positive about it. I've already had four. Okay, hold on. Is this better than or the, as good as the pickle? I'm in some Nutella. This is better. So it's s. Yeah. I think it's s. I'm Not gonna first fair. S. I feel like though. Okay, well, let's say you were at the kitchen. There's a bottle of Nutella, a bag of Doritos, and a piece of white bread. What do you do? This is more fun, actually. Wow, that's S. <laughs> that's S. <laughs> Holy shit. Okay. <laughs> Damn. These results are surprising. Me. <laughs> they are surprising. Then fuck you if you don't. Tuna and ice cream. I'm not even trying okay, this, bro. This one is disgusting. Ew, why do you have to present it like this, Dan? I don't think I can even try it. I don't like oh. tuna, so. I'm yeah, not, I'm. Not I'm, I'm like okay with tuna, but. Anybody want to try it? I also feel like tuna is another thing you're not supposed to eat when you're pregnant. I think tuna's fine, but let's let's just double check that. I feel like I remember something about it. Might be because yeah. of the mer mercury. Yeah, the mercury. I think it's fine if it's just not a ton of it. I can tell you, I'm gonna you can hate eat, it. You can enjoy eating uh, canned light tuna, albacore tuna, elephant tuna. They're safe. Oh, it's They're okay. They're good for you and your baby, as long as you limit how much you consume. Okay. Yeah. But not so much different than the rest of us. I will try a bite of ice cream. You're saying you're saying no, you, you're not allowed to have the ice cream if you don't put the tuna on there. That's no, how it works. 
Ethan. <laughs> Eat your greens before the Ethan? Throw. Ethan? Where's the okay, tuna? Well, well, well. What? Try the tuna. No, I don't. I'm, I swear to God, I can't do it. I, I just, honestly, I, I mean, hate tuna. I totally feel you on that. This is disgusting. But you're doing you're it. You're going to do it? I'm going to do it. Oh, Let's hero. Go. Let's go. I'm going to do it. it. There's not any you didn't. I'm trying to, like, get a pretty small bite, but also not too small. <laughs> disgusting. Disgusting. I'm not hating it. It's oddly like it works together. <laughs> what? Oh. Right, let me try it. Okay, <laughs> okay. I gotta see if this is that. Well, it's a but it, you about. still will taste the tuna. You're not gonna like it. All right, so I took. I mean, this is wild. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing a nasty challenge. Ew! 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 <laughs> 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 yeah, this is horrific. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. I feel like if I like tuna more, this would be a good one. But I'm just not a fan of it. Oh. But they kind of work together. <laughs> you guys. Does I anybody else want to try it? You want to try it? You don't have to take the word for it. You can try it right now. Oh. What do you think? If just you would bite. love me to, I'll I do would. It. Oh, you would love okay. Yes, I would. Oh, Sam's saying she would like it too. Sam's gonna try it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ethan is traumatized. We need we need a new try fork. It. Share with me. Are you sure? Tonight, you would love this. I gotta ask Olivia when she's done dying. She's dying. That is disgusting. It's like what it does in my mouth is like <laughs> similar to what human <laughs> does. Really? Right. Jesus. Oops. Oh no, what is this one? Do you like tuna, Olivia? Yeah, I do. Oh, you do? Yeah. Uh, we have to rate the tuna. Oh. Yeah, where does that one go for you, Eula? Um, just because I'm not personally a tuna person, maybe I would put it at. What? Okay, so fairly low. Um, you didn't love it. You would yeah. never do this. No. Never. No. Okay. That's probably a C. We have our first C. It might be a D. A if it, I mean, it, you didn't hate it. I didn't hate it, though. Yeah, it's a C. It's a C. <laughs> so it looks like now we have um, blue cheese. So this is just for you to try, Ethan. <laughs> oh, but wait. It's blue cheese dressing. This is probably pasteurized. Oh, wait. It's dressing? I thought yeah. it was real cheese. This is blue cheese dressing. That's for sure pasteurized. Blue cheese. This is hidden ranch. Dressing pasteurized. L Lighthouse blue cheese dressing. Gotta be. It says most, if not all, uh, commercially produced salad dressing. Made you're good. Ingredients. Yeah, you're, you're fine on this deal. I mean, if you want to put. It? Uh, it's salad dressing. It's, it's, it's definitely pasteurized. No question. Okay. Blue cheese dressing is always pasteurized and has to be in order to make the dressing shelf stable yeah. okay i mean it sounds like it is yeah. pasteurized yeah now i don't like blue cheese so uh, this is gonna make this hard for me so we have the brownie and the blue I cheese i cannot imagine this working so far you've liked everything <laughs> okay i don't like it you don't like it so this is maybe our first D rating. Mm -hmm. this was, I don't like it. This was a pretty <laughs> adventurous pairing, I must say. Let me, I just, I like chocolate try. too much. I just want to eat it on its own. Right, the brownie is pretty good. So here I go. All different flavors. You know, when you just get a little dab of it, it's not mm -hmm. bad. Really? Like a little salty? Like, let me try this for you. You're going for seconds? No, no, this is pretty Elon. I'm going to do it for her, like... So just I mean, like a little dab. You think I had too much on there? Maybe. I'm not enough brownie. That's a lot. <laughs> Doesn't elevate. No. Not working for her. I still don't like it. So it's a D. <laughs> okay. 
Who could have guessed? Blue tree brown wouldn't hurt. <laughs> Surprising. <laughs> Blue cheese brownie. This next one is. I don't see how I could dislike this. One. Yeah, like. Oranges I, it, and white bread? What? It is weird, but like, what is there not to <laughs> like about that, you know? Yeah, I don't see anything wrong here. What that was the theory so behind weird. this one, Sam? Who came up with this stuff? It was from a list of, uh, like, weird combinations of cravings that happen when you're pregnant. Okay. I feel like I'd like that. Yeah, there's nothing wrong here, but try it out. Maybe you love it. I mean, shit. This is just a new thing. A new meta. This. Okay. Uh, nice. Put bread in the jam. The thing is, oranges are very fibery. Already. Wet. When you chew it, and then uh, you wet. the bread doesn't complement that. You know, it's hard enough to chew and get a orange peel down. I don't need uh, more shit. I don't hate it, but I wouldn't eat that much. That's the C. That's the C. How many fucking baby zombies? How are you feeling? Are you surprised so far at the uh, enjoyment of these? Yeah. And if you weren't pregnant, do you believe that you would interpret these the same? No, I would hate everything. That's what I think. Because <laughs> yeah, Ela really is not into... I'm a hater, normally. Yeah. Food. Or stuff like this. Yeah. He's taking an orange peel. Oh. All right, up next. There's nothing wrong here. Lay's, oh. chips, and Greek yogurt. There is nothing Let's wrong go. there. Oh, I thought this was cottage cheese. Okay. Like it's Greek yogurt. The question I feel like is I really, have to check all these now. You're going to like it. The question is, is it S tier? Oh, this is good. If you're like, I need this at home. I think you would like this even if you're not pregnant. I'll tell you right now. Is it just salty chips? Mm-hmm. So the chips are so salty, it does a lot of work. Right. Quick yogurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. I mean, uh -huh. I probably like sour cream better. Mm-hmm. But this is healthier, mm -hmm. if you care about that. Mm -hmm. No. Do we have another S? I mean, you're both liking it. You look familiar. It's not S for me, but it's not my choice. It's not my life. Um, probably right under S. On the line. <laughs> a? Well, it's... Yeah, A. It's a, is an okay. A. Okay. You would eat this. I would eat this. If it was out on the table. Yeah. Yeah. No surprises there. I don't see this one being any problem. Sweet potato and maple syrup. Oh, wow. <laughs> there is no problems <laughs> here. Oh my god, that looks so sweet. good. Let me see this. It's that like a pancake. Sweet. <laughs> But you know, sweet potato is fantastically nutritious, mm -hmm. healthy. So, if this is good for you, if it tastes good to you, it's a great meal. Huh. Great snack. Very healthy. So here so. you go, it goes. Well, shut up, doctor. What do you know? Taking our first bite. Sweet potato and syrup. Sweet potato is a superfood, apparently. One of them super food. Mmm. Good. That's nice. The sweetness kind of leaves before the end. This is nice. I, think you, I mean, I like sweet potato. One for everything. Thing is, <laughs> literally every every first comment that you made, he's had a soundbite <laughs> of saying the exact same thing ready to go. Oh fuck! No, you haven't. Be one. Fail, mm. F. F. The problem with this is I like sweet potato. It's it is sweet by itself and right. nice. You eat it with the syrup. When the syrup sweetness goes away, your mouth is used to the super sweetness. You can't really taste the sweet potato. Mm -hmm. the chat In order to comprehend, you're gonna have to break <laughs> some <laughs> comprehend. <laughs> In order to comprehend and to eat the uh, the, the, the omelets of knowledge, you're gonna need to break <laughs> the so true. eggshells. So, so true. Uh, a chatter um, said that in South Korea, they eat sweet potato with honey uh, all the time. Oh yeah, that sounds good. It's so good. It's really good. That sounds really good. 
I you like from South Korea, really though? That's a no, the not. thing is, like, it's a really healthy snack. Yeah. <laughs> just to... <laughs> he wishes. Just to beast mode, a, uh... Great baked sweet potato. I feel like there's a chance I would eat that at home because it's healthy. So it's probably... Would you go out of your way to prepare this? Because it's healthy. I might. You might. That sounds like Because us. I've been that, craving that, that so be much nice. crap and like sugar and stuff mm -hmm. that I'm trying to not eat only unhealthy stuff. So. It, I can make it for you too. It's so easy. So that's an S tier then. That sounds like an S. That's like a real snack that might happen in our house. Right. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Very nice. Nice. We're actually getting ideas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last thing I expected. <laughs> nice. So this last uh, one is... This one is a tough ride, man. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Soy sauce and mango. Now, mango uh, is incorporated in a lot of Asian cuisine. Yeah, that was kind of my only thought as well. So like it might weirdly work well. A mango vinaigrette or something. I feel like that would be good. It's sweet I mean, and salty, right? So. so this is not a great mango. It doesn't look right. Let me taste <laughs> it. Well, that might hurt. Our oh, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's still sweet, mm -hmm. but... Not, it's, not not where you, best, it's not where you want your mango at. Not the best showing for mango today. Try the mango before you go in. Just so very you know nutritious. where you're at. Yeah. It's yeah. not horrible. It's not a ripe one. No, it's not there. I normally love mango, so I feel like I'm not going to like this. Mm. You're a purist. Yeah. Don't take a big, just a little dab, you know what I mean? Yeah. You don't want too much soy sauce on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was taking a bite, the mango soy sauce. Her wheels are turning. It's not bad. It's not bad. Mm. I guess I need to try it. It's not that bad. <laughs> there you go. Somebody said green mango and soy sauce is good. I don't know if that's a common thing or just something they like in particular. It's not horrible, but I would never do this. Yeah. Which makes it probably like a, a C. Yeah. C? What, there was no B. Huh. C? Uh, no, that's true. C? We either love it or we hate it. Well, that's it. I mean, the orange was... Should the orange one be C? Because mm -hmm. you were kind of neutral on that. Right. I just don't think that you would ever make this. You would never... If you saw bread think, and oranges, would you put them together? No. Yeah. Yeah. That would probably go lower than the mango, I feel like. The bread? Yeah. So maybe the mango's B. Okay. Brick. But you would never do this either. Yeah. What if you had... We are working with an unripe mango here. Right. Could that be a factor? Yeah. Do we need to account for that? Okay, give it yes. a B. Yes. Yes. Give it a B. <laughs> so... So here we have it. There it is. I mean, my goodness. We've wow. really uh, learned it's some things way today. better than I expected. Yeah. I thought... You'd hate most of these. <laughs> uh, the S tiers, the recap, is Doritos and Nutella. Mm -hmm. And sweet potato and maple syrup. Yeah. Congratulations to our two winners. We'll have to be preparing for you. <laughs> Give and, it up. Uh, Congratulations. Give it up. Yeah. Yeah. We need to acknowledge the runner-ups, Pickle and Peanut Butter. Yeah. Who what a weird one. Stole our heart as the first contestant. So congenial. It's crazy. And of course, Lay chips and Greek yogurt. A fantastic showing. I want to give really, um, really good. I think the pickle and peanut butter can win like a wild card award because mm. that's the one that surprised me the most. There it is. The wild card go. Nice. Yeah. Two. Pickle. pickle peanut, peanut, peanut butter. butter. And the one thing we really did learn is that blue cheese brownie, mm -hmm. not good. No. Not good. And then I, I would give the audience favorite award to the to the uh, sweet potato because that one is also healthy. Oh! <laughs> so maybe the winner of this whole contest, maybe. you say? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> and everybody at home, look under your table. There's a sweet potato there for every one of you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Enjoy your prizes, everybody. It's a sweet potato for everybody at home. You guys at home stay sweet. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching, everyone. <laughs>
would be fun to get him like that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, early day, guys. <laughs> oh, that was fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Nice. Are you still hungry though? Do you want to get something? You didn't eat that much. Pizza. Um, pizza? What are, we thinking? are you a pizza fiend? <laughs> well, I have a little bit of a beef. Last time we ordered mm. pizza, there Thank was a you. veggie no, okay. on I'll every please. single pizza, dude. Bro, you that sounds like a you problem. You Dude, why, why not get order a uh, uh, pepperoni pizza? One, a classic that everyone enjoys. Pepperoni enjoy. pizza? <laughs> okay. There was a, a pepperoni pizza. I need to say no. something about pepperoni pizza. A mm. classic. Uh-oh. Hot take If coming. you're not a child, that is a psychotic pizza to eat. <laughs> it is I'm, so, it's like so fatty, <laughs> it's so greasy, it's so gnarly. I, I mean, could not agree more out. with you, dude. I know, love eats popcorn That's for true, I guess so. it matches up with your, where your palate is. That. And he hates veggies. Like, I don't know. You know. I, don't I think an overarching theme of this podcast show needs to be slowly but surely working on Love's diet. Mm -hmm. Well, Love, I gotta ask And him, introducing him to the beauty of vegetables. How, how are you walking? He's, 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 walking. he's going back to Sweden. We, we like, just walk. had a big meal. Have how you are tried you? a cucumber with salt on it? Like, what just cucumber mean? with salt. A cucumber with salt? Yeah. Oh, I like that. Oh, okay. I like cucumber with okay. ketchup too. <laughs> okay. Lost me there. Take that back. Wait, Wait love, how are you so right hungry? <laughs> we ate? Yeah, dude. We, we had, had a, a fucking giant, Hawaiian, barbecue. Hawaiian barbecue thing right before the show. You guys had Hawaiian Oh, you guys ate? I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> I I, love, I know that feeling, man. I, I know that feeling. That was a lot of food, too. Holy it was. shit. <laughs> I completely blacked that out. Bro, this I, is an example of your mental game taking over. So. I'll, I'll still eat pizza knowing I have that. <laughs> I've been there, man. That's a dangerous road to walk down. Yeah, it is. Fuck. You know. I need help. <laughs> So nobody else is hungry. I'm cool. I, mean, I, I could eat. I, I don't could know. Eat I I don't what do you want? What does Dan want? I, I'm not particularly hungry. I don't want to decide. I, I can't take that pressure. Mm. Get the camera off me. I just. Oh, I, people I, are now. People are um, saying I'm in no position to criticize pizza <laughs> coffee, and I'd like to tell you all that of those that have tried it, I see this all the time in our community. They love it. No, he's right on this. I hate to say it, but his his weird ass pizza, it's not bad at all. Thank you, pretty, It's even pretty good, I'll say. People. Thank you. It's got it all. It's, you know, I mean, it's it's like a symphony of flavors. Yeah. <laughs> and all I'm the, the maestro. <laughs> You're the Leonard Bernstein of this Exactly. Pizza, yeah. <laughs> Look at my big ass Jew nose. People are saying that was a really <laughs> bad take. About the pepperoni? Yeah. Apparently. Of I'm course. sorry. I told you. I, I'm sorry. I feel like... I'm not even going to debate that with you guys. <laughs> I will back you up to yeah. the depths of hell on that one. It tastes <laughs> good, but it's psychotic. I agree. With you. I, even I would give the taste is a little much. The, the, the pepperoni is a little overwhelming, if I'm being honest. It is, yeah, it's strong. But, I mean, if there's only pizza there, I'm going to eat it. Don't get me wrong. And I'm going to love it. The, it's not over. The, that fall is bad. Why it's not? not? About it being overrated, right? Because it's a good pizza. It's just, it's unhealthy. It's Pepperoni pizza on health. No, I think it's. Like, I, I agree with it. It is overrated. Yeah, yeah that was your yeah. take. Was that it's yeah. massively overrated. It is. It is overrated. Nutritious. But th apparently people are disagreeing. What the hell? Well, <laughs> I don't give a fuck if it's on health. I'll eat that shit anyway. <laughs> Listen, you guys. When you guys criticize me, you're like, I get it. You like to eat at McDonald's. I prefer to eat at Michelin star restaurants for their. You know, doing interesting things. <laughs> they're they're thinking. They're intelligent. <laughs> it's more of a analysis of food and earth and life itself. I will say the uh, spicy uh, Italian pizza at California Pizza Kitchen. Uh, good, good pizza. Mm. Dan, any comment about the California <laughs> Pizza Kitchen? I what heard you used to work there. It's the uh, it's the spicy uh, Italian pizza. I don't. Really it might remember. be a new. Is that a newer thing? It might I don't be, know. Yeah. On cauliflower crust? Dan used to work there. There was no cauliflower crust when I worked there. Yeah, I used to we work. used to work at CPK, dude. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, it's true. Really? At the Topanga Mall? Did uh, you the one the no way. maybe serve anybody famous ever? Do I bring it up a lot? Do I? You know what? No. It just is one of those things where it's like everybody knows that about. It's me. like huh. it's come up. You've mentioned that a lot, not intentionally, but I go, huh? I've heard that story a lot of times. Sure. <laughs> It's, it's like the Logan like Paul story. How many times like have I told the Logan Paul? To work. 
I get it, man. You're a worker. You're a man of the people. <laughs> Even though it's like the Logan Paul red car story. I haven't told it that many times. I haven't told that story in years. The, the Logan Paul what story? With the red car. I asked him what color is the car. Oh, and then he threatened to punch you? Yeah. yeah. You've told that like a thousand times. <laughs> When's the last time I told that story? Uh, like a week or two ago. We, we did right. talk about it. <laughs> no, yeah, you uh, last week. Last Friday, I think. I'm not kidding. You talked we about it last week. You told the story last week. Wait, no. but you know what? You know what? I remember when we were talking about if we should go to the stream exactly. and we were saying would Logan be there, mm -hmm. right? I think that's how. But it why? Came up. But I didn't bring up the damn, the race car story. Very Are there two briefly. Logan? Did you troll him twice? Are you talking about two separate stories? There's the one where no. he saw you and he turned around. and He was like, "That's yeah, you that's the one. That's the only time I've met him in person." You know what's a great time. deep cut story though, which like, I mean, you might have told it once when you smoked crack that one time. Uh, right, that's my crack story. I've never heard about that one. Your, your, your pizza kitchen is my crack. <laughs> Alright, Dan, tell us what you want to eat so we can move on. I'm not, I'm not the guy. I'm not that guy. Love mm -hmm. says pizza. Do you, do you accept or do you... You're, you're Empress. Show us with your thumb. I I did kind of enjoy that one with the cheese in the crust. Ooh, that, that shit was kind was of insane. insane. But like one you slide guys. was enough for the day. Like true. I was so full forever. I did I did regret <laughs> eating that all day. That's a true point. That's something to consider. <laughs> you know, Mexican. Here, just do it like this. I'll give you an idea, and you go bleep, bleep, or you just hit me with the thumb, okay? Okay. Mexican. Mm. Okay, you gotta wow. leave your thumb like this. Okay. And then you go up or down. Okay, um, pizza. Oh! Ooh, you got a okay, reading! Okay, okay, okay. What about, um, Mediterranean? That was good. Which one? I don't know, whatever we ordered last time was really good. Me. Me. Vetoed. Chinese? Me. Vetoed. Vietnamese? I don't know. Bing. Sushi? Mm -mm. Sushi, you're not supposed to eat while pregnant, yeah. right? Yeah. Cool. Excuse me. I'm just trying to say stuff so you get her thumbs I got down. You. I got you. Uh, I feel like Taco this Bell? Is too general. Like, I need to know Ooh. the exact places, you know? Taco Bell? That's a maybe. Do it with your thumb. Mm. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, Chick fil A? Do I like anything there? Nah. No. Overrated. Bing. Uh, McDonald's? Not today. Um, boba isn't food. <laughs> <laughs> I hate boba. I'm so out on boba. Uh, I'm out on it too. I've tried it so many times. Breaking my heart. Guys. Breaking my heart. I'll do it on my own time. Boba. Same. Okay, I'm going to say this, and if it's too rude, just button it out. <laughs> boba is the Tom Ford of beverages. I don't get it. I I've tried it. I've given it a shot. It's just not happening. Who the fuck is Tom Ford? <laughs> the designer Tom Ford? <laughs> like floating brand or car? Tom? He means Tom Ward. <laughs> the gentleman who we spoke to you. Jesus Christ, get the <laughs> Wait, you, what? You guys should know what I'm talking about. I mean, I did. But. Yeah. Only then you. Dan speaks my language. Did you say F or W? Tom. But you said Ford, right? I, I did say Ford. Because <laughs> I was going to say Tom Ford makes great shit. You're you have a your man of class and style. Okay, so then um, it's like Tom Ward. That's a permanent no. That, then like we come to that conclusion. Yeah, right? you almost like, died last. Yeah, time. <laughs> we're all out on Chipotle. I want Popeyes, try. nah. Mm. So it seems like you're pretty interested in pizza or yeah. Taco Bell. Yeah. Oh. Maybe we should just do pizza. Wait, combination. Taco Bell Pizza Hut. Dude, See, that's I, a real thing. <laughs> am I dreaming right now? How does that work? We're set up perfectly. <laughs> that's like a thing. Do they put the they have common because they're owned by the same company? They put the tacos on oh the pizza. My God. No, but they like ha they just have both. You can order both at the same time. I don't like that. There's a song about it too. And there's a song I, about I, it. Too much ingredients. You should just get the Mexican pizza. Damn. Oh, oh, really oh that's a good thought. Is it good? It sounds like. Why people swear by it? Really. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan personally, but a lot of people love it. Oh, dude, I have a that I'm not sandwich a fan. place, we had the best mm -hmm. fucking sandwiches. Oh my God. Really? It was insane. What kind of sandwiches? Yeah. So they're like... They had everything. It was, I don't think it was Vietnamese. Was they there had a vegetarian some, option? There were, yeah. Dan had a veggie sandwich. 
Really? I had a bomb me. Tokyo you liked it? Me. Yeah, it's it was like, great. It's like Vietnamese inspired, so like I got Man, like, a spicy that. chicken sandwich, but it had like cilantro on it. Mm. So good. Maybe we should do that. Maybe. Maybe we should. Very good. Maybe. Let's make a decision here. Maybe. Alrighty, you left. Sandwiches, pizza, or Taco Bell? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Play the stress music. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Amp up the ticking clock. Well, what does the love clock. choose? Pizza? pizza Out of those three? Oh, uh, definitely not the sandwiches. It's <laughs> pizza or Taco Bell. I probably hit the tie. Oh no, I, I'll hit the pizza if it's pepperoni. Otherwise, back <laughs> around. We're not getting pepperoni. That's negotiating, bro. What's Zaza, Sam? Pizza? Pizza. Sam Let's do pizza. Let's do yeah. pizza. All right, it's oh, pizza. All right, we'll get, we'll, should, we'll get a pepperoni. We did Taco Bell too many I times. Let's do all, all veggie pizza. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like any veggies on pizza? Maybe. Yeah. He doesn't like any veggies, period. Black <laughs> olive. No. No, it's not like even, it's, I'm not even memeing. This man does not eat vegetables. No. no, no. Meat only. That could yeah. become a problem for you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. I haven't. When you no hit problem. 30. Yeah, you're I'm young old. still, man. You start yeah. to feel those. The problem yeah. starts showing. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're going to be old yeah. one day and you'll be like, maybe I should eat a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> nah. <laughs> <You're fine. laughs> yeah. All right. We All right, we'll get the pizza right now. We can buy kids. Uh, salami pizza. We can get you a, we can get you a pepperoni. Would you, do you like cheese pizza? Like no meat? Well, get cheese. Uh, you need uh, meat. Get him the pepperoni, I don't have any meat. Meat lovers? Just salami lovers. I mean, nobody else is going to... Okay, all right. <laughs> Nobody's going to touch the thing. All right, we'll, we'll work it out. We'll, we'll work it out. We'll work it out. <laughs> meat lovers? Do they do have... Oh, they probably do yeah. have half. Mm. That'd be a good compromise. Yeah, that's nice. You could get half a meat, no. half a meat lover or half a pepperoni. <laughs> pepperoni lover. You're a pepperoni lover. Yeah. So we'll do half a pepperoni. Right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right. We accommodate. Uh, and Cam, do you have any special requests? I'm, I'm a veggie too, so anything can get some cool. There it is. Yeah. I think every yeah everybody here likes the veggie options, so... I'll get the peps. All right, very good. Extra cheese in the crust. Cheese in the crust. All right, where were oh. we? Oh, Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> Damn, you really bothered me on Twitter. Huh? Me? Yeah. What did I do? You what tweeted something that really upset me. Here it is. Upset it? Yeah. Upset it. Upset it? It's upset me. <laughs> you read this and tell me how does it make you feel. Oh. <laughs> read it, Yola. I cannot read that. Why? This reminds me. I have a hat that says on it. And this morning, my mom was like, "Can I borrow this hat?" And no. I was like, "You can, but you don't know what it is." And she was like, "What? Tell me." And I was like, "I can't tell you." She was like, "Tell me." I can't tell you. I feel like that. Sam, explain this though. I'm unpacking. You know what I mean? That's where it is. <laughs> so the, the clit or the, or so where is the, the clit or is it? Is it the hole you drink out of or is it the button above it? Um, I feel like it's probably, I mean, it's got to be under the hood, right? Mm. So I guess it's the hole you drink out so of. So you're drinking that thing. Just drink it. We're just going it. by like, you know, like anatomy. <laughs> Mm. Get after it. All right, Sam. Thank you for that image. Appreciate that. Pretty fire. Pretty fired. <laughs> Making me feel that type of way. Here's a snowboarder taking out everybody on the slope. You know, I love this shit. I'm a softy for people getting hurt. Uh, here it is. Everybody, enjoy. That's right. <laughs> you got this. You got this. And it's a tip in the cum of the semen. <laughs> All right, here it is. Do people do this where they hold? Is like holding onto a hook. Oh, no. Yeah. Bales. Oh no. Oh, they're all going up that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. That's that's 
Uh, you put it between your legs. Oh. <laughs> he's oh. just going Fuck down. Dude, he's guys, no. He could have tucked his feet in on that one. <laughs> he's taking out what? Damn, that's gonna be 10 people. So, wow. No, it's like I, a video game. Oh, 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 oh. How many people you can take out? <laughs> sure looked like that was his goal. <laughs> now I've never been I've been skiing once, but it was a chair. I never seen this seems pretty sketchy. Like this would like happen. Like going up one inch air. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or one foot fell out and then it was all over. And he knows there's no escaping this space. <laughs> <laughs> so I've done this. You have? Yes. I've fallen and taken people out. Uh, oh, no. No. In this situation, going up the slope? Yes, this exact this exact thing happened to me. I didn't take oh out that God. many, but took out two people. <laughs> two? Yeah. Yeah. How I far away that. apart were they? Uh, huh? How far apart were they? They were right behind me. The, the people, it, it was like a slope, right? And I had, after I took them out, I like started gliding, and then I uh, kind of tried, and I went down the slope, like down the woods and shit. I had to walk <laughs> down like a wooded, wooden area because I got out of bounds. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's gotta happen fairly regularly. Yeah. Like, this, like, look at this. This is madness. Dude, people got fucked I'm up though. Falling. This dude here really ate shit. Sam, I don't need my usual. I'm I, I can mix it up. Look at the wreckage. Dude, what do you crazy. yeah, I, 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 I stand in solidarity with you guys. For real. Battlefield. But you want a veggie pizza regular or do you want baked like extra bacon? I was gonna get a few different ones, so if anyone Just has veggie. <laughs> This, this second guy gets absolutely bodied. Oh my oh god. Yeah. And that woman, that woman did not need to go down. Like, he could have tucked it in for her. <laughs> he put oh, it out! <laughs> he crazy. tucked it in and then put it out. I'm talking to your dick. <laughs> what did you do, man? You could have saved that lady. Oh, well, let's, watch a let's watch it frame by frame. Okay. Or it's not letting me do that, unfortunately. So, if you watch his skis, at a certain point, right here, he tucks it in. Oh. Yep, and he kicks his legs out. Yeah, he's fucked up. <laughs> Whoa, that one's <happened. laughs> So, people are saying, couldn't you, like, dig into the snow? What they do here is they drive a machine up and down to make it, like, pretty much ice. So, if you start gliding, you fuck. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, super slippery. Huh. Mm. Yeah. They should put... <laughs> okay, all right, listen, I'm not of this world. Y'all got your own problems. <laughs> you know. But there it is. Did you hurt anyone, love? I mean, I don't know. I just, I kept going. You never going. checked back no, in. No, no, I never. Because <laughs> you were falling. Yeah, I was going down like a slope. And I had to walk for like 20 minutes. <laughs> were you hurt? No, no. Oh. Just cold. Skiing or snowboarding? Skiing. First time ever. Oh, shit. And last. That was my first time. I had last. a first and last, too. <laughs> yeah. Mine was awful sucked. the first time. Yeah. I think I told the story, so I'm not going to do a California pizza kitchen if you guys know. <laughs> but my first time skiing. Yeah, you have. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys know the story. You can just play the sound like that. <laughs> um, Wait, what? Yeah, never mind. He's kidding. <laughs> He's kidding. So here's a little XQC update. Oh. If you guys are interested. Yeah. I personally am going watching the the, yeah. the plane hit the side of the mountain. Okay. So XQC claims that um, he's reached out to practically everyone to ask for permission. Mm -hmm. But when Vince came out, and said that's not true. He sent his fans on Twitter to say, "Oh, this guy's harassing me, and he's lying." To send his fans to harass him. Okay, but another person now has come out and said, "Um, he did not contact me either." Uh, let's take a look. It was posted on our subreddit. This is by the Asher Show, who we love. Uh, here's his video. Two years ago, 15 minutes, 27 seconds, 1.4 million views. XQC almost got the same amount of views. Mm. And it's 16 minutes long. Same thumbnail yeah. and his dumb fucking face. And then, by the way, is, if Mizkiff is doing this too, he needs to fucking stop also. You know? XQC is just the biggest. Mm -hmm. And he uploads that shit to YouTube. I, I don't know what Mizkiff does. If he does the same thing, he got to stop that shit. It's fucked yeah. up, no matter who does it. Yeah. Look how many views XQC got, though. Mm -hmm. You know? So, I guess, you know, Asher show, reach out for that 10x. 
<laughs> Which, by the way, he refused to pay Vin. Now that, I don't understand. He 1,000%, he Does says... That's, I, that's what he said. What he said. <laughs> now, 100 millionaire yeah. who goes to Vegas and happily wastes a million dollars. Who's gambling again, by Gam the way. Yeah. That's what he, yeah. he's gone back to just being a g gambling streamer. So, oh. that's cool. <clears throat> um, he said, unless you can prove damages, I'm only going to pay you the revenue. At that that's not what he said here. Nope. There isn't. And like, why are you being such a cheapo bitch, dude? Don't say it unless you mean it. Oh, right, because he's a liar. He doesn't. He doesn't care about anything. Here he is, uh, gambling on kick again, which again is so funny because one of his main defenses against me was, "You're a liar," because I haven't gambled on kick. <laughs> And I said, okay, you're right, apologies. Was true at the time. Uh, I, what I didn't Five get to later. What I really wanted to ask him, which I didn't get yeah. a chance to, was, do you plan on gambling? Do you plan on, on it? it? Yeah. Uh, but uh -oh. this was yeah. like two days later, mm. and he is just... Right back in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? What is this gambling? It's like a slot machine? Yeah. That's it? That's it. Oh, my God. Love love is, has watched him, so he gave us an insight. I guess yeah. it's just... Okay. I mean, there's ups and downs. I guess it's exciting. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, look, he's got eight hundred thousand dollars here, and each spins fifteen hundred. Yeah. Uh, and I think the spins are even more because he does. He they buy into the bonus directly, or like the. Uh, so so they, they they spend like usually fifteen k for a roll, and they get guaranteed to come into the bonus round. Uh, so they. Yeah. It's such scumbag shit. Like you're not. He's not losing money. He's getting paid a gajillion dollars. It's just like a fun thing that you do. And you know, you don't see the part where like he's stealing shit from his like friends and family. He's selling like his bed. What is that? But if you're a gambling addict, you lose everything. Oh, gotcha. But he's still, he's crushing it, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Your life is great. You don't see the dark side the of reality it. reality of no. it. No. Yeah. Um, here he is playing. Oh, dude, he won 500,000. Oh, this was like his second spin, right? <laughs> I don't know if it was the second, but yeah, I saw a lot of big wins the second he started. Like five minutes after he started, he won a $500,000 outside. How lucky. Just authentic, Ethan. Stake would never. Stake, the unregulated crypto casino based in a shaft. Unthinkable. <laughs> in, uh, Curacao. Curacao? Mm -hmm. Would never, 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 never. Um, also, I think we saw this already, but in case we didn't, he was in Vegas with his boy, Aaron Ross. Oh, so they're friends? Yeah, of course they are. Well, they're both doing the kick gambling shit, so mm -hmm. they're, you know, thick as thieves, literally. <sighs> here he is, uh, and here he is losing uh, 1.1 million down. Mm -hmm. Ha 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 ha. How do people respect this? I mean, like, the the vast majority of his audience has got to be... Life would be completely transformed forever with $1.1 million. All right. Doesn't that bother you? As a, as, as a, I guess, former or current audience yeah. member? Uh, of Does course. Sing a little bit? Yeah. yeah. Like, how little he cares about yeah. money? I mean, it's possible that pe when people look at this, it's like they look at a fantasy. Well, sure. So it's not, they're not taking it <clears throat> in a literal way, I guess, but. I just lost one million, ha 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 ha, yeah, whatever. And then, um, this was an interesting post. Oh, he called me out? No, okay. no, no, it was just, we don't even have to recap it because we've gone post. over all this shit. The one thing missing is that post about gambling from our subreddit. I wanted to read that. Uh, that was debunked, Ethan. We shouldn't read that. Mm. But um, debunked. Yeah. No. Oh. Um, but this is interesting. This has actually happened while we were live. Mm. Breaking news. <laughs> Xuc's old gaming YouTube channel has been changed into a gamba channel to promote his biggest wins from stake. Mm. All the original gaming videos have been removed. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Exactly. I'm sure the hundred million dollar contract that yeah. you signed was didn't was not related no <laughs> way you didn't have to do any of this <laughs> stuff. also the problem with advertising gambling with twitch streamers is that you know you see them lose a lot so what you should do 
what he's doing is to just cut out all the highlights, uh -huh. all the all the good stuff of just all the money you win. Yeah. Right. And so you can just mainline that shit. You know what I mean? Look at this. Awesome. And these these apparently all just happened. He won six hundred seventy thousand, four hundred fifty thousand, five hundred thousand, and five hundred thousand. That all just happened yesterday, guys. That's two million dollars. Oh. Uh, so is it Crazy. legal to promote gambling on YouTube? I think as long as you don't link. Oh right. Or yeah, promote a URL mm. that you can post it. I think that's the, the carve out. Although to be fair, I don't. I've never watched XQC gamble, but I don't think he does this stupid shit that Trainwreck tries to do. Right. He's like, no, it's gambling, and you'll, you'll here's a chance you'll you're gonna kill yourself if you watch this. There's like a me there's like a measurable amount of people that will kill themselves. Right. Because of from gambling. being addicted. Some of you will die as a result of watching this. All right, let's spin. <laughs> uh, train wreck. At, I mean, he he kids himself into thinking. He goes, "You don't gamble, you will lose money." It's like whatever. Dumbass. Okay, well that's that's really cool. Nothing seems to affect him though. Uh, I, uh, seems like some people were getting over his stuff, but he's still getting fifty thousand views. Him just doing a slot machine. I think so. Yeah. He gets cancelled a lot and, and just bounces back. I think most of his viewers don't have any morals. Don't really care. Yo, Trainwreck won ten million dollars on Wanted, the slot machine. Here he is reacting to it. Oh my god! So it's not even his content. <laughs> it's him reacting. The train went. Wait. And what? Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, go ahead. No, you... no, it's just like. Okay. Go ahead. Gambling react content? I'm just, I'm blown away that this is a thing. Like, if, as if the gambling content wasn't fucking brain dead enough. We need XQC in the corner. Well, you know why? Because I know Tr Train probably posted this on his. XQC posted on his. Why? Because Stake is paying them to promote the wins. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. And then maybe we can have uh, Aiden Ross react to the uh, XQC's reaction of Train <laughs> winning 10 million, you guys. This is wild. Here it is. God, I got it! Wait, I got the full here? screen! No way. I got the full screen! Oh, no way. No way. No way! No way. I got the full screen! No. No. He no. finally oh did it. I got the full screen! No way. Well, it took him so long to... Um, Why is he being... He's trying... Why is he being a hater? <laughs> it took him so long. <laughs> he just won 10 million, dude. Just throw, give it down to your homie, dude. Look how happy he is. Oh my god. Bad oh exes, too. I got this. Oh on my no, it's not even max. It's, it's minimum, Wait. but we'll take it. That's max minimum, yeah. Oh, here it comes. We, we, just we got it. Three. It. We just asked for it. Wait, 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 wait. We need the sound bite that. <laughs> we got all three. Okay. We just asked for it. <laughs> oh my god. No. What is this? What is 10 mil. Wait, that's not a max win. 10 nah, mil. Nah, nah, thank Fawzi there. That's the lucky spot. I think it's small, actually. Wow, XQC, that was a really good reaction. I understand why he posted that. <laughs> that was definitely an XQC highlight. Can I hear it again? I just want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try no, and highlight. That. Yeah. Um, train rock. Do you think he's even excited, or is it just like an act? He doesn't care. He doesn't care. No. Is it all like? He own. He's a part owner yeah. of Stake now. He's, yeah. He's it's a, just an act. Which is crazy. I, uh, or no, no, kick. kick sorry, kick, kick. Kick. But those are the same people. He's literally in business with them now. He's in business with them. Yeah. I got all three! Bitch. I got the full screen! Yeah. No, this was really good that XUC uploaded. This. I got the full screen! <laughs> well, it took him so long. Yeah. <laughs> all bad X's too. I got the full screen. Oh, no, it's like max. It's minimum. Take it. That's max minimum, yeah. We got the full screen. We just No, we got the full three! We just asked for it. And God answered! Wait, that's not a max win. Nah, 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 thank Fawzi there. That's unlucky as fuck, that kinda makes him mold actually. That's unlucky as fuck kinda makes him mold. Is what I call it. The 10 million, right? Yeah. Nah. Yep. Mold. Yep. I'm getting okay. better. I'm getting fluent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> if you guys are interested in watching him react to other people's opinion. Oh wait, no, this is XUC Clips. Wait, now I'm confused. What is this? Why is the view so low? Oh god, he posts that much. Is okay, that not his it. channel? No, it is. 
He posted two minutes, four minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, one hour. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, congratulations to Train. Ten million, dude. He got all three. <laughs> Alright, moving on. Um, okay, this is very good. Now, I saw this on Reddit. And Zach did some legwork to try to figure out if this thing is real. Look at this. Uh, what is West Virginia? Correct. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> West Virginia! We're back to West Virginia today. <laughs> Fuck the fat people. Save the pedophile. This was hanging in the police station. Okay. What does the scroll say? And some call him pig. pig. What do you see here? Yeah, disturbing image. <laughs> What's disturbing about a peace officer saving the life of a child with CPR? I don't think you do CPR in your that hand. they are kissing? I think he's supposed to be on the <laughs> ground. <laughs> That's the explanation that was uh, offered for this. Yeah, I mean, clearly it's supposed to be a resuscitation, but he in the arms. It yeah, looks can't like do a chest compression. No. Like you have to alternate. He's taking advantage of an yeah, unconscious yeah, this is child, <laughs> potentially a deceased child. Um, so, beyond the creepiness of this, I have a theory about this painting. Okay. It's very similar to a famous painting by Peter Paul Rubens. A stone is devouring the stone and drinks it. <laughs> and it's a, uh, oh. And this is actually a depiction oh. of, a, of a tyrant preserving his power. I don't know. If wow. Can, uh, wow. You think there's some occult shit going on? Well, yeah. I, think, I think it's a subtle a cab to the creepy ass. Oh, the artist was. Yeah. Uh, that would be so but iconic. It does man. two things. It one depicts the Stady as a fucking creepy little creep, and two, it just shows him as a fucking tyrant. Mm. Very wow. interesting interpretation, Cam. That's that's actually very interesting. Yeah. That makes more sense than someone yeah. painting this in earnest. Well, yeah. So, okay. but they put it on. They put it up in the police station. So let's back up for a second. All I was able to find of this was a handful of Reddit posts, and in the comments, people saying it was in this police station. Now I, now I was skeptical. Oh, maybe it's not. Well. It's okay. just like, because you could just put that picture from yeah. wherever and just say, why is this in the police department? Yeah. It could be a troll. However, in several of the threads, there were replies that were saying, that identified the police station. Yeah, I've been there. I've seen it. Mm. Still isn't definitive proof. This is all. Let's start over. Okay. Do you think that's a problem? I yeah. prefer not to. Okay. okay. It's in West Virginia, the state yeah. of West Virginia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this um, specific location, um, I gave a call and I said, hey, I'm an art student at the University of West Virginia. <laughs> and I am doing my thesis on uh, art in the, uh, you know, public service uh, buildings, if you will. And... <laughs> This woman, she was she was nice. I said my spiel, and she's like, "Hold on one second. A minute goes by, and I get a voicemail. She transferred me to a voicemail, mm. and that's all I got with it. So, what my take from that was that the fact that she didn't outright deny it makes me think that shit was right so there's two two theories i would have is one who's this fucking dumbass like why the fuck you know well, i don't give a shit number two is people might have before i inquired um so i don't know i feel like you couldn't have been the first person correct and uh, so i think that shit was up i think they did it man i i would agree with that i think I he rest resuscitated a child with his with tongue I mean, and apologies for that, but that you know, w and some call him pig. Right. The awesome. artist ten is one of them. We gotta I find don't out. Know. I feel like this metal. is. A, I feel like this is just like a, a a painting that's made with that statement. I feel like it's probably not. In the that's my feeling. Well, 
that was my feeling as well. But I it think it was only after seeing repeated mentions of because uh, again, it wasn't just one thread. It's been posted to Reddit four or five different times over the last several years. And again, and in it, each one, somebody would crop up and be like, "I, uh, I've been to this police station. I've seen it." Wait, love this. Yeah. Wait, we have oh. a new development. Holy fuck! Yeah, Th found that. Hold on, this is around. actually a reference to this. Yeah. So it's not a Kronos thing. This is a real what thing. What is this? 1971. Police advert. What? Some yes. call him Pig. Mm. Here's the cop uh, resuscitating a child with tongue while holding him. What is this demon shit? So this is real. <laughs> <laughs> so this helps the case of the, oh the validity God. of the painting. I guess it, it helps yeah. the case significantly. Yeah. Dude, yeah. 1971 was a crazy year. Wow. Uh, what a find. In yeah. none of those threads did I see anybody mention this. That it had history. This is breaking. This, oh, is, this is breaking. This is an history podcast exclusive. People. I googled some Colin Pig and like scroll down, way down. And it was oh, on Google yeah. Images, huh? Yeah. But you can even see it was some advertising company. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah like, see, once you Google some Colin Pig, there's others. Yeah. It was like a whole campaign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What the fuck were they thinking, man? I guess people didn't even really think about like pedophiles back then. <laughs> They're just like, no, he's a pedophile. That's cool. <laughs> I, I, They're like, I that's dope. It's part of their job, man. I don't think that's what people think. I see one. Some call him pig. I call him officer and sir. Welcome, Georgia police. Okay, okay you so know this what? Is like a anti, this is an anti-police hate uh, campaign. And they managed to make it a cop. <laughs> making Molesting out with a child. child. <laughs> All right. My question is this. <laughs> that's, so, that's so much crazier. Yeah. <laughs> this was up in a police station. There's no chance. <laughs> they thought they ate. Okay, here's my question. You got a cop with a dead child he's making out with. Here you got another cop with a passed out child. Here you got another cop, Matt Gates. Why are all these cops hanging out with these all of these passed out kids? Because they're pigs. <laughs> 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 I'm calling pig and they'd be right. A public service wow. advertisement from Hustler Magazine. Hustler University? N Hustler Magazine. Oh, the so there, that's that's a troll then. No. Yeah, yeah. A public it's... service advertisement from Hustler Magazine. Oh, Larry Hustler. Flint. Larry that's Larry Flint, Flint. notoriously would do. <clears throat> Trolling Shit, like the police. Why would they put it on a stop sign? <laughs> it says Outdoor Advertising Company of the Twin Cities, Inc. Hmm. On this one. We gotta dig. We gotta dig more. We gotta get to the bottom of the story. It's, I'm fascinated now. Here's another billboard, and some call him Pig. Hmm. Fraternal Order of the Police. So they definitely pay for this. Jersey City Lodge, four. Although this one, he, he's not kissing the child. So this not is like a whole child, thing. Simply holding it. There's Yo. all kinds of versions of it. Like there's a bunch. When it's, you, it's when you Google a, some call him Pig. It's such a crazy ad campaign. It's like yeah. Yeah. Well, one <laughs> officer saved a kid once. Therefore. Don't think about anything else. <laughs> just not worry about the other stuff. I think this is real. I, I don't know what to say. This I, I don't know that this one was in Hustler. And this one, he's not even kissing the kid. So this one seems somewhat serious. Uh, the fact that it says it's from Hustler Magazine leads me to think it's not. I mean, it, well, did 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 Layer Flint have a problem with the police? Just, I mean, he was a First Amendment advocate. Um, I don't know. You could, by the way, you can see an officer's name on this. Yo, you can see, you can see the name of the pedo officer. Oh wow, that's interesting. <laughs> Why people be worrying about gold miners instead of miners on an island somewhere? Mm hmm. Why are people not worry about the pigs making out with our kids and not the pigs eating our corn? Mm-hmm. You gotta have that song yeah, maybe ready maybe. for me, Jack. Yeah, people are saying, can you send me the link that you, because you kept scrolling so fast. Oh, here it is. Uh, we are furiously back-checking the this story, which is... <laughs> Yeah, okay. Constantly developing. D directly above the Hustler thing, it says, here it's being mocked by Hustler. Because it's dumb. Yeah, but 
So this, so look at this giant the billboard in like fucking LA or New York City or some major metropolis area. This work concerned a billboard, enormous advertisement in the Minneapolis Police Department had produced and put up so they did this shit and various who were for this they did this shit the only european observer petana underlined its contradiction in terms and unintentional irony incomprehensible to the americans of the midwest the poster was paid for by the police department <laughs> to celebrate the courage of their agents but faced with the image of a policeman kissing a little boy on the mouth i said it was no surprise they were called pigs but I was also the only one to have seen it as a kiss, and the others saw nothing funny in it. Interesting. <laughs> this is a fascinating story. Yeah. 1971. Oh. So yeah, the oh. police did this shit. Oh. So it seems that, yeah, they were getting mocked just because people hate the police. But mm -hmm. I guess the pedo thing wasn't really observed by any but a European observer. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess they're more used to uh the they've been around the church for longer, you know what I mean? They know they know what they see. The Europeans been around longer than the Americans. Uh. That's a that's pedophilia! No no no, that's called Sunday school, boy. I don't know what y'all Europeans get up to, but that's just choir boy training. Show us! We put all our choir boys through similar training experiences. Show us! <laughs> Don't show us. Here's there's more information about it. Some call the him pig. We'll see the, the source here. The American Catholic political and cultural culture from a Catholic perspective. Who, who else would know better? Yo, this was posted in 2023? This was post- wait, what the fuck? Where? This was posted today. No. Wait, no, no, it's no, not. No, that's just today. This is just today. today? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, yo. Okay, this came out in 2016, so not that long. Ago. Yeah, there was already the whole <laughs> scandal was pretty much come to life. Mm -hmm. Let's hear what the church had to say about this. We seem to be in danger of replaying the long hot summer. Oh, I see you're already getting all steamy and hot. The long hot summer of the late 1960s and early 1970s when the radical left declared open warfare on cops. The above billboard was put up by Mit uh, Minneapolis Police Department in 1971, showing an officer giving mouth to mouth resuscitation to a boy. The poster went viral <laughs> across the nation. In the wake of the murder of five cops in Dallas by a sniper, Xavier Johnson, intent on killing as many white cops, cops as he could, oh, wasn't that guy of the cop? I think that guy was a cop, if I remember correctly. What? I don't know. Micah, I don't know that story. Micah Xavier Johnson killed five cops. Cops are not above criticism, and over the years, I've done a fair amount of that. However, cops have a very tough job. Most of them do that job as best as they are capable, fairly, and with heroism. When they're called upon to run towards danger, you know they can respond. Just like what happened in, uh... Just like what happened in, uh... What was it cool? Were they just killed in the hallway? Those kids were murdered? Evolved. Just like what happened in Uvalde, baby. That guy was uh, ex-military, by the way. He wasn't a cop. Uh, not from what I'm seeing. So let's let Jack Webb as Detective Joe Friday have the last word. Okay. Let's hear what Joe... Let's see. I'm interested. What's the difference? You might as well know. She told me two days ago. Told you what? We broke up. You're not... This is claimed? That's shocked. Like, what the fuck? Oh. Oh, it is? Seems like it. Oh. Okay, well, the Catholic loves it. In 2016. Of course they do. <laughs> Look at this. Some call him pig. I call him sir. You best obey, boy. Now come here and give me a kiss. Pretend like you passed out. No one's asking no questions. Mm. That's right. Okay, that was a bit of a meme hole. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I think, in short, I think we can basically make an educated guess that that I, painting is real. I now yeah. feel much more confident saying it's real. Yeah. Me I mean, good theory, Cam. I thought for a minute that you were onto something, and <laughs> it made more sense that to me that... That could still be true for whoever originally designed it in the 60s. Hmm. Yeah.
Yeah. Well, it makes more sense as a parody than it does as a real statement. Yeah. But as far as we can tell, that shit is real as it gets, man. It's supposed to depict safety, and it is literally the most dangerous painting I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, I don't even think you could like show that on TV. Okay. All right. <laughs> that was interesting. Kid Rock, you remember Kid Rock? He goes, Gramp, Grandpa's was getting Grandpa's a little frisky. A little frisky and he shot a bunch of Bud Light during the uh, Dylan Mulvaney. Uh, uh -huh. He was like one of the main perpetrators. Well, guess. Oh, you sent me that original video. Let's set this up properly. Yeah. So, everybody was blowing up their beer that they had already bought. <laughs> Reminded. They were shooting it. They were. Dumping it, exploding it, stabbing it. Because Dylan Mulvaney drinks Bud Light, and we don't like that kind of stuff. Grandpa's feeling a little frisky. If Dylan Mulvaney drink Bud Light, then it's like I'm kissing her. I can't accept that. So here's Kid Rock making a, sending a message to America. No, to the world. Here it is. Go ahead, Grandpa. <laughs> Grandpa's feeling a little frisky today. Oh. Let me uh, say something to all of you and be as clear and concise as possible. I don't like when Grandpa feeling frisky. So, again, cool. this, wow. it's great. Either he went out and bought these for this purpose, right, or he bought them before. What, you, you, you both are good. Purpose. Yeah, I, I think I, he bought it for this purpose, so which is, you know, <laughs> pretty ironic. But I think he made his, his uh, message loud and clear. Okay. The message is that I will never touch another Budweiser as long as I live right. because of them promoting a trans Right. It's despicable. How long ago was that video posted? Uh, I want to say like two or three months ago. Oh, is that it? April. Okay, a little bit more. So, anyway, cut to uh, Kid Rock enjoying himself at the game <laughs> with the Bud Light. Concert, actually. Concert. He's having the time of his life, <laughs> and he's enjoying a nice, cold Bud Light. But I thought you made yourself perfectly clear. Yeah. Now I'm confused. What was your message? <laughs> I have, I'm going to have to reanalyze that. Because um, I'm just more confused than ever. I thought Man, you... I was worried. I thought you weren't gonna drink none of that. You telling me you just doing what I heard is virtue signaling kind of thing? That you don't really care. One more time, because again, really confusing. <laughs> Grandpa's feeling a little frisky today. All right. Let me uh, say something to all of you and be as clear and concise okay. as possible. <laughs> okay. Shooting. <laughs> Bud Light. Huh. Badass. But then he's drinking Bud Light a few months later. It's I don't Beta. Bye. 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 Bush. Have a terrific day. <laughs> Maybe they made up. Him and Anheuser Busch, they yeah, made up. <laughs> Grandpa's feeling a little <laughs> frisky today. I guess he was feeling a little frisky yeah, on this day. He's like, I'm gonna fuck around and have a Bud Light. As clear and concise. Is possible. What a phony bitch. <laughs> what a phony bitch. Like, you don't even give a fuck. Like, you don't even care enough to not drink it for, like, a few months. <laughs> and here you are basically advocating for violence against trans people. And you don't even care, Kid Rock. We drank beer. Also, your white trash and your music sucks. Maybe he changed his mind and now he's, he's down. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe he's a trans, yeah. a Our trans ally. I feel like as a statement, he's holding it up proudly. He's a trans ally. Yeah, he's facing the logo to the camera. I think, honestly, he's coming oh. out to say something here. Mm. Shout out to trans ally Kid Rock. <laughs> maybe that's the vibe. I think it's fun. Too. Here he is from another angle, Look actually. Look at that. It's like an ad for... But he's out there, like, <laughs> so... Publicly, yeah. it has to be. Uh, He's holding it over the edge, high hey, up in the heavens. Bud Light, man. I mean, you I'm can so read the words. And he's at a country show, so I mean, 
Shit, dude. He's talking right to the people. Yeah. yeah. Dang, wow. I've changed. Wow. Shout out, France <laughs> ally. It's a soft. It's a soft one. He's just holding a beer. Okay. It's a soft beer. Yeah, it's soft launch. I'm glad he did some work. He did some therapy. introspective, some therapy, probably and some, some met, education. Probably spent some time with some trans people yeah. that have learned about their real yeah. experience. He's coming out with a statement. Should we make a uh, post on Twitter? Just shout out to trans ally Kid Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. I would love post the both images, the first one and this one. Yeah. And you can do it from the podcast. All right. Shout out to trans ally Kid Rock. We appreciate your support. Cheers, my dude. Cheers, my dude. Love you. <laughs> Cheers, my dude. Uh, oh. Oh. Now that's that what allyship quick. looks like. Love you. We didn't blow those up. I was feeling too frisky today. I thought we blew all those up. Oh, time. shit. You probably should have kept that to yourself, my guy. So there it is, Kid Rock out there sticking to his guns, bro. I'm Kid Rock. I stick my guns. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Love sculpture. We better didn't get Yes. To it. Let's take a look. Oh, my God. Yeah, let's Fuck. go. Wait. You ready? Let's do it. Yeah. Let's yeah. Go. Okay. Okay. Wait, Shit. Then... It's like we're at the bottom of the show already. Right? Yeah. I feel bad that we didn't do it earlier. Uh, we did it on my way. Sure, yeah. Fuck we'll like you. Let me see what Dan thinks. We've had a good old time. I think he's taking it down. <laughs> he ran off real quick and he's been uh, gone for, uh, for a long time. Or he's eating the food? Mm, no. I think mm. that's <laughs> He's taking it off. Yeah, he's in the uh -huh. bathroom. Sure come out. Dan's feeling a little frisky today. Um, Brittany here said, show Ela the girl going down the slide, the one who fixed her reflective oh. vest as a diaper. Mm. There, was a, there was a fan who went down the slide with a vest. She was going very fast. So the vest she launched that. Yeah. Like yeah, it does. It does. Nice. Problem, mystery solved. Should we do love sculptor, sculpture on Monday? Because we're almost out of time, Dan. Or should, I mean, we could definitely we do it now. We could definitely it do it now. It doesn't take long. All right, I mean, let's do it. Like a big segment. Let's do it. All right. Here, you want to see this, Hila? Uh, I guess oh. the people want you to see this. Oh, let's take a look. Yeah, it was really good. I'm, I was really happy with her work. On as to mimic what the cop was wearing. I don't think anyone realizes the trek it takes to get up to this slide. You need to go through all these slides. <laughs> Round two. The slide, little bit wet on the inside, cause a little bit of friction. So it's a little wet. Well, so I decided ah. to put the vest on my butt, <laughs> like a diaper. Oh my god! Right through there. And okay, the she definitely confirms <laughs> the fabric. <theory>. Oh. <laughs> so the second one, she goes even further. Watch out how far she goes. <laughs> I'm really far. Yeah. yeah so. Nice. Once again, a big thank you to yeah. um, Benzo Babe. <laughs> Benzo Baby, 22. All right, love. Show us what you got. Uh, all right. Should we just jump for like set it up a bit? Should we yeah, show? Sure. Maybe yeah. oh, can we right. show there's the there's other a, ones? There's a gallery in there for the other ones. Refresh right. our memory. Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. So. Here on the H3 podcast, we do somewhat of a ink blot test for the crew members. Mm. Uh, but instead of, you know, dabbing the ink and telling us what they see, they do a sculpture of my face. And the results are just so profound and so insightful into their beings um, that we basically, I need to see what love really thinks about me. So, 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 as you guys can see, I mean, stare into the souls. Some of these are deeply disturbing. Zach's <laughs> was the most disturbing. I was rendered speechless. <laughs> this one was also terrifying. Thank you, love. Thank this, you. This one's just Wally P. <laughs> so, and the winner was Ian's here. But okay, so love, you you've made your own creation. So right. go ahead, please. Yeah, so, I guess we can swatch over. I took the same inspiration. Okay. Uh, as the other crew members, uh -huh. so I have not. This is not now Ethan, this is old Ethan. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Yeah, all right. I got so. you. Yo. 
Wow. Mm. Oh, he got a little hat on too? Wow, I didn't know that. You I'm can gonna, take the hat off. Yeah, I'm going to reveal the hairline here too. Oh. Wow. Hairline reveal. Gorgeous. 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 <laughs> All right, can you turn go. it to the side for me? Sure. Hmm. Is that a wow. prosthetic ah. nose I see? Dude, the neck area is crazy. Yeah. Yeah, also, you got my patchy time. fucked up beard. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a little patchy. Just... Wow. Oh, my God. That's quite good. Uh, what do you lips? think, Ethan? The lips are pretty good. Show me the front. <laughs> <Your lips. laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Those kind of look like me. <laughs> a little bit. I think it captures something, right? <laughs> Show me the other profile. I love that Oh, the other way? The Wait, other this profile? was... Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Oh. Got it. <laughs> yeah. The profile is quite, It's quite a one-dimensional profile. Um, I think it's good. Let I me mean, move over, so... And let me see the back, please. Sure. You know, I did not spend too much time on the back here, but... <laughs> okay. It's quite Lots simple. of hair. I yeah. went with the artistic uh, choice to... Uh, don't... Not add, like, wool for the hair, because mm. I... I'm dead. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's quite flat up here, but of course the hairline is still beautifully lined up here. The classic McDonald's M hairline <laughs> as we've all fallen in love with. Wow. Uh, gorgeous. Gorgeous. Uh-huh. Yeah, do a little zoom in. I'm, I'm, I'm gazing into the eyes and I'm I'm trying to feel what motion it is. And you, you might as well see the eyes are beautifully um, colored too. Actually, hazel? Hazel, yeah. Oh. Um, amber, amber, amber. 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 Yes. Amber, yeah. Good work. You know, it's not. Some of these terrified me. Like, I'm like, this person's disturbed or they want me dead. Sure. I'm not getting the same. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I see the resemblance. I think it it's looks, kind of it, great. It, it genuinely yeah. does look like me. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, well, that's great. Want to do a side view? <laughs> for the close up, too? I feel like it's the mouth and the chin. <laughs> Dead ring. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, honestly, it's, it's good. Oh, yeah, and I gotta say, I think you might actually not hate me based on this. Oh yeah, I don't. I don't. Definitely not. There's a, there's a, sin, there's a serenity in it. Right. Yeah. There's, mm -hmm. you know. How long did it take? Well, that's a good question. It took uh, probably total one and a half hour, I'd say. Okay. Um, the longest time took to like put all the clay on. Mm -hmm. We did that yesterday. And I guess I spent 30 or 40 minutes painting it today. Mm. Uh, yeah, it took a long time to blend the colors too. Yeah, mm. I think you did a great, a fantastic oh, I job. That. I yeah. gotta that. say, thank you. Yeah. Thank and it you. does. Yeah, it doesn't give me existential dread. So. Well, yeah, <laughs> right. That's good. It was. I I made the eyes way too small at first. It did give a little bit of a creepy vibe to it. I did make them a bit bigger. Oh, you mm. you uh. Okay, you redid it. Well, I just kind of yeah. made the pupils too small. Very it looked good. like you were uh, staring into yeah. my soul. Mm -hmm. All right. Very cool. good. There you go. Nice. Thank you. Uh, he'll join the pantheon of of heroes. Yeah. We have what an the, honor. We have the a little display shelf with all the heads. Thank you, love. Very well done. Very well done. Beautiful. It's really not easy to sculpture. Not easy. A three-dimensional <laughs> head. No, I, I mean, listen. I think everyone. I'm impressed with what. Yeah, me too. Accomplished. But what? I mean, like, look at Zach, and then like you understand how <laughs> how disturbed, how disturbed I was. you felt. <laughs> I mean, I was literally speechless when this was <laughs> unveiled. <laughs> uh, you know, truly a. And, uh, really a formative day for me. There's no shot this is me and not Wally P. Who did this one? Look at the reference next to it. I think oh, I you just, did this one, yeah, Cam. I just think I went too close to the reference. I did <laughs> the reference, actually. Because so yeah. you're like a low angle there. You know, 
I never no, tried I it, and I kind of wouldn't no, mind trying do one. it. That'd be mm. fun. Oh god, because yours is going to be really meaningful. I just feel like it seems it's fun so to do. Do it. That'd be awesome. Mm. Maybe I should do one about myself too. Just keep it oh, all going. Yeah. That'd be fun. Yeah. 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 Self portrait. Yeah. Interesting. Uh -huh. Interesting. Let's get okay. Trevor and Alfredo to do it too. Yeah. <laughs> right. That is so sweet. It's actually very therapeutic to do. It's very calming. Everybody I had a said great that. time. That's what everybody that. said. Yeah. So, where's the pizza? Because it Shit. is it's been a while. for the pizza. charity. It's on its way. ETA? Do they know that there's Doesn't a pregnant lady? 30 minutes from the time mm. I ordered it, so let me... It's been way over 30 minutes, shit. I know, I agree. It's been like well, over an hour. Well, when they're close. You so. know how Postmates has like a priority option? There needs to be a pregnancy <laughs> option. Right, <true. laughs> Oh, Jones and... Pregnant and hungry, motherfuckers. Baby wants. <laughs> it's been exactly 30 minutes, so they should be calling me any Oh, it's only been 30 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. They should be calling any time. All right, so let's let's move on here. You know what I was enjoying as we wait for the pizza? Hmm. I was really enjoying that country singer. I'd like to listen to some of his other songs that are yeah, starting. Yeah, actually, I am curious. Is and it I, also like the same? That's what I'm, I'm wondering if it's also like, I hate bad people. Or was this one, one mm. where he was fed lyrics? The others are different. Let's look into it. So what's the name of his song that's like number two? Let's see, it's Rich on the chart. Oh. I'm looking for that. That was the number one. number one. And then can you also just check the copyright before I throw it up? That's just a good plan. True. And in the meantime, let's just enjoy it. The rich man out here in Richmond. They fat as fuck. <laughs> they stand outside the world welfare office like it's a food truck. Hey. These fat motherfuckers, they ruin our goddamn beautiful country. So the number two one is called Ain't Got a Dollar, and it was actually published 11 months ago. Ain't Got a Dollar. Uh -huh. So this one is actually predates the smash hit by quite a bit. Oh, it, well, it now has a lot of views. Okay, hold on. Other one, Ooh, this one sad. feels more authentic. This is a dude in the woods with a guitar filming on like This one feels real, iPhone. bro. This is Okay, real. this yeah. Yeah. This you is can real tell this is like shit. phone footage. This is real country folks. This are real shit. Why? Wow. Here, let's put on the lyric. Mm -hmm. Uh, I see the lyrics are actually in the description. Ain't got a dollar? Um, although I- I got CC. Sounds like a dollar in the woods. Mm. I found the fat man in the woods. Working all day. He was hungry, Overtime wouldn't feed him. Bullshit pay so I can sit out here and waste my life mm. This is the other one. This is the- I'm not playing it, that's that. Oh, gotcha. Just get the fat part. Did you okay. did you check the copyright on this? I'm downloading it to okay. re-upload it and check. I'll just I'll wait a sec. His voice is beautiful. Yeah, I was it's listening to it. It's a shame, yeah, but beautiful. There's a, listen, beautiful voices are dime a dozen. We're in a country with 330 yeah. million people. No, you're right about that. You know, whoever's a successful musician is such a crapshoot slash just about how attractive you are most of the time. Right. Well, thank God I look like a supermodel. That's right. Hell yeah, brother. <laughs> You're gonna make Heart it. brother. Heart throb. <sighs> All right. Um, Towering at six. Six one. Four. <laughs> Thank you to whoever clapped. All right. As we wait for the uh, claim. Why is he worried about taxes? Like, what's his tax rate? <laughs> he probably lives in a tax-free state anyways, right? Like, mm. literally, no, what, no, why are you crying about taxi, bro? Do you even make money? The fat motherfuckers are eating Twinkies! You know what I'll do is I'll, uh... Um, because this song's, like, super easy, I'll just re-record it so we can just have a bed of it. You know? Without okay. any vocal. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. That'd be good. Check this out. What does this make you feel, Hila? Oh my god. Wait, does That's that make crazy. you feel something? It's like... It, it, oddly, it works. It's quite good. 
That's me and Claymation. You did oh, good, well. love. Oh, well, thank you. Very good. I used to do it when I was a kid. Like, uh, yeah? Yeah, I worked with stuff, and my parents do it, too. So. Are we good on this, Dan? Uh, looks no immediate claim. All right, just keep an eye on it. All right, this is dollar in the wood. No, ain't got a dollar. <laughs> so this is a song I wrote. Uh, it's based off a true story. It's called uh, Ain't Got a Dollar. <laughs> That, that is literally like simple, man. The Skinner song. I think it's like uh, the same chords. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's pretty. Right? Yeah. When the sun goes down on this city, city town, we can ride up bowl, pass it around. I ain't got a dollar, but I don't need a dime. Skipping the chorus. This one's. I see why this one didn't go viral. It just mm. doesn't have the oomph. Um. No obesity no passes, joke. No obesity joke. <laughs> they don't. They mentioned smoking weed in it too. Yo, that is not cool. I hate this song. I, can't, I, I, I can't see hate why it. they weren't promoting yeah. this one. You know. Muscadine. Muscadine. Okay. Okay. Found a dead dollar. Found a dead dollar. So there's no. Um, <laughs> I think uh, so far it's supporting our theory. The astroturfing? Yeah. yeah. For sure. Again, why didn't they share that out? So to go Bad back to life. my original question, what is the point of that industry plans are astroturfing? Is it just to... They're trying to get, like... Again, the problem is not the capitalism. The problem is the people on welfare. The people poorer than... Easy. No, I'm just mean like the people propaganda. behind this. It's propaganda. just spreading pro yes. propaganda. Yeah, it's propaganda. Because again, it's like the greatest. But with somebody like that girl from the podcast, Bobby, what would yeah. be the reason? That I'm, I'm still not on board with that. Okay. No, well, no, that's not propaganda. They just want to make money. Mm -hmm. That's. Yeah. I'm not on with the Bobby Astor turf. Although astroturfing is political, usually, right? Yeah, I mean, th those are different concepts, so they just overlap, but... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the greatest trick that these genius, diabolical uh, Republicans get away with is convincing a bunch of poor country folk that... You know, it's poor people's fault. It's welfare people's mm -hmm. fault. It's gay trans people's fault. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like to support Donald Trump, who literally has a giant skyscraper in New York City. No, no, no. The guy who would never let anybody that looked like these yokies in one of his golf clubs. He would never let them. Shut up! <laughs> you think these people would ever get into He would technically be a returned dwarf. Mm -hmm. And so this is this, is, and all of them are. All the top Republicans are like straight, Ivy League, mega privileged, super wealthy. 
and 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 they've and th you know this is brilliant propaganda for them to mm -hmm. convince these types of people that it ain't us, boy. It's all the fat people and twinkies and all that, you know. All right. Listen, I'm trying to stretch this out. I just want the pizza. We can just wrap I it mean, up. It's five. Yeah, I mean we're well. Well, it's, well, it's like if we're just sitting we here, I might as well pizza keep doing the, the show. No, I just I mean we're just here, so I might as well entertain the people while we're here. You know what I mean? Keep the keep the people uh, keeping keeping it up. But this is a really cool. Oh, I need this clap. <laughs> yeah. I found a team star in the woods. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's listen to another one, I guess. Fuck. Here he is playing a massive crowd five days after he went viral. Let's see what this looks like. Y'all filled 25 acres with cars for my first ever gig. I am so proud to be a part of this movement. Yeah, don't tell him if you ever give any kind of live take in any of your songs that you'll be completely discarded so these people actually don't care about you at all as an artist or a person just as a piece of propaganda they love them why is my health care not social oh ab they went on a ab's not here today i forgot to explain that uh they went they're visiting back home or they have, nope. they have uh, family. Oh, they're, oh. I, knew they have family. I knew that, I knew that. Yeah. Their family's in town. I knew it was family something. Picked a terrible time to come to LA with a hurricane. A fucking hurricane. Oh, hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> they had to hit the, the city for the first time, <laughs> like, ever. Yeah. That's crazy. Climate change is kind of fun all of a sudden. Okay. Get some nice rain out here in the summer. Shit. <laughs> you know what Good I mean? Damn. Hey, everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks to everyone who stayed after for photo and to tell me your story. It means more than words can describe. If you couldn't make it, rumble.com, baby. You know he posted on rumble. Why not? Of course he's posting on rumble.com. Yeah, that's another one. Like, why is he already on rumble? Doesn't make any sense to be on a rumble as a small crazy. No yeah. fucking yeah. sense yeah. at all. Clearly something yeah. fucking going on here. That's like opinion. posting like, thank you to the Daily Stormer. <laughs> yeah. You guys are the best. Do you want to listen to more music from him? Mm, not really. Not really. <laughs> shame. That's a shame. Uh, we got a TikTok singer <laughs> accuses his target employees of being racist. Fantano update. I think I talked about that on C next Tuesday, but Activision bailed on the Fantano lawsuit because they were fucking wrong. So wrong. I uh, was not following that story. They use... Okay, so Activision used Anthony Fantano's sound from TikTok. He has a viral sound where he goes, That's enough slices! Maybe okay. he says it. Someone's cutting a pizza and he goes, That's enough! Okay. And then they used it to promote a video game. So, like, what's been happening Exactly the sound? same. Okay. And so Fantano, Ooh, yeah, this. A fresh pie, save me a slice. That's good. So this was a popular okay, sound on TikTok good. for a while. Yeah, okay. that's... All right, that's good. Okay, okay. <laughs> all right, okay, all right. Okay, that's good. That's good. It's it's enough slices. <laughs> so he wrote them a letter like we did. Yeah. I was like, "Yo, you need to pay me. What the fuck?" <laughs> and um, and response. He's a maniac. <laughs> they were like, "We're suing you." Well, okay. So that the headline was that they were suing, but what they actually. They filed something to like force the judge to um, make a, a early a pleading. Mm. I don't know what it's I forget what it's called. But they were like fighting it, trying to fight it. And all there's all these headlines about Anthony Fantano being sued by Activision, uh -huh. and they were trying to paint it like he's this greedy bad guy. Mm. And people were taking the bait. I feel like too. Really? Somewhat. I mean, you had a lot of support too, though. I don't know. It was, it it was, was really sneaky what they did. Mm. But my take was like, there's no fucking... I think they were just trying to do some PR bullshit. Mm. But uh, they dropped it, and I'm sure they settled. And I'm sure Anthony got paid. Fine. 
So there's no word if he actually. Does. I mean, if it's settled, yeah, he got. Probably like, yeah, yeah. Because he's not gonna like, drop. Yeah. It. No. That kind of stuff is like NBA. Yeah, could be. Right. I mean, it's up to the parties, but probably yes. Yeah. I think he got like. I think in the letter he asked for a hundred thousand. Mm. I don't remember. But because of the uh, the coverage it got, I wouldn't be surprised if he got like fifty thousand or something from that. Good for him. Yeah. That's yeah. enough slices. <laughs> Activision be like, that's enough slices. Mm. Yo, Alfredo is so soft, man. He's so cute, He's man. The best. <laughs> Absolutely the best. Oh. oh, this is fun. People like when we do this. React to the sniper wolf first. Oh, that's long though. If you're well, looking to we don't have to watch the whole thing. A few weeks. Oh, ago. this is the Jack film one. I was gonna react to a Darman sniper wolf one. That's what I thought you were talking about. Those what ones. are you talking about? This is Jack vs. Uh, sniper wolf uh, update video. Oh, I see, I see, I see. A few weeks ago, I made a video okay. about YouTuber Sniper Wolf and how she's profited off the works of thousands of other creators by reacting to them in the laziest way possible. And on my other channel, Judge of Jack's Films, we've gone much, much deeper into just how empty Wait, her commentary is. No, in this fact, channel's doing super so good for us. That Twitter People user really is in. Let's street. go check out his channel. Uh, like it, his, it's really interesting. Oh my God. Judge of Jack's Films. Wait, hold the fucking phone. Wait, that is so funny. Papa said they're 10 minutes out. The driver had other orders to drop off. Papa, get your <laughs> shit together, <laughs> man. Other <laughs> orders. Wait, you got Papa Excuse John? Me. Papa's in the house. You they do that the stuff, Chris? Yeah, oh, the they stuff do that? I thought that, that was a time. I thought that was well, a pizza hut thing. Welcome to Papa's house. My bad. Here, here's uh, his parody channel. I mean, that's just five hours ago. He's got, he's, look wow, at that. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's doing quite well. Oh and these my are just god. Right? Look, 700. No, this videos. is this is the channel that's like dedicated to this. Oh, but are these channel. not are these not highlights from his live stream? No, he does he does produce his videos. Oh, okay. I, no, I think he's like they they right. I think live. he does it live. I think uh, he records okay. them live and then posts them to this channel. Okay. Yeah. Well, he does put a bit of work into editing. Yeah, they're edited. So. Click that. We got another epic Sniper Wolf reaction. Dude, he's got to be <laughs> loving this. I hear yeah. I'm hating it. Can we talk about how awful this crop is? This is a terrible crop, um, which I believe is a square. I believe that's a new spot. So we have bro, and we have terrible crop. Good card, good card. <laughs> no wins. Let's go, good card. Oh, she's going to read the, the captions. Videos. OK, let's let's see, let's see. Bro, letters and truth of thoughts win. <laughs> read the <laughs> captions. <laughs> oh, I don't have caption. <laughs> All right, so sound effects. People are saying double free boot. Oh <laughs> shit! Look at the overtime. That might as well be a viral hog. Oh my god. Free boot, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, he really hit something. That's uh, so funny. He really hit on something. <laughs> yep. I, I I don't even know. His main channel videos were not getting these this many views. No, like, yeah. He's and posting every day too. So. Yeah, I was just gonna yeah. say that. Good for him, man. <laughs> yeah, good for him. That's, That's awesome. crazy. I'm happy for him. <laughs> Do me a favor. Pull this channel up on Social Blade. I'm curious. What's his monthly views? Uh, on this channel? On J J J Jack's films. <laughs> oh, he's live on Twitch right now. Let's pull it up. There you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's let's see the man in the action. Five point three million views. That's money. <laughs> um, can you? Yeah, yeah, he's live right now. Let's let's check in on Jack. <laughs> And then I, I guess I gotta, I gotta get off this. Okay, here's the deal. It's very possible there was unnecessary oh yelling. <laughs> Holy crap, Peter! I'm, I'm really, really. Close What's his live viewers? Is blocked by the. Uh, it's five thousand five hundred. Five thousand? Yeah, five thousand. Let's go, dude. And then I let yeah. you decide. I let you decide. <laughs> On Twitch, that's pretty good. I will finish the clip and then I will let you guys decide. Oh my god! If I get a bingo, I'll like, I'll gift subs. Um, but hold on. Let's finish the TikTok. Uh, so we can <laughs> <laughs> Sniper Wolf Bingo. That's so fun. Yeah. All right, so, <laughs> bro is You can play along. Fuck it. See, if you type uh, exclamation I bingo. He should, he should be no, selling bingo card sheets. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Yeah, she'd be reading the. 
Oh my god, stop saying Shibi. Stop doing that. Stop. Um, let's see. Oh my god. Sign that says please wash your hands for at least 30 seconds. And now oh. she want a snack. So this is okay. She does she, so like she just she narrates. Say what's happening before yeah. we even yeah. narrating the video is not commentary. She does this all the time. It's weird. not transformative. It's commentary. very very weird. So it's not like a natural reaction. Actually, I wonder, is there a cut? All right, I gotta go. I'm getting tired. I'm all, I, I can't do it anymore, guys. I, I wanted to do it, but I can't do it. Sorry, the pizza's about to arrive, so. And you know, I'm still reeling from that dream. I'm still recovering. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to. You're on no sleep. I'm on no sleep. So guys, listen. With all the peace and love in the world, I thank you for being here, for watching, for Pizza's another great here. week of shows. What? The pizza's here. Oh, fucking thank God. Thank <laughs> there you God. go, you yeah. made it. <laughs> Let's have a slice on camera for the folks at home. Oh, let wrap up. I hope you guys have a great weekend. If you're in LA or SoCal, watch your ass, because there's a storm yeah, coming. this weekend. Yeah, well. For real. I'll be out on, we'll be out on the sea whale watching. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like Lieutenant Dan at the top of the mast. Rain or shine. Rain or shine, motherfuckers. Let's check the weather forecast because it, it like changes every hour. Because they don't know if it's gonna like hit LA exactly or if it's gonna go west. Right now it's looking like a direct hit. Oh my god. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's a direct hit. What is it gonna be like? I don't know. Thank you so much. What, what do we got here? Oh. What is veggie? Oh, was this uh? Burn on his feet. Oh Lord! So hot! Wow! Yeah. Okay, this I'm not gonna complain because I like it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching, everybody. This is a crazier pizza combo than what I get. Banana peppers, mushrooms, chicken. See you on Monday. See you guys on Monday. <laughs> Bye. All right, don't go to. Japan's Edo period was an amazing time of peace, drowning in prosperity, and splattered with the hot juices of culture. One huge source from which culture erupted was a place closed off by walls and surrounded by a moat, a magical district called Yoshiwara. 
the pleasure quarters of Japan's capital at the time. Within these walls lived so many women ready to bring men's desires to life, and so many more not ready to. And we're gonna talk about all of them, most of them. Watch out, I'm gonna be throwing a lot of names and terms at you. I need you to do your best to pretend to remember them. Yujo was a general word for prostitute. The characters mean literally playgirl or pleasure woman. Another word for them is joro, basically anyone who slept with their clients for money. Prostitutes tied their sashes in the front. All that glitter and glamour was a fantasy. These women mostly lived under the silk boots of their brothel owners, resigned to years of selling their thick bodies for a thin slice of the profits. Not all prostitutes were the same. Cheap ladies of pleasure were a plenty, and even men whose money pouches were as lonely as their wives could afford to spend some time with one. But Yoshiwara also had some high-ranking prostitutes, those we usually call by the word courtesan. There were other less famous pleasure quarters like in Kyoto and Osaka, but this video is about Yoshiwara, the jewel of the capital city of Edo, the family jewels. But most of this information applies to the other pleasure districts too. In the first half of the Edo period, when Yoshiwara was young, the women at the top of the pleasure pyramid, the highest ranking courtesans, were called Taiyu, also often called castle topplers because their beauty could start wars. Money flooded the pleasure district like Katrina. Early clients were elite samurai and the nobility, men whose wallets were as full as their balls, men who wanted not just any woman, but a woman with looks and brains and plenty of grace. Prostitutes had a bunch of ranks, but we'll just talk about the very top rank. Have you ever tried to eat sushi but only had one chopstick? Getting promoted to the highest rank of Taiyu was harder than that. A council of respected residents, business owners, and courtesan managers got together and had a whole reddit discussion about every inch of a courtesan. She had to beat everyone else in looks, intelligence, sophistication, and how much money she could make. One record listed a few features they looked for. Close, smoky eyebrows, larger eyes with big black pupils, face the shape of a melon seed, double-jointed hands, small waist, and long legs. Bad features were having an upturned, high-ridged or flat nose, big mouth, chin too pointy or no chin at all, bow legs, and having unsteady eyes that darted around like a monkey. That's what it said. A Taiyu couldn't touch or talk about money, couldn't eat in front of clients, and from her mouth never escaped a vulgar word or topic. She wore high platform sandals and tied a huge sash in the front, sporting white makeup, blackened teeth, and a million ornaments in her hair. A Taiyu didn't just grant you access to her body, she graced you with song, music, poetry, all of the cultured things. They were the celebrities of the pleasure quarters, regularly rejecting clients they thought were unworthy. A Taiyu was like a fish, try to catch her without the proper skills and she'll slip away, leaving you wet and alone. Even a Taiyu's name was a big deal. It carried a legacy. When one Taiyu retired, a later Taiyu could take up the name if she was worthy. The name Takao was passed down like a prized katana to 11 women, and the accomplishments of each woman added to its prestige. Now all parties must come to an end. Fun things must become soft again. In the second half of the Edo period, Yoshiwara's glamorous makeup was wearing off. The streets of the pleasure district were filled with more and more merchants and commoners instead of Japan's elites, people who were fine with paying bargain prices for bargain quality. So prices began dropping, and even the Taiyu became less sophisticated. You might even have heard a Taiyu do the unthinkable and curse once in a blue moon. The number of Taiyu fell as the years went by. Prostitutes of that quality were too hard to find and too expensive for most of the degenerates walking the alleys shopping for a warm bed with a cold wallet. At its peak in 1642, Yoshiwara housed 75 Taiyu. In 1761, there were only zero. That's right, they went extinct in the district. Now each Taiyu and other high-ranking courtesans were assigned one to three Kamuro each, depending on their rank. These were child assistants, girls in waiting. They were five to 14 years old, brought to the brothel for work at a really young age. Pleasure houses sent scouts all over the country looking for girls who had the potential to become beautiful women. These girls were usually seven to nine, but could be as young as five. 
They especially liked to visit beautiful places in the countryside recently struck by famine or natural disasters, or families drowning in debt because these people were more likely to sell their daughters. Upon entering the brothel, the girl became a kamuro and was taught the ways of the pleasure district. She was assigned to a courtesan. An extra good-looking and smart girl was assigned to a high-ranking courtesan. A courtesan took care of her girls and paid for all expenses, and a kamuro attended to her big sister, like lighting her pipe, bringing her meals, and running errands. One of her main jobs was playing Cupid for her big sister and the clients. She would send love letters and gifts back and forth. Clients often asked a kamuro about her big sister. What kind of flowers does she like? Does she love me? Is this her real finger that she sent me? Yeah, that really happened. Of course, clients had to ask themselves hard questions like, could they trust the words of a kamuro who was loyal to her big sister? And get hard answers like, no. They did not see clients, but all kamuro had the potential to become prostitutes when they grew up. Brothel owners pulled aside any kamuro with potential and taught her the three R's, reading, writing, and rocking the shamisen. Her education also included powerful courtesan techniques like playing other instruments, tea ceremony, and flower arrangement. But a girl who lacked potential got no education and for the rest of her contract just did child labor stuff like cleaning, washing clothes, and hating her parents. Kamuro grew up in the brothel and probably didn't know much about the world outside the Red Lantern District. They dreamed of being assigned to high-ranking courtesans and of becoming courtesans themselves, though they likely didn't fully understand the life of a courtesan, but no one wanted to be the loser kamuro stuck doing manual labor. At around 13 or 14, a kamuro graduated. Around this time was when her child contract would have ended and the brothel could choose to buy her for longer or not. If they thought she was good enough, the girl became a courtesan. If not, she became a shinzo. Shinzo literally meant newly launched boat. In the first half of the Edo period, young Shinzo were not allowed to sleep with clients because she might steal clients from high-ranking courtesans. She only entertained men while they waited for her big sister, talking to them, lighting their pipes, bringing them tea. But in the second half of Edo, she was basically a low-level teenage sex worker, able to see patrons on her own. There were a lot of jokes that old clients liked to seek out Shinzo because of their age, so that was probably not too uncommon. Part of the graduation ceremony from Kamuro to Shinzo included selling the right to deflower the graduate. Most women stayed at Shinzo for the rest of their careers, never sailing to the higher ranks. Yuna, bathhouse women. Bathhouses were nice innocent places where customers came and washed themselves instead of bathing with their cheap water at home. Then some visionary bathhouse owner had a bright idea. Instead of a place where people bathe, what about a place with good-looking women? Brilliant. Bathhouses started hiring attractive women to wait on guests, and sometimes get in the bath chamber themselves to help guests. For those men who were unsure how to bathe, they scrubbed people's backs, lathered shampoo, dried them with large fans, and provided other services. Some were in the front, offering tea and flirtation. In the evening, the baths closed, and these yuna changed into silk kimonos and played the shamisen, serving sake and a side of themselves. These places had an indoor latticed area for disrobing that'll become important later on. These bathhouses operated all over the capital city, which meant they were illegal. In the capital, prostitution was only allowed within the walls of Yoshiwara. But bathhouse girls were so cheap and popular that these bathhouses sprang up everywhere outside the pleasure district, eating into the profits of Yoshiwara businesses. Business owners cried to the government, and in 1657, the authorities closed all of these places. This killed the bathhouse business, but not the bathhouse business owners, who pretty much just changed the sign in front and called themselves tea houses. Yuna became Sancha. Sancha was what they called tea house girls or waitresses. Like bathhouses, the tea house business took off. If tea houses don't sound exciting to you, that's because you're thinking of places where they sit and drink tea and drone on about history and culture. If that does sound exciting to you, I love you. 
but tea houses were like today's hostess clubs slash lounges slash nightclubs where people gather for music entertainment and prostitution known for not rejecting customers and being affordable they became the most popular type of sex workers tea houses started opening in yoshiwara itself they kept the lattice divider style and made it face the street to showcase the beautiful women prisoners over time the status of sancha rose like a pee, -pee in the presence of one especially after the taiyu disappeared these women adopted a new rank called chu sang and by 1750 became the highest ranking courtesans in yoshiwara Around this time, the people of Yoshiwara started using the word oirang as a general word for high-ranking courtesans. A chusang was an oirang. The district had its own vocabulary and way of speaking, often cooking up new words like this. The word was used mostly within Yoshiwara. Oirang were the idols of the pleasure quarters, famous and lacking freedom. They wore extravagant clothing and hair decorations, copying a lot of what the taiyu used to wear. One of the most well-known entertainers in the pleasure district were geisha. The word just meant artist or performer. The very first geisha were these cultured and mesmerizing men. Yep, they were men. Dudes who could entertain a party like it's 1699. They sang, danced, and played music, but didn't offer sex. If you were throwing a birthday party and the clown called in sick, you could never go wrong with hiring a geisha to make it a fun night while you eat a birthday cake for one. Over time, because it was the pleasure quarters, female geisha stepped onto the scene and just took over the stage. The men couldn't compete, and one day they turned around and saw that the majority of geisha were women. It was a common sight to see geisha traveling in pairs on the streets of Yoshiwara, with shamisen carriers walking after. Every self-respecting geisha knew the shamisen like the back of her sleeves. They went for an understated, simple beauty because they wanted a contrast from the flashiness of courtesans, but mostly because the law banned geisha from dressing like courtesans and snatching their clients. A geisha tied her sash in the back because remember the front tied sash was like a now open sign for her sushi restaurant. Geisha officially did not roll over, which was street talk for sleeping with someone, but did geisha actually roll over for their clients? People have argued on both sides. One side says they did not because it was a respectable profession and geisha were not allowed to compete with actual prostitutes. They only offered entertainment. The other side are actual historians. Geisha were like the Hulk. They'd be smashing that shamisen like they just snorted gamma rays. Because the main job of a geisha was playing music, singing, and dancing. Many prided themselves on their skills rather than their bodies. But strolling through the muddy streets of Yoshiwara, one can't help but collect stains. Geisha were propositioned all the time. When those coins whispered their sweet jingling melody, it would have been hard for a poor worker to cover her ears. Over time, the musical skills of geisha declined as more people sought them out for their after-party services. There were even areas of the city of Edo outside of Yoshiwara where most geisha sold sex openly or as openly as you could while avoiding the cops. The word geisha became a euphemism for prostitute. As late as 1955, this euphemism existed. The history of geisha and sex work is fascinating, but that's a whole other topic. Of course, modern day geisha are not sex workers, so don't go around asking them weird questions. Geisha were also known as geiko. The word meant another type of performer initially, but eventually the terms became interchangeable. Nowadays, we call them geisha if they're from the Tokyo region. From the Kyoto area, they're called geiko, and an apprentice geiko is called maiko. In the Tokyo region, an apprentice geisha is called hangyoku. You can recognize Maiko and Kangyoku because they wear more colorful clothing than geisha and more ornaments in their hair. They only color the lower lip red. Their sash hangs long in the back, unlike the geisha's short sash. Yep, there were many female entertainers in the pleasure quarters of Japan. Most of them had rough lives trying to satisfy their clients every day. Some performed extreme acts, desperate to keep their patrons. Click here to see the things they did. It's not for the faint of heart, only the mighty of balls. We got a new emperor on Patreon today, Lana2811. Thanks so much, you are amazing. We also have some new regular patrons, Mika Bailey, Amy Steele, Karen Joyner, Christy Hollow, Rogue MD, and Amy. Alright, I love you and spread the knowledge. All right, that's all.